Whitehall, one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in its history... Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories. The plain, unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names have, for obvious reasons, been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research for Whitehall 1212 comes from Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. This is Chief Inspector John Davidson, who is in charge of Scotland Yard's famous Black Museum. Good afternoon. Can you imagine mistaking this exhibit here for a revolver or a pistol, or in fact for a gun of any kind? Here, have a look at it. Sorry, I dropped it. If it had landed on my great toe where that cab horse trod on it in December 1907, well, thank goodness it didn't. No, I shouldn't think that anyone in his right mind could possibly mistake this for anything but what it obviously is, a hammer. Yet a large number of persons, some of them policemen, were at one time quite certain that it was a gun. Now, I hung it up here on the wall in the year 1929, the same year that Pierre Point, the hangman, did as much for the man who used it. Now, this is Chief Inspector Reginald Porter, who will tell you how it happened. Reginald? The morning of 11th January, 1929, I was handed a telegram which had been sent the night before from Southampton. been in the room some eight or nine weeks. Will you please send a man down to investigate the matter? McCormick, Chief Constable of Southampton. One thing was obvious to me at once, that Mr. McCormick had had very little instruction in the art of eliminating unnecessary words in his telegrams. A good CID detective sergeant could have told the story in 20 fewer words, although I agree not so elegantly. In Southampton, a smart young detective sergeant smelling of pear soap and a good grade of hair oil escorted me to the scene of the discovery. The place here was formerly a garage, sir, as I'm sure you can see. Yes, I can see, sergeant. Yes, sir. Is this the one that was padlocked? Yes, sir. Oh, as a matter of fact, both this door and the one in the rear were padlocked. The rear one is still intact. Uh, This is the one that was broken. The main entrance? Quite, sir. The men who found him broke the lock? Yes, sir. Where are they? They should be inside, sir. I'll ask the constable at the door, sir. By all means, Sergeant. Yes, sir. I say, constable, those two gentlemen are inside, Sergeant. I suppose you're looking for them, aren't you? The ones that found him. Inside, sir. Inside here, Chief Inspector. No, sir. This way, if you please. You needn't sound like a blasted shop walker, you know, Sergeant. Morning, sir. Morning, constable. They'll be inside, sir. I heard you. Yes, sir. Doors open, sir. Am I blind? Yes. After you, sir. Where are they? Mr. Remington? Mr. Finn? Where do they go? Mr. Finn, are you here? Over here, Sergeant. Come over here. Over there, sir. What are they doing in heaven's name? I don't know, sir. Here, Sergeant. Where? I don't... Behind the oil drum, Sergeant. I see them. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, morning, sir. sir. They got here, Sergeant. Gentlemen, this is Chief Inspector Portner of the Yard. Scotland Yard. Where'd you find him? Right down there, sir. He was crumpled up against them oil drums. Dead, sir. I can see the blood. That is blood, isn't it? I'm afraid so, sir. There's quite a lot of it, isn't there? Yes, sir. For one man, sir. Find the gun? No, sir, not yet. 
We're starting to look again this morning. You did find the body, though, didn't you? Oh, yes, sir. Rather, these gentlemen did. How'd you happen to find them? You're the ones that broke the lock? How'd you get in here? I haven't been briefed in this thing yet. Don't even know the murdered man's name yet. Oh, his name... His name the... was Rafe Street, sir. Uh, he was our agent. Your agent? Our company's chief inspector. Lion Oil Limited. He sold oil and petrol, sir. All these drums are ours, chief inspector, you see. Mr. Street was not actually our employee, you see. Just an agent. You see, we hadn't heard from him for several months. Several months? October 28th, to be precise, Finn. I hope you don't mind being precise, gentlemen. This is a murder, you understand. Sergeant. Sir. Had this man been reported missing before his body was found? Not to my knowledge, sir. I'll want to know why his disappearance wasn't investigated, if he was reported missing, you know. I'll check, sir. Now, gentlemen, I am to understand that your agent had not been heard from for something over two months. And you people up to now made no effort to find out why. Is that true? Well, sir... Oh, I can explain that, Inspector. Uh, Chief Inspector. Do so, please. Well, in the first place, the late Mr. Street was a man of no known relatives, according to our records. That's right, sir. He had sleeping and living quarters in the back of this building. And I suspect there was nobody to notice his absence. Wouldn't then. you people notice it? Well, the company had written to him several times regarding his failure to send in his reports of November the 1st and December the 1st. Isn't that unusual with you people? Not necessarily, sir. Our agents are often late in rendering their reports. Oh, yes. We did become concerned, Chief Inspector. And we'd heard nothing at all from Mr. Street for so long. He owed us three consecutive monthly reports. November 1st, December 1st, and January 1st. That's right. So the company sent us down from London to investigate, you see. That was when you found his body? We found the garage door, padlock, front, rear, and... We had no keys, of course. So These I premises got... were Mr. Street's. So I got a tire leave on my tool kit. Together we ripped the padlock off the front door. We have that padlock, sir. Be quiet, Sergeant. And then you entered and found the body. Precisely. We could have them both for breaking and entering. Sergeant, sir. will you please put a sock in it? Well, sir. Sergeant. Yes, sir. You didn't use a hammer to break that padlock, gentlemen. No, sir. We... No, sir. Tire lever. From, uh... Well, uh, then will you tell me what that bloody hammer's doing Sir, is it in... necessary to use such language? Sergeant, you have an evil mind. Will you look at that hammer there beside the Lion Mane SAE 30 oil drum? How'd that blood get all over the hammerhead if that man was shot? I left the fragrant sergeant to arrange for and supervise a draft of detectives from the Southampton police to organize and conduct an all-out search of the garage warehouse for the gun with which the victim had allegedly been killed and proceeded in good order to the mortuary where the body lay. It was not in very good shape, but a careful examination on my part convinced me that the cause of death was not a bullet, but a series of wounds caused by repeated blows from a heavy object. Now, please don't at once begin to find fault with the Southampton police. The wounds resembled a great deal more than superficially those often caused by bullets. Gregory Aldous, the police surgeon, pointed this out to me. You see, here in particular, Chief Inspector... A deep punctured wound, exactly like one made by a bullet. And here. Yes, I see. And here again. And the fractures themselves were so covered with dried blood, it would be the obvious thing for a layman to say at once, a gunshot wound. I wouldn't have. You Scotland Yard chaps are geniuses, of course. Well, I will admit if I hadn't noticed that bloody hammer on the floor... Don't be so modest. I was about to say where you chaps had seen it a dozen times and paid no attention to it. I think I'd better just make sure there isn't any bullet in his head. Or evidence of one having been there. Well, I'm sure I'm not going to watch you do it, Doctor. That will be helpful, sir. <sighs> Mind you're careful now. I shall want to try that hammer to see if it fits those marks on the skull. So shall I, sir. Must be an extraordinary hammer to produce marks like bullet holes. It is. The end of the hammer head opposite the striking part, the peen it's called, Doctor... It's quite thin and long and about the diameter of a 38 caliber bullet. The kind of hammer often used by motor car mechanics 
as Mr. Remington of Lion Oil Limited was good enough to point out to me. How does he know? He was once a motor car mechanic himself, my dear doctor. And when are you going to arrest him, Chief Inspector? It had occurred to me at the very moment I was saying it to Gregory Aldous. I went back to the garage to find him. He had gone back to London to report to his firm's officials, but Finn was still there, helping assiduously but ineffectually in the search for the alleged murder gun. I sat him down in a corner of the place which rang to the voices and the noises they made as they overset racks of oil drums. Haven't found it yet, eh? Not yet. Oh, my sainted aunt, I'm tired. Tired? Those oil drums were in the neighborhood of a hundred weight apiece. I've moved several million of them. Remington move a lot, too? Not really likely. He had to go to London. Yes, I know. Tough on you. Well, he's my boss. Fine to be a boss, isn't it? He's all right. Known him long? Met him in the Navy 20-odd years ago. <laughs> I was his boss then. Oh? Huh? Wavy Navy. We were the crew of an MTB. I was skipper, full lieutenant. Remington was just a sub. I hadn't a job when we were demobbed, and he was going back with Lion Oil. He offered me one. And I've been there ever since. That before he was a motor mechanic or after? During. We ran the company's garage in Cheltenham before we got onto this job. You're both motor mechanics, then? Yes. You're both uh, familiar with that kind of hammer, I found, then? Oh, quite. We use dozens of them. Ah. Oh. Sergeant! Sergeant! Yes, sir. You want me, sir? Sergeant, that hammer's still here. The one you found, sir? Yes. Yes, sir. Take it, please, and deliver it to Dr. Gregory Aldous of the mortuary where the body is. Dr. Gregory Aldous of the police surgeon? Yes, sir, I know him. Right, but be very careful with it. Oh, I will, sir. I had Geordie Tucker photograph it, sir, before I moved it and wrapped it up in paper and put it in a biscuit tin I found. I'll send it right away. Take it, I said. Uh, Yes, sir. Wait there for me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Nice chap, that. Oh, yes, quiet. So you've known Remington a long time? Oh, yes. How long have you known this dead chap, Street? I never saw him till now. <laughs> the first time I've ever been in Southampton, even. Oh? Remington know him long? He'd never seen him either. Oh, oh hadn't no. he? I don't think so. He'd tell you if he had, wouldn't he? I expect so. Oh, why? Just wondered. You think Rem killed him? My dear man, how do I know you didn't? Why, you know, should we kill him? That's what I'm going to find out. Come along, I want to see this fellow's books and papers. Now then, you chaps, get going there and see if you can find me that gun. Which I doubt. Come along with me, Finn. All right. This his office, you suppose? It must be. The only door in the place. Open it. You've got keys, haven't you? I've got no keys. Then I'll open it. Stand clear. <clears throat> Some use for regulation police boots, after all. Oh, this must be where he slept. Oh, they're frosty in here. Ugh. It's a pity there isn't a window. Had he any desk? Seem to have had. Well, oh, the man do business. <laughs> he did all right. He was a good customer, even if he did live in a pigsty like this. Wonder where he kept his money. Here, what's this? What is it? I found where he kept it. Oh, a kid's money box. Well, it's empty now. Uh, uh, don't touch it and spoil the dabs. The what? Fingerprints. 
Oh. Robbery, eh? Place was locked up. All right, there's a spring lock on the door. Oh. Poor devil must have closed it himself when he came out. Oh, no, the murderer did it after he killed him and broke the money box over. Cool, Blighter. He must have known the place pretty well. What are you looking at me for? Where are you going? Oh, I just want to see what's in this coat there. Where? Here. Oh. How did you know it was his? Oh. What's his name? Streets. I don't. It must be, though. The murderer wouldn't leave his. Have a look at it. Give it to me. Here you are. Pockets full of papers. Well, not exactly full. Letter. Here, hold the coat. Uh -huh. Ah. Well, what's the matter? How well do you know your friend Remington? What? This letter, Mr. Finn, is attached to one of Street's invoices. This is the letter. It's on the stationery of Messrs. Clive and Buckley of this city. It says, Dear Sir, the amount, 14 pounds, 11 shillings, mentioned in your attached invoice, was paid to your salesman, Mr. Remington. What? Your salesman, Mr. Remington, in cash at the time the goods I were delivered. You can't, you can't. Remington didn't know the man. We suggest that you consult your Mr. Remington regarding this amount for which we hold his signed receipt. Yours, etc., Clive and Buckley. Uh, Terence Buckley, Secretary Treasurer. I'm afraid I must ask you to, again to come with me. Where? Where are you? We are going to the nearest police station, sir, where I shall telephone London to bring me Mr. Remington. I'm going to consult you both. Come along, if you please. <laughs> It was no trouble at all to reach Scotland Yard in London and to arrange to have Mr. Remington contacted at Lion Oil and then accompany an officer back to Southampton. In the meantime, Mr. Finn consented to accept the hospitality of the Southampton police until his partner arrived. Myself, I went to the mortuary, found Gregory Aldis gone and left that gloomy place for Aldis's official quarters where he sat talking with the sergeant was not so redolent of oils and unguents by now. Gregory Aldous looked at me pleasantly. Well, was I right, Chief Inspector? Hmm? Have you arrested Remington? He'll be in custody at once, yes. What did you discover about the hammer? It fits perfectly, sir. I was speaking to Dr. Aldous, Sergeant. Excuse me, sir. Does it fit the wounds, Doctor? Perfectly. Good. There's no bullet in the skull, though. I hope he didn't spoil it. It's so difficult to spoil a skull that's been worked on by somebody with a peen hammer, sir. The sergeant here has made an interesting discovery, Chief Inspector. Oh, has he? And what have you discovered, Sergeant? Where the hammer came from, sir. What's that? You looked at the handle, of course, sir. Of course, of course I looked at the handle. Why? You saw that Morris works and a number was branded on it. Sergeant, I must admit I did not. Thank you, sir. Who is this Morris Works? Did you find out? If you had lived in Southampton, sir, you'd of course recognize it at once. Of course. Well, what's so blasted funny? That's the factory where they make the Morris motorboats, sir. The Morris Works. <laughs> well, I'll be blurred. That shows you what a Londoner doesn't know, doesn't it? <laughs> and what else did you discover, Sergeant? Well, sir... I rang up a chap we know at the Morris Works and I asked him about that number. Good, good, good. And he put me on to the tool issuing department and a man there recognized it at once. Better and better. It was the number of a chap in the engineering department, a motor mechanic. You see, Elders? We were right. I was right. Go on, Sergeant. Go on. Well, sir, that's the lot. We we found this fellow, name of... Uh, I wrote it down. I found this at the garage while we were hunting for the gun. There isn't any gun. Nothing but the hammer. Yes, sir. The fellow's name is... P. Gallons... No, no, that's not it. Oh, here, on the other side, here it is. Teddy Vanuken. Go out and arrest him at once, Sergeant. You found him, you make the arrest. Thank you, sir. Doesn't suspect anything, does he, eh? He's not the one, sir. What? What are you telling me? No, sir, on, on October 24th last year, uh, Vanuken reported that his hammer, uh, 
A spike peen hammer, he called it. I told you, Aldous. Spike peen? Go on, Sergeant. Well, he'd lent it to a man, a stranger, who never brought it back. And he had to requisition a new one. That's all, sir. Well. Sergeant, just as soon as they deliver this Remington chap from London, you and I'll hurry him right down there. It would save time if we got this Teddy for Newcomb to come up here, sir. Right. Then we'll let him identify the fella. No, by gad. What's the matter? Let him identify whichever one of the two borrowed the hammer. If he doesn't know the man's name... He doesn't, sir. Well, that's either Finn or Remington. They're good friends. We'll see which one he identifies. Sergeant, that's extraordinarily good work. Thank you, sir. Uh, tell me, what kind of hair oil is that you use? Oh, it's, it, a... it's in excellent taste. The identification parade to which both Remington and his friend Finn readily consented was scheduled for ten in the morning in a vacant room at the Southampton police station to which the sergeant was attached. Mr. Teddy Finucan was seated alongside my desk with me as the crowd came in and stood along one wall. I had secured six or eight other persons to stand in with them to make it as fair as possible for the suspects. That, of course, is standard procedure. Will you gentlemen please take off your hats? Thank you. Not that there was any doubt by now. We're all ready, sir. If you please, then, Mr. Finucan. Now, will you please tell us whether you recognize any of these gentlemen, sir? Good, the first one. No. Remington was third, Finn seventh in line. Uh, this gentleman, Mr. Finucan? Uh, no. This one, sir? Hey, I know you. Well, you ought to, Ted. Even after all these years... Corky Remington! <laughs> oh, I, I haven't seen you since the night you and I and Joe Finn were thrown into the clink together. And Chenef. Where in the world have you been? <laughs> Joe Finn's right here, Teddy. Why, Joe, it's uh, Teddy. Why, Teddy for you? Why, you old nighter. <laughs> you, you know them? No. Well, they're the best pals I ever had in the wavy navy in the war, and I haven't seen them since. <laughs> Say, Corky, what time is it? The pubs will be open any uh, minute. I, uh, uh, I know you'll excuse us, <laughs> won't you, Admiral? Why, Corky? What are you doing here? I'm the blinking suspect, mate. By nine that night, they were all three in jail. The charge was under the Act of 1872 in such cases made and provided, Section 80, of which reads... Being guilty while drunk of riotous or disorderly behavior in any highway or other public place, whether a building or not. It had been both, and the Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve had done themselves proud. Mr. Teddy Finucan, former artificer petty officer attached to motor torpedo boat squadron umpty-oomp, was able at last to master his hangover and speak to me. Uh, no, sir. They ain't the man I lent my hammer to. No, sir. Positive. I'm very sorry to put you to all this trouble, Mr. Finucan. Pleasure, sir. But it couldn't be them. Neither one of them has a slide in his left eye. Port, starboard, right eye. Cross-eyed, you mean, hmm? Swill. Should have told you before. And a cut on his same right cheek. A big one. That's all I know. There's Cocky. He'll be able to join you for breakfast, Mr. Finucan, I'm sure. He and Mr. Finn both. <coughs> breakfast? I shall probably join you then. Breakfast? Goodbye. Come on, Sergeant. Well... I'm as disappointed as you are, sir. You're not old enough to be, son. Yes, sir. Well, we'll find him someday. Not much use keeping this any longer. What is it? The card I wrote Teddy for Newcomb's name down on, sir. Picked it up at that garage where the dead man was, stuck in the edge of an oil drum. Anything else on it? Just the name, sir. Oh, well. Name? Gollinson, Gollinson, P. Gollinson. Never heard of him. Why should that card with a name on it be there, though? 
Donaldson. I don't know, sir. Huh. Did you ever play a hunt, Sergeant? I do all the time, sir. Do they work? Quite often, sir. Come with me. I'm going to play mine. I borrowed a telephone in Dr. Gregory Aldous's office at the police station. A trunk call, sir? I'll get it for you. What's the number? Whitehall 1212. Right. <clears throat> Put us through to Whitehall 1212 in London, please. It's Chief Inspector Portner calling. Yes, sir. Put me through to the CRO. Criminal Records <clears throat> Office, yes, sir. Criminal Records Office. Look here, this is Chief Inspector Portman. Yes, sir. Here we go, Sergeant. Do you have anything on a man named... <clears throat> Wait a second, let me see the card, Sergeant. Gollinson. Uh, Gollinson. G-O-L-L-A-N-S-O-N. P. Gollinson. I'll see, sir. Uh, the eye, sir. What did you say, sir? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, he has a slide in his right eye. A what, sir? A slide, a cast. And a large scar on his right cheek. Can you check him at once, please? I'll try, sir. Will you wait, please? I'll wait. He's looking, Sergeant. Oh. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Are you there, Chief Inspector? I'm here. We have him, sir. Sergeant, we got him. <laughs> uh, where is he? Donaldson. Peter Herman. You want his record, sir? I want his whereabouts. He's got a bad record, sir. Good. Give me his address. He'll be quite easy to find, sir. He has eight more months to serve at Wandsworth Prison of the term he was sent on for last November. That's all. That's nearly all, anyway. There he was in Wandsworth, calmly sewing mail sacks. He knew what he was doing when he pled guilty to breaking and entering two days after he murdered poor Street. Rather, he thought he did. He had worked for Street for a short time and had been stealing from him consistently, using the name Remington, which he had seen in some of Street's correspondence. We took him to Southampton... This time, Finucane identified him at once as the borrower of the hammer with which Street was killed. Street, Gollinson said quite calmly, had accused him of stealing. And he had hit the poor man several times with a borrowed tool. So he stayed in Southampton with the Assizes, and when they found him guilty there, Sir Charles Wilson sentenced him to go back to prison. This time at Winchester, where they hanged him. Here today on Whitehall 1212, Horace Braham as Inspector Portner. Others in the order of their appearance were Harvey Hayes, Lester Fletcher, Maurice Gosfield, Pat O'Malley, Gerard Burke, Francois Grimard, and Gordon Stern. This is Lionel Rico speaking. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed by Willis Cooper. <laughs> When you're driving your car, remember that speed has its price. Death or injuries that can cripple you for life with endless bills to pay and endless years of suffering. Just because you may speed at times and get away with it, don't be lulled into a false sense of security. The price tag on speed violations last year was 15,000 killed and 500,000 injured. This year, thousands of lives can be saved if you and millions of other motorists come to the sober realization that speed is the biggest killer on the highways. Follow the campaign of the next president on NBC. Whitehall, one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. <laughs> For 
the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling crimes. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have for obvious reasons been changed. The stories are presented for the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. This is the story of Scotland Yard file number 202124. Here is Chief Superintendent John Davidson to brief you. Uh, these two rooms constitute the famous Black Museum of Scotland Yard, in which are preserved many of the objects which were of importance in solving of crimes which have confronted us. The exhibits in here range from lethal weapons to the most innocent of hearing items. They're all classified and filed most carefully so that they'll be available for study. We find them quite useful. A blood stain that let Scotland Yard men to the discovery of a murderer in 1930 may be of great assistance in solving a similar crime in 1952. Here, I show you a plain mirror, tag 202124, a plain gilt-framed mirror, its frame badly tarnished. Just such a mirror as you might find hanging in a hundred cheap flats in London's West End. But with one small difference. This smudged fingerprint here in the lower left-hand corner. Here, just there, above the frame. This mirror had looked on murder. This is the murderer's fingerprint. Oh, now here is Superintendent Charles Breton of Scotland Yard. He's the man who solved this case, 202124. I had the assistance, though, Don, of Marjorie Ashley, remember? Why wasn't Marjorie Ashley the woman who was murdered? Yes, that fingerprint's in her blood. On a morning in February 1942, a scant two months after your Pearl Harbor, I had a telephone call from Inspector Francis Xavier Costello at West End Central Police Station. What is it, Frank, I ask? The woman was apparently murdered, sir. Strangled with a green scarf. Her name was Rachel Soskin, sir. Where'd they find her? Wyndham Place, Maryland, sir. Identified her from her purse. The murderer had thrown it away, but we found it. Nothing in it but her identity card. Well, what are you calling me for? Can't you handle a routine murder, Inspector? Excuse me, but I don't think it's a routine murder. Why? Well, sir... The woman, in addition to having been strangled, had been horribly beaten up. I'm sure that's regrettable, Costello, but after all, is it so unusual? It is, then, sir. The doctor here says the blows were inflicted after death. The report from the mortuary by Keith Yarrow, the Home Office pathologist, confirmed the report. The woman had been brutally beaten after she had died from strangulation. At first glance, it appeared that the murderer, in an attempt at robbery, had inadvertently committed murder. But with the discovery of the beating... Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper flourished in the years 1888 and 89, 53 years before. He would have been at least 75 years old. Criminal Records Office was consulted. The names of every possible suspect were dredged up and thoroughly investigated, but to no avail whatever. Investigation of the murdered woman, Mrs. Rachel Soskin, disclosed the fact that she had been acquired, a highly respectable person whose husband was absent in the African campaign. There was not a single clue of any sort. On the third day, I had another telephone call from the West End Central Police Station, Inspector Costello again. There's another, sir. Another what, Inspector? Another murdered woman, sir. Oh? Border Street in her own flat. Name? Marjorie Ashley, 26. Lived alone. Same type of woman? Uh, a dancer. Uh -huh. Found her this morning about ten o'clock. Uh -huh. The landlady looking to collect her rent. Had she been robbed? The room had been ransacked. Apparently only money had been taken, but only she'd been killed, sir. How? Butcher knife, sir. Her own. It's rather dreadful. 
Anything new on the other case? No, sir. Uh, this could be the same chap, sir. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, what are you doing? He left his calling card this time, sir. Mm-hmm. With his name? Uh, no name, sir. But it's him, all right. Who? Jack the Ripper, sir. It could have been Jack the Ripper's calling card right enough. I visited the room myself with Inspector Costello. They've got the knife in the laboratory at the odds, sir. No fingerprints, I expect. Well, not on it, sir, I'm afraid. But they're looking. But here's his calling card, sir. Blood. Like a slaughterhouse, sir. But here... On the mirror. Yeah, he, he touched it, sir. The fingerprint man from the yard is sure it's not hers. Uh, mm-hmm. Smudged a little. He says they can classify it all right, sir. He's photographed it. They're working on it now. Well... You, uh, you say she was robbed. Took all her money, emptied her purse. Wanted to make it look like robbery. I must think we're fools. If you could have seen her, sir. Thanks. Well, he's left his prints. We'll find them. I don't think we'll find his prints in the files, sir. Why not? They didn't have fingerprints in Jack the Ripper's day, did they? Costello was right. They counted the fingerprint found on the mirror, the one you saw a moment ago, but it could not be found under any classification in our files. Forty-eight hours later, the police found the body of Margaret Newton in her flat in Gosfield Street near Tottenham Court Road. It's the same one, sir. Her purse emptied and the place turned upside down and, and she... Well, slaughterhouse again, sir. Worse than the last one. Fingerprints? Yes, sir. A bottle of bath salts has been smashed. Or one of the pieces. Two sets of prints, hers and his. Who was she? No particular occupation, sir. Uh, seen around various West End nightclubs a great deal. Mm-hmm. Must have met him in one of them. Who, sir? Jack the Ripper, old boy. <laughs> In the criminal records office at Scotland Yard, men worked long hours sifting files for the names of known or suspected sex offenders. Men with criminal records which included crimes of violence. Each was painstakingly investigated. Fingerprints of all were checked with those we had found at the scenes of the last two murders. The results? Nothing. The West End of London was terrified. Women stayed in their homes after dark behind locked doors. Hundreds of suspects were questioned. The results, nothing. Nightlife in the West End all but ceased to exist. Uh, two days later, Mrs. Doris Brooks, the wife of a hotel manager, was murdered in her flat not more than a mile away from the scene of the last crime. Uh, I'm ready for the loony bin, sir. Oh, we all are, Costello. No clues this time at all? None at all, sir. Peter just the same way as he did the others, but he didn't leave any clues. Any fingerprints. Well, a fat lot of good the other fingerprints have done us anyway. Yes, sir. Well, cheer up. We'll get him eventually. He's crazy, obviously. He'll slip. Well, how many more poor women will have to be murdered before we do, sir? Well, have you any ideas, then? No more than you have, sir. What puzzles me is why he still keeps up the pretense that the motive's robbery. The man's got a diseased mind. But well, obviously. I, I mean, I think he's... He, he, he thinks he's fooling us. Sir. He is. You could have got more than 20 pounds from all his victims. It isn't money he wants. He's a maniac. He takes their money, then. That's how he thinks he's fooling us, Costello. He's done this before. Every assault case in the last ten years has been examined. He's not any of them. Somebody knows him. We've checked the acquaintances of all four women, sir. If we could find one person that more than one of them knew... Well? There's no such person, sir. Three days went by. Four. Five. 
a week. There are no more reports of violence, either attempted or consummated, on the persons of any more London women. Our people were still hard at work. The scene of each of the four crimes had been gone over again and again for cures. But none. None at all. Our voluminous files of crime yielded nothing. Women began to appear again on the streets of London, but was still almost as much as a man's life was worth than to speak to an unescorted woman. The newspapers were still full of warnings. Women screamed for a policeman when a strange man lifted his hat to them. But some women are foolhardy. Such a one was Miss Paula Ingram. I heard about her from the station superintendent at C Division in Savile Row, Arthur Austin. I hurried to Savile Row to see Miss Ingram. A slight, rather pretty little woman with astonishing blonde hair. Of course, I don't know, sir. I know there's lots of soldiers walking the streets, sir, looking to pick up a bit of fluff, especially if they're <laughs> good-looking, you know. Go on, please, Miss Ingram. Well, it was last night as I was coming out of a place in German Street when this bloke stopped me. Hello, sweetness and light, he says. And <laughs> I didn't realize he was speaking to me. Oh, you didn't see his face, of course. Uh, no, sir. I, I didn't see his face. But I could tell he was in an RAS uniform. How? With a little cap, you know. I could see that. Uh. Air cadet he was. I could see the white on the cap. Mm -hmm. Well, going somewhere, he asked me, and I stopped off a moment to speak to him. I always try to be nice to the forces, and he sounded so nice and so polite. Go on, please. Well, so I, I stopped and we started to talk. Mm -hmm. He kept getting closer to me, but I didn't give it much attention. Why? I thought perhaps he was going to try to kiss me. They often do, you know, especially the RAF lads. And, and all of a sudden, I, I felt his hands on my neck. What did you do? Well, it came to me in a flash. This is Jack the Ripper, I thought. And, and I tried to push him away, but he, he just got his hand around my throat and, and I just screamed, Help! And he let go my neck and said, now don't. And, and, and I screamed again and he turned and ran. Uh-huh. And then I thought to myself, you're, you're, you're making a bloody fool of yourself. And I called after him, but he was still running. And I thought, well, now maybe I haven't. And I came over here to the police station and reported it. Did, did I make a bloody fool of myself, sir? You didn't see his face? No, sir. But he, but he was most pleasant-spoken, though he was rather forward. Oh, dear. Now, now I wonder if I did the right thing. You're still alive, aren't you? Yes. But, oh, dear! What's the matter? So is he! We kept the news of Paula Ingram and her experience out of the papers. Might be trivial, but then... Then again, it might not be, I said to Costello. This girl, Ingram, sir, what do you think of her? London's full of girls like that, unfortunately. Soldiers call them Piccadilly Commandos. Right. That was the kind of women Jack the Ripper specialized in, wasn't it? Oh, will you stop that Jack the Ripper stuff? Well, wasn't it? Wasn't it, sir? That's a pretty thin sort of clue, Inspector. What about the other four women that were killed? Weren't they the same kind? Well? Well, sir. Could be a clue, couldn't it? All the same class of women. Same way Jack the Ripper. How are we going to find this Jack the Ripper? How do we know whether he's the right one? How do we... Excuse me. Superintendent Burrison here... Oh, yes, Superintendent Austin. Oh, is that so? Well, that's quite encouraging. He's on the way. Good. We'll wait. I expect... Oh, here he is now, I think. Uh, uh, open the door, will you, Scott Fellow? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, I... I think it is one of your men. Okay, I'll take it. Right. Costello's got it. Thank you. This is most awfully good of your men. 
Yes, that's it. Thank you. I'll, I'll tell you what luck we have. Goodbye. What is it, a gas mask? Yes, sir. The superintendent Austin at Wall Street. Let's have it. It uh, found in a doorway on German Street shortly after noon, Austin says. Let's see. Uh-huh. L.A.C. Frederick Gordon, R.A.F., number... Number 70... Well, let's see what we shall see, eh, Costello? Uh-huh. German Street. Not two doors away from where our Miss Ingram had her encounter with the amorous airman. Hand me the phone, will you, Costello? Yes, sir. Give me the air ministry, please. Here, you take this. Ask them where leading air craftsman Frederick Gordon is stationed, will you, whilst I'll take a look at this thing. Yes, sir. Think that's him, sir? We'll see. Huh, what's this? Hello? Inspector Costello, Scotland Yard here. I wonder, can you tell me where to find L.A.C. Gordon? Frederick Gordon. Number 707-1256. Quiet. I'll, I'll wait. What have you found, sir? Look. In the gas mask bag. Yes? Regent's Park. Special cadet wing there. Thank you. She said he was a cadet, sir. I think you'd better go see him. Yes. What did you find of the case, sir? It does, uh... Does a woman's comb and a lipstick marked D.B. look like part of an RAF cadet's kit? While Inspector Costello set up a Regent's Park where the special RAF cadet wing was quartered, preparing for their commissions... I took the things I'd found in the gas mask case down to the property room. May I see the effects of these women, Mrs. Rachel Saskin, Miss Marjorie Ashley, Margaret Newton, Mrs. Doris Brooks? Jack the Ripper murdered. If sir. you insist on calling them that. Yes, I got them right here. Right here, all together. Well, sir. let's see them. Yes, yes, sir. Well, here, here's the first one, sir. Rachel Saskin. Mm hmm. Nothing in it but her identity card, sir. Ah. Well, let's see another. Marjorie Ashley. That all? Just a handbag, sir. Aha. Mm. Uh -huh. What is it? This comb. Yeah. Same as the other things in it. Where did you get it, sir? The RAF had it. Yeah. Matches, doesn't it? Yes, sir. Let's see the others. Uh. Margaret Newton. Mm. Empty. Next. Doris Brooks. Right. What is it, sir? Was there a lipstick in this? No, sir. Then this one was hers. Must be, sir. Yeah, initials on it. D.B. Doris Brooks. Yeah, just like the silver pencil. And the comb. And nail file. Sterling. All the same initials, D.B. Not bad, not bad. Oh, uh, excuse me, sir. Well, uh, that's all I wanted. Property room. Who? No. Oh, oh, yes, sir. Superintendent Broughton? The call is for you, sir. Who is it? Who is it, please? Uh, Inspector Costello, sir. Oh, good. Thank you. Broughton here. Hello, Costello. I'm at Regent's Park, sir. Yes? Well? The warrant officer here tells me he's on pass. Well, where did he go? Does he know? Yes, sir. He heard Gordon say he was going to visit a lady friend of his. Back in my office, I had just completed the telephone call when my door was flung open. Costello entered with a, with a man in Royal Air Force Blue. Come on in. Ah, you did find him, Costello. No, sir. This is Warrant Officer Gibbons. He's from Gordon's cadet wing at Regent's Park, sir. Sir, I believe you're wrong about Gordon. Why, Mr. Gibbons? Gordon's one of the most popular cadets in the entire wing, sir. Well, what does that prove? Oh, I don't believe Gordon's capable of the thing. What's he like, Mr. Gibbons? Well, he's a fine chap, sir. Well, I admit he does chuck his weight about a little, but most of the chaps call him the Count because he's so... Uh, um, 
Well, he's a gentleman, sir. May I ask, Mr. Gibbons, what did you do in civilian life? I, um, I was sales representative for the uh, Peerless Bicycle Company of Ealing, sir. Ah, I see. Warrant Officer Gibbons has brought Gordon's fingerprints with him, Superintendent. Fingerprints? Uh, we require fingerprints to be taken on all men posted to this wing, sir. A new regulation. Very uh, praiseworthy, I'm sure. May I see them? Uh, uh, by all means, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, Costello, will you ask Ernest Whiting to bring up those fingerprints we have so he can compare them? I'll take these down, sir. If Mr. Gibbons doesn't mind. Oh, not at all, sir. Good. All right, then, Inspector. All right. Uh, you told Inspector Costello Gordon was going to see a lady, for instance. Uh, yes, sir. Did he mention her name? Uh, no, sir. Uh, why is he so popular there at Regent Park? Well, sir, he's, uh, he's very pleasant. He has lots of money and he, he spends it quite freely. Ah. And the men, uh, they, they like him a great deal, sir. Right, they say. Uh, uh, would you, of course, recognize Gordon? Oh, yes, of course, sir. Uh, we may ask you to do so. All right, sir. Uh, is he here? I think he will be eventually. All right, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. But you may need to go with us to identify him. Do you know where he is, sir? I think I know where to find him. My, you Scotland Yard people, you're... <laughs> you're marvellous. Not always, Mr. Gibbons, I'm afraid. Excuse me. Yes, yes. Superintendent Brereton here. Uh, I'm calling for Superintendent Austin, sir. Good. Any news? Uh, yes, sir. The, the porter from the Silver Kitten... The... Where... The what? The nightclub, sir, where Paula Ingram works. Oh, yes, yes, the place on Germ Street where she... That's it, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, he came in only a minute ago. He said there was a raft man, you know, an airman, asking him where she lives. Miss Ingram? Paula Ingram, sir. Did he tell him? Unfortunately, yes, sir. How long ago was that? But he asked, oh, about ten minutes ago, sir. Then he got rather terrified. He knows the story, sir. And he ran right over here to tell us. You have men at the place where she lives? Yes, sir. But there are hundreds of men on the street in airmen's uniforms, and we haven't any idea what he looks like. Well, I can remedy that. I have a man here who can identify him. Well, we're afraid we'll be too late, sir. Be there as soon as I can. Now, where the devil's Costello? Costello! Ernest Whiting says they're the same, sir. Eh? The fingerprints, sir. He says he'll swear that they're the same as the ones that we have. Oh, I still think there's some mistake, sir. There isn't. If Ernest Whiting says they're the same, they're the same. He knows more about finger... Come on, Mr. Gibbons. Where are we going, sir? After Jack the Ripper. Come on, quickly. But I say... Here's your cap, Mr. Gibbons. We need you. Traffic didn't hamper us very much. We were in one of the cars of the flying squad, and nothing seems to bother them. Pedestrians scuttled to the pavement as we skidded around corners on our way to the house off German Street, which Paula Ingram had given us as her address. Now, of course, you followed me. I had ordered policemen to that address as soon as I'd heard that Gordon was on his way to see a lady friend. Somehow or other, he'd obtain her name. I was certain that eventually he'd find the address and I proposed to find him. If possible, before he'd attack Paula Ingram. It was a long way there. Our car drew up at last a few doors away from the house. Have you seen him yet? There have been several Lord AF men along the street. Come sir. on, Costello. Come on, Mr. Gibbons. Oh, thanks. Come on. This house. Come on. Up the stairs. Hurry. Do you think that... Shh, shh. I say, I was going to say, I think I can smell something. Her perfume. No, sir. It's the kind he always wears. Perfume? He always wears it. It's channels Russia leather. I recognize it anywhere. We're always spoofing him about it. <laughs> Come on, at that door! Come on, come on, come on, now, now! Oh, he came back! He came back! He's just the river! Gordon! Watch out here! 
it. You recognize him, Gibbon? Of course I do. He's Cadet Frederick Gordon. You, you coppers knock you. Frederick Gordon, I charge you with the willful murder of Marjorie Ashley. Take your filthy hands off. And I warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. Don't touch me. Are you all right, Miss Ingram? Search him, Costello. Hold your arms up, Gordon. Get away from Hold me. Hold your arms up, please. What's this? I know what that is. It's the carving knife the cookhouse sergeant told me had been stolen by somebody. That's the king's property. I shouldn't worry about it, Mr. Gibbons. Cadet Gordon isn't going to use it. Bring him along, Inspector. <laughs> At his trial, Gordon was asked why he committed these four savage murders. He smiled. He was an extraordinarily attractive young man, and he did have a winning smile. He was asked again, why? It's really quite simple. When I was posted to the special wing, I realized that these young men, my fellow cadets, were young men of the best families, used to much better things than I was. I wouldn't be patronized by them. I'm as good as they. But I need money. I realized, of course, that an officer of the Royal Air Force, which I was soon to be, wouldn't stoop to stealing from his comrades. <laughs> oh, I have stolen before, sir. But not since I became a cadet. I, I felt I must have money, however. Why? One must keep up one's standards, my dear man. But I decided to acquire money. There are many women with full purses... Women the world would never miss. And I hit upon the scheme. I would rid the world of uh, quite undesirable people, and I'd have their money. Nobody'd ever suspect they were destroyed for their money if uh, Jack the Ripper killed them. You'd be too sure the murderer was Jack come back to Earth, and you'd never notice their money, too, was gone. <laughs> I think that was rather clever. <laughs> They'd be looking around for human fiends and... Never even glanced at the handsome RAF cadet. I've been told so many times that I'm quite attractive to women. <laughs> I did very well, thank you. My only regret is that I didn't kill you, Miss Ingram. She had a good bit of money. You'd still be looking for Jack the Ripper, wouldn't you, Superintendent? <laughs> Despite the desperate representations by counsel that Frederick Gordon was insane, a jury at Old Bailey found him guilty of the murder of Marjorie Ashley. He was hanged in June 1942, still smiling in the most charming manner. You have heard another in the series Whitehall 1212, compiled from the official files of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Whitehall, one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have for obvious reasons been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is from Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. 
Now, here is Chief Superintendent John Davidson of Scotland Yard, the curator of the famous Black Museum, to brief you on case number 330220. If you're planning murder, which I sincerely hope you're not, a visit to the Black Museum here will most certainly, I believe, serve as a deterrent. Here we have a large collection of murder weapons, from the simplest to the most ingenious, and most of them have been used effectually. Now, here's a knife still stained with a murdered man's dried blood. Yeah, the user of that knife was hanged. And here is a revolver bullet from a man's brain. Yeah, the man who fired that shot was hanged. And the one-time possessor of this tiny phial, which at the time contained poison, thought to murder her husband. Yeah, the hangman ended her career, too. And this carpenter's mallet here. The wielder of that one drew a trip to the execution shed for the unorthodox use of it. You know, most murderers are caught, and they die more ignominiously than their victims. And here in the Black Museum lie the instruments that encompass two deaths, the victims and the murderer's own. This innocent tool once fell into evil hands. It's all that remains. Now, Chief Inspector Nigel Loring knows a great deal about this case, number 330-220. The old heathens used to believe that their gods were the ones who inspired mortals to murder. This god has the bloodiest murder record of them all. Who was that, Nigel? Mars, the god of war? No, no, John. His name is Cupid. He was the god of love. When Thomas Beckett Appleby married Alma Virginia Farnestock in Canada, he was 70 years old. Alma Virginia was 39. They had both been married before. Her first husband was dead, and Thomas Appleby had divorced his first wife to marry the attractive middle-aged widow. The affair had been a nine-day scandal in their Canadian home, and they had shortly removed to Bournemouth near Southampton to take up what might be called life anew. When I was first assigned to the case, I asked Uncle Tom Cobley, the village ancient of Bournemouth, to describe the Applebys to me. Appleby? Why, he be a bitter old man. Oh, he's a good score of years younger than I be. Never pays no attention to nobody except in his money and his bottle. Forgot everything but that... <laughs> that that wife of his even, mister. And uh, Mrs. Alma Appleby? Eh? Hey? Mrs. Alma Appleby. Oh, she's pretty, even if she be no chicken. He don't pay her no mind. Even if half of the men in Bournemouth be in love with her, mister, including me. <laughs> and so, when Thomas Beckett Appleby died at the age of 75 from the result of a broken skull, there was scant sympathy to be expected for him and much indeed for Alma Virginia, his wife, until Alma Virginia opened her mouth and spoke to a sergeant of the Bournemouth police station who had been summoned by Dr. Owen Trelawney, the attending physician. I did it. I tell you I did it. I tell the coroner I did it. That's all I have to say. Madam, do you know what you're saying in the presence of witnesses? Certainly I know what I'm saying. I killed him. I hit him on the head with Malik. Write it down. Madam, you don't know what you're saying. You're drunk. <laughs> I was assigned to the case the following day. You know as much about the case now as I did then. Thomas Beckett Appleby lay dead in a nursing home with his skull fractured in three places. The new-made widow, it was now near ten the following morning, was awake after having slept nearly twelve hours after her confession to the Bournemouth sergeant. The maid, Marjorie Bates, brought her downstairs. There was nothing very attractive about Alma Virginia Appleby as she slumped into a chair in the disordered sitting room. I need some more tea, Marjorie. Scotland Yard, eh? Uh, yes, Mrs. Appleby. Well? I was hoping you'd care to amplify the statement you made last night, Mrs. Appleby. Statement? About your husband's death, Mrs. Appleby. Marjorie! Oh. Are you ever going to bring that tea? I uh, was hoping you'd care to amplify that statement, Mrs. Appleby. How? 
We are wondering how your husband was murdered. Oh, I don't know. I... All I know is I heard a noise. I came downstairs and turned on the light. And sitting in his easy chair, all bloody. Oh, here's the tea. You better pour, Mr... The detective some too, Marjorie. Oh, good. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Then I'm to understand, Mrs. Appleby, that you say he had already been struck when you saw him first. Oh, bloody dreadful. Poor Tom. I might point out that that statement hardly accords with the statement you made last night, Mrs. Appleby. Did I make a statement last night? You did, madam. To whom? To Sergeant Milton of the Bournemouth Police. I don't remember it. I wonder... I was so shocked and shocked by the sight of poor old Tom. He'd been drinking as usual, and I picked up the bottle and just swilled down a great drink myself. But I drank a great deal, honestly. I don't remember. Perhaps I said something when I... When I... When you were drunk, madam? What did I say? You said that you had murdered your husband. I, I said I murdered him? It's in the Sergeant Milton's report. Well... I killed my husband. You did? Why? Then... Oh, I did. Have you come to take me to the jail? Well, I... I'm quite ready. Marjorie, fetch my cloak. Marjorie, bring my cloak, I said. I'm going to jail. But, uh, look here, Mrs. Appleby. What's going on here? I say, what's going on here? It's quite all right, George. It is not all right. Who is this man? Who are you, fellow? I think I might ask the same question of you, young man. Now, don't come that on me. Is he annoying you, Aunt Alma? I'm Chief Inspector... This Chief Inspector? I'm afraid I've forgotten your name. Loring, Scotland Yard. Oh, you are, are you? And what are you doing here? We've had enough policemen... May I ask who this young man is, Mrs. Appleby? This is George Evans, Chief Inspector. George has been our chauffeur. George is... Your nephew, I gather? I am not. George has been almost one of the family. And it's my duty to protect you. George. Well, where's he taking you? Were you here last night, young George? When old Tom was killed by that burglar. Is that the way it was? Mm, he was drunk, as usual. Answering your question, I was out in the garage working on the car, George mister. George didn't know anything about it. Till he heard me scream. And I found Tom sitting there all bloody. Dead. I didn't know he was dead when you found him, Mrs. Appleby. He was... I thought you said you killed him. What? Oh, that's right. I did kill him. I'd forgotten. You did not. I did, you I did. did not, Alma. She yes, couldn't. She I says did. she did, young man. Well, she did. I did. I did, George. I swear no, I You did. did not, Alma. I I'm said... sorry, Mrs. Appleby. I detain you on suspicion mm. of having been involved no. in the murder of Thomas Beckett. Appleby. No, I tell you. And I must warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. Very well, sir. Alma. Be quiet. Then I say that I alone am responsible for the death of my husband. I and I alone murdered him. But it's Let not... Me be, George. I did it. Now, if you're ready, Chief Inspector. Aren't you going to kiss me goodbye, George? The boy, George Percy Emmons, insisted upon accompanying Alma Appleby and me, but there was nothing for it. He had to stay behind. Mrs. Appleby wept copiously as they parted, and it was with some difficulty that the maid, Marjorie, and I were able to separate them. I glanced at young George as I closed the car door. I was a little surprised to discover that he, too, was whimpering like a puppy left behind, and his eyes were overflowing with childish tears. I was faintly revolted at the sight of this great hulking moon calf's behavior, and I'm afraid I spoke my mind. Bawling like a blasted baby, I said. Poor George is a baby. Poor Lamb's only 18, after all. Only 18, I thought. If I'd bawled like that when I was 18, I'd have had my trousers well booted. It would help this great larrikin, too, I thought. Poor George. So sweet. I glanced at her curiously, I suppose. I've seen a look like that on a woman's face before. <laughs> Motive, the back of my mind said to me. Motive. 
inattentive, grumpy, 75-year-old husband, I thought. Handsome, attentive, 18-year-old boy. And then I remember that unmanly blubbering, that squalling like a spanked baby, and I was ashamed of myself. And when she spoke again... My baby died when he was two. I keep thinking of George as my baby boy. But the love in her eyes when she turned to me, I thought uneasily, wasn't exactly the kind of love, uh, love one has for a son. According to the judge's rules, one may not ask questions of a person who has been charged except to clarify any statements made. There was no need to ask Alma Appleby any questions. Yes, I killed him. Yes, I had a reason. Reasons, rather. Tom was... Oh, but ill. He was always in poor spirits. He worried about money. He worked hard all his life. And now his savings, he thought, were being spent. He knew he could never get any more money. He was an old man. He was afraid of dying. But he constantly talked suicide. He always sat alone in the sitting room and drank. Every night. Half a bottle every night. Very simple. I couldn't stand it any longer. I'm not a young woman, but I'm not unattractive either, am I? I had a hard life, too. I deserve another chance, don't I? Tied to an old man. A sick old man. A drunken old man. A worried old man who constantly threatened to kill himself. He'd be better off. And I thought I'd be better off. He didn't know it. He didn't know anything. He was sitting there in his chair, drunk like he was every night. So he wanted to die, I'd grant his wish. I'd be free. People would think a burglar or a tramp did it. So I picked up his bottle. I had to steal myself, didn't I? Yes, I drank. I drank quite a lot. He was sitting there staring at nothing at all as I drank out of his bottle. So I went out and got the man. George wasn't there. He didn't know anything about it. He was in the garage working. And I took the mallet and I hit Tom on the head. Just once I hit him. He didn't move or cry out or anything. I just smashed him once and he died. Then I, and I'm afraid I drank the rest of Tom's whiskey. That's all I remember. No, I don't remember telling anyone I'd murdered him. But I expect I must have, because I did kill him, you know. I'd been thinking about it a long time, you know, and this time I made up my mind to it. I would do it, and I did do it. He died very easily. Just one smash with the mallet, and it was all over. He didn't even know it. And I feel he died happy. I'm sorry for him. I did rather like him, but... Well, that's the whole story. All of it. I thought I was doing him a favor, and everything would be all right. I could blame it on the burglar or whoever. I should have known I couldn't get away with it. Oh, yes. And be sure to put down that it was all my idea. Nobody at all had anything to do with it but me. Put it all down in writing, just the way I've told you, and I'll sign it. I murdered him. Oh, help me. I'm a Virginia Appleby. That was the gist of what she told the examining magistrate of Bournemouth, who accordingly remanded her for trial at the Southampton Assizes later in the month. I wasn't satisfied. John Davidson, the black museum man, he was plain superintendent then, was in Bournemouth visiting his great aunt who was afflicted with sciatica. John, having escaped the ailing aunt for a morning, had attended the examination. Afterwards, he and I repaired to the nearest pub. John was not happy. None of my business, Loring, but... That woman's lying. Uh, she lied about the number of times old Tom Appleby was tapped on the head with a mallet. The doctor said three times. She insisted it was only once. Well, she was pretty drunk. Granted. So let's have some more pigs here, shall we? Right. Miss, two of the same, please. Right, sir. <clears throat> Granted that she has made a mistake there. Granted that 
She was undoubtedly a little script, as I should probably be if I have much more of this beer. <laughs> uh, thank you, miss. But what murderer ever forgets how many times he strikes his victim? Cheers. Cheers. Ah. <clears throat> more than meets the eye, see, I. Oh, well, that's the way I feel, too. Call me down here from Scotland Yard. First thing that happens, the woman confesses. Confessed the Bournemouth policeman before, didn't she? While she was drunk. She a drinking woman? Apparently not. Uh, Dr. Trelawney told me old Appleby did all the drinking in the family. So at the risk of sounding like a fool, I'd say that circumstances are all the cases. Well, murdering one's husband can be said to be something of a circumstance, sir. Well... Covering up a murder of a husband by somebody else could also be said to be circumstance lying. Ah. Isn't it? Who's she covering up then? I don't know. Wasn't anybody who hated the old man, apparently? No. Don't you know? Well, after all, I've been here a very short time, sir, and the case is closed. Well, it's the hangman who closes murder cases, lying. I know that. <clears throat> See, I noticed another thing. What's that, sir? She seemed very anxious to impress on everyone the fact that this murder was her own idea. Yes. See, I know quotation. Uh, yes, sir? Shakespeare, Hamlet. Oh, oh, oh. what is it, sir? The lady doth protest too much, methinks. Mm. Yeah, <clears throat> I seem to be full of wise souls and modern instances to tell Lauren. Yeah, yes, sir. You know, French have a saying, uh, Sache la femme, if uh, my pronunciation is right. <laughs> well, we've got the woman, sir. We don't have to look for her. Excuse me, I got my genders mixed up. In that case, look for the man, old boy. The man's dead, sir. Hmm. Is he the only one? The good grey superintendent drank up his beer and left for the bedside of his great aunt. I paid the score and set out for Canary Villa, the place where the tragedy had occurred thinking to make certain discreet inquiries of the maid, Marjorie. The doors were open. Marjorie was absent. I wandered through the silent, dreary house, looking in every room. The place was deserted. And I heard a noise. The garage, I decided. I followed my ears. I watched young George for quite a while before he discovered me. What do you want? I'd like to ask you a few questions, George, if you don't mind. Oh, you're the policeman. Chief Inspector Loring, that's right. I've got nothing to say to you. You're trying to hang my Aunt Alma. No, I'm not, George. I don't think... She that... didn't do it. I told you she didn't do it. I know. You got any suspicions, George? Well, of course. Some thief, some tramp or something done it. Really think so? Yes. I don't think a tramp did it. Well, well, she didn't do it. I'm sure of that. Can you prove that, mister? Frankly, no. Look, George, I have an idea it was someone that didn't like Mr. Appleby. Who? I thought perhaps you could tell me if he had any enemies. I don't know any. Go on with your work, George. We can talk. I'm almost done. Well, I'll help you. I'm a pretty good motor mechanic. Well, um, uh, I was just straightening this thing. Well, I'll give you a hand. I suppose I should feel sorry for old Tom. You don't? No. I didn't like him. He didn't like me either. You'd know, I suppose, if anybody ever indicated that he hated Mr. Appleby. Of course. I knew them both pretty well. Worked here six months. No, no, seven. She didn't hate him. Alma? Uh, Aunt Alma, you mean? No, she certainly didn't. Put up with an awful lot from him, though. He was frightful. Always grousing at her when I drove around the countryside in the car. Always drunk. She drink, too? No. Only that night, when she found him with those three holes in his head. Was he struck three times? Three jolly great smashes. And you don't have any idea who did it? This burglar. Burglar? Well, whoever it was. Where did the mallet come from that he was killed with? Well, it was ours. Cops took it away. 
Well, I hope they find whoever it was. Well, if you cops are any good... We're trying. That's why I'm talking to you, George. Huh? Why? Hoped you might be able to help her. Listen, mister. I'd give my life for her. Well... I love her. She's been very nice to you, I understand. I love her. She's the sweetest, the most adorable, the most... Well... Huh? She's going to hang. No! She's not! She didn't do she it! Confess, she... George. <laughs> they won't let me see her. Now, George. I've got to see her, I tell you. I've got to see her. Why is it so important? <laughs> Why, George? Because they'll hang her. They'll hang Alma. And she didn't do it. She didn't murder Tom, and they're going to hang her for something she didn't do. But what, what good will it do for you to see her? I'll tell you what good it'll do. I know who did it. I know, I tell you. Do you hear me? I know who killed Tom Appleby. Who? I know who murdered him, and so does she. I've got to talk to her, or they'll hang her. <laughs> Alma Virginia Appleby's life was in desperate jeopardy. She had been remanded for trial, and no power on earth is sufficient to alter the slow, regular course of British justice before that trial takes place. Not even a confession by another person can change her status, that of a prisoner awaiting trial before a jury of her peers. I explained that to George Percy Emmons. You're coming to the rescue a trifle late, young George, I said. It might be that you're too late. I've, I've got to save her. I love her. And she loves me. This is George Percy Emmons' statement. I have worked as chauffeur and general handyman for about seven months for Alma and Tom Appleby. Alma, Mrs. Appleby, has been very good to me. She said I'm like what her dead son might have grown up to be. He did not like me. He didn't like anybody. He was always drunk. And he mistreated Alma, Mrs. Appleby. She tried to keep away from him. She always asked me to drive her to various places so she could be away from him and his, his tyranny. I love her very much. Three months ago, I asked her to marry me. First, well, she laughed at me. And then she cried. She said that she was old enough to be my mother. I said that I was old enough to become her husband. But she said she already had a husband. And I said he was a bad husband, and old, and ill-mannered. And she agreed. But she said he was her husband, and she'd sworn to be his wife. I told her I loved her, but she said, no, that is evil. I asked her, if she didn't have Tom for a husband, would she marry me? She cried and said, you must not say that to me. I asked her many more times to marry me when Tom died. Six times. Tom was old and he was no good and he mistreated her. And finally, the seventh time, I asked her if she would marry me if Tom was dead. She cried some more and I begged her to answer me. And at last she said yes. And she kissed me and said again she would marry me if I still wanted her to after Tom was dead. And I thought about it a long time. On the night Tom was... Tom was killed. On that night, I'd brought her back from a trip in the country and we were very happy. She kissed me when we came home and she said she loved me. And my heart was breaking. And then when Tom got drunk that night, he hit her when she told him he shouldn't drink so much because it was affecting his health. And then I decided. I waited till she and Marjorie, the maid, went upstairs to bed, and then I got the mallet from the garage, and I stole into the house, and Tom was sitting in his chair, and he was in a stupor, and he didn't hear me. And I crept up behind him, and I hit him three times on his bald head, very hard, so I heard the bone crack. And he slid down in the chair, and he was dead, I thought. And I thought, now we can be married, Alma and me. But I, when I went to the staircase, 
to go up and tell her. I looked up, and she was standing there. And she had seen it all. And everything I did, killing him, had come to naught. And I am a murderer, and Alma must not hang, although I surely shall. This is my confession. Write it down, and I will sign it. So help me, George Percy Emmons. George Percy Emmons was remanded for trial by the same magistrate who had examined Alma Virginia Appleby. They were tried together at the Southampton Assizes a little more than a month after Thomas Appleby had died. Both defendants pleaded guilty. Both seemed, as one crime reporter complained, to outdo the other in protestations, not of innocence, but of guilt. Unlike almost every case where a man and a woman had been accused of murder, they did not attempt to fix the guilt on one another, but each seemed determined to save the other's life at the cost of his own. This was the verdict of the jury. Members of the jury, are you agreed upon your verdict? Yes, sir. Do you find the prisoner Alma Virginia Appleby guilty or not guilty of murder? Not guilty. Do you find the prisoner George Percy Emmons guilty or not guilty of murder? Guilty. And we should like to add a rider to that. We recommend him to mercy. George Percy Emmons, you stand convicted of murder. Have you to say anything why the court should not give you judgment of death according to law? I wish that... No, no! I didn't take me! Let the prisoner Alma Virginia Appleby be discharged. So they hanged 18-year-old George Emmons. And on the day he was hanged, Alma, the woman who was old enough to be his mother, but young enough to have wanted to be his wife, sat down and wrote a letter. She sealed it, addressed it to the people of England. And standing in the room where Thomas a. Beckett Appleby had died by her lover's hand, she stabbed herself through the heart. Justice was done. You have heard another in the series Whitehall 1212, compiled from the official files of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Whitehall, one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in its history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the true stories of some of its most important and baffling cases. These are the true stories. Plain, unvarnished facts, just as they happened, reenacted for you by an all British cast. Only the names have, for obvious reasons, been changed. These broadcasts are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. The voice you will now hear is that of Chief Superintendent John Davidson, 
who is in charge of Scotland Yard's famous Black Museum. I'm sure I don't know whether a woman's stockings come in pairs. That is, shaped separately for right and left foot, as shoes are. And I fear I shall never know, or remember if I do. However, I do know that this one was for the right leg. And I remember further that its father was described as dream dust. Why, I'm sure I don't know. Looks a sort of a light cocky to me. Now, this pattern is not woven into the nylon or whatever it is that women's stockings are made of. Let's lay the stocking out flat here so you can see what it is. There, you recognize it? That's right. It's an impression made in greasy mud of a tire, a motor car tire. Now, the people who first saw it were quite justified in believing that the young woman who was wearing the stocking had been struck and killed by a motor car. She was struck, but the motor car didn't kill her. I asked Chief Inspector Patrick Bull here to tell you all about it. Now, Mr. Bull, if you please. About midnight on the 15th of August, 1948, leading fireman Horace Bertram Adler of Kingston Fire Brigade was driving alone on Somerset Road, Wimbledon, on his way home from a meeting of his lodge of Freemasons. It had been raining all evening, and on a particularly badly illuminated section of Somerset Road, Adler was startled to discover what appeared to be a body lying in the muddy roads ahead of him. He applied his brakes and approached it cautiously, halting his car, which was a Humber saloon, about five yards away and dismounted. The body proved to be that of a well-dressed young woman, quite dead, and a cursory examination by the light of the headlamps indicated that she had been struck by a motor car. Police from the Wimbledon station were summoned, measurements were taken of the exact position of the body, and leading fireman Adler was released, it being obvious that his car had, had nothing to do with the accident, if indeed it was an accident. The body was taken to the Wimbledon mortuary for further examination. I arrived at the mortuary about noon of the following day, the 16th. Still raining, I wasn't happy about the assignment. I said so to David Brown, the police surgeon. Well, if you don't tell your troubles to me, Chief Inspector. I'm supposed to be off duty today, too. But yesterday was the day my relief chose to sprain an ankle playing tennis. So here I am. Tennis at his age. And don't raise a row about coming in here at noon. I've been here since 8 a.m. Pity for both of us to have to be here. Well, what else are you going to do on a day like this? Might as well work. Well... Here we are, working. And the other people from the yard have been here since the crack of dawn. What did they find out? Not much. So far, nobody's been able to identify her. Well, it's a hit-and-run case, of course. Obviously. These her clothes... Aye. Pretty good clothes, they seem to be. Well, she was well-dressed enough. Is her purse? It's empty. Oh. No, there's not even a lipstick in it. Hmm. I expect that's one of the reasons you're here. Eh? Well, robbery isn't usually one of the concomitants of a hit-and-run case. Do you think she was robbed? It's not my business to make deductions, old boy. Isn't there anything in her pockets or anything? I haven't looked. Your man says there's nothing what pockets a woman has. And nothing to identify her either, of course. You can see for yourself. Mm. Laundry marks. Well, your man says no. Well, there must be labels. He's calling Selfridges now. The label in her panties there. Where? Or here? I doubt he'll trace it. No other labels? You said her shoes. Selfridges, too. Where are her shoes? There. Oh. Well, if she had an account at Selfridges. And if you're lucky. We'll see what we shall see. Said Sherlock Holmes. Yes, quite. Well, it's my opinion you'll need him. These her stockings? I don't know, Chief Inspector. But the one she had on. Ah, uh, muddy. It was raining last night. Looks like tire marks on this one. Well, that's what your man said. They're not from that car the fireman fellow was driving. The chap that found her. How do you know? Only he was driving a Humber, the report says. These tires would be too small for a Humber. You are a detective, aren't you? That's what your man said. Did he? I said they'd be something like an Austin 7 or a Morris Minor, one of those wee cars. I'd agree. Well, what are you looking for now? See if there are marks on her dress. 
In a hit-and-run case, we usually paint marks from a car, or if a lamp hit her, there might be splinters of glass that could be identified by the laboratory people. There aren't. Eh? I said there aren't. You don't mind if I go with the dress carefully, do you? Quite all right with me. But you'll not find anything. How do you know? The first place, your man admitted he couldn't find anything. I think the laboratory can. I doubt they can. Why not? Because she wasn't killed by being struck by a car. Well, now, she was found in the road. There are tire marks on her stocking. She... I suspect those marks are accidental. I doubt that. She was murdered elsewhere and brought here to Wimbledon dead. Shall I give you my Sherlock Holmes hat? Come over here and have a look. Well? Now look at her, Inspector, uh, Chief Inspector. Those marks on her face were made when her head struck the roadway. No, Chief Inspector. Or by the car when it struck her. No. Look at the right arm here. Those look like bruises made by fingers. I rather think they are. Oh. Now, lift her other arm. Ah, easy. See? Blood, well, that's... No. There, where it's dried. On her body. What's this? There, Chief Inspector. In the second intercostal space, if you'll observe carefully, you'll note that an edged instrument has been introduced, which has severed one or both of the superior intercostal arteries. Which means, I take it, that she was stabbed to death. This message for general circulation, information required... Any person having knowledge of the name and movements, July the 14th or 15th, the following female person is urgently requested to notify Chief Inspector Patrick Bull, CID, New Scotland Yard, W1, at once. The woman a woman's age, about 30. Reddish hair, brown eyes, height about 5 foot 2 inches. Weight, 103 pounds. Last seen wearing the following clothing. Black dress. White blouse. Uh, what do you call that stuff her blouse is made of? Nylon jersey, sir. White nylon jersey blouse. Red artificial flower. Rhododendron. Cerise rhododendron. Cerise? Mm hmm Cerise artificial rhododendron on left shoulder of blouse. Large white openwork hat. Lace gloves. Ecru. All right. Ecru lace gloves. Transparent. Platform shoes. Uh, what do you call that color? Oyster, sir. A bolting. Stockings. Ecru? Dream dust, sir. Dream dust? Dream dust, sir. Ah, right. Dream dust, then. And carrying a large purplish handbag. Cyclamen, sir. Cyclamen, I mean. All right. Put down cyclamen. I only hope people understand what we're talking about. Women will, sir. There's only one thing, sir. What's that, Miss Sears? Was she really wearing an outfit like that? With red hair? <clears throat> and, uh, green cami knickers. Beg your pardon, sir. Cami knickers haven't been worn in England since before I was born. Oh? And a lingerie is the fashion, sir. Good Lord, no. Well, write it down, write it down. I must have been mistaken. The first day of the 17th of July that my description of the dead woman's remarkable clothing was received by all stations in the Metropolitan District for all policemen to chuckle at me, the first day it was published in the London Daily Newspapers, I had a visitor. Good afternoon, sir. I should like to speak to Chief Inspector Patrick Bull, if you please, sir. I'm Chief Inspector Bull, madam. Oh, how do you do, sir? I come about the advert. Advert? The one in the Express, sir. The one about the ladies' clothing. Oh, yes, yes, indeed, yes, mm. indeed. 
I seen it, sir. I saw it. Oh, you did? And you recognized those clothes? That I did, sir. Quite fashionable, aren't they? What's she done, sir? Is she on the jam lout? I always thought I'm sure was... I don't know whether she's a shoplifter or not, madam. And where did you learn that term? Now, look here, mister. Don't think to put your great fat hairy hands on my shoulder. I come here to give you some information you was asking for. And might I explain that you ain't got nothing on me. Nothing at all, kind sir. Well, I'm sure I beg your pardon, madam. Granted. I was asking a civil question. What she wanted for? So far as we know, madam, she's not wanted for anything, I assure you. Would you just as lief not call me madam? My name is Miss Elderbrand, or Tense Elderbrand, if you must know. I sell newspapers on the corner of Inner Park Road and Parkside, Wimbledon, sir. That's how I happened to see this advert of yours. And thinking there might be a bit of spare cash in it. There's no reward offered, and, uh, uh, Miss Hildebrand... Well, in that case, I may as well be back to my work. I am prepared to offer... A pound, I'll take it. Thank you. Well... Now, perhaps you'll tell me who this young woman with the extraordinary clothes is. I don't know who she is, I'm sure. What? Now, now, sir. I don't know what her name is. But I see her quite often near my corner, and I seen her the day before yesterday. The 15th, just like it says in the advert. Having knowledge of the name. I don't have any idea of the name. And movements... I can describe them to you as of 10.30 on Monday, July the 15th as ever was. And I was talking to her for four or five minutes just before it started to rain. And to that I'll take my oath. Go on, please, miss. Elderbrand, all tense Elderbrand, sir. Um, what did you talk about? Lord love you, sir. I couldn't get my mouth open. she done all the talking. What did she talk about? About money, sir. Money? And men, or a man, I mean. What was his name? She didn't say, sir. But he was trying to borrow some money from her, she was saying. Said she wouldn't find her giving money to a man. Not her, she said. Not a wooden thruppence, to which I agreed. Yeah? She showed me her handbag. Oh, that gorgeous cycleman one in the adverts, sir. And... Yes? She must have had 50 pounds in it, sir, as well as about a pound and a half of hard money. Half her goggled at it. I haven't seen that much ready money since my aunt died. She had two insurance policies. Will you tell me more about this young woman, please? Well, then it started to rain, and she said, Oh, bother. But the man came up. What man? The man that wanted to borrow the money, I expect. So she says, Good night, Miss Elder Brand, and I hopped in the van, and they came away together. What's this about a van, please? Oh. Well, it was a little van. It looked like it had been, oh, I don't know, Morris Minor or an Austin Seven with a van body built onto it. And it was green. I could see it was green. And did you see the man? No, sir. I couldn't see him. You're sure it was the woman described in the advertisement? Lord love you, sir. I see her at least once a week. And I couldn't forget them clothes, could I, with that red hair? Well, thank you very much, Miss Hildebrand. You've been of great assistance. I'm... I'm sorry you don't know her name. No, sir, I don't. I hope you get her, sir. I never liked her looks. What did you say she'd done? She's dead, madam. Oh! Lord, love and die. The poor thing. Who killed her? Which was precisely what I wanted to know, I reflected morosely, as Miss Hortense Hildebrand waddled out the door of my office, mopping up tears. Well, anyway... I had our unknown victim located a short time before she met her death in the neighborhood of where she was murdered. But the green van <laughs> sounded like the title of a song I remember from my youth. My Diane of the green van. <laughs> yes, yeah, seriously, now, there must be at least 10,000 green vans in London. Then the door was pushed open again and Miss Hildebrand was back. I remembered something else, Inspector. Oh, and what this time, Miss Hildebrand? About the van, though. What about it? It had a shoe on it. A what? A great shoe. Like you wear on your feet. Painted on the side. Well? So all you have to do, sir, is find a green van with a shoe on it, look inside, and there'll be your murderer, sir. That's all. <laughs> What would you think that a shoe painted on the side of a delivery van would indicate to you? That's right. 
someone who deals in footwear or repairs it or... In the telephone directories of Greater London, there are 276 pages devoted to the practitioners of the profession of St. Crispin. The number of shoe shops, bootmakers, cobblers, cordwainers, and dealers in leather findings is astronomical. And amongst all of them, there are probably three who operate a small green delivery van with a shoe painted on its side. I contemplated suicide. But I found myself seated in a bombed-out cellar that had formerly housed a famous pub, along with John Davidson, the black museum man, and David Brown, the police surgeon from Wimbledon. I drank beer, Brown imbibed ginger beer. John Davidson, not to be outdone, drank both. Shandig up, my friends, is pure nectar and ambrosia. Well, you can have it, sir. I'll take my beer bitter. And my ginger beer unadulterated by it. You boys have no imagination. My imagination staggers at the thought of interrogating every person in London remotely connected with boots and shoes. And saying, uh, what color are your bands, sir, to each of them? Well, somebody will say green. By the time we get to him, he'll probably have a painted amethyst. Have you started looking for the owner yet, Patrick? This morning, sir. No results, of course. I've heard of none. How many of these people will you have to see? About 40 billion, roughly. Seriously? Well, I reckon actually about 10,000. Perhaps 11. Don't you think so, David? Uh, 12, I should think, at least. Um, how many are there in the Metropolitan Police? Not enough. I just finished reading Sir Harold Scott's report. How many? 15,647, including 67 pensioners and 122 auxiliaries. That many? Well, that was last December 31st. I should say we gained a few since then. That includes chief superintendents, superintendents... Police sergeants... Chief inspectors, inspectors... All sorts of persons who couldn't be expected to go around knocking on doors and asking questions. Signalers, laboratory technicians... Motor car and motorcycle drivers... Well, see, only half of the full 15,000 are effective to you. 8,000. Hmm. At that rate, if my guess is correct, about the number of people to be called on. Each one would have only about a call and a half to make. Oh, that's not such a tremendous job. Especially when you're sitting here drinking ginger beer. Well, don't you feel better, Patrick? It isn't quite as simple as that, sir. Nor as hopeless as you thought, is it? <laughs> Well, sir, I must admit. But what if that wasn't a shoemaker's van? Set your mind at ease about that, Chief Inspector. What do you mean by that? When you telephoned me about the shoe business idea, I popped down round the corner and borrowed a shoemaker's knife from the cobbler. And? I tried it on the wound. Oh, did you? It just fits. So I rather suspect that our killer used the shoemaker's knife, too. As your cobbler or green delivery van? <laughs> <laughs> Have another shandy, Gav, sir. How's your advertisement going, Patrick? Only the one reply, sir. Miss Hortense Hildebrand. And she doesn't do so well on names, sir. No, she didn't know the girl's name nor the name on the shoemaker's green van. Too bad you can't find the girl's name. Might save us a lot of trouble and effort. How? Some of her friends might have an idea who the man is. The man with the shoemaker's knife. Oh. You know, those clothes of hers... How a woman dressed like that could escape notice wherever she went. Fantastic. I could tell you how clothes like that might escape a great deal of attention. How so? How so? Well, if they were worn where other women wear clothes of the same general appearance... Where would that be, sir? No, no, no. Let me make myself clear. I'm not an expert on the kind of clothes worn by... Uh... By whom, sir? Musical performers. A music hall performer. Of course. Neither of John Davidson's ideas was as easy to work out as they first appeared. If I could be permitted, I... 
I think I should have to say that there's many a slip betwixt an idea and the relic of a crime hung on the wall of the Black Museum. Uh, <coughs> but John was right, as I must admit he usually is. Took many days of hard work to ask about the green van of all the names listed in the telephone directory. I would have been inclined to give up and start afresh, but Miss Hortense Hildebrand knew what she had seen and was quite vocal about it. I know what I saw, Governor. I saw the red-headed girl with a heart official road here, Denver, climbing into the little green van. And drive away, she said. And drive away. But I don't know her name, sir. On the 26th day of our quest, after 3,165 firms had told investigating policemen that they either had no green delivery van or had one of the wrong size and general description... I received a telephone call from a constable who had been making inquiries in Putney. Is that Chief Inspector Bull, sir? Yes, it's Bull here. It's Constable Beeler here. Who? Beeler, sir. Constable Beeler from the communications room. Yes. I was assigned to go out and ask questions, sir. A great many of us have that job. And yes. I found Jim out, sir. What's that? Yes, sir. He's a Mr. Colfax, sir. C-O-L-F-A-X. He's a music hall proprietor here in Putney, sir. Putney? Yes, sir. The woman's name is Sheila Colfax, sir. She's his daughter, and... You mean the dead woman? Yes, sir. Now, I asked him, sir, if he knew who killed her, sir. And... Uh, how would he know who killed her? Well, I don't know, sir, but I thought I'd ask him. What did he say? He said he didn't know, sir. Well, bring him in here. Yes, sir. He doesn't want to come, sir. Why? Why? Him and she's a strange sir. So they don't like each other. Ah. Uh, look here, Constable. Ask the gentleman where he was on the night she was murdered, the 15th of last month. Don't alarm him. I know where he was, sir. What? How do you know? He was in hospital, sir, with his legs broken. He's still in bed here at his home. He was hit by a tram, sir. Thank you, Constable. Beeler, sir. PC 317, A Division. I'm afraid we don't live right, I thought. That door which had opened such a little way closed with a dull thud. And Constable Beeler and all the others went on with their questionings about the green van with the shoe painted on its side. The 22nd day passed. The 23rd. 24th. At 4 p.m. on the 25th day, a Mr. Fox was announced. He came in and sat down. Sidney Fox, Chief Inspector of the Fox Shoe Repairers, Tottenham Court Road. I'm your man. I think you'd better explain, Mr. Fox. I have a green delivery van. Oh? It's a Morris Minor chassis. It has a large shoe painted on each side panel. So? I could show it to you. Well, I'd like to see it. Where is it? In the firm's garage on Charlotte Street, just off Tottenham Court Road. We don't use it anymore. I yes. should think you wouldn't. Oh. oh, it isn't that. It isn't what you think. Oh? No, sir. We haven't used it since Lionel left us. And who's Lionel? Lionel was our delivery man. And where is Lionel? Well, he told Harry he thought he'd go to Spain. Who's Harry? My partner, my brother. I wish you'd be more frank with me, Mr. Fox. Why is this Lionel going to Spain? Did he leave your employ of his own accord, or did you discharge him? Well, I'll tell you, Inspector. Lionel stole, <laughs> let us say, embezzled, a sum of money from us, a considerable sum. I see I finally set a certain date for him to return the money he had taken or be turned over to the police. What was that date? The 15th of July. I see. He did not return it. Well, he didn't even come back to the shop. But Harry told me Lionel had assured him he'd have the money that night. He knew where he could get it. He didn't say where? No. How had your brother seen him if you hadn't, Mr. Fox? We always allowed Lionel to keep the van at night. He and Harry both live in Houston, and he always go very home at night and back to the shop mornings. Where did he keep... He kept the van in his own garage. Is this Lionel married? He had been. Well, the next day... Sixteenth. Yes. Harry drove in alone from Houston. I, I said, where's Lionel? Where was he? Did a bunk, Harry said. Oh? Harry said about six in the morning, Lionel came to his house and waked him. Said he was sorry. He got some money, but it wasn't enough. Told Harry he was leaving. Going to Spain, he said. Couldn't stand the disgrace and all that. Said the car, the van was in his garage. Here are the keys. Bang over, he's off. 
And what did Harry do? Well, he went over to Lionel's carriage. There was a van all freshly washed and... Washed? And Harry drove it in. We've kept it in our own garage ever since. If Harry wants a ride home, he can buy one. And where was this Lionel going to get the money to repay you, Mr. Fox? The money he didn't get, so he washed the car so carefully and went away to Spain. Well, from his wife, I suppose. His former wife. You saw her quite often. Oh? Daughter of a rich uh, uh, theatre, I mean, Putney. What was her name? Colfax, I think. Come along, Mr. Fox. Let's go and have a look at your green van. And so we found the green van. It had been carefully washed. Not carefully enough, though. There were bloodstains in the cab, and David Brown proved they were the same blood type as that of the murdered woman. And hidden under the seat cushion was the late Sheila Colfax's smooth leather wallet with 70 pounds in it. Not enough to give to Sidney and Harry Fox. There was a bloody fingerprint on the leather. It wasn't hers. And out in Lionel's garage, where the car had been, the good constable Beeler found a knife. A shoemaker's knife. Just like the one David Brown had tried on Sheila Colfax's body. The blood on it was her blood type, too. Oh, yes, and we found Lionel. He was hiding in the garage with a great tin of biscuits, a round of cheese, and a jug he refilled daily from the tap, he told us. The first thing we did was check his fingerprints with the one on the leather wallet. They matched, of course. So we arrested him. And when he'd shaved off his guilty accumulation of beard, he was brought to trial. It took the jury 15 minutes to bring in a verdict of guilty. And he was hanged at once with before the first frost. And a curious thing. Upon a thorough examination being made of the body of Sheila Colfax, it was discovered that she had been in the last stages of cancer at the time of her death. She would have died of that dread disease in less than four months. Perhaps she did have reason for wearing those fantastic clothes. Heard on Whitehall 1212 today, Horace Braham as Inspector Bull. Others in the order of their appearance were Harvey Hayes, Pat O'Malley, Beulah Garrick, Lester Fletcher, and Guy Spall. This is Lionel Rico speaking. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed by Willis Cooper. Every 20 seconds through the year, a fire breaks out in the United States. These fires kill 11,000 persons each year, disfigure for life or severely burn thousands more, and destroy $7 million worth of property. Protect your homes from fire by following these simple rules. Don't smoke in bed or throw away lighted cigarettes. Clean out closets, basements, and attics, any place where old newspapers, magazines, and inflammable materials are liable to accumulate. Remember, don't gamble with fire... The odds are against you. Follow the campaign of the next president on NBC. Whitehall, one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have for obvious reasons been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Here are the participants in case number 921-MR421. 
Peter Williams, who boxed at 135 pounds. It's all right. It looked like your duty. Mrs. Jessie Fallowfield, his mother-in-law. It'll come out all right one of these days, I'm sure. Sir Brendan O'Neill, Home Office Pathologist at Scotland Yard. We're doing the best we can do. Iris Williams, who resembled her mother. No, no, not to the police station. <laughs> Chief Inspector Oscar Ford of Scotland Yard. On the morning of 19th November, 1943, two engineers employed by a Bedfordshire town discovered something floating, half submerged in the waters of the River Lee. Now, if you'll come with me down the corridor here to the Black Museum, I'll show you what they found. Come along, please. Now, this is Scotland Yard's Black Museum, of which you may have heard. Well, Chief Superintendent John Davison doesn't seem to be here. Well, John. Who is it? It's Austin Ford, John. Oh, be with you, Grant. Chief Superintendent Davison is the custodian of the Black Museum. Has a long and distinguished record with the Yard. Oh, good afternoon. Came in connection with the Williams case, John. Oh, yes. 921-MR-421. Up here on the shelf. Say, I hope you're not too disappointed in not finding skeletons and gory human bodies lying about in here. But they're in short stock with us. Yeah, this is it, Oscar. Actually, this isn't the Grand Guineo, you know. The articles filed away in here, all, of course, at some connection with one crime or another, but they're not particularly gory now. We don't keep them here to inspire writers of penny dreadfuls on the wireless at all. No, they're here for the use as reference items in our business of catching criminals. Examples, you see, of how certain crimes were committed. And I think you'd be amazed how much they aid our people in solving of other similar ones. Now, these things in this box are potato sacks. Ordinary rough burlap sacks. But potatoes come in. Other things come in them too, John. Yes, a dead body came in this one. Clammy rain mixed with snow had been falling all day when I arrived at the riverbank, 40 miles north of London. And thanks to the inclement weather, no crowd had gathered. And the huge local constable, the unfortunate victim, and I had the dismal landscape all to ourselves. I showed my card to the constable. Thank you, sir. That's it? I wouldn't look if you don't need to, sir. Drowned, eh? Not only drowned, sir. No. Oh. Doctor's just left, sir. They'll be coming to take her to the mortuary. Her? Huh? He thinks it was a woman. It was, of course, patent that the woman had died a violent death, to use the old cliché, at the hands of a person or persons unknown. Our job was not only to find that person or persons unknown, but first to establish the identity of the unfortunate young woman who had worn potato sacks as her ultimate garment. Now, homicide is a very personal thing. The relations between victim and killer that exist before the deed are most important in discovering the latter, but lacking identification of the victim most difficult to establish what relations ever existed between the late unlamented and any other person in the world. So one might think that the secret of successful murder is to render your victim unidentifiable. But don't try it. It can't be done. We'll catch you. Sir Brendan O'Neill, the Home Office pathologist, told me to what extent the killer had attempted to prevent identification of the victim and thus of himself. And there are no fingerprints, of course. I, I suggest that you have the bottom of the river Lee dragged at once. All right. See if you can find the missing hands. Already had that, Sir Brendan. No luck so far, though. Well, whoever she was, she wore false teeth, so there's no good trying that one. The teeth are missing, of course. Neither upper nor lower plate. Oh, they might be at the bottom of the river, too, in a foot of mud somewhere. Well, you'll never find them. I've never seen such a completely anonymous body in all my time, Oscar. No scars or moles, birthmarks, that sort of thing? Not a thing. I can tell you her height, though. Five feet, three inches. And her weight. Assuming that the missing arms weighed about 20 pounds, that'd make her 121 pounds. Say 120. Quite average brown hair, bobbed. Can't tell you what color her eyes were. No. Uh, we're trying to type her blood now. I'm afraid that's all. No, her age, sir? 
Oh, I'd say about 27. Oh, yes. And she'd had children. Well, it isn't much to go on, is it? Well, best we can do, Chief Inspector. Oh, I know that, sir. Those wounds on her head. Hit with something that has a sharp corner. Smashed the skull in three places. Dead when she was thrown into the water. Well, we'll check every missing woman case up Bedfordshire way first. See if we can find out which 120-pound, 5-foot-3 woman's not accounted for. Had children, dull, brown, bobbed hair. That's all of it. I should have listened to my father. Huh? He wanted me to be a parson, sir. Oh. Well, good luck. Well, bloody well needed, I muttered to myself as I closed the door. I didn't have any, though, for a long time. This is what we accomplished in the next six weeks. 534 lorry drivers known to have passed the riverbank where the body was found during the 24 hours previous to the finding of the body were investigated and screened. Result? Nothing. The movements of every soldier on day leave from the nearby army camps during that period were traced. Result? Nothing. Every war factory worker in the vicinity, in both day and night shifts, was questioned. Result? Absolutely nothing. 604 women throughout Britain who had been reported missing were checked on by Scotland Yard and Provincial Police. Result? All 604 women were found alive. The banks and bottom of the River Lee were searched for two miles in both directions from the place where the body was found. Results? Quantities of mud and useless debris. A photograph of the skull was given to an expert artist who carefully retouched it into what we all hoped was a semblance of the dead woman's features. And we caused copies of this photograph to be handed from house to house in this market city of 70,000. We had the photograph exhibited on the screens at all the local cinemas. Thousands of persons saw this retouched picture in the weeks before Christmas 1943, including the murderer himself, we found out later. But the results were still nothing at all. On the day after Christmas, the coroner's order for the burial of the remains was signed. Case number 921-MR-421 was about to be stamped unsolved. As I was leaving the yard on the evening of that 26th, I ran into Chief Superintendent John Davidson, the Black Museum man. Have a good Christmas, sir, I asked. Not bad at all, Oscar. Very pleasant. You? I worked. What a pity. Understand they're burying that girl tomorrow. I expect that's the end of it. Burying her up there in Bedfordshire, are they? Aye. Right. Going to the funeral? Well, sir, you'd hardly call it a funeral, exactly. You're going? Hardly, sir. Hmm. Oh, have a cigar? Canadian friend of mine sent me a box for Christmas. Real Corona Perfectos. Thank you, sir. Well, one more for me, then. <clears throat> I should think it would be an act of Christian charity if you did attend the girl's funeral. Well, sir, I... I remember once about 199 or 10, if I remember correctly. I think it was old Smudgy Steele, Inspector Steele, dead now. He nabbed a man at a funeral. That's so, sir. The murderer. Chap came to gloat, I expect, at his victim's last rites. Steele wondered who the stranger was and got into conversation with him. <laughs> Orson Wells or someone ought to get hold of that one. <laughs> Make a corking good penny dreadful, wouldn't it? The stranger at the funeral or something. <laughs> but it really happened. Might happen again, too, you know. Well, good night. Yes, uh, good night, sir. And so I rode 40 miles to a market town on a dismal day after Boxing Day to a grimy little cemetery not far from one of the hat factories for which the town is celebrated. The two second assistant sextons were shoveling the frozen clods into the raw new grave as I walked away from there with the huge constable and the young army chaplain who had been summoned away from a nearby officer's mess to officiate. The cemetery was deserted except for us. The murderer hadn't been in attendance after all. The big constable and I walked on past the hat factory whilst the young chaplain left to go back to his unfinished lunch. It was cold, streets almost deserted. 
The policeman talked about the tug of war at the last summer's police game. I give you my word, sir. I never saw such a team as them blokes from the city police. Uh-huh. Not a man less than 15 stone amongst them. And two blokes, that anchor man. Well, that chap weighed not a pound less than 17 stone. And strong. Oh, a ruddy bull. Name of Brian O'Brien from Galway originally. <laughs> I, I thought I should have died laughing, sir. <laughs> the way that belt nearly cut him in two. <laughs> he sunk them great eels in and he huffed and he hey, puffed. What's the matter with you, young lady? <laughs> nothing the matter with her voice. Oh, now, what's the matter, dear? I want my mummy. Oh, she's lost the best take of the nearest police station, eh? Come along, young lady. No! Policeman, no! Oh, she thinks you're going to throw her in jail. No. I'm not going to pinch your sister. You lost, you see. Mummy lost. Mummy lost. Probably swilling tea somewhere or else planted in a cinema. No. Mummy in London. Mummy got. I want my mummy. Oh, that's jolly. Well, what do we do, Constable? Mummy said she's coming home for Christmas. And mummy not go. Poor little child. Here, little girl. Little girl. What's your name? Well, look up at me. Here, let me let me see your face. What's the matter, sir? I have a hunch. Yes, sir. Now, don't let that kid get away. Here. What's she done, sir? I'll show you in a second. Look, keep her quiet, will you, before we run in. Show it, you little dog. Oh! No, no, mustn't bite. Oh! Hurry up, sir, please. Oh, give her a sixpence or something. I'll find it in a minute. Ah, uh, here. Here it is. Look at it. Look at it. Don't let her see it. No love a ruddy duck. You recognize the paper there? Of course, sir. We circulated thousands of these all over town. Well, tell me what it is. Oh, darling. Um, yes, sir, it's the picture of the missing woman that you people at Scotland Yard had made up. What else do you see? Sir? I said, what else do you see? Oh. This little maniac whose mother is missing is a spitting image of the picture. All right. Come on, come on, darling. We'll take you home. My mummy come home? No, dear. Your mummy can't come home now. We accompany the little girl whose name we learned was Iris Williams, age three, to her home, a short distance away. It was a modest three-room flat occupied by a Mrs. Jessie Fallowfield the child's grandmother, and her son-in-law, Iris' father, a member of the local National Fire Service unit. Little Iris retreated to the doorstep with an enormous slice of bread and wild bramble jelly while Mrs. Fallowfield talked with us. Yes, I've been here only two weeks, you see. I didn't want to talk before little Iris. Her mother's away, my daughter. So we understand from Iris, Mrs. Fallowfield. Quite. I don't like to have to say it, but Jessie, my daughter, she has the same name as mine. And Peter, my son-in-law, didn't get on together. Where is your son? At the fire station. Uh-huh. Well, to speak quite plainly, my Jessie wrote to me at Seven Oaks in Kent, you know, that she couldn't stand it here with Peter any longer and she was going away. Well, how long ago was that? Oh, the 19th of November. Uh-huh. You haven't heard from her since? Oh, yes, indeed, almost every week. You've heard from her since she left? Oh, yes. But we're on the best of terms, as long as we're not together, you see. I'm afraid she's a bit flighty. Well, one can't live one's daughter's life, can one? No, no, one can't. And you say you've heard from her recently? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, the reason I came from Seven Oaks to live here is because she wrote asking me to. She did? Yes, she insisted she couldn't live with Peter. But he needs to be taken care of, says she, and won't you go and make a home for him, Mother? So that's why I'm here. Peter just moved in with me a week ago. It's very cozy. Though I do wish she'd come home again, though it would probably be the same thing all over again. Bicker, bicker, bicker. Oh, there's no peace in this world anywhere, is there? Well, uh, uh, I'm sure we're very sorry to have bothered you, Mrs. Fallowfield, but... We were quite captivated by little Iris. I do hope she didn't hurt you. Oh, a bit of a cure to come will fix that up, ma'am. Iris was quite upset that her mother hadn't come home for Christmas. Oh, my, yes. Though Jessie wrote both Peter and me saying she couldn't make it. She was so busy there in Hampstead, the Christmas rush and all. 
A hairdresser, you said. Yes, but I'm afraid I don't know the name of the place. Well, it doesn't really matter since you're sure it was your daughter's handwriting in that letter. Well, I should think I'd be able to recognize that handwriting of hers. <laughs> the hours I've spent trying to teach her to write tidily. <laughs> well, I hope you'll pardon our intrusion, Mrs. Fallowfield. We were so taken with dear little Iris. Yes. And rather alarmed about her mother. Oh. And I'm afraid that we, uh, police officers... Suspicious. I'm sorry. Well, there's nothing at all to worry about my daughter, gentlemen. I'm quite sure that she's safe. Oh, I'm quite sure of that, madam. But, uh, her husband, your son. Oh, I'm sure. That... Oh, I wouldn't be surprised if that's Peter now. Peter? Hello, Ma. There's another letter from Jesse here. Oh, I'm sorry. These gentlemen are from the police, Peter. The police? About Jesse? I'm happy to see you, Mr. Williams. Oh, I'm Chief Inspector Ford of Scotland Yard. What? What's this about, Jesse? Oh, don't be alarmed, Peter. Iris was blubbering in the street about her mummy being lost, and these gentlemen were afraid murder has been done or something equally horrid and brought her home. Oh, well, well, thank you, gentlemen. Mother, I must have tea early. I'm fighting tonight. My son is a boxer. You're, you're a lightweight, I take it, Mr. Uh, Williams? Uh-huh. 135 pounds, yes. Didn't see your name on the card. At the drill hall, eh? Yes. Slasher Rifkin broke his wrist this afternoon. I'm a substitute. Oh, I shall probably see you then. Too bad about Slasher. Good man, that. Saw him fight that Australian four weeks ago. Oh, I've beaten him twice. He can't stand up against a left-handed boxer. You're left-handed? Yes. Another letter from Jesse Peter. Yes. The postman was just passing and he... Uh... Is that another example of your daughter's handwriting, Mrs. Fallowfield? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, of course. Did you ever see such writing? A girl will never learn. <laughs> Nobody could ever imitate that writing. Well, gentlemen, I'm sorry that you've had to get mixed up in all this. My wife's a very charming girl, but... Can... No, we quite understand. I, uh, I hope you'll forgive our intrusion. Oh, it's all right. <clears throat> Looked like your duty, I suppose. Another one of those unfortunate affairs. I'm sorry about it, but... Well, you're men of the world. You understand. Oh, yes, quite, quite. It'll all come out right one of these days, I'm sure, though. It's all right, Mother Fallowfield. Hey, gentlemen, if you'll excuse me, I've got to have my tea now. Oh, of course, of course. Uh, so sorry to have disturbed you, sir, and uh, Mrs. Fallowfield. Oh, it's quite all right. Good night. Good night. Good, Good night. night. Now, Peter, would you fancy a nice kipper, perhaps? <coughs> well? <coughs> what did you think? Sir, I've done a bit of boxing in my time, too. What? One thing I learned many years ago. Yes? Never trust a left-handed boxer. I went back to London completely baffled at this turn of events that had suddenly reopened a case that should have been closed in that wintry little graveyard. Here was almost indubitable proof that the woman we had buried was still alive and in constant communication with her husband and her mother. The letter from her had arrived on the very day I had seen her body committed to the frozen ground. It was impossible, obviously. Out of my desk at Scotland Yard the next morning, I arranged to have every known hairdressing shop in Hampstead and the whole north of London investigated to find if any employed a girl named Jessie Williams or Jessie Fallowfield I'd caught the return address on the envelope in the Fallowfield flat, and it said, Jesse Williams, Hampstead. Hampstead. Spelled that way, without the P. H-A-M-S-T-E-A-D. I remembered. Well, I thought she spells as badly as she writes. I dismissed it. And picked up the telephone to make a routine inquiry. Criminal Records Office, Sergeant Healy. Healy, I'd like you to look up a chap for me, please. Who's this speaking, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Chief Inspector Ford. Yes, sir. A chap named Peter Williams. A boxer by profession. Comes from Bedfordshire. See if we've ever had any dealings with him before, will you? Take some time, sir. Oh, good enough. Ring me when you find out, will you? Williams, Peter. That's all I know about him. We'll see what we can find, sir. All right. 
Thank you. I went upstairs to see Sir Brendan O'Neill, the home office pathologist. Hello, Oscar. Get her buried, all right? Yes, sir. Now sit down. But I want to dig her up again. Oh, what for, old boy? Can it be done? Well, of course, if there's sufficient reason. I need to know one or two things. Well, it's unusual, but... Uh... The case isn't closed yet. I saw to that. Well, if her relatives don't raise the row... We haven't been able to find any relatives, sir. Oh, that's right, isn't it? Well, in that case, dig her up. Right, sir. Then we can have her sent down here, and I'll need your personal assistance, Sir Brendan. For what? I want to find out some things. Well, I can't tell you her name, Oscar. Perhaps I can. Well, what do you want me to do, then? Help me to find a very clever murderer, sir. <laughs> These things happened during the next two days. First, a report from the officer in charge of checking the hairdressing establishments. We have checked every hairdressing shop in the entire north portion of London, with special reference to Hampstead, sir. 131 shops. Not one has any record of a woman named Jessie Williams or Jessie Fallowfield. There was only one Jessie among them all, a Mrs. Jessie Forrester, aged 61. She was obviously not the person we was after. Thank you, Sergeant. Yes, sir. A report from the Criminal Records Office of Scotland Yard. Sergeant Healy speaking, sir. We checked thoroughly on your boxer, Peter Peter Williams. Find anything on him? Yes, sir. He's been up twice. Convicted. Penal servitude in both instances. Good. That all, sir? Yes. Oh, no. Uh, what was he charged with? Forgery, sir. A final visit to Sir Brendan O'Neill's laboratory. Here's the... Uh, here's the report, Oscar. She was struck twice on the head with a flat object, like a wide metal bar or a heavy, narrow wooden plank. The instrument was of an undetermined length, but the marks on the skull indicate that it was three and seven-eighths inches wide, at the point where it was struck into the skull. Very good indeed, Sir Brendan. Uh, how about the other experiment? Well, they're still working on that. Ah, looks rather silly, doesn't it? I think you were right. Will you be able, do you think, to swear to it if uh, you find I'm right, sir? Well, if results continue this way, we shall. Uh, you sent for me, Sir Brandon? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, you're Hayes, aren't you? Yes, sir. Mm. Right or left-handed, Hayes? Left-handed, sir. Good. Uh, over on that side, they'll call you when they're ready, Hayes. Uh, yes, sir. Would you like to take a little trip up to Bedfordshire with me, Sir Brendan? My constable friend from the tug-of-war team had briefed me on how to find the little house where the boxer Williams had lived with his wife, Jessie, before she went away, as he said, to Hampstead, before he had gone to live with her mother. It was a tiny cottage not far from his present flat. I noted with interest that one of the windows looked out onto the graveyard where we had buried that poor woman a few days before. We walked around the place, staring at the neat rooms, empty as they'd stood since Williams had moved out. There was nothing at all at first to excite our interest. Sir Brennan O'Neill walked into the tiny stone-floored scullery. I watched with the other Scotland Yard man who'd come with us. Sir Brendan spoke from the other room. This might be it, Oscar. Uh, this strip of wood on this old bench here. Uh, measure it. Three. Three and seven eighths inches, all right. Well, right width, Oscar. Good. It's been nailed off fairly recently, sir. These are new nails. Mm. See if you can get it off. Uh, carefully. Oh, I can do it. Hand me the parcel, Oscar. What's that, sir? It's a skull. Never mind it. The, uh, the piece of wood. You've been here before, madam. Fits the scars perfectly, Oscar. I think we've got... <coughs> that him? Right inside, Mr. William, if you please. That's him. Back here in the scullery, constable. Right, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Williams. Hello, Inspector Ford. Scotland Yard, sir. 
I'm afraid I don't quite understand. Why, we'll try to show you, Mr. Williams. I really haven't much time. I... <laughs> uh, that's enough, Constable. What? A few things, Mr. Williams. Now, what's the name of that place that your wife writes to you from? Why, Hampstead. How do you spell that? Why, H-A-M-S-T-E-A-D. How interesting. Well, that's the way it's spelled on those letters from your wife, isn't it? Isn't that right? I... That's the way I always spelled it. I... Exactly. This object is the skull of a woman. Shall we say, uh, resembled your wife in many ways? I don't know. I... May I have the club, Sir Brendan? Thank you. This heavy plank, which has been once removed from this stool here and been replaced, fits the scars on the skull exactly. You see? Now, look here. I don't know about Watch him, that... Constable. I'm watching him, sir. Now, Sir Brendan O'Neill here conducted certain experiments with this poor relic of the woman who so closely resembled your wife, Mr. Williams. A large number of men... 141. 141 men struck at this skull which was placed where a standing woman's head might be. What is this nonsense? I'm afraid it's far from nonsense, Williams. <gasps> None of the right-handed men were able to strike the skull at all in the region of the scars. But every left-handed man could. Steady, lefty. Peter Williams, I arrest you on a charge of willful murder of your wife, Jessie Williams. And I warn you that anything you may say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. Do you wish to make a statement at this time? The evidence was incontestable. At the trial, the testimony of handwriting experts proved that Williams had written the letters purposely coming from his wife after her death. The days on which these letters had been posted were in every case the days on which Williams had been off duty the only days on which he had been able to go to London for that purpose. It was demonstrated in court that only a left-handed man could have struck the fatal blows. The testimony of more than a dozen acquaintances of the couple provided the motive for the murder. And in a dramatic break with his counsel in open court, Williams shouted out his confession that he had indeed committed the brutal murder. He was sentenced to be hanged and the sentence was executed on May Day, 1944. You have heard another in the series Whitehall 1212, compiled by special permission from the official files of Scotland Yard. Only the names have been changed, otherwise the story is true. Research for Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's it. First time in history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have, for obvious reasons, been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Here to brief you on Scotland Yard file number 1098002 -002 is Chief Superintendent John Davidson. Here in the Black Museum of Scotland Yard, we have only one memento of case number 1098002, but it is a notable one. This is a bottle, alas, only partly full now, 
of one of the finest unblended pot still Scotch whiskey that mortal man has ever tasted. I say its name with the proper respect. Its label says Jew Glenlivet. Only three or four drinks remain in it. But I expect that wee drop is quite safe. A, the bottle is sealed. And B, I doubt that there exists any Englishman who would care to drink after the man who last owned it. No, it's not poisoned in the conventional sense. But this Jew of Ben Livet helped to poison a man's mind. It's a shame that such an excellent product should even once be put to such an end by such people as those who gave it to the man who last owned it. Don't you agree, Commander Leonard? I find myself speechless at such sacrilege, John. Uh, this is Commander Leonard, head of the famous special branch of the CID at Scotland Yard. I may say that the late owner of the bottle was a greater criminal than appears on his record. Well, how so, Commander? I thought... That... He diluted that noble whiskey with ginger ale, John. <laughs> The city of Ottawa, in Canada, is often thought of as an American city, which of course it is. But it is also the capital city of the Dominion of Canada, and as such, a very important part of the British Commonwealth of Nations. I take you back now to September of the year 1945 in Ottawa. In the Royal Canadian Mounted Police headquarters there, early in that month, Inspector John Miller of the RCMP was speaking on the telephone with a representative of the Canadian Ministry of Justice. Who's this speaking, please? Uh, this is Mr. Dufresne, sir. And may I ask to whom I'm speaking? Inspector Miller, RCMP. Uh, how do you do, Inspector? Well, that's not important. What I want to know is, do you know a man named Igor Kovenko? Uh, I do, sir. But may I ask why, please? Well, he's here in my office, mister. Oh, I must warn you about him, Inspector. He's a dangerous man. He says he was in to see you this afternoon. That is true, sir. He is a very dangerous... Dangerous man. my foot. I beg your pardon. I said dangerous my foot. He's sitting here scared to death. <laughs> scared, sir. I must say I can hardly believe that. Uh, he he is... says he walked out of the code room of the Russian embassy this afternoon where he's been employed with some highly secret documents. He said... He says he brought these documents to the Ministry of Justice and was told to go home and stop bothering you. Is that true? We hardly put it. Did you throw him out? We told him we could engage in no negotiations whatever with a representative of a foreign power with whom the British government are not at war. Sir. You didn't look at any of the documents he smuggled out of the Soviet embassy code room? Naturally not, sir. You didn't know he was fed up with communism? We did not believe him, sir. I say, look here... You didn't believe he wanted to aid the British government? Uh, look here, Inspector... You turned down information that might be of the utmost importance to Britain and Canada. Clumsy spy, sir. He isn't. What's he? I said he isn't. And may I ask how you know that, Inspector? You may, sir. Uh huh. Mister, half hour ago, a squad of Russian thugs, led by the chief security officer of the Soviet embassy in person, broke into Kovenko's apartment, armed with pistols and Tommy guns. And... Uh, are you joking, sir? I am not. This was an official search party. They were going to take Carl Cohen and his whole family away with them, or murder them if necessary. Fortunately, he was able to get through to the RCMP, and we took care of the matter, sir. What did you do, Inspector? Uh, you we don't... spanked a lot of Russian behinds. We brought Carl and Cohen and his family, including the children here, to the station for protection. I think you'd better get over here in the morning real early before the Ruskies get here with a writ of habeas corpus. Because from what they said... Well, uh, there's some very interesting plans for the Covenco family. I, I must report this to my chief inspector. No, yeah, do that. And tell him to hire a Russian translator. If these papers he swiped are what he says they are. Yes, I, I'll telephone my chief at once, sir. And, and, and thank you very much for calling, sir. Good night. Bureaucrats. <laughs> Igor Kovinko, the code clerk, had not only taken copies of secret documents with him, 
He had also a copy of the Soviet Embassy's most confidential code book itself. The documents, accordingly broken into plain Russian and translated into English, were startling. This is a paraphrase of the contents of one of them. Facts given by Alec... Excuse me. I should explain that the name Alec proved to be the Russian's identification name for the man who had betrayed British secrets to them. Go on, please. Facts given by Alec include specific information about the atom bomb dropped on Hiroshima in August. He also states that the amount of uranium-233 at the Clinton Magnetic Separation Plant in Canada is 400 grams daily. Another. Alec handed over to us a platinum container with 162 micrograms of uranium-233 in oxide form. He will keep us advised of further developments in the production of the atom bomb. Another. I enclose data on the American proximity shell for anti-aircraft, supplied to us by Alec. There are several others, only one of which I can even now reveal to you. That I will give you presently. All these messages were addressed to the director and signed by Colonel Vladimir Rabukin, the Soviet military attaché in Ottawa. I was summoned to the foreign office a few days before the 1st of October, shown the translations, and told the whole story as it was cabled from Ottawa. The special branch, of which I was then the head, was to take over. Take over what, I asked? Isn't all this taking place in Canada? A very important gentleman in the then British government showed me another of the documents. I promised you I'd tell you about that one, if you please. To Colonel Rabuchin, Ottawa. Work out and send by courier all arrangements for the meeting... What meeting, I asked. ...and the password by which our representative will recognize Alec when he comes to London. Most necessary for him to come to London at once. Signed, Director. He's coming here, I said? To the Director. Alec will meet our representative in front of the British Museum during month of October. Time, 11 o'clock in the evening. Identification for Alec. A copy of a newspaper rolled up. That's all I said? He read me another one. To Colonel Rabuchen, Ottawa. Here are revised instructions for Alec. Meeting place in front of British Museum in London on Great Russell Street, opposite side of street about Museum Street from side of Tottenham Court Road. Alec to walk from Tottenham Court Road, our contact man from opposite side, Southampton Row. Time near 8 o'clock in the evening, if practicable. Identification signs. Alec to carry under left arm the newspaper Times. Our man to have in left hand the magazine picture post. Password. Contact man, quote. What is the shortest way to the Strand? Alec, quote. Come along, I'm going that way. At beginning of business conversation, Alec to say, best regards from Mikhail. Report on transmission of details to Alec, also date of arrival in London. Most urgent, signed director. Must be rather serious if he's coming over here. It is, Commander. I can only say this, that he will be bringing with him secret information of the utmost importance. Information of such importance that it cannot be committed to paper. I think I may also say this to you. The future existence of the British Commonwealth cannot be guaranteed if this information falls in the Russian hands. Then our job is to arrest this man, Alec, before he can make his contact. It's imperative that you do so. Tell me, what's his real name, and when is he coming? The message I've just read you is three months old, Commander. In that time, 14 persons concerned with atomic research in Canada have arrived in Britain from there. Yes, sir. Any one of those 14 may be Alec. We haven't the remotest suspicion of his identity, nor of the contact man. Neither have we any hint of the time the contact is to be made. The very life of our nation is at stake, sir. We must depend on you. MI5, the counterintelligence branch of military intelligence, placed dozens of their own men at our disposal. Together with the operatives of Special Branch, we were able to place in the field a quite imposing force of men and women. And there was plenty of work for all. To find an unknown man on an unknown date in a place where thousands of innocent people were passing. And with the urgency of the Commonwealth's danger to spur us on, 
a task as near to impossibility as one would care to mention, I'm afraid. The obvious thing was first to screen the 14 men from the Atomic Research Project in Canada who'd returned to England in the three months since the message to the director was sent. We found them one by one. I spoke to the first on the list, Mr. Frederick Giles, an Englishman, in his laboratory. Yes, I rather liked Canada. Glad I didn't have to stay the winter there, though. It gets frightfully cold. Were you in Quebec? Marvellous city, I understand. Medieval sort of place, isn't it? No, I, I never got there. I have a friend in Ottawa, Winko, in the air ministry there. Chap named Norman Helfrick. Wonder if you ever met him? No, I was never there either. Lots of chaps were, but uh, not I. They kept me at Clinton all the time I was there. The magnetic separation plant, you know. I was supposed to be an expert on a rather secret sort of isotope, you see. Never got anywhere. Quite dull, really. We checked Giles. Records showed he'd never been away from Clinton, as he said. No opportunity for him to contact any foreigners. He's in the clear, subject to further checks. Next man, Herr Professor Dr. Hannes Fischbein, a former German scientist who'd also worked in Canada. Uh, so, uh, I in Canada was four days only. I am fly to Montreal. I make my report. I am fed. <laughs> A large dinner. Colossal. And in my hotel room, they lock me up and stand the policeman with a red coat outside the door. More dinners I am fed. And then comes the man. And I am to back to England fly. <laughs> Better I should have here geblieben sein. Canada is to me a street outside the hotel window. But I did eat. Oh, oh wonderbar. Check off Hannah's Fishbein. Word came to us from the Foreign Office. Three new arrivals from Canada Atomic Research Project. Alec may be one of these. Please report progress. Checking of the arrivals from Canada went on. Mathematics professor John M. Dodds signed from Ottawa to King's College, Strand, London. Yes, I've heard that the Russians are very active in Canada. I knew a Russian girl, Vilma Semyonova. What happened to her, Professor Dodds? I married her. But she's now a Canadian citizen. Where is she? Oh, she came back with me from Canada. She's here in London. Assign a woman detective to check on Vilma Semyonova Dodds. Lawrence Mackay. Lawrence Mackay traveled alone by a government airplane from Ottawa to London. Lawrence Mackay is the six-year-old son of a Scottish nuclear physicist who was killed with his wife in a Canadian motor accident. Check off Lawrence Mackay. Georg Hasselblad. Georg Hasselblad, native of Denmark, in the employ of the Atomic Project at Montreal. Return direct to Oldberg, Denmark. In England, only three hours. Check, Check Hasselblad off. James Nicholas McGee, junior mathematician. Died at his home in Belfast two days after returning from Canada. Check off McGee. Professor Duncan M. Allen, a senior member of the Nuclear Project Division of Imperial Chemicals Industries and a university reader. In Canada since 1943, just returned as a senior in the Nuclear Projects Division. Some hope at last. Here was a highly responsible man with long experience in Canada. His advice on who might be Alec should be helpful. Since he was next on the list, I called on him. He was not of much assistance. How should I know, my dear sir? I'm a scientist. You're a detective. I thought in view of your long residence in Canada, you might be able to give us some hints. I as... can't. I was much too busy to add spying to my duties. You knew all of these people, though? I probably did, but I'm sure I don't remember most of them. I worked with some of them. I remember this child, Leslie McKay's son. Oh, I was sorry about Leslie and his wife. How about some of the others? This German, Fischbein, he was a former enemy. Remember the name? Didn't know the man. Dr. Dodds. Mm, I heard he married a Russian girl. Didn't know him. Giles? Short, fat chap. That's all I know. You were in Ottawa. Yes, but I was busy. I'm sure you're aware, sir, that I shouldn't be asking you questions unless this were a most important matter. What's up? Someone ran off with some U-233? As a matter of fact, that's part of it. But not all, I'm sorry to say. Now, look here. Are you serious? If any U-233 had been missing, I should have known about it. You knew of none being missing? I did not, nor do I know now, sir. That's odd, Dr. Allen. We have what we consider excellent information. Let me see. 162 micrograms of uranium-233 were missing. Your information is quite erroneous, I can assure you, sir. 
Part of my duties included keeping an extremely close check on the amount of fissionable material on hand. In fact, I was responsible for it. And if I say that none is missing, then you may rest assured that none is. Our authority is unimpeachable. Your authority is a liar. Well, I expect you ought to know. Who gave you this cock and bull story? I'm sorry, that I cannot tell you. Well, send him to me and I'll set him and you straight at once, sir. I'm afraid we can't do that, sir. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Allen. <clears throat> if you should happen to remember anything in your name... Young man, I have mathematical formulae to remember that would shatter the brains of all Scotland Yard combined. I'm afraid I'm not going to be of any assistance to you, whatever. By the way, Doctor, do you happen to remember anyone out there named Alec? Yes, of course. May I ask who, sir? Sergeant Alec MacDonnell. The MacDonnells of Kepoch, not of Calgary. He was always at pains to inform me. He was the absurd Royal Canadian Mounted Policeman who was assigned as my bodyguard in that godforsaken place. And where is he now, sir? So far as I know, my dear sir, he's never left Canada. <laughs> but he has promised to visit me here in London on his next leave, if you'd like to meet him then. <laughs> The Foreign Office was on us every minute, demanding results. Every known Russian national in London was being watched, but not a known Russian could be discovered anywhere in the vicinity of the British Museum, the rendezvous named in the dispatch the Ottawa Code Clerk had given us. I wondered briefly if we'd not been made the victims of a hoax. Dr. Allen, who certainly ought to know, I said to the Foreign Office, was certain that no uranium-233 was missing. It is quite possible the stuff was taken without the knowledge... My dear Commander, after all, we are not dealing with children, you know. Dr. Allen was quite positive, sir. I'll send a signal to Canada asking them if they can account for it. Their records will certainly show any discrepancy. Quite true, sir. But if they say none is missing... We'll discuss that when we know for certain, Commander. Yes, sir. You have no results to show, I take it? None whatever, sir. I'm sorry. We have expected more, sir, from the special branch. I left the Foreign Office in remarkably low spirits. The special branch have always prided themselves on taking difficult assignments in stride. But this one... The age of miracles is past, I reflected, as I walked into my own office at Scotland Yard. Put me through to Fred Ibbett, my chief clerk, please. Thank you. Now, Fred, Commander Leonard here. I want this done at once. Get to all the people who are checking on the various Canadian visitors and have them supply you with as many photographs as they can get of the various ones they've checked on. No, I should think these people, if they're the proper kind, should be glad to let us have them. Yes, quite. Then send them by airplane to headquarters of the RCMP in Ottawa with instructions to let the code clerk, the Russian who skipped out. What's his name? Eh? Kovinko, that's right. Let him see all these photographs and tell us if he recognizes any of them as people he may have seen round the Russian embassy. No, they all seem to be clear, but he might just remember seeing one sometime or another. What? Yes, it may help us find Alec, I hope. Thank you, Fred. Yes, at once, please. I left the office, still deep in thought. Bought a newspaper and started walking. And what can we do now, I thought. Begin checking everyone again. Does Alec really exist? I glanced up. Where had I got to in my daydreaming? <laughs> there was the British Museum. Excuse me. What's the shortest way to the stand? Mm? Uh, oh, back that way to High Holborn. First turn to your left down Kingsway and... Wait! Oh, excuse me! You're not Alex! And before I could do more than goggle at her, the young woman carrying a copy of the picture post had turned and vanished into the crowd on Great Russell Street. I pulled my times from under my left arm and flung it away and was properly reprimanded by a constable. But the contact man was gone. Would you mind kicking me, constable? I said to the officer. <laughs> Funny, wasn't it? One week and two days later, the bloated body of what had been a young woman was pulled from the Thames just below Wapping Old Stairs by men of T Division of the Metropolitan Police. She was thought to be a former employee of the Russian Embassy, but none of the Embassy staff could identify her. The morning after my contretemps in Great Russell Street, I called again on Dr. Allen. 
the senior scientist who had assured me that I was wrong about the missing uranium. I'm very sorry, Commander. I have a lecture to give at King's College in half an hour. I've no time to talk to you. I think you'll find it of great importance, sir. And moreover, I have given you definitive answers to the rather idiotic questions you've already asked me. I must tell you, Doctor, that this matter seriously and urgently concerns our national security. I'm sorry, but as I told you, it's... I'm sorry too, Doctor, but I'm afraid you'll have to answer my questions. Now, see here. I dislike to say this, Dr. Allen, but I must point out that I have sufficient authority to compel you to answer my questions. I hope I shall not be forced to use it. Are you impugning my integrity, sir? I'm merely pointing out that the matter is one of the utmost urgency, sir. Young man, I've exactly 15 minutes before I must leave for my lecture. I told him what we knew. I told him of the dispatches we'd gained possession of. Were any names mentioned in this message, Commander? Any that could be recognized? No, I told him. Only Alec. And I told him what had happened to me the day before. He chuckled heartily. I reminded him with some asperity of the seriousness of the situation... He sobered at once. I agree with your man at the Foreign Office, whom you so pointedly avoid identifying, that this Alec, whoever he is, is in possession of information which, if obtained by a hostile nation, might easily spell destruction for the British Commonwealth, Commander. I reminded him that Alec must obviously be someone who possessed a great knowledge of the progress of nuclear fission research. That's true. That's a very good deduction, Commander. He's obviously an important person. I asked him if he had the faintest suspicion of who he might be. That I'll have to think about. Here is a list of the arrivals from Canada. Is there any name on this list who could conceivably answer such a description, I asked. He scanned it rapidly. Mm. No one except myself? Perhaps he hasn't got here yet, I said. I think he has. Else why were you accosted with a password yesterday and even addressed as Alec? You're right, sir. He is here. And then, Commander, I see only one thing for you to do. What's that, sir? Find him if you can. Well, sir... I assure you, the most frighteningly immediate end of this nation of yours is inevitable if you do not find Alec before these secrets are turned over to Russia. I say it's inevitable, sir, because I, too, know what they are. I will talk with you again, but my present job is also of importance in the national security. Shall we say tomorrow, then? I returned to Scotland Yard to my office. There was an urgent note on my desk. It read, Call RCMP headquarters in Ottawa, Canada, at once. Inspector Miller. Highest priority, immediate action. And several other words whose meaning was quite as clear. I put through the call. I want Inspector Mill... Yes, Ottawa, Canada. This is Commander Leonard at Scott... Oh, Miller here. Are you Commander Leonard? Yes, yes, this is Commander Leonard. Hello. Yes, this is Leonard Miller. This oh, is, is Leonard. That Leonard? Yes. Oh, this is Inspector Miller in Ottawa. How's the weather there in London? What? It's all right. What did you want? Oh, yes. It's raining here. Cold. Probably turned to snow. What did you want of me? Oh, yes. Well, your picture's got here. Photographs of those people. Yes. Well, we showed them to the cold clerk fellow, this Coven Cole. He recognized only one of them. He used to see about the Russian embassy several times, he said. Which one? I said, which one? Oh. Well, you didn't put any names on them, just those numbers. You recognize the one marked number four. What? Four. One, two, three, four. Four? You got it? Number four. I don't know what the fellow's name is, but it's number four. All right, thank you. Who is he, you know? I haven't got the list here. I'll have to let you know. But thanks. Thanks, old boy. I think we've got Alec. What do you say? Goodbye. I identified him all right. It was mid-afternoon before I could reach Dr. Allen with the news which I was impatient to check with him before reporting to the Foreign Office. I got him on the telephone and rushed to his flat at once. So you think you've got him, eh? Well, tell me about it. How did you discover? Are you sure? I'm reasonably sure, sir. He's the only one of the whole list who'd ever been seen around the Soviet embassy. Who is he? He's the only one who could possibly be Alex, sir. Well, before you tell me, let's have a drink, shall we? I seldom indulge, but I've got a very fine bottle of Dew of Glenlivet here. Here he is. I expect you'll have it neat, won't you? <laughs> Don't think I'm a barbarian, I know, but I always mix mine with ginger ale. Here, help yourself. No. What's that? I will not drink with you, sir. What's the matter? I have one more question to ask you, Dr. Allen. Go ahead. The number four man on the list whom I checked on is the one they identified. Do you know who he is? I'm afraid not, Commander. I'm afraid then I'll have to ask you one more question, sir. 
What is the shortest way to the Strand? Well, come along. I'm going that way. I think not, Alec. I arrest you on the charge of violating the Official Secrets Act. And I must warn you that anything you say will be taken down and may be used in evidence. Yes. It was Dr. Allen himself whom the code clerk recognized as having been a frequent visitor to the Soviet Embassy in Ottawa. Dr. Allen testified at the Old Bailey at his trial that he was opposed to any program that did not share the secrets of nuclear fission with all nations equally. It is not clear what his reasons were for sharing with the Russians not only what secret information he possessed about the atom bomb and its construction, but also the secret details of the proximity fuse and several other top-secret weapons of war. Here is one line of his testimony that will interest you. Yes. I received in exchange for this information a small amount of dollars. I don't remember exactly how many. Oh, yes, yes. And they also gave me a bottle of what I was told was very excellent whiskey. I'm afraid I still don't see, Commander Leonard, why you would not drink with me. For his treasonous exploits, Dr. Duncan M. Allen, the nuclear physics senior, received a sentence of ten years' penal servitude. It was never proved that Dr. Allen was ever a communist, but it is certain that he's a secure prisoner. You have heard another in the series Whitehall 1212, compiled from the official files of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in its history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the true stories of some of its most interesting and baffling cases. These are the true stories, the plain, unvarnished facts just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. These stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. The next voice you will hear is that of Chief Superintendent John Davidson, custodian of Scotland Yard's famous Black Museum. Good afternoon. Would you have a cigarette? No, I'm sorry, not this case. This is the exhibit from the Black Museum, and it has fingerprints on it. Besides, if that makes any difference, it's empty. Yeah, one of these, if you don't mind. I smoke them myself. <coughs> Woodbine. <coughs> well, if you insist on one of your own, then this case... 
had a great deal to do with the murder case. <coughs> Back in the last year of the First World War, 1918, <coughs> it was owned by an army officer. That's a curious mark on the outside of the case, isn't it? A scar, almost, you'd call it. Tis a scar. Bullet scar. And here's the man to tell you how it came into our possession <coughs> here at the Black Museum, Scotland Yard. Superintendent, then Inspector, Norman Gray. Yes, been a long time since I've seen this case, Chief Superintendent. I remember the night quite well. September 26, 1918, the day the Yanks began their fantastic offensive in the Argonne Woods in France. I remember the telephone call I received that night, about a quarter to nine. Inspector Gregg, uh, will you go at once, please, to a house at 131 Ladbroke Grove, please? What's up, old boy? The chap's been shot, that's all I know, sir. Right, 131 Ladbroke Grove. Right, sir. I am on my way. <laughs> In a few minutes, thanks to one of the earliest of Scotland Yard's motor vehicles, I alighted near number 131 Ladbrook Grove, which is a fairly posh address. My knock on the door was answered by a lanky gentleman with a large black moustache, wearing a uniform with the crowns and red tabs of a staff major and the flaming grenade badges of the Royal Fusiliers. What's up, sir? I asked, remembering to say sir. I'm Major Robert Henry, officer. My brother's been shot. I looked past him, and on the sitting room floor, another officer was lying, bleeding from what appeared to be several wounds. I looked more closely. He was gasping. Uh, my brother, Captain Dougal Henry, officer of the KRRC. Who shot him? Uh, an intruder, a burglar, a housebreaker. Where's he? Escaped, I'm afraid. Can you do anything about my brother? I've tried, but... Sorry, sir. Uh, Dougal... He can't hear you, sir. Is he? Is he? Yes, sir. Now, sir, what happened? Dougal, old boy. What happened? Oh. There's nothing... Nothing, I... sir. I'm sorry. He's dead. What happened? He was in the library talking with Major Ward. Where's Major Ward, please? Uh, oh, he's in the library. Edmund... May I go in the library, sir? Is that it? Edmund's in there. And so he was. Oh, I say. Are you Major Wardson? Yes. May I have that revolver, sir? Huh? Oh, oh yes, yes, of course. I I'm afraid I fired it. At whom, sir? At the burglar. The man who killed my brother. But I'm afraid I missed him. I I'm not a very good shot. He didn't miss. No. No. Poor Dougal. Is he dead? He is. Oh. You didn't give me a revolver, sir. Oh, excuse me. Thank you. This your service revolver, sir? Yes, of course. One goes on leave, of course. Webley, caliber 38. Issue. You're in the London Irish Rifles, sir. 174 Brigade. You know this gentleman? One of my dearest friends. That's right, dearest friend. He'd been at my home this evening. Oh? Before we came here. Oh? That can easily be proved, officer. I'll not require that, sir, now. Uh, well... You were on good terms with the dead man? I... Of course he was. What are you implying, officer? Only that I never saw either of you gentlemen before, sir. Nor him. I'll have you understand that... May I other... remind you, sir, that nobody has told me what happened. Well, I'll tell him, Edmund. Thank you. Please. I'll tell you quite simply, Constable. Inspector, sir. Oh, excuse me. I was sitting here looking over the overseas edition of the Daily Mail. Uh, the one our soldiers received uh, Major in Ward and my brother were talking in the library while I waited. Uh, we were all going to dinner shortly. And carriages. Please. Uh, yes. Uh, well, there was an infernal noise in the library. Uh, scuffling. Shots fired. I jumped up. Just as I came hurrying out. And told me. Said a burglar just shot poor Dougal and I think I've wounded him. Wounded whom? The burglar man. Wounded whom, Major Ward? Eh? Wounded whom? Oh. Uh, oh the, the, the burglar, of course. Just as he was clambering out the window with his arms full of... He had already killed Captain Henry. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Uh, but I didn't know he was dead then. Uh, how did he get in? The burglar? Yes. I don't... Think... I haven't the faintest idea. Uh, one minute we, we were alone, and the next minute there he was, pointing a gun at Dougal. And you shot at him? I certainly did. I see you fired all the chambers of your revolver, sir. I'm afraid I didn't hit him, though. 
You fired at him, though. He did. I heard him. Bullets are probably in the walls. We'll find them. Of course. Of course. How'd he get out? Out the window, the way he came in. And he did take something? Well, what did he take, Edmund? Oh, that, that silver tankard that always used to stand on your desk. It belonged to my grandfather. I'm sorry I didn't kill him. It's too bad, Major. Now we must find him. Yes. Yes, indeed. Do you think you could describe him, Major? Well, I know. Well, partly. Eh? I, I could describe him partially, officer. Little chap. Ruddy face. Ginger hair, I thought. Uh, but I'm not sure. I, I was shooting at yes, him. Yes, yes but, but you missed him. You missed him. And I wish... What should we do now? I think our first task is to get this dead man out of here. Dougald. Yes, I don't think he'll be much help. What's that, sir? Why, I... I said... A dead men are quite often useful, sir. Murdered men, I mean, sir. I'm afraid I don't understand that, sir. Why, sir, a murdered man is often the only one who knows who killed him. Except the man who did it, of course. May I telephone Scotland Yard, sir? Major Robert Henry stood and watched sorrowfully as the detail I summoned from Scotland Yard loaded up his brother's body and started away to the mortuary with it. Where's Major Ward, I asked. He's lying down. Mara. After all, old chap, he's just seen a very close friend shot down in cold blood. Oh, yes, yes, of course. But he's a combat officer, I notice. Surely he's seen a good many other close friends of his killed. I doubt he's seen any who were closer than Dougald. Oh? They've been pals since they were kids. I'm a good deal older than Dougald. Never was much of a brother to him, you know. The warden's just his age. He was the brother, in effect. Oh, yeah? Dreadful blow to him, especially under the circumstances. Circumstances? Yes. A ward was shell-shocked. Oh. Buried alive by a shell burst not two weeks ago. Yes, they didn't get him out for five hours. Totally unconscious. The dead man lying across his knees. Horrible. Unconscious, I said. Perfectly conscious the first few minutes, though. Remember the worst part of it. Then to come home and see his best friend murdered before his very eyes. I'm sorry. I didn't know that, sir. Of course you didn't. How could you? You never saw him before. Did you? I remember him now. What? Oh, Oh, you've seen this picture. Everyone's seen it. I remembered it from the illustrated papers when he was married. To Marjorie Carswell. Marjorie Carswell, about six years ago, for the war. Uh, Dougal was groomsman at the wedding. Oh? He was godfather to the first child, too. Yes, yes, I remember now. Uh, Dougal's been stationed here in London for a year now, attached to some uh, American something or other, while Ward's been overseas. Oh, yes? Uh, as soon as he heard Ward was home on sick leave, he popped out to Carling Hill. Uh, that's where Ward lives, uh, Carling Hill. Did you say that was tonight, sir? This afternoon and tonight. Oh, yes. yes. You said your brother returned here. He and Ward were booked for dinner at Claridge as I asked them to stop past for a cocktail. Yes, I remember. Uh, they were in the library talking when this burglar, or whatever he was, entered and... Well, you know the rest. Yes, sir. Uh, Mrs. Ward's still at Carling Hill, is it? Yes. She doesn't know anything about this. Or perhaps you telephoned her. No, I didn't. I don't believe Ward did either. Um, quite understandable if he didn't, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I was wondering... Yes, sir? I was wondering if I hadn't better go down to this uh, mortuary place where they took poor Dougal, you know. Well, sir... What? Oh, I, I shouldn't if I were you, sir. Well, look here, why not? Well, sir, the, uh, the police surgeon will be examining the body now. Well, what difference does that make? You won't be able to see your brother, sir. Oh, what'll he be doing? Something unpleasant? I don't think you'd better go, sir. Oh. Well, what'll I do? Perhaps you might stop and see Major Ward, sir. Perhaps there'd be something you could do for him, or... Or better still... What? I was wondering if you'd like to call Major Ward's wife, sir. Marjorie? Yes, sir. I see. Uh, oh, tell her what's happened. Um... Break it gently, you know. She was very fond of poor Dougald. Uh, good, good, good. Oh, but I say, uh, what'll you do? I was hoping I could see the library. Library? Isn't that where they where they were when the burglar shot your brother? Oh, yes. Uh, don't expect to find the fellow now, do you? No, sir, of course not. I want to look for bullets. What bullets? The ones Major Ward fired at the burglar. Oh. oh why? 
Why, Major Ward fired all the bullets in the cylinder of his revolver. If one or more is missing in the walls, well, perhaps he didn't miss, after all. And the fellow will be carrying one of Ward's bullets in his body. And we'll put out a call to find a man that answers the description Major Ward gave us. And who's been recently wounded by a Webley 38 bullet. That's clever, sir. Thank you, sir. It'll be simple. Uh, those slugs from a service revolver make the very juice of a hole in a man, uh, seeing what they do to Germans. Well, I see this case is in good hands. I'm going to go telephone Marjorie. I was in that library 26 minutes by my watch. I was just concluding my examination when Major Henry entered again. Ah, there you are. Amazing. I've been trying all this time to reach Marjorie, but the telephone doesn't answer. What seems to be the trouble? Why, I expect she's asleep after all. How's Major Ward feeling? Still sleeping. Not very quietly, but sleeping. Uh, how have you been doing? Major Henry, I've just made the most extraordinary discovery. Whitehall 1212, which you are listening to, is compiled from official Scotland Yard records. And this story, like all the others, is true, except for the names of the people involved. It is presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research is by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. And the stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Now, back to the story of the murder of Captain Dougal Henry of the King's Royal Rifle Corps, which occurred in September 1918. Inspector Gregg had just told the brother of the murdered man that he has made a most extraordinary discovery in the library where the murder occurred. No, sir. I'm afraid I can't tell you about it now. Police secrets. Aren't I right? You could call it that, sir. Well, uh, I expect you'll tell me in your own good time, won't you? I probably shall, sir. I probably shall. Uh, well, then. Uh, now, I think Edmund Ward had better go home. Well, sir... Uh, eh? Well, there's no harm in getting him home. I should think not. Yes, sir, quite. I was wondering something. Yes, sir? I'm due at the war office in 15 minutes. Yes, sir? If I could persuade you to drive him home... Uh, you're quite through here for the moment, I fancy. <laughs> You've made your extraordinary discovery. Yes, sir? Well, then, I could lend you a car. I think we can spare enough petrol. It'd be on official business, huh? Oh, quite so. So it would, wouldn't it? You, you'll do it, then, like a good chap. If I may make bold to ask you for a favor, sir? Naturally. Tit for tat, old boy. If I could borrow your car to drive me to the mortuary after I take Major Ward home? And breaking the news to Marjorie? Of course, sir. Well, I think so. Oh, I say, the mortuary, you, you wouldn't let me go there. This will also be official business, sir. Oh, of course. Uh, so, sorry I didn't think of that. Uh, certainly you may use the car. I'll send it back by a police driver, sir. Oh, I'll have my man drive you, sir. Uh, let's see, what do you call yourself? I mean, uh, how does one address you? Uh, Sergeant, uh, Lieutenant, uh, were you ever in the army? Yes, sir. Oh, really? <laughs> A sergeant, or...? Uh... I was invalided out after Passchendaele, sir. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry, sergeant. I was a lieutenant colonel in the Royal Artillery, sir. Oh! Oh, I... Uh, I say, I, I... I do beg your pardon, sir. That's quite all right. Forget it, Major. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I'm ashamed to say I really did chuck my rank about just the slightest bit. I let Major Henry stand to attention a little longer than was absolutely necessary, and uh, I let the other Major, the one who had been so grievously shell-shocked, ride in front with the driver. We arrived at Carling Hill and drove sedately up to the small cottage he occupied with his wife whenever he was home. We entered. The place was dark. My wife should be somewhere about. <clears throat> Marjorie, dear... Marjorie, are you asleep? Marjorie, we have a guest. I'm afraid she's asleep. Uh, I'll go see. Well, 
Marjorie. She's not here. She's not. She's not here, you see. Turn the light. There's nobody here. She may be in the other room. We have a very small place here. Marjorie? She's not here either. Could she be at one of your neighbours? Well, there aren't any neighbours very near. I wonder where... Shall I help you look? Oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I'll find her. She, she's about somewhere. That her hat there? Well. Oh, yes, that's her hat. Well, then she must be here. Wait, I know what to do. Uh, where, where, where are you going? That's your telephone there. Uh, yes, but... but uh, who are you calling? Put me through to the nearest police station, please. No, 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 no don't do that. I can't have policemen running Inspector about... Inspector Gregg of the CID here, Scotland Yard. I shall want a police constable here at once, please. No, 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 please. There is no necessity to have a policeman here. I'll find her, I'll find her. I don't want any big, flat-footed constable mucking about in my house. Now, listen to me. Listen, I Thank say, you... you very much. You'll be here in half a minute, Major. But I don't want anybody, I tell you. I'll wait a moment till he gets here. Now... Where shall we look next, Major? The largest, the most truculent policeman I've ever seen shortly appeared at the door, complete with manacles, lantern, and an enormous truncheon and I returned to the waiting car whilst he and Major Ward began their search. Not with the exceptional grace on the part of the Major, I thought. I would have liked to remain, but I had an appointment with the police surgeon at the mortuary. The body of the dead Captain Dougald Henry lay on a white table, now in considerable déshabille. Sit down, invited the surgeon... And I sat down beside the late captain. I wish I was a detective. You got a better job. Huh. You chaps have someone to talk with. That's right, we do. Too many. Who shot this one? He didn't stay. If he could, he probably would. Where's he come from? Somebody will catch it for shooting an army officer. He was in his brother's library with another chap. Who? Friend of his. Burglar came in and killed him. He didn't know the burglar? General? Huh. You know an odd thing? About what? The burglar. What? Other fellow said he shot at him. Who shot at whom? Other chap shot at the burglar and missed him. Oh. An army officer, too. The burglar? No. This chap's friend. Lots of army officers can't shoot. And this one admitted it. That's unusual. In the library where this one was shot. Go on, Daddy. Six bullets from a service Webley. Emptied the cylinder. I saw it. What's so funny about that? I went into the library afterward. And? Not one of those six bullets was there. In the wall, or the floor, or anywhere. Webley revolver bullets? Yes. I found them. What? Here they are. These are Webley bullets. Right. Where'd you get them? In the captain's body. Ah, there's only five here. Where's the sixth? In his tunic pocket. Here. How did he get there? Only one that didn't go into him. Flattened out against his cigarette case. See? Have one of the captain's cigarettes. Woodbines. No, thanks. I don't mind. I like woodbines. Blow it the other way. Look. I'm looking. Sure these bullets killed him? Positive. No other wounds on him? None. And answering the question you haven't asked yet, yes. I'm practically certain they are from an army Webley revolver. 
saw enough of them when I was in the army. I'm sure, too. I carried an army Webley myself a long time. Sure enough. Sure enough to convince the jury? Well, no. You haven't got a case. Who's that? Come in. Is Inspector Craig of Scotland Yard here? Tell her no. No, madam. Who is she? Who are you, madam? Marjorie Ward. Marjorie Ward. Tell her to come here. I'm sorry. Will you come here, please, Mrs. Ward? Are you really, Mrs. Ward? You're Inspector Gregg. How did you get here? I found a taxi cab. You're a genius, madam. Where were uh, you? Uh, how do you know where I was? How do you know who I was? Where were you? Give her a chance, Inspector. Answer me, please. I was in the cellar. Answer the rest of it, madam. The inspector wants to know. I was in the cellar all the time. I heard you and Edmund. I heard the constable come in. He's the one who let me out. Let you out? I told him I had to see the Scotland Yard man. And he said... Who's that? Oh, Stugald Henry. Oh, no. Is he dead? He is dead. He is dead. Then Edmund did kill him. Oh, oh poor Dougal. Don't please, madam. Be still. Why do you say your husband killed Captain Henry? He the one that had the bullets and the webley? He the one that was with this poor blighter when the burglar... What are you talking about? Yes. What burglar? Is he? Yes, he's the one. What burglar? Your husband said he saw a burglar shoot Captain Henry. Where? At his brother's house. Robert's house? Robert Henry's. Where's the burglar? He ran away after the killing. Oh, poor Dougal. And your husband shot at him, but he missed. It was Dougal he shot at. There wasn't any burglar. Edmund murdered poor Dougal, just as I said he would. Edmund murdered him. I know he did. You're very convincing, madam, but why should your husband shoot the man? Yes, why? They were oh, friends. you fumbling idiot. Don't call names, please, madam. Both <laughs> Inspector Gregg and I had grave doubts of your husband's story, inasmuch as the bullets that killed the late lamented are undoubtedly from your husband's service revolver. And, but... But Why? Why should he? Because my husband's crazy. Yes, he is. Long before he got shot, he was crazy. I can prove he's crazy. How? Don't listen to me, whoever you are. There's a history of insanity in Edmund's family that's easy to prove. But it isn't enough to prove him crazy, madam. Well, then look here. Look at my shoulders. Does a sane man beat his wife with a whip? Oh, well. And look here at my arms. Better let me put something on there. This is what he gave me when he locked me up. But why should he lock you up? The man must be crazy. I've written, Edmund, that I was going to divorce him. And then he came home, shell-shocked. Shell-shocked? He was buried alive. And I hadn't the heart to go through with the divorce. Poor Dougald came here to call. And he was sitting there talking to me. Not about the divorce at all. And Edmund came in. I went out of the room. And then after a while, Dougald left. Then Edmund came back and his eyes were blazing. He hit me with his riding crop and he swore at me. Accuse me of all sorts of dreadful things with poor Dougald here. And Dougald was such a good friend of both of us. And when I tried to reason with Edmund, he hit me again. This is the mark of that. There was nobody there except us. He screamed at me. Threw me down the cellar stairs. Screaming that he killed Dougald. He knew where Dougald was going to his brother's house. Edmund would kill him. Then come back and murdered me because he said I was a... Oh, I just can't say what he said I was. He slammed the cellar door. And I could hear him raving and screaming. I'll shoot him. I'll murder him. I'll kill him. I'll kill him. And so he did. Oh, poor old Dougal. You were the best friend Edmund and I ever had. And he's killed you. And where is he now? Who? Your husband. He's still at home, raving, I suppose. Oh, I am then, am I? Edmund! Yes, my beloved wife. Yes, me. Hello there, Dougal, you. You... How did you win all right, old pal? 
I know. Oh, there you are, Marjorie. Stand up and be killed, dear. Made that silly great oaf of a constable tell me where you'd gone, and here I am. I'm going to kill you. And you. And you. And you too, Dougal. Killed you once. I can do it again. He's got a gun. Didn't know I had another, huh? I'm an officer. I got two guns. Quite enough for everybody. You first. <laughs> what? I'm sorry, I don't seem to have any more bullets. Cartridges, I mean. Excuse me, Dougal, for not having any more cartridges, Mark Three. I seem to have used them all up killing you. Excuse me, sir, is there something I can do for you? Edmund Ward, I arrest you on a charge of willful murder. Well, excuse me, sir. Sorry, dear. Beg your pardon, Dougal. Old chap. Here, here. I warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. Major Edmund Ward was duly tried for murder and duly found guilty. He was, however, adjudged insane, and instead of the scaffold, he ended his days at Broadmoor. His wife got her divorce. today on Whitehall 1212, Horace Braham as Inspector Gregg. Others in the order of their appearance, Harvey Hayes, Guy Spall, Lester Fletcher, Gerard Burke, and Isabel Elson. Lionel Rico speaking. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed by Will Cooper. <laughs> America is a country blessed with mountains and forests, woods and timberlands. But each year, thousands of acres of our forests are destroyed by fire. And these are acres of wealth and beauty that cannot be replaced. This is our most shameful waste, because most forest fires are caused by human carelessness. Today, this problem is more vital than ever, because forest fires destroy the natural resources upon which our nation's security depend. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. For the first time in its history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the plain, unvarnished facts just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names have for obvious reasons been changed. The broadcasts are produced with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research for Whitehall 1212 is provided by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. And this voice is that of the custodian of Scotland Yard's famous black museum, Chief Superintendent John Davidson. Good afternoon. Someone's put this so far back on the shelf. Uh, Here it is. This is what is known as a Winchester bottle. This one is the 80-ounce size, half a gallon. 
There are 20 ounces in an English pint. A Winchester bottle is frequently used in hospitals for the storage of liquids, which are shortly to be used. Milk, for example. That's what this one was used for. You will note that there are two fairly clear fingerprints on it here. Here, ringed with the chalk marks. There were once a great many more, but all have disappeared except these two, which have been covered with a plastic solution to preserve them. These are a murderer's fingerprints. These are the clues which put Scotland Yard and the Lancashire Constabulary onto him. He was, of course, hanged. Now perhaps you'd like to hear what was done to find him. Chief Inspector Leslie Crawford here was in on the most of it. <clears throat> Four years ago, I was a hard-working chief inspector at Scotland Yard. I didn't know how hard an officer could work before this case. I was roused at 3 a.m. by a telephone call from a town in Lancashire. Their chief constable was calling. I'm sorry to ruin your night's sleep, Chief Inspector, but there's been an atrocious murder here, and you're wanted at once. I've cleared everything with the people at the home office and at the yard, and we shall leave you at once. No, I'll take the first train, sir. Who's been murdered? A four-year-old girl has been murdered near the hospital where she was ill. There are certain clues, but not very many. I arrived in the town of Blackburn at an excessively early hour, was met at the train by a police car of the Blackburn Borough Force and rushed at once to Queen's Park Hospital. There were a great many people there, hospital attendants and police officers. The body of the little girl, whose name was Mary Margaret, was in the hospital morgue. Her head had been smashed by a vicious blow and there were bruises on her bare ankles. The chief constable explained that. As if she'd been held by the ankles and her head dashed against the wall. Is that a guess, sir? The wall's out there, Chief Inspector. Down the little hill there. Right on the hospital grounds? Yes. Your clues you spoke of, sir? Well, I think... Uh, Nurse Rollins... Yes, sir. In here, please, Nurse Rollins. This is the sister that was on duty. Chief Inspector, Nurse Rollins. Yes, sir. Go on, please. Well, sir, that little Mary Margaret was asleep with the other children. How many of them? Um, four others, sir. Three girls and one boy. Go on, please. Uh, I was in the kitchen. I, I'm on night duty and we're short-handed. Preparing food for them for tomorrow. And this uh, is a small hospital. So far as we're able to determine now, no other nurses were about. And the watchman? Well, uh, I see. Go on, please, nurse, Roland. Well, I, I was cutting bread and... I heard a sound in the children's ward. Uh, I went in, and one of the other children was crying. I picked her up and took her out to the kitchen, gave her bread and jam. A worthy... Mary Margaret was in her bed when I come in, and also when I returned with the other little girl after her bread and jam. I... I bent over and kissed Mary Margaret. <clears throat> yes, and the trolley with the empty Winchester bottles was standing alongside the wall. I saw it. And what's that? Wait. Then, about ten minutes later... That would be at about fifteen minutes after midnight. Yes. I heard a dog barking, and I was afraid it would wake up one of the children. Why are the children here? Oh, various minor kids' diseases, influenza and so on. They're all very poor. As I glanced in the door, the first thing I noticed was that one of the Winchester bottles had been moved from the trolley. What's the trolley? A sort of little table on wheels. Oh, yes. One of Excuse the Winchester me, bottles had take, been taken from it, and I saw it lying in the corner. We have the bottle. Go on, sister. Then I saw Mary Margaret was gone. I ran to her bed. Sure enough, she was gone. Had she been asleep? Oh, oh yes. She didn't wake up. Even when I kissed her. Miss Rollins is tired. Oh, 
Don't mind me, please. What did you do then? I ran back to the kitchen through the switch that turns on all the light. That summons the watchman to the main building, of course. And I, I looked out the window. I saw what I thought might be a little nightgown. And then I ran into the wood again to see if I could have been mistaken. But it wasn't. <laughs> she was gone. <laughs> I cried out to the watchman. Mary Margaret was gone. And he ran outside and... Oh, it seemed such a long time. he come back with her. It was a nightgown I saw. <coughs> then what? Well, well, I saw him, sir. I called the police. They're all here now, sir. The Winchester bottle, did you see any fingerprints on it or anything? Well, I... There are two well-defined prints on it, which are apparently new. There are also quite a number of old ones, rather smudged. But the two are fresh. Why, then... We think they're the murderous prints. This is from the murderer's confession four months later. Of course, we had no idea of it at the time. I was outside the building. I admit I'd had something to drink. Investigation at the time of his arrest revealed that he had drunk six bottles of bitter beer, two double rums, a bottle of Guinness, and six or eight more bottles of bitter. But I wasn't drunk, really. I don't remember how I got to the hospital or why... But there I was, looking in the window. I saw the nurse carrying the other kid to the kitchen and feeding her and bringing her back and kissing Mary Margaret and going out again. Then I thought I ought to go and see Mary Margaret. That's a nice name for a kid, isn't it? So I unlaced my shoes and took them off and I could hear the nurse singing to herself and the outside door that leads to the ward was open so I just sneaked in and took her. She wasn't sure who I was, but she wasn't much scared at all, I didn't think. She started to laugh like, but I told her to stop. Oh, I picked up that Winchester bottle to see if there was anything in it to drink, but there wasn't, and I set it on the floor before I scooped Mary Margaret out of her cot. Nobody heard me, I'm sure. Oh, yes, when I came back to get my shoes, I left them on the porch. There was a dog barking. I thought I'd make him stop, but he stopped anyway. I was halfway across the field when I saw the lights come on in the hospital, and I hurried. Mary Margaret was still lying there by the stone wall. The sun was just rising when I went into the ward from which the child had been taken. The other children had been awakened and taken away, so I couldn't tell at that time which had been Mary Margaret's cot. The floor had been freshly painted a day or so before, and the sun slanting across from one of the east windows showed me something that stopped me in my tracks. It was a collection of footprints in the fresh paint. Remember now, at this juncture I had heard nothing of what you have just heard. I called Nurse Rowlands. Whose are those, I asked. I don't know, sir. I never saw them before. It's only because the sunlight's hitting them this way that they're too large to be one of the nurses. Stand away from them, please. We'll have them photographed. Whose do you think they are, sir? Additional moves. I saw the Winchester bottle in question. There were two clear fingerprints on it. One of a left thumb and one of a left forefinger. The fingerprint photographer copied them at once after carefully powdering them with white zinc oxide. The bottle itself was a dark greenish glass. And we had our first collection of prints complete. But possessing a set of prints and placing your hand on a murderer's shoulder are two different things. I talked with the chief constable. 
Yes, we have several thousand fingerprints on file here in Blackburn. And the Lancashire Constabulary has a large collection, too. I'll get copies of these prints down to a laboratory at once. And as soon as their prints are ready, I'll pass them on to the Lancashire people. And then I've already passed the word to send them to the CRO at the yard. CRO? Oh, oh, the criminal records office. We ought to be of help. We've got a million or more prints, all indexed. Well, I hope that some of us have the right one. If he's a habitual criminal who has any kind of record... Yes. But what else can we do? You've looked at the grass out there in the field where she was found, of course. Early this morning. Nothing there. The dew's taken care of that. And no fingerprints in the child's cot or anywhere else, so far as we can find. You think it was a local man? No way of knowing or even guessing now. Yes. What are you going to do? Ask everyone, did you murder a little girl last night, sir? Not very satisfactory. Not very. The bottle. What about the bottle? The fingerprints. Oh. Yes. Meaning what? The other fingerprints on it. I've been thinking of that. Things positively gummy. Probably nine million other prints on it. Well, we'll have to check them also. All of them. Well, we can't get very far till we find out who made the others. Have to do it. It'll take years. But it has to be done, sir. Well, of course. But it has to be done. Checking and identifying is... What was it the American staff officers used to say? It's of the essence. Of course, but... Uh... Well, cheer up, sir. I'm asking for a crew of fingerprint technicians to be sent up from Scotland Yard. They'll make short work of it. I hope. I wonder how many there'll be to check. Millions, I'm afraid. Every nurse in the place that might have touched it, every workman... Every patient. Well, not only the present ones, but everyone that's been here since the bottle was washed last. Doctors. Technicians. Clerks. Watchmen. Deliverymen. Cleaners. Relatives of patients. Everyone that's been here since this bottle was last washed. We checked them all. There were no fingerprints on record at Queen's Park Hospital, so we checked everyone. It was grueling work and we were obliged to take more than 3,000 prints before we were satisfied that we had everyone. Some of them required journeys as far away as Blackpool and Lancaster, but at last, it took a month and a day, we were satisfied that we knew all about the owner of each print on the bottle. That is all except the newest pair, the thumb and forefinger of the left hand of a person unknown. I give it to you as my considered opinion that those are the murderer's prints. I must agree with you. They're the only ones that we don't know about. I'm very likely he's all right. All we have to do is to identify them. Yes. There aren't any other clues yet? None. I understand the whole town of Blackburn's upset. There's been a good deal of, shall I say, unrest. Yes, I know. One of my sergeants was hit by half a brick last night. And hurt badly? No. He was cycling back to the town, and he heard someone mutter something about lazy cops. That was all he heard. Good thing he was wearing his helmet. One of my men had a telephone call from a woman he didn't recognize at his home early this morning. They want action. Hmm. You've passed the word? To whom? Institutions and so on. To every police force of any size in England. I asked them to print every drunk, every unaccounted for dead man, every suicide, every tramp. And no results? None yet. Of course, they're still coming in. I don't have much confidence in it. You think it was a local man? Well, I wonder. Well, I think you'll agree that whoever it was knew a great deal about the hospital here and its layout. Seems reasonable. Well, I wish we had fingerprints of everybody like they have in some of those places on the continent. No, I don't either. No, we just got rid of Hitler. We can only have things like that with another Hitler. Which God forbid. I mean... Well? I know how. How? Let's fingerprint everybody. You are listening to Whitehall 1212, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper. The story today, like all the stories heard on Whitehall 1212, is compiled from the official files of Scotland Yard, and is true in all respects except the names of the participants. Inspector Crawford of Scotland Yard 
has just made an unheard of suggestion to the chief constable of the city of Blackburn in a desperate effort to unmask the murder of the little girl, Mary Margaret. The chief constable is speaking. But you can't do that, my dear Crawford. Can't do what? Why, force everyone, force anyone to be fingerprinted. Not in England. Yes, you can. How? Well, not order them to do it, because if I know Englishmen, you won't get anywhere. I should say not. They'd mob you. If I order them to, yes. It's never been done before. Fingerprinting a whole town? I'm afraid it'll have to be done, sir. Crawford, look here. This town has a population of 130,000. And one of them is a murderer. Yes. A particularly atrocious man. Well? And everyone in the town wants to turn him up. I don't think it can be done. It's never been done, that's true. No. That's not to say it can't be done. Will you print everyone? Every man. Yes, I'm sure it's a man. I'll try all the men first, and then... Oh, I don't think it's a woman, Crawford. Those prints are obviously a man's. And that footprint we found, that's a man's footprint. Well, shall we get started, then? I've never heard of such... Have you any alternate suggestions? Well... Have you any alternate suggestions? Well, but... What's to be gained by waiting? Haven't enough policemen. We'll get them. I don't know. Don't you think the people of Blackburn want to find this fellow, Chief Constable? Well... Well, indeed. If we fail... We? Everybody's failed up to now. Yes, I know. I realize it's an unprecedented thing, sir. I know, I know. But we have an important set of fingerprints, which we all suspect to be the criminals. If we can find the duplicate of that set here, we'll be doing no more than our duty, sir. I know, but to... to fingerprint a whole town? Where else would we find him? But... But in England, sir! I can't believe that an Englishman will stand aside when it's his obvious duty to lay a child's murder by the heel, sir. I'm afraid I can't explain to you how unheard of it is to set such an enterprise in motion in England. The Englishman is perhaps the freest man on earth. To indulge in such a thing as freely handing his fingerprints to the police is most incredible, even for such a cause. But the Englishman is also an unusual being. While we had expected opposition to the scheme, we were amazed at the response. The mayor of Blackburn spoke to the townspeople. Ministers in their pulpits urged everyone to cooperate. The wives of the citizens urged their men to give their fingerprints. I got twenty more men from Scotland Yard... The chief constable of Blackburn supplied 20 more. The Lancashire Special Constabulary sent volunteers, Boy Scouts, Girl Guides. Everyone cooperated. In order to eliminate trips to the police stations, we sent pairs of constables and others to every house on the electoral rolls to urge every man to give us his prints. The first man to be printed was the mayor, publicly. His example was a good one. Many women volunteered to give their prints also. But it was not as easy as I expected. A few Englishmen at first... No, you may not have my fingerprints, sir. I've lived for 77 years in this town and no man ever seen my fingerprints. Am I a criminal, sir? It took three of us to talk that one out of it. What do you do when you find my fingerprints and all the others aren't the right ones, sir? We'll destroy them, sir. We'll put them all in a pulping machine and chop them up into little bits and bury the bits. Mm -hmm. Nurse Rowlands from Queen's Park was one of our most devoted assistants... I put her under this stubborn fellow. Come on, Mr. Hodges. Don't you want to help? I ain't going to let anybody take my fingerprints like a dumb criminal now. Don't you want to help find the beast that killed little Mary Margaret, Mr. Hodges? Now? I didn't kill her. Well, of course you didn't. Neither did I. And I gave them my fingerprints straight away, Mr. Hodges. And so did the rector of St. Pancras. Why should he give his... Uh, a rector. St. Pancras is the patron saint of children, Mr. Hodges. Oh, is he now? Don't you like children, Mr. Hodges? Being as how I've got three, old enough to be your father, your mother either, and, and nine grandchildren, uh, Geordie would have been 47 come next Whitsuntide if he hadn't died of yellow jaundice in America. 
and fourteen great grandchildren. Do you think I don't love children then, Ness, Maggie Rollins? Answer that. But I won't have no fingerprints taken, and that there's the last word. I'm a Lancashireman, and a Lancashireman's home is his castle, and... Wouldn't your little great-granddaughter Sheila be just about the age Mary Margaret was, Mr. Hodges? How old was she? She was just four, Mr. Hodges. Sheila was four the day before yesterday. Oh, my... Now, now, just give me your left hand, Mr. Hodges. Here, we'll press your thumb down here on the ink. And then... Uh, my finger now. Don't forget my finger. Uh, just the same age as little Sheila. Uh, I wonder if I could buy Sheila a little box of sweets over there at uh, yon counter. Are you wondering about the murderer? Well, I knowed about all the fingerprinting, of course. Everybody did, but uh, <laughs> somehow or other, the cops missed my house. They come the next day, and I said, No, you've got my dabs, I said, and you've thrown them away because I wasn't the one. And I laughed. Well, it was a great hulking young constable from Scotland Yard itself, and he'd never been outside London, he hadn't, so he believed me. And anyhow... You can't make an Englishman give the cops his fingerprints. And so we missed him. We missed a few others, too. Although we had a pack of prints that would strangle a horse. Not there. And that was after two weeks of checking the cards. Afraid not. Those are the fingerprints of every male between the ages of 16 and 60 in Blackburn. No, no they're not, sir. Hey, what's that? What's that? That isn't all of them, sir. Correspond with the electoral rolls, Nurse Rollins? There are 30,000 cards here, Nurse. I don't care. That hasn't all of them, sir. Begging your pardon. Who have we missed? There was hundreds of servicemen on leave oh. here in Blackburn the night Mary Margaret was murdered, sir. Soldiers, sailors. Well, they've all gone back to their stations, Nurse. There's a record of them, sir. Hmm. That might be... Well, they're all over the world. Be a lot of work. Let's get the circulars out. Circular letters to every organization from which any man was known to be on leave in Blackburn on the night of May 15 to 16, 1948. About 190 letters with a question fingerprints and an urgent request for reply. Then on the chance that there might have been one unaccounted serviceman in Blackburn that night, letters to the police departments in every section of the world where British servicemen were stationed. Letters to the police of Canada, South Africa, Germany, Japan, Denmark, Italy... And a score of other places where the criminal might be. 261 letters. We didn't find him. All the fingerprint cards had been destroyed. We didn't have anything. And the town was muttering again. Three months had gone by, and not a trace of the murderer, except the anonymous fingerprints, had been discovered. No wonder they muttered. We had nothing. We thought of another thing. There were some 600 men living in Blackburn, DPs. Displaced persons who'd made their way to Blackburn in one way or another. There were records of them. They all marched into the borough hall together and asked to be fingerprinted. We didn't miss one. We didn't find anyone either. The murderer must have laughed to himself. They didn't look in the right place. A new issue of ration books was about to be made. The old ones were to be turned in with their fingerprint identification. Each one was examined and compared with the copies of the prints on the bottle. It was another hopeless task. But if we had to do it the hard way, that the man should be caught. caught. Nurse Rowlands found him. On duty in the Borough Hall, the fourth day of the examination, on the 46,253rd book. I've got him! I've found him! I've found him! I've found him! Next morning, exactly 90 days after the crime was committed, the Chief Constable and I walked together to 21 Marfield Terrace and arrested the owner of the prince. One Lionel Tomlinson, who had been discharged from the army as a soldier with character indifferent a week before Mary Margaret was murdered. We took away with us one of the prisoner's wool army socks. 
the forensic laboratory matched fibers from it to fibers found on the footprints on the floor of the ward. And the fingerprints matched perfectly. We found out why you did it. Why you murdered four-year-old Mary Margaret. Quite simple, gents. She's my niece. <laughs> Don't laugh, gents. I was sorry for the poor little tack. I was home about two days when I heard my half-brother and my sister-in-law talking about her. They hadn't any money, not a farthing. They said they'd have to send Mary Margaret away when she come back from the hospital. Give her up. You know, mates. I love Mary Margaret. I... I didn't want to have that happen to my darling little niece. I loved her. So that night when I got squiffed out into the hospital and got her and killed her... <laughs> I, I hope it didn't hurt her. But what else was there to do? trial attracted a great deal of attention throughout the British Commonwealth. Many thought he should be released. But the termination of the insanity of a criminal is judged by laws which were passed more than a century ago. Thus, after the greatest exposition of the infallibility of the human fingerprint as a clue in British history, Lionel Tomlinson was brought to trial at Castle Lancaster on the 15th of October, 1948 five months after he had murdered little Mary Margaret. Four days later, he was sentenced to be hanged, and the sentence was carried out in December of the same year. You have heard another true story of Scotland Yard, told on Whitehall 1212. Heard today, Lester Fletcher as Chief Inspector Crawford. Others in the order of their appearance, Harvey Hayes, Winston Ross, Catherine Hines, Gordon Stern, and Guy Spall. This is Lionel Rico speaking. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed by Willis Cooper. Whitehall 1212 was presented from the NBC studios in Radio City. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. One, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in its history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the true stories of some of its most celebrated cases. These are the true stories. The plain, unvarnished facts just as they occurred, reenacted for you by a British cast. Only the names, for obvious reasons, have been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research for Whitehall 1212 is finished by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. You will now hear from the man in charge of Scotland Yard's famous Black Museum, Chief Superintendent John Davidson. Good afternoon. This is not, for a change, a murder weapon. But through its use, a murderer was brought to book. It is normally a most innocuous article, innocent and, in its way, useful. You do recognize it, do you not? Of course, it's a blotting pad. Regrettably, magenta in color. 
Big enough to hide a newspaper beneath it, if one wishes to hide a newspaper. You find blotters like this on desks in the writing rooms of small hotels in Britain. And strangely enough, that is where Superintendent Edward Weston found this one. I shall ask Superintendent Weston to tell you about it. Edward? On the eve of the August bank holiday weekend in 1931, July 31st to be precise, since the holiday itself was to be Monday the 3rd of August and I was planning to spend it at Stonehenge on Salisbury Plain, I was notified that I was wanted for the investigation of a murder at Oxford. I sighed regretfully over the departed thoughts of Stonehenge and the friar's heel, said yes, sir, quite politely, and was told I would hear shortly from a man in Oxford and put up the telephone. It immediately rang again. Superintendent Weston? It is rather you speaking to you, sir, from Oxford. And I am a scout at Jesus College, and my dear sister Megan has been murdered, Superintendent. They said to me, Superintendent Weston will come, and indeed I am sick with horror. Uh, what's that? I am Arthur. You will speak to you from Oxford, and... You are the man who was to call me. Yes. Indeed, I was told to call you, sir. It was your sister? Uh, who murdered her? I don't know, sir. I was told you were coming here. You're in Oxford? Uh, tell me where to come in Oxford. It is a cottage called the Boundary, sir. It is in St. Clement Street. Uh, St. Clement Street. Uh, yes, sir. It's really the London Road where it crosses the Infly Road and the I Street near Martin and Brit, sir. Now I'll find it. Will you be there? I shall be here, Superintendent, with my dear sister. There is also a policeman here. I took the midnight train which deposited me in the university city before daylight. I found the cottage near Magdalen Bridge without much difficulty. Arthur Hughes was there, uncomfortable in a stiff chair beside the door. The constable was frankly asleep. I identified myself to Hughes and we went inside. Uh, she's in here, sir. Where? I have lifted away oh. three of the cushions, sir. On the tablecloth. She was completely hidden to them. I came to the house, sir. Wait. I will turn on another light. Yes, that's better, thank you. Is it your usual custom to come here? Uh, we had intended to spend the holiday together, sir. I came to take her to the train. And this is the way you found her? Uh, yes, sir. Under this pile of cushions and this tablecloth, I lifted her uh, You off said that. Uh, yes, sir. I did indeed. And this is the way I found her, sir. Moved anything? Uh, no, sir, I am not. Uh, the house is exactly the same as it was. The medical man barely touched her. He did not need to, as you can see from her head. My, my, my poor sister. Yes. I have uh, have you any idea? I have none. What's your business? Profession? I'm a scout at Jesus College. A scout? I think I told you. Uh, that is the accepted term here in the university for personal servant, sir. I am a young man from Canarbon. A fine uncle for me, young gentleman. Welsh? Uh, yes, sir. A great many of the scholars at Jesus College are Welsh, sir. You're Welsh, too. Uh, my sister and I come from Pontypridd in Glamorganshire, sir. Yes. You were on good terms with your sister, of course. Uh, I was, that. I love my sister dearly. And you say you have no suspicions? I have not, sir. If I could think who in the world had done this, my hands would be at his throat this very minute. I should not be here, I assure you. I think the first thing to do is to remove your sister's body to the mortuary, Mr. Hughes. Uh, that is well thought of, Superintendent. If I wait in the constable at the door... Uh, please do, sir. Uh, so I will, then. An ambulance was duly fetched. We removed the cushions which had been placed on top of the body, which was forthwith taken away, and Hughes and I devoted ourselves to an examination of the room. To me, it is quite... Evident that my sister was taken by surprise. What makes you think that? First, there on the sideboard is a small nosegay of flowers from her garden. Every morning, my dear sister took a nosegay to the grave of our sister Maud. She has not missed one morning in the eleven years since Maud died. If the flowers are still here, then... Yes. Anything else? Uh, you can see through this door, the room in which my dear sister slept... Uh, please notice that her bed is only half made. <coughs> yes, I see. And in the scullery, here, 
her uh, breakfast dishes, still unwashed. She would never leave them that way. Yes. And here is a new vacuum cleaner. She left that too. Yes, but the vacuum cleaner isn't connected up. Huh? You see, the flex isn't plugged in. She wasn't using it. There is something strange about that. What's that? She always vacuumed me out in the afternoon, not in the morning. She was a creature on impeccable habit. But my dear sister... I don't think I follow you, Mr. Hughes. It is quite evident she was interrupted this morning by the bed and the breakfast dishes and the vacuum cleaner should not be here. Sure you didn't put it there yourself? Of course not, sir. Why should I? Sure, I don't know. It was there when I came in. The the door was unlatched and there it was. And she was lying here under this great pile of... Ah! What now? That's not my sister's vacuum cleaner. Whose is it, then? Whose is it, can you tell? It looks ever so much like the one she bought last uh, Lady Day. Uh, last of uh, But it seems different somehow. Huh. I don't know. I was here with her when the man delivered it to her. But, uh... Know what I think? No, sir. I think you're dotty. Uh, wouldn't she be doing with a vacuum cleaner in the morning? I'll have a look in the dust bag to see if she was using it. Or the hell she'd use it without connecting it. The dust bag? That's what's different. Different? Quite right, sir. I've seen this vacuum cleaner a dozen times, and the dust bag dark red. Just like the one I have at Mr. Morgan's room at college. Uh, the dust bag's a peculiarly hideous shade of cerulean, Mr. Hughes. Yeah? Blue. Sky blue. Well, darker than sky blue, but it's blue. How could it turn blue, sir? I don't know. Are you sure you're not mistaken that it hasn't always been blue? I was here, I say, when it was the river. And it was red. It was red yesterday, sir. Then what's happened to it? Has it been it's changed? It's been changed. Oh, yes. Well, why should she change it? My sister? She could not change it herself. She couldn't mend it husband. Well, who changed it then? Besides, where would she be getting another dust bag? This blue one. And from the vacuum cleaner shop. There is no vacuum cleaner shop here in Oxford. She bought it from a peddler. Would you recognize this peddler if you saw him? You've seen him before, have you not? He's a nice, such a nice, pleasant young man. So quiet. Eh? Yes, I have seen him, but... Uh, What's his name, do you know? No, I do not No, Superintendent. I do not think I ever heard him. Do you know where he lives? I'm sorry, I do not know that either. Well... I'm sorry. Yes? Well, we have no idea that he's even been in Oxford. Since he sold your sister that machine, if that is the machine he sold her. It is the machine. Do you see where the enamel has been knocked off the front of the thing? Mm-hmm. That happened the very day he cracked the machine. He knocked it against the door with it, And he let my sister have it for a shilling less before off because of the damage. Oh, oh, yes. I know that machine. It is indeed the same one. Except the dust bag. Yes. Look you, Superintendent. It is daylight outside now. Well? I could go out and wake up some of the neighbors for my sister and ask them if they have seen this peddler here today. Yesterday. Uh, for now, which is tomorrow. Huh. You know the neighbors? Indeed. And do then. Go and ask. I'll go over to the police station and see what I can learn. Then I'll return if you've learned anything. Uh, shall I come after you, sir, or will you uh, return here? Better come to the station, Mr. Hughes. Uh, yes, sir. And if I'm not there... Uh, yes, sir. I'll be at the mortuary. But you wouldn't want to come there, I suppose. And why not, sir? My, my dear sister is there. Is she not? They could tell me little at the police station, except that a neighbor's child had mentioned having seen a man undescribed at the door of Miss Hughes' cottage, the boundary, sometime during the previous morning. The man appeared, the child said, to be carrying a large parcel done up in green paper. And further, the child said nothing. And the man was seen no more, according to the best reports. Was this the mysterious assailant, thought I, and repaired to the mortuary? It was too early in the morning for the medical examiner to be there, but having attained access to the dreary base, I examined the dead woman's body myself. I thought she had been beaten about the head with some sort of blunt instrument. There was a fearful wound in the back of her head, sufficient, in my opinion, to have caused death. 
In addition, there was an incised wound in her neck, which alone could have caused death. She had apparently been dead for some 24 hours, which would have put the time of the assault, as we had supposed, about Friday morning. She had bled copiously, with dried blood adhering to her head and neck. No other wounds were visible. I returned to the Boundary Cottage in St. Clement's Street and was surprised to hear voices issuing from the cottage. I entered. Well, good morning. Uh, good morning, Superintendent. Good morning, Mr. Hughes. Good morning, madam. This lady is Miss Dora Abernathy, sir. I am one of Miss Hughes' neighbours, sir. I live at the bottom of St. Clement Street. Uh, Mrs. Abernathy has been a close friend of my dear sister for many years, sir. This is Superintendent Weston from Scotland Land, Mrs. A. Are you an inspector, sir? A superintendent, madam. A superintendent, Mrs. A. Oh, uh, I thought everyone from Scotland Yard is an inspector, sir. Forgive Not me, all sir. of us, madam. Uh, Mrs. A saw the man indeed, uh, Superintendent. You did, huh? He stayed at my house overnight, sir. Did Mr. A of then? Oh, you know Abernathy, Mr. Hughes. He's seen the day when he hadn't the price of a night's lodging either. You're speaking of this vacuum cleaner peddler, I assume. Uh, yes, sir, Inspector. Uh, superintendent. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, Superintendent. He was here, then? At least in the city, sir. The little girl told the police she saw him here, or saw a man at any rate yesterday morning. Oh! You may interview the child later, Mrs. Uh... Abernathy, and see the child description tallies for that of the peddler. Who is the child, sir? I believe her name is Daphne Cubbins. Uh, Cubbins? Cubbins? I I trust Josie Cubbins is young, and even if they have got one of them pongeranium dogs always nipping the postman. You said this peddler stayed the night at your house, Mrs. Abernathy. Yes, sir, he did. You know him that well, then? Well, sir, not precisely. He sold Abernathy and me a vacuum cleaner like Miss Hughes's, sir. Oh. And he showed up yesterday afternoon. Not yesterday afternoon, Mrs. A. It was the day before you said to me. Oh, yes, that's right, Mr. Hughes. The day Abernathy was at the doctor's for his blood pressure. Thursday, while Abernathy was at the doctor's for that matter, and he said he was in the city, and had I any complaints about my vacuum cleaner? I said no, and I offered him a cup of tea as a matter of course. Oh, um, Superintendent, did you ever drink Lapsang Souchong tea like Mr. Fetchell drinks? I didn't know Mr. Churchill drank tea. Abernathy's cousin, who's a sergeant in the Royal Court Catarus, says he does. And when they hadn't any lapsand shoe chuck at Aldershot, when Abernathy's cousin was there, Mr. Churchill had to drink brandy. So I bought two ounces by mail to, from Fortnum and Mason to try. It costs a fright, but Abernathy likes it. Well, Mr. Podmore came who's in. Who's Mr. Podmore? The gentleman who sold me the vacuum cleaner. And we drank Lapsan Soo Chunk. I'm not chucking my weight about, sir, as the bus used to say. It's really very good, although expensive. Smoky. And then he looked at me, and I could see tears in his great brown eyes. He's a very handsome man, is Mr. Podmore. Yes, that, sir. Quite good looking. It's very likely he murdered your sister. Go on, Mrs. Abernathy. Why was Mr. Podmore weeping? He finally came out with it. He lost his money. Well, I just couldn't stand it. I went to the tin we got the lap sand soup chung in, and I took out part of the money I did not there, and then I handed it to him. Here, Mr. Podmore, I said, accept this as a loan until you find your money. How much did you be lending him then? Four bob, I think it was, and sixpence. And when did he pay it back, Mrs. Eyre? He didn't have a chance, Mr. Hughes. When he left in the morning, he forgot it. He'll pay it back. Oh, indeed. Tell me, Mrs. Sir. <clears throat> have another. He took the money. Yes. But there was no bus to tain that late in the afternoon, you see, sir. He was going to tame then? The tame, yes, Mr. Hughes. He said. Tame is only about uh, 12 miles away, sir. Yes, I know. Uh, would he be there now, Mrs. A? Uh, we could go there and fetch him, I would think, sir. We'll wait, Mr. Hughes. Then did you show him to his room? No, sir. He said there was some business still to be done and he went out. And then he came back and he was carrying a parcel. And done up in green paper. Like the ironmonger he uses, sir. How did you know? And what was in this parcel? Oh, I don't know, sir. He kept it in his hand. And when he came back, he went to bed. After we had a nice cold supper. And sir. he kept the parcel with him when he retired. Uh, yes, sir. And, and then when he went out this morning. And didn't come back? He said he needed a shave. As he did indeed, sir. He was bearded like a prophet, sir. And didn't come back? I think he forgot about my four and six and caught a bus to tame like he said. 
There's one about noon, sir. Or maybe you'll send it to me from there. Ouija, if you want. Is there a police station in town? In town, sir. I think so, sir. Oh, but I'll get my money back. I don't want to have the police talking to Mr. Podmore about that, sir. Nevertheless, the police are going to talk to him, Mrs. Abernathy. But not about that, I can assure you. Before I talked to the police at Tame, I asked some other questions in Oxford. Of the ironmonger. Yes, I know the bloke that was peddling vacuum cleaners here. Cost me money, too, he did. I sell vacuum cleaners myself. But I've no cheap wire purchase arrangements like he has. I think it was real cheek, him coming into my place yesterday to, to buy a hammer and a chisel for me. Though he did pay me. That was my money. Abernathy will skin me. And the barber, Dusty Miller. Please, he was pointed out to me more than once, this peddler. What more he calls himself? As he walked into my place of business yesterday morning, carrying a green paper parcel that clanked and a set of ginger whiskers down to his collar button. I shaved him, never asked him to see the colour of his money, and he gave me my sixpence, all right. It's the last copper I've got, he says, with a great orate laugh, and pops off. And didn't I see him two hours later, as drunk as a duke in Charlie Wilson's public house, and offering to buy me beer? Of course he had money, the best part of ten pounds, all tied up with a black and white checkered air ribbon. And when I said, you've got money now, didn't he say, I've been visiting a lady? Uh, my dear sisters, the ten pounds was tied up with a black and white check of air ribbon she wore when she was a small child in Pontypridd, in Glamorganshire. Hello. It's Superintendent Weston of Scotland Yard speaking. Please put me through to the police station in Tame. Tame which is a country town of about 3,000 population, is about 12 miles north of the city of Oxford. It is a typical small English country town, too close to the other largest cities to have retained its ancient importance as a market town. I had taken into consideration that visitors are comparatively rare in Tame. After asking the Tame authorities to report to me at Oxford by telephone, I asked to be put through to Aylesbury. Aylesbury. Just across the border between Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire is a town of nearly 30,000. It is a well-known center for straw and laces and is a municipal borough, the capital of the county of Buckinghamshire. Travelers by bus from Oxford to Aylesbury transfer at Tame, a few miles away. As I anticipated, Tame knew nothing about a vacuum cleaner salesman named Podmore and answering to the meager description I was about to give them. Aylesbury was more reassuring, however, and about midnight the 1st, August 1st, the first day of the bank holiday weekend, I received a telephone call from Sergeant Urquhart there. Thank you, Sergeant Urquhart. Yes, sir, at Elsbury. Now, sir, as far as we've been able to discover, your man is not in Elsbury. Oh, too bad. Well, sir, we're not sure he hasn't been here. What's that? <laughs> Perhaps I should say, sir, we are sure he has been here. Oh, good, then, I hope. Yes, sir, if he was here, we're reasonably sure. At least a vacuum cleaner salesman was here, but his name seems to have been Hugh. Hughes? Yes, sir. Arthur Hughes, sir. Arthur Hughes. My name. I think that's our man, Sergeant. Is he still there, then? Sir, I think my Uncle Dan has done a terrible thing. Your Uncle Dan? What's your Uncle Dan got to do with it? Well, sir, he owns the hotel where the man was staying, sir. What did he do? He chucked the beggar out, sir. What? Why? What's the matter, sir? Why? Why? Tell me that, Sergeant. Did he get it? Yes, sir. The clerk gave it to him. And then my uncle Dan found out about it, and he went to this vacuum cleaner fellow's room, and he said, quite properly, I'll have my money now, if you please, mister. And the vacuum cleaner man said, I haven't any money, and he didn't, so my uncle chucked him out, and where he is now, I don't know. Your uncle Dan? Isn't he at the hotel? The vacuum cleaner man, sir. He's gone? Yes, sir. He seems to be. Well. What did you know, sir? He's gone. Oh. You don't know where he is? 
suitcases in the hotel, sir. He brought it in with him when he came back, and Uncle Dan made him leave it there, sir. Tell him to keep it there. Do you hear me, Sergeant? Yes, sir, I hear you. Uh, yes, sir, yes, I'll tell him. What do you want me to do then, sir? Put your uncle in jail. What? Come on with me, Mr. Hughes. Be to goodness, sir. Where are we going, then, Superintendent? We're going to Ellsbury. I think we found the man that murdered your sister. In the hotel room at Ellsbury, we found the suitcase in the room where the guest had left it when he had been told he was no longer welcome. Arthur Hughes watched me as I opened it, watched me as I lifted it up and turned it over. What is that? This is a hammer. Uh, this is a chisel. That is what he bought at the iron is then. That's where one buys things like this. Why did he carry things like this about with him, then? Are these the tools of a vacuum cleaner salesman? If you will pardon me, I should say they are the tools oh, of the murderer. No. Oh, yes. Do you suppose that, that my sister... Tell me. I don't know. Look. What's this? What? These. What are these? Red crumbs on the floor here. Did they, make, did they not fall out of the suitcase too? wonder what they are. Here, look at the hammer. What? The label's been scraped off the handle. How shall we tell that it is the armor we bought? How shall we tell it what is? I think I know why the hammerhead's so clean. Why is it? It had blood on it. Oh, please. My, my, my poor sister. And the chisel? Mm-hmm. It's clean, too. Quite clean. You'd have to have it clean. If indeed he is the man who did it. We can't prove he's the one. No? Not yet. My, 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 my poor sister. We only knew where he is. Yes, if we could find him. I wonder if he gave an address when he came here the first time. I could not tell, I'm afraid. He wrote any letters or anything. Who would that be? I don't know that either, Superintendent. Can I say it? Yes? I'm Sergeant Urquhart, sir, of the Buckinghamshire Constabulary. I don't speak station, sir. I told you... About time you got here. Where's your uncle? You said arrest him, sir. What shall I do? Let him out. Uh, yes, sir. And then? Wait, Sergeant. I want to find this man. Hughes, sir? I'm Hughes, officer. Are you the... Well, isn't he... Oh. I beg your pardon, sir. What I want to know is, did this man who called himself Hughes give any address when he came here? Or did he write any letters? Did he say anything about where he lives? I don't know, sir, but we could ask the attendant in the commercial room next door. It's, it's, it's where letters are generally written, sir. Then come along, then. Come along, Mr. Hughes. Yes, sir. Through that door, sir. This one? Yes, sir. Come along. Joe! Oh, Joe! Joe! Yes, sir. You've left for the bank holiday, I fancy, sir. I see. Here, are these blotters. On the table, sir? On the table. Well, that's where the guests generally block their letters, sir. Not convenient. Have you got a mirror, Sergeant? Mirror, sir? Mirror. Looking glass. A mirror, man. There's one on the wall, sir. There is indeed, sir. Shall I take it down? I'll get it, sir. Oh. Don't drop the blaster thing. I'll look out, I tell you. I've got it, sir. Uh, what do you want me to do with it? See these signatures on the blotter? They're reversed, sir. Th that's a characteristic... Look in the mirror. Oh. I can read them now, sir. Can you, then? I can read them, too, sir. Look, here is me. And better not bother with that one. What's this one, sir? Dear Uncle De... Oh, <laughs> I wrote that myself. I can't read that one either, sir. Read all the others and write them down. Perhaps one of them is this. Well, sir... I want them all copied down, and I want every one of them investigated, Sergeant. And if one of them is the man that murdered my sister... Someone murdered your sister, mate. If we find him, I will kill him with my own hand. Oh, no, you won't, mate. I swear I will. Don't scrubble, mate. We'll hang him. <laughs> We 
when I went back to the other room and sat down, my eye fell on the curious objects that had fallen out of the suitcase I was already beginning to think of as the murderers. The things that looked like, as Hughes had said, breadcrumbs. I picked one up. It wasn't a breadcrumb. It was a tightly rolled wad of paper. Curiously, I dipped it into a glass of water. It opened up like a tiny flower petal, and I saw printing on it. I opened it up. I reached for another and repeated the performance. Another. Same results. I put them all together after a manner of a jigsaw puzzle. The printing was clear now. High-grade steel forging. And there was something else, too. Bloodstains. There on the missing labels from the hammer and the chisel from the man who came to change the dust back on the vacuum cleaner in the house of the little old lady in St. Clement Street. I hardly noticed when the sergeant and the brother came in with the list of dresses they had copied from the reflection of the names on the blotter. But four weeks later, when all the addresses had been checked by policemen working round the clock, there was one of them where a man named Podmore lived. And he was an itinerant salesman of vacuum cleaners. And when the time came, he confessed. And at the Oxford Assizes next spring, he was sentenced to hang. And hang he did. And Arthur Hughes smiled when he heard about it. On Whitehall 1212 today, Lester Fletcher as Superintendent Weston. Others in the order of their appearance, Harvey Hayes, Willem Williams, Patricia Courtley, Gordon Stern, and Guy Spall. This is Lionel Rico speaking. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed by Willis Cooper. Blood and blood plasma are of vital importance in treating wounded men. They are the one treatment for which no amount of medical skill can provide a substitute. To give our soldiers in Korea the blood they must have for life, 300,000 pints a month are needed. The American Red Cross will not take your blood unless it is perfectly safe for you to give it. And if you're one of the forgetful people, think it over. You'll realize that giving blood is about the most important thing you have to remember. So before you forget again, phone your local Red Cross blood collection center. Tell them you want to give your blood to save an American life. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. One, two, one, two, quickly. For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These accurate records are drawn from the Scotland Yard files by special permission of Commissioner Sir Harold Scott. They're true in every respect except for the names of the participants, which, for obvious reasons, have been changed. The research has been done by Mr. Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express, and the stories for radio are written and directed by Mr. Willis Cooper. Here are the participants in case number 498MR381. Neville Hutchins, shopkeeper. Yes, I saw the man. Rafe Dibble, taxi driver. I drove him to Charing Cross. Arthur Cunningham, the estate agent. I never saw the woman before. Mrs. Veronica Fanshaw, housewife. The woman was a most unsatisfactory housekeeper. Mrs. Leonie Fournier, housekeeper. Inspector Harold Lowe of Scotland Yard. One of these persons is a murderer. Which one do you suspect? Incidentally, if you're looking for what the Americans call cops and robbers with the goods and the bad shooting it out, or if you expect lean, pipe-smoking men in fore-and-aft hats saying, follow that cab, you may be disappointed. 
The job of a policeman, says Commander Rawlings of the Yard, is 95% perspiration, 3% inspiration, and 2% luck. But we have our moments. We have our moments. Now, having concluded my little sermon for today, and if you're still interested, come along with me. This is Scotland Yard's Black Museum. I'd like you to meet Chief Superintendent John Davidson, the caretaker. Yes? It's Inspector Lowe, sir, and a friend. Maybe come in. Well, by all means. Come along. Chief Superintendent William Davidson. Well, how do you do? I expect Lowe has told you all about this place, has he not? Well, uh, frankly, no, sir. I was hoping... Quite... Well, these cases you see around the wards contain articles of all sorts which were important to us in the solution of crimes. On the other room, there are our murder weapons. Now, here are bits of evidence each of which has played its part in the conviction of a criminal. There's a blood-stained jacket and a plaster cast of a dead man's hand. Well, what did you wish especially to see, though? Case number 498MR381, sir, if you... Oh, the Fournier case. Right, sir. Oh, here in this corner. Come on. That's a trunk, rather large, old-fashioned black trunk with a heavy lid. It served its purpose admirably. Telephone call received by Inspector Harold Lowe at Scotland Yard, 2.55 p.m., Monday, 10th May, 1948. Inspector Lowe speaking. This is Bannerman in charge of the left luggage room at Charing Cross Station, sir. Yes? We've come across something queer here, sir. Something that I'm afraid wants investigating. What seems to be wrong, Bannerman? I think you ought to see it, sir, really. Well, what is it, it's man? It's a left luggage ticket, sir, that was left by one of the station bookmen. Book, 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 book. A left luggage ticket? Yes, sir. Well, uh, don't you think... The ticket is for a large, heavy black trunk, which was left here several days ago, sir. Oh, well, that does alter matters, doesn't it? I'm afraid so, sir. Well, I'll be right over. Bannerman, is it? Ah, uh, you, Bannerman? Yes, Detective Inspector Lowe, you spoke to me on the telephone. Oh, yes, sir. Will you just step inside, sir? I'll be away for a few minutes, George. Well, I'll be back. Will you come with me, sir? I've the ticket in my desk, sir. <clears throat> Here, sir. Oh. Well, what's wrong with it? It was found on the up platform by one of the boot blacks a few minutes after I'd issued it, sir. Well, the owner lost it. It's exactly the way it was found, sir. All crumpled up in a ball. Yeah. Yes, I see what you mean. A man could lose a ticket, sir, but he wouldn't throw it away just a few moments after he got it, sir. Do you remember the man? Oh, I don't remember him at all, sir. I don't remember if he was a man. What? It might have been a woman, sir. We handle so many people here. Well, is the trunk still here? You said it's for a trunk, didn't you? Yes, sir. It's right over in that bay, sir. Well, let's have a look at it, please. Follow me. There, sir. The black one. You know, the number's checked. Ah. Uh, it's, it's very heavy, sir. Let me give you an hand. Yeah. Hmm. The lock doesn't look very strong. Well, I'll have it open. Hmm. Full of floor. Cloth isn't that heavy. There's something else in here. Take the end of this piece. <gasps> the trunk and its contents were removed at once to Scotland Yard for examination. The contents were taken to the pathological laboratory. Detective Sergeant Sean Flannery and I examined the trunk itself. It seems to be very old. It's in good condition, though. Uh, they don't make goods like this nowadays. Well, we shall have to have it tested for dabs, of course. Uh, fingerprints. We'll find millions of them, sir. Man of the left luggage rooms, our own people. The late occupants. <laughs> and from the age of it, we're likely to find Oliver Cromwell's. Up a top. What's this? What? I'm afraid our French have removed that. What? It's a label. Hey, give us the magnifying glass, will you? Uh, answer it, will you, old boy? All right. Larry here. Oh, all right. Well, send me down here to watch, please. What is it? Report from the laboratory. They're sending it down. Report from the Pathological Laboratory, Scotland Yard, delivered to Inspector Lowe, Tuesday, 11th May, 1948. Reference 498-MR381. The body found in the trunk is that of a Caucasian female about 40 years of age. Black hair and eyes, perfect teeth, height 5 feet 1 inch, weight 104 pounds when alive. Bruise on back of head, not cause of death. Oh. Bruises and superficial abrasions caused by fingernails on neck. Sure, 
Sure, well, preliminary examination indicates death caused by manual strangulation. Outer garments missing. Body clad in undervest bearing laundry mark 316 ADFA. Black nylon stockings, new, size six and a half. Body wrapped in cotton dust, a slightly stained with blood, same type, type OA. That found on neck. Body removed to mortuary. Please advise disposition of other articles. See Schedule A attached. Ah. Pathology Laboratory, please. Excuse me, Inspector. Yes, Flannery. Hold it a sec, please. Inspector Lowe here. What is it, John? I finally made out the printing on that label. And? Neville Hutchins, second-hand articles, Brixton. Nip off and see the fellow. Does he remember the man who bought it and all that, you know? Best got once. All right, sir. Hello? Hello? I'm sorry. Who is it? Gwyn? Look, Gwyn, suppose you take the fingerprints of the lady from the trunk and pass them onto the print file at once. Perhaps we can discover who she was. Oh, you have done that. Good, good. She might have been one of our former customers. After all, really nice girls aren't often found in trunks, are they? Thanks, Wynn. Ask them to let me know, will you? Thanks. Oh, uh, and get photographs of those laundry marks checked with our list, too, will you? You have done so. Well, I shall buy you a beer one of these days, Gwyn. Over and out. <sighs> Three irons turning a dull red in the fire. Fingerprints, label, laundry mark. Not bad, Inspector Lowe. Not too bad at all. Conversation between Detective Sergeant Sean Flannery and shopkeeper Neville Hutchins at the latter's shop in Brixton. I'm Detective Sergeant Flannery of Scotland Yard, Mr. Hutchins. Well, uh, what do you want? You carry second-hand luggage in stock, sir? Well, what about you? Trunks, perhaps? If you're looking for stolen goods, I don't know anything about any. Anyway, I haven't got any trunks. I sold the last one I had something more than a week ago. Indeed. In bloody deed. Uh, so what? The ancient black leather one? Well, how do you know? Well, we found it. Yeah, where? I should say that's none of your business at present. That the one they found the body in at Charing Cross? How do you know? Well, I read the papers. Perth Elskins had half a column about it in today's Express. Uh, that's the one. Well, how do you know? It's your label. No. When did he sell it? Well, let me look. Yeah, here we are, here we are. May the 2nd. You got the buyer's name? Now, this ain't Selfridge's, mate. You remember what he looked like? Well, he was tall uh, and thin. Complexion? Dark hair, dark eyes. Dressed? Yeah, I don't remember that. What, did he do it, you think? Would you recognize him again? Well, of course I would. If he walked in here a year from today. Tall, thin, dark. Well, we may ask you to identify him. Thank you. You're, of course, to say nothing whatever at this call. Now, look here, Mr. Ray. If you do, we shall be very seriously annoyed with you, Hutchins. I've got nothing to conceal. I'm an honest man. And if your tall, thin, dark man hears of it, you might just find yourself inside a trunk one day. Yeah. Just mind your eye, Mr. Hutchins. <laughs> I shall be seeing you again. Yeah. Good day, sir. <laughs> Report of the Fingerprint Division, Scotland Yard, to Inspector Lowe. Uh, no record at all, sir, of the prints. None at all, eh? Uh, none whatever, sir. Uh, shall we continue our search? Interpol, the provincial police, the American FBI? No, not until I ask you. That'll do for the present, thank you. The laundry marks on the dead woman's clothing were identified by a laundry in Shepherd's Bush as having been issued to a family named Fanshaw. Further inquiry disclosed the fact that Mrs. Veronica Fanshaw, the only woman member of the family, was alive and well. She was summoned to Scotland Yard by Inspector Lowe. These are your laundry marks, then? No doubt about it. But the clothing's not mine. That I'm quite certain of. Yes, I'm sure they wouldn't fit you. They're very small. They're very cheap, obviously. Vulgar. I should never wear things like those. Have you any idea how your laundry mark could... I've no idea. Unless... Unless what, madam? We had a cook housekeeper a short time ago. She was one of those tiny women. And where is she? What was her name? Her name is Leonie Fournier. She's French. Is she still in your employ, Mrs. Fanshawe? She is not. I discharged her more than a week ago. I don't know where she is. Why did you discharge her? I did not approve of her. She'd been divorced and, well, you know these French women. Besides, she was the most unsatisfactory housekeeper. I see. You disliked her a great deal. I... I disapproved of her. Will you come with me a moment, please, Mrs. Fanshaw? Why, well, whatever for? Will you come with me, please? Where are we going? If you'll follow me, please. What is this place? 
This table here, if you please. This is an awful thing. This is our mortuary, Mrs. Fanshawe. Did you ever see this woman before? It's Leon. Your former housekeeper? I always knew she'd come to this. Thank you, Mrs. Fanshawe. Other visitors to Inspector Lowe's office, Scotland Yard, between 12th May and 15th May, 1948... Bus conductor Simon Norwich of Houndsditch. I was reading in the paper, sir, about this here black truck the bloke murdered the woman in. All right, I did, sir. Well, see, you know, there was a fellow got on my bus at Brixton the afternoon about the fourth of the month. He had a large black truck with him. Ah? Uh-huh. You know, I was half a mind not to leave him aboard, sir. But the bus was empty, and I says to myself, poor sir, oh, with that great big heavy thing, so I let him on. Though it is against the rules. Heavy, you said. Well, not heavy after all. Same bulk is the word, but it was big and black and old-fashioned, like a piper says. Would you recognize him again, Norris? The only thing I remember about him is he had dark black hair, sir. Where did he get off your bus? Oh, I remember that, sir. Rochester Row in Westminster. I helped him off the truck. The last I seen was him staggering down Rochester Row with his great oak and black trunk on his up in the rain. Say, was he the murderer, sir? Rafe Dibble, taxi driver of Clarkenwell Road. The garage sent me, sir. They said they had a notice from Scotland Yard asking about any driver that had a fare to Charing Cross Station on Monday the 10th who had a large trunk as luggage. Had you such a fare? Yes, sir, I did. Would that be the murder trunk locked in all the papers, sir? Where did you pick up this fare, uh, Dibble? It was a very heavy trunk, sir. The gentleman says it's full of books, sir. Books, I says, feels more like a dead body, sir, I says. And he just snickered. So I roped it onto the luggage rack and took it to Charing Cross. My books, he says. Dead body, I says. And that's what it was, wasn't it? Where did you pick him up? Oh, in the rain, sir. At Rochester Row, right across the street from Westminster Police Station. See? Here's my trip card. Rochester Row. If he's the murderer, sir, I'd know him in a minute. He was tall and thin and had black hair, like an Italian or an Irishman. Tracy of case number 498MR381, 13th May 1948, compiled by Inspector Lowe and Detective Sergeant Flannery, 14th May 1948. Mrs. Fanshawe, number one. Her antipathy toward victim, highly suspicious, watching her closely. Two. Hutchins, the shopkeeper. Uncooperative, but possible suspect. All right. Description vaguely like that of unknown suspect. Tall, thin, dark haired, under constant observation. Myself. Number three. Bus conductor Norwich and taxi driver Dibble state they can identify suspect. Have they seen the shopkeeper Hutchins yet, son? Take them over there tomorrow, sir. Good. Number four, now the victim. No apparent police record. No fingerprint record in our files. Meager reports on... uh, Yes, meager. Reports on her indicate she was quiet, industrious, and of comparatively good deportment, regardless of Mrs. Fanshawe's opinion of her. Well, how about the Rochester Row coincidence, sir? Yes, 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 of course. Number five. Bus conductor says man with trunk alighted at Rochester Row with empty trunk. Taxi driver says he picked up man with heavy trunk at Rochester Row. Detail of constables and detectives under Inspector North commencing search of all buildings in Rochester Row. Very short street. Better put down that Sybil tomorrow. Results will be reported. I think that's about all at the moment, isn't it? Uh, all I can think of, sir. Very well, Sybil. Finish typing it and I'll sign it. Yes, sir. At 8 o'clock the next morning, Inspector North and his detail of 20 detectives and constables arrived in Rochester Row with a Scotland Yard lorry fetching the trunk, carefully covered with a tarpaulin so that it could be exhibited to the tenants for their identification. Followed by the lorry, they went from house to house, questioning every inhabitant. At 6 in the evening, when operations were suspended, the trunk had not been recognized. The next morning at 10.15, Inspector North telephoned me asked me to come at once to 9A Rochester Row on the fourth floor of a business building. I puffed my way up the four flights of ancient moldy stairs 20 minutes later. Oh. Oh, hello. Uh, what's up, North? Uh, North, this is Mr. Henry Elvinson. Inspector Lowe. How do you know? Good morning, Inspector. I was saying to Inspector North that I recognized the trunk at once. Good, good. I want to sit down. Before you fall down, old chap, 
Well, here you are. Here you are. Now, uh, go on, go on. Uh, um, uh, oh, um, I-, I saw it in the hall outside this room one day last week. Ah, I was right. Whose room was this? Well, unfortunately, I'd never seen him. My assistant rented this place to him on April the 11th. His name, Arthur Cunningham. Where is he? Skipped. Why? He left without notice. The sixth Thursday, that was. What was his business? Well, an estate agent, he said. Left this note on the table there. I got it out of our files. Uh, sorry, gone broke. Paid up to 11th. Please let typewriter people have a machine. Arthur L. Cunningham. Who has been and gone and hopped it. You know, North, there must be another way of making a living. I can give you the name of his bank. You should be able to find him quite quickly through them, sir. Oh, most excellent man, Elphinstone. Now, who will carry me down four flights of stairs to a telephone? At the Camberwell address furnished by Cunningham's bank, the landlady reported to Inspector Lowe that Cunningham had left the place on the 5th, leaving no forwarding address. But she remembered a letter addressed Cunningham had been delivered to the house two days after he had departed. She gave the unopened letter to the inspector, who opened it legally at Scotland Yard and read it eagerly. It was a form letter from the post office telegraphs department. We regret that your telegram, dated 3rd of May, to Mrs. Harriet Cunningham, Greyhound Hotel, Hammersmith, was undeliverable because... Aha! Spec Lowe here. Put me through to Hammersmith, the Greyhound Hotel, Mrs. Harriet Cunningham, at once. I'll wait, yes. The innocent Mrs. Cunningham was only too glad to tell the inquiring friend where her husband was to be found, of course. The Hammersmith police picked him up in a pub that night, and the next day he confronted Inspector Lowe at Scotland Yard. He was quite at ease. No, I'm sorry, I never saw the woman before. <laughs> you know, I'm that old-fashioned character faithful to my wife, Inspector. Well, that's very commendable, I'm sure. Well, I admit I've been about the country a bit since I was demobbed last year, but I assure you all my travels were in quest of that elusive thing, a job. I gather they're rather difficult to come by. I found it. Sir. I, I thought I had a good thing in this estate agent business, but I found myself possessed of nothing but my fare to Hammersmith to my wife. Fortunate she has a good job at the Greyhound there. Wonderful woman, Harriet. It was her ninepence I was buying my gin and it with at the pub where chaps found me. Um, you say you did see that trunk at the place in Ros- Rochester Row? Uh, yes, I, I think I'd seen it. I didn't take any special note of it. Horrible. Quite. Well, you've been quite open with me, and I appreciate it, Mr. Cunningham. You won't mind if I check up on the statements you've made? Oh, of course not, of course not. I have nothing at all to conceal. From. Just as a matter of formality, uh, do you mind having those two chaps who said they'd remember the man with the trunk, the shopkeeper and the taxi driver? Do you mind having them look you over? Oh, of course not. Uh, I do think, though, that you should parade one or two others with me to see if they can vote for one. Uh, isn't that the proper procedure in detective circles? Of course, I'll see to that. If I get them now and bring in one or two others to stand inspection with you... Oh, well, let's get it over with, by all means. I'll get them all at once, then. All right, on with the show. Oh, excuse me, sir. Flannery, go on in. You can help me. I'm just... Just a minute, sir. I was checking on relatives of the murdered woman. Yes, yes, in a moment. This is her former husband. Afternoon, sir. You were married to Leonie Pounier? Yes, sir. Have you been in the mortuary? We just came from there, sir. He recognized her. Bloody awful, sir. Tell the inspector why you divorced her. Oh, I didn't divorce her. I just left her. Tell the inspector why. Well, she was running around with another man. Tell the inspector his name. Arthur Cunningham, sir. I was very happy as I ushered Sergeant Flannery, Sergeant Anstruther, Inspector North and Constable Fletcher into my office. Stand along the wall there, I said, in the bright light with Mr. Cunningham. I picked up the telephone. Will you please send in those three men in the waiting room? Come in, gentlemen. Now, if you will look at this group of gentlemen very carefully, please, and tell me if you recognize one of them as the man you saw with the black trunk. Now, take your time. Yes, Mr. Hutchins, you sold a man the trunk. Is he present? Oh, I don't see him. Are you sure? Positive. Well, you assured me you could recognize him. Not one of these. Mr. Norwich, do you recognize the man who boarded your bus with the trunk? Well, that, that tall one with the glasses. That's Inspector North. Well, if it I don't have any idea, sir. You devil. Is the man who hailed your cab among these gentlemen? No, sir. He had a moustache. Nobody here's got a moustache. Oh, that's right. 
You're certain that you do not identify any of these men? Well, then I take it, Inspector, that none of us are criminals, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. All of you. Inspector Lowe's office, 11.30 that night. Only one lonesome light burning. The two men silent, thinking. Oh, must you always be lighting that stinking pipe? Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Sorry, Sean. I didn't mean to speak so sharply. I know. I'm just as upset as you are. I was so sure. Teach me a lesson, I hope. Well, those chaps were so certain they could identify him. They couldn't. The taxi driver. I talked to him afterwards. That tall chap, he says. He, he might have been the one, except he hadn't no moustache. I know. And his hair was the wrong color. A man can shave off a moustache. Yes, and dye his hair. Dye black hair? Well, you can make it lighter. I suppose. Well, I don't know whether Cunningham did it or not, but I'm definitely of the opinion that the murder was committed in that place in Rochester Row where the trunk was. An ideal setup for a murder. Tenant gone, place empty, the renting agent, that Elphinstone chap. Why, he didn't even miss Cunningham till the next morning. The woman's husband said that she'd been running around with Cunningham. Now, she might have gone there to see him and found him gone. Friend husband could have been following her, caught her and cracked her neck. He was tall and thin. He had dark hair and a mustache. Well, uh, we're not in such bad shape after all. Look, North and his crew are over there at Rochester Road taking the place apart, brick by brick. They're going to work all night and perhaps they'll find something. I devoutly hope so. Anyway, I'll have this husband fellow picked up and printed in case he left any marks of his paddies about over there. Well, we start all over again. I'll... Go home and get a night's sleep, and we'll have our little group of talented identifiers in here early in the morning to tell us that's our boy. You know, you're an extremely clever man, Sergeant Flannery. Oh, he'll have them all here first thing. Yes, Inspector Lowe? Who? Oh, yes, Mac. Well, we were just leaving, but... Oh? Not really. Of course we'll wait. Come on down. Mac, up in the laboratory... Says he's been working on the contents of the trunk. Oh, not the late Mrs. Pornia, the other things. And he wants to show us something. Did he say what? But well, I didn't give him a chance. He's fetching it down to us, whatever it is. Well, I hope he hurries. Come in. Hello, Mac. Glad I caught you. It's just enough chance, but I... What have you got? What have you got? Well, uh, this is the duster that was in the trunk uh, with a late lamented. Hmm. That looks awfully clean. I just washed it. I wanted the blood stains. Uh, look here under the light. Yeah, you see it in the corner? Bloodstains covered it up before, and it's uh, pretty faded. Yeah. Greyhound Hotel, Hammersmith. The hotel where Cunningham's wife works. Is it important, Inspector? It's rather small for a hangman's new smack, old boy, but I fancy it will serve. It will serve. Now, Sean, you get friend Cunningham out of his comfortable bed at about the time Dawn is mucking about with the rosy fingers. And you grasp Mr. Cunningham between the thumb and forefinger of the right hand and fetch him here to the waiting room. And watch him wait. Till I consent at last to see him. Yes, sir. And then what, sir? And then you and I'll make a short visit to the mortuary. What for? To see if the unfortunate lady on the slab is in there is still smiling. <laughs> Seven fifteen the next morning, a rather tousled, bleary-eyed Cunningham arrived at Scotland Yard with Sergeant Flannery and was seated to wait for my arrival. When I arrived at nine thirty, he stopped me. What's up now, Inspector? Oh, just wanted to talk some things over with you. See you in a few minutes. Uh, but look, I've not had my breakfast. Well, I'll be with you in just a few moments. Oh, Inspector Lowe. Oh yes, North. I've uh, I've something for you to look at at once. Just wait a bit, Cunningham. I'm sure you don't mind. Uh, but Inspector, what, what do you want? Nice going, North, I said. A very good act. But North looked at me quite seriously. Not an act, Bob, he said. We found something. He handed me a little bottle cap. What's this, I asked. Read it. We found it in the fireplace of Cunningham's place last night, alongside these hairpins. Now, you read what it says on the bottle cap. Madame du Maurier's golden hair rinse. Why, North, I think Mr. Cunningham will be delighted to see that. After he's waited and sweated another hour or two. I let him in after two more hours. I'm afraid he was a rather pitiable sight. Flannery's cryptic remark to him as he passed by, something about new evidence, 
had ruined his sorely tried composure. And the waiting and speculating and wondering. I let him speak first. I... I decided I'd better tell you the truth, Inspector. I let him wait. What I would like to know is uh, this. I did kill her. Uh, but it, it was accidental. I, I didn't mean to do it. It, it. it was purely an accident. She came to my room. You did know her, then? Uh, I, I knew her slightly. She came to my rooms and, and she demanded money and she threatened me when I told her I had none. How did she threaten you? Hey? How did she threaten you? Uh, she, she struck at me and I automatically uh, struck back and then she fell and hit her forehead on the fender of the fireplace and then... Wait, wait, wait. The bruise was on the back of her head. Uh, and I got, got panicky and I stuffed her body in a truck. When did you bleach your hair? What? Uh, I... I but I tell you, I didn't murder her. I killed her accidentally, I tell you, accidentally. Listen to me, Cunningham, before you say any more. What, what? Arthur Cunningham, I arrest you on a charge of willful murder. I warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and used in evidence against you. Now, go on with your story, if you like. The crime. Cunningham's admission at the trial as he had lured his former inamorata to his office to put an end to her threats of exposure, together with his eventual identification by the shopkeeper, the taxi driver, and the bus conductor, the stolen duster from the Hammersmith Hotel in which the body was wrapped, and other evidence produced by Scotland Yard were of great importance at his trial. The verdict. My lord, we, the jury, find the prisoner guilty of willful murder. The sentence. To be hanged by the neck until you are dead. And may God have mercy on your soul. You have heard the true story of Scotland Yard case number 498-MR-381. The names of all participants have been changed for obvious reasons. The research on Whitehall 1212 is done by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express, and the stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Next, listen for Tales of the Texas Rangers on NBC. Whitehall, one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the true, authentic stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have for obvious reasons been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Here are the participants in case number 693-MR-966. Lance Corporal John Latimer of the Royal Corps of Signals. It was my lorry, right enough. Signaler Lewis Ruling of the same company. It only hadn't rained that night. Mrs. Elsie Avery, who lost her son. He was a lively lad, but he never done any harm. Miss Hartley, the colonel's daughter. I was raised in the army, and I know what I see. Superintendent Robert Lester of Scotland Yard. If you will come into the Black Museum here with me, I think Chief Superintendent John Davidson can show you what we started with on this case. Here's quite a collection in here of items that have figured in various cases we've worked on here in Scotland Yard. Some of them successfully, and some of them unsolved to date, shall we say. Come with me, please. Ah, here you are, John. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson, who has a long and distinguished record with us. Well, how do you do? 
Say, I finally found those things, Bob. Ah. I mislaid them, I'm afraid. Now, don't be afraid to look. They're not at all gruesome. Some folks seem to think we have a kind of chamber of horrors here. But I assure you, these things are quite innocuous for the most part. Now, this is the handkerchief. Still quite clean, isn't it? Wasn't always so clean, Bob. See, an ordinary cocky-colored handkerchief, such as millions of soldiers carried during the war. <laughs> I carry one. And this, you don't recognize it? It's a gas mask cover. See the shoulder strap here? Oh, no. Soldiers didn't carry this kind. This is red leather, or imitation leather, if you will. It was the type children carried with them. A child did carry this one. You can still see his name inside it here, written in his own kid's handwriting. Philip Ainsley Avery. Philip Avery is dead. But this little red leather bag helped Superintendent Lester start a man on the early morning stroll that ends on the gallows trap. I was fortunate enough to be called by the Bucks Constabulary at once on this case. Too many times Scotland Yard has called in only after the local police have exhausted their every resource. But those chaps in Buckinghamshire wanted help at once and badly in this little village in early November 1941. Station superintendent... Uh, no, I'll not tell you his name. Brief me. He tossed the gas mask case, the one you just saw, on the desk. This is all we found so far. Rather a bright-colored gas mask case for a boy to carry. Uh, how old is he? I don't know whether we should say is or was superintendent. Hmm... Been looking for him how long now? Three and a half days now. And this is all you found? Aye. I'm scared if he's lost and if he'd throw away his respirator case. Where'd you find it? About a mile from here, down the road in the ditch. Well-traveled road? Not very. Get anything from his parents? Father's dead and mother's well as you'd expect. He was the only child. What did she think? Well, first she thought he'd run away. Mm. He was quite dotty over the army, and she thought he'd be hanging around some camp or other in the vicinity. He wasn't. Well, they've all moved out last one a week ago. Oh, except for that convoy that went through here the day after the kid disappeared. Could they have taken him along, a mascot, perhaps? <laughs> Checked them first bloody thing. Not with them? No. Their O.C. telephoned me from somewhere over the East Coast. Nice chap, and worried. Said he'd turned out the whole party and no one had heard of the kid. Good man. And the countryside is turned out, you said? Not an able-bodied man in the village that isn't out in the country searching. They'll find him, perhaps. That's what I'm afraid of. Yes. Well, where do you want to start? Who saw the boy last? His mother. He was just setting off for school. Hmm. What about her? Well, frankly... Oh... I've seen mothers who treated their kids better. I'd better see her, hadn't I? Killing her kid's awfully nasty, Superintendent. Yeah. She's my sister-in-law. Oh. Her brother's wife. I, uh... I thought the kid's name was Avery. Oh, she met a day after my brother was killed at Calais. Where is Avery? Killed at Tobruk. She must be pretty bitter. Bitter? I'll have a talk with him. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's all right. I was rather fond of my young nephew. Probably why I telephoned you so quickly. Yeah. Thought you said every man in the village was out looking for the boy. They are. Who are all those chaps, then, coming down the road? Well, they're carrying something. Steady, steady. It's my sister-in-law. That's it. They found him. In my time, I've seen a good many murdered persons. I shall probably see a good many more before I turn in my warrant card. But this one... An 11-year-old schoolboy. 
I can still see that great blue bruise on his forehead and his throat. I've got kids myself. His mother, she was quite controlled when I talked with her. You'd better take me in, Superintendent. I did it. How did you do it, Mrs. Abrams? Smith was such a lively boy, but he... He never meant any harm. Everyone says he was a fine boy, Mrs. Avery. I called him a little hellion. He was always talking about the army and how he was going to join up the minute he came of age. I hate the army. Yes. It's taken Philip's father from me and Avery. I couldn't bear the thought of losing him to it. I raised my hand to my son. <coughs> He said it was his duty. I thrashed him so many times, but he was stubborn. Duty, I said. What about your duty to your mother? He was all ready for school. With his little gas mask case, standing in the door. Somebody, he said. Somebody's got to take Daddy's place. Just like a kid talks. Daddy's place. Oh, Mr. Avery's. And I... I said slapped his face. I could cut off my hand. And he... He gave me such a look and went away and I never saw him again until... I sent him to his death. I murdered him. The army got him, too. I went away from that stricken woman. What else could I do? She was obviously convinced that she was responsible for the boy's death. But if her story was true, then that was a matter for her own conscience. If it was not, well, if she had killed the boy, there was time enough. The divisional superintendent drove me to the place where the body had been found in his own car. It was a side road off the main highway. Little travelled, and the local constable pointed out the place. I was right there, sir. I marked it with a stick. I was with a searching party. We came across the road here, and... Sammy Roberts, he seen that red gas mask bag lying on the edge of the ditch right over there. We picked it up and we was looking around like, and I spotted the body lying right down there. Lying on his back, he was. Like he was asleep with his little arms folded on his chest. I, I thought he was asleep till I saw the blood. Though there weren't much of it for the rain, we run over here and and then we saw the mark on his forehead. He's dead, all right. And quite peaceful, as I said. That's all, sir. Be no other cars along here since you found them, then? Only one or two, sir. Where did all that oil come from, then? Where, sir? Down there. Oh, I, I don't know, sir. Looks like crankcase oil. The car's been standing there. Some time ago, though, the rain's washed it out, partly. Like it washed away all the fingerprints on the gas mask bag, sir. Certainly looks as if a car or a lorry's been standing here. Could those be its tire marks? Constable, see that no one that comes along here gets near those tire marks. You want to make a plaster cast of them, sir? Yes. Well, Nobby Clark back at the station knows how to make them, sir. He, he was at the police college at Hendon. Well, I'll send them out when we go back. Ever covered everything else, McKinnon? I think so, sir. Rain's washed away everything else, but, but I, I didn't notice these marks. Who's there? Stop him, Constable, before he runs on those tire tracks. Stop! Stop, stop! Please, stop! Who is it, you know? I think it's Miss Hartley. She's got the only MG in this spot. Who is she? The daughter of our local retired colonel, Chief oh, Air Raid Warden. to learn about poor Philip Superintendent. He was such a charming boy. What in the world are you doing out here? This is the place where he was found, Miss Hartley. Oh, how dreadful. You have my deepest sympathy, sir. Who's this man? I'm Superintendent Lester of Scotland Yard, madam. Now, don't call me madam. My name's Hartley. Inga Hartley. Lived here for years. My father's Colonel Hartley. Late, late the Green Howard. Been in the army practically all my life. I, What's I... Scotland Yard doing up here? Can't you handle this, Superintendent? Well, I... Oh, no. Your nephew, of course, yes. Sorry. Who's had a lorry up here with a leaking crankcase? I don't quite... a leaking crankcase, as far as I can see it. Who was it, the murderer? Oh, sorry. You've only just come in on this. I saw a lorry over there at the road junction three mornings ago. Army lorry, 
driven by a lance corporal, driving onto the main road from this road. Oh, was that the day the boy was reported missing, Superintendent? Was, huh? You're sure it was an army lorry, Miss? Hartley. Of course I know it was an army lorry, driven by a young lance corporal wearing steel-rimmed glasses, a 1,500-weight ports, and I was raised in the army, sir, and I know what I see. Was there any markings on it, Miss Hartley? Of course. It was a Royal Corps of Signals lorry. How did you know? Why, it had the blue and white patch painted on the front like the signaler's armband. A big 56 was lettered on the side in white, and there was a red and green clover leaf painted on the left front door. Yeah, the trucks of that signal convoy that passed through here... Eh? Huh? I remember the markings on them. Cod pips, that's right. What, sir? Yes, what are you talking about? Yeah, they were marked with playing card pips. Some of them with the ace of spades, some with diamonds and hearts and... and... clubs. There's your clover leaf, Miss Hartley. Gosh, stone the bloody crows. Excuse me, that's the murderer. <laughs> As Miss Hartley roared off in her MG, we headed for the village. It was a thin enough clue, but it was the only one, except for the mother's fantastic confession, but we started to investigate it at once. A telegram to the war office. Request most urgent the present location of Royal Corps signal unit. Passed through this village three days ago, headed for East Coast Port. Information desired in connection with serious crime. Lester, Scotland Yard. No use trying to trace him any other way. Security regulations and all that. We'll have a reply in no time, I'm sure. But if that signals call corporal did kill him, why? Probably struck him with the lorry and got frightened. But what was Phyllis doing over there? The school's in the opposite direction. Maybe he was running away. Excuse me, sir. Would you like to have a look at the things we took from the boys' pockets? I... Would you mind looking, Lester? If there's anything you think I should see... I'll have a look, Constable. He's a string, sir. An old cap badge. That was his father, sir. He always carried it with him. Threepence and coppers. Half a packet of peppermints. Mm. Fair breaks your heart, doesn't it, sir? Poor kid. Go on, Constable. Parky handkerchief. Hold, hold, hold. Hold on a minute. Was that his? Can't say, sir. Hold it out, I... I think we'll take a closer look at it. I believe that's oil on it there. It is, sir. Smells like old crankcase oil to me, sir. Hold it out. I'll tell you what to do with it. Might be quite important. Yes, sir. How was his mother? Took her to a nursing home down the road, sir. She's, uh, I'm afraid she's, you know, not going to get over it. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, is that all... Only this, sir. What? This we found inside the gas mask case, sir. What is it? Looks like the corner of a pound note, sir. All crumpled up. It's a bloody strange place to find a bit of money. How do you suppose he got it? Why, I think, Constable, the important thing to discover is... Who has the rest of it? The murderer. Oh, hello, sir. We've heard from the war office about the signal company. Where are they? Oh, uh, they're at a port of embarkation. Oh. They're due to leave the day after tomorrow for North Africa. If we were to follow up what seemed to be a promising clue, in fact, our only clue, there was, of course, no time to lose. But there were things that we must accomplish before we left for the port of embarkation. And these are the things we accomplished with the aid of Scotland Yard technicians who were rushed to us from London. We have the plaster cast of the tire marks on the road, sir. The samples of oil we took out of the murder here, too. They match the oil stains on the khaki handkerchief. The handkerchief has been washed and examined. What appears to be a laundry mark, K201537, was discovered on the edge of it. It had been partially obscured by the oil stains. The wound on the boy's throat was inflicted after death, which was caused by the blow on the head, sir. One thing we do not know yet, Superintendent, is where that torn piece of the one-pound note came from. I brought Philip's mother here to tell you about that. From Philip's money box. 
What? I knew it once when the, my brother-in-law told me. I took her home to see. Philip had come back and taken it. I looked in the drawer in his cupboard where he kept it. I found it broken open and empty. I knew what had been in it. Thirty-one shillings in coin. I almost gave him a shilling for shining my boots. And the pound note I gave him for his birthday the day before Michaelmas. He'd taken it all to run away on. They murdered him for thirty-one shillings a pound note. The army paid me much more for his father. <laughs> I don't think I shall ever forget that. We arrived at the barracks of the signal company at the port of embarkation shortly after Ravelli. Major Hugh Scott, the young officer commanding who had been an engineer at Wandsworth, was waiting for us in what he called his orderly room. The men were still at breakfast, but the company sergeant major ushered us in. The gentleman from the police, sir. Oh, yes. Thank you, sergeant major. Come in, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, man. Sit down, gentlemen. I'm afraid I don't know what this is all about, you know. I had an urgent message. Yes. I'm afraid we shall have to cause you some inconvenience. This is a very serious matter. Mm-hmm. I gathered that. It, um, it involves murder, sir. Mm-hmm. You're serious. What do you want me to do? Answer some questions first, Miss Major. As well as I can. By the way. Are all your men present? The Sergeant Major will know that. Sergeant Major. Yes, sir? All our people on hand, Sergeant Major. All present at Ravelli, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, they're all here, murderers included, if any. You were encamped at the superintendent's village a few nights ago. Right. He called on us. That's correct. You have one vehicle that has a bad leak in the crankcase. How'd you know that? Well, I'm asking you, sir. We surely have. Our number 56 is 56 of 1,500 weight Fordson. <laughs> I don't know how you know, but... We're having more trouble with this monster. And the uh, markings on this lorry? Well, the usual blue and white signals tab. And then uh, there's the sexual marking on the front door. What's it like, please? An ace of clubs in red and green. Ah. Oh. May we see the driver, please? Of course. Sergeant Major again. Yes, sir? Send in uh, Lawrence Corporal Latimer. Get him out of our palatial breakfast room, please. Yes, sir. Here the... Really? Murderer? We'll see, I hope. A mild-mannered bloke can't see him murdering anyone. Oh, you must be wrong. You have a special laundry mark for your company, Major? <laughs> laundry mark? Well, hardly in this man's army. We found one on this khaki handkerchief. Mm, might be anyone's, old chap. I have one myself. It was in the murdered boy's pocket. Boys? Oh, good Lord, gentlemen, do you... Yes? Latimer, sir. Come in, Latimer. Lance Corporal Latimer, sir. Stand easy, Latimer. What makes you jingle so, Corporal? Jingle, sir? Ring like bow bells. Oh, that's shillings, sir. I've got a pocket full of shillings. Excuse me, sir. Never mind, Corporal. Where did you get those shillings? Why, sir, I... Answer anything these gentlemen ask you, Latimer, that policeman. Oh. I got them from my mate, sir. Who's he? Signal or ruling, sir. Sergeant Major. Yes, sir. Send for ruling. Yes, sir. Thank you, Major Scott. Yeah, that's quite right. Where did he get them? I don't know, sir. Latimer, is this your handkerchief? Looks like mine, sir. May I see it, please? Yes, sir. He, here's the laundry mark they put on it when we were stationed at Leeds, sir. K201537. Yes, sir, that's mine. Where did you lose it? Lose it, sir? I didn't lose it. My pal had it. I lent it to him. Ruling? Yes, sir. Sure? Yes, sir, I'm sure. Do you always wear those steel rim glasses, Latimer? Yes, sir. Always, Wearing them when you met the lady in the M.G. the other morning? What morning, sir? When you turned off the side road onto the main road. When you were to camp before the last one. 
I never saw a lady up there, sir. I, I wasn't even out of the camp. The morning you stopped your lorry on the by road and stayed there a few minutes? I never left the camp, sir. Your lorry was out, I think. I wouldn't know, sir. I, I was working on the generator truck all day, sir. Alone, no doubt. Alone? Yes, sir. Look at this. Do you know what it is? Looks like slabs of plaster, sir. They are plaster casts of tire marks left by your lorry at, um, at a certain place, Latimer. I don't think they could be, sir. The lorry wasn't in a certain place. What certain place? Well, where you sit, sir. We can easily prove it by comparing these casts with your tires. Well, sir, if it, if it was where you said it was, it, it wasn't me driving it. Where did I say it was? Well, I, I don't know, sir. Latimer. Uh, one moment, please, Major. Latimer, do you recognize this? Do you know what it is? No, sir. A red satchel. It was the boy's gas mask case. I never saw it before in all my life, sir. I, I'll take my bloody oath to that. What boys, sir? Oh, blood. Come in. What is it, Sergeant Major? Sorry, sir. What? Ruling's missing, sir. I think he's gone over the hill. Major Scott got the military police on the track of the missing signal ruling at once. We wanted to see him badly enough, but um, Major Scott had reasons of his own. Desertion from a post in wartime is also a very serious matter. While a red cap MP lieutenant, a former Berkshire constabulary sergeant, assured the Major that they'd very soon find the adjective rascal... The superintendent and I went out to compare our plaster cast with the tires on lorry number 56. They matched perfectly. We returned to the orderly room to find the policeman gone and Major Scott sitting staring at the contents of Ruling's kit. Look here at these clothes, gentlemen. Hmm. They're soaking wet. Perhaps they were the ones he wore when... It was raining then. They could very well be, if he did it. I didn't do it. Yes, you said that, Latimer. Look... Here's something on the cuff of this jacket. Well, look here. What's this? Uh, looks like blood. He, he said he cut his hand. Did he? he? Didn't show me the cut, sir. Then you don't know. No, sir. What kind of chap is this man ruling anyway? Well, he's a, he's a great husky young fellow. He, he wears steel rimmed glasses just like I do. He does. Sir, I. I was just thinking. What? Well, when I came back to my bivvy after working on the generator <coughs> lorry all day, I, I had a look at 56. And? and well, she was awfully muddy. Much muddier than the other lorries that had been standing in the park all day. Could someone have taken her out without your knowing it? Could they, Latimer? Would be possible, sir. Ruling? Well, sir, he's, he's supposed to be my pal... But what? He was always drifting off, I remember. Alone. What oh. for? Well, he, he always liked to visit people in the business, he said. What business? The business he was in before he was called up. What's he do? He was a butcher. The MPs brought signaler ruling back at three the next morning... They had found him, they said, standing in front of a... Um, you guess what kind of shop. He was quite self-possessed as he stood in Major Scott's office. Stand easy, Ruling. These gentlemen want to talk to you, Ruling. I say. I think they want to ask you some questions. First, we want to search this man, Major. Go ahead. I'll look at your wallet first, Ruling. I say. Not much in it, sir. We'll see. Yes, sir. I open the wallet... There was nothing in it at all. Nothing except a torn one-pound note. 
Give me the torn piece of Philip's pound note, I said to the superintendent. That was all. It fitted perfectly. Let me do it. Lewis Ruling, I arrest you for the willful murder of Philip Ainsley Avery. I say. And I warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. Ah, I'm not afraid to tell you about it, sir. I killed poor little beggar. He said he was running away to join army. I laughed at him. And he told me he had plenty of money. And I asked him where he kept it. He said in his respirator case. And I reached for it and he yelled. Just like one of them little lambs when you've got it by it back. <laughs> and I got mad. And he jumped out of lorry. And I after him. And he turned to yell at me. And I hit him with a spanner. Just like a cute little lamb. And then he fell down. And I did what you always do to a lamb when you kill it. Lewis Rowling was tried and found guilty of the murder of the poor little lamb. But his counsel appealed on the grounds of insanity. And he was adjudged mentally irresponsible. He was committed to an institution for the criminal insane and died there more than a year ago. You have heard another authentic story from the files of Scotland Yard on Whitehall 1212. Research is prepared by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Today... Whitehall, one, two, one, two. Pretty, please. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These accurate records are drawn from the actual files of Scotland Yard. They're true in every respect, except for the names of the participants, which for obvious reasons have been changed. Research on this exclusive series has been done by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Some of the participants, Donald Rhodes, chief security officer of Heath Row Airport and a former Scotland Yard man. It was a considerable responsibility. Detective Sergeant Vivian Morris of Scotland Yard. I am a suburban housewife. Chief Inspector Robert Sheehan of Scotland Yard's Flying Squad. Step into the Black Museum here with me. I should like to show you something. John? Oh, is that you, Sheehan? Yes, I brought some friends to see you. Yeah, I'll be with you at once. Good afternoon. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson, curator of Scotland Yard's Black Museum. Oh, how do you do? Well, I expect you've come about the relics of the Heath Row affair. Right. Oh, on the table there behind you. All we have. Oh, good. Yes, this one I recognize. Iron bar used by criminals in Heath Row affair. <laughs> some of my hair still sticking to it. Yes, yeah, some of your blood too, Bob. Makes my head ache yet. Uh, this is a uh... briefcase carried by the GOC. And here, <coughs> alterable license plate. Used by the GOC gang. You see, it reads GMU 436. Press the lever, please, John. And hey, presto. It reads CGC 829. Very neat, isn't it? You, of course, don't have the most important souvenir at all here, John. What's that? The half million pound sterling. <laughs> I think that I should tell you a little about our flying squad. It consists of a large number of motor cars, 
all wireless equipped, all very fast, and all kept constantly in superb condition. The Flying Squad is on duty 24 hours a day, a highly mobile force, available on extremely short notice at any point in the entire London area. The members of the Flying Squad are hand-picked, and they're very unusual men. These three are typical. This is Detective Sergeant Nobby Clark of the Flying Squad. Yes, sir. I was one of Lord Lewis's commanders. I was at Norby. Oh, yes, and at Gear. Former leading petty officer Dusty Miller of HMS Phoebe. I am 29 years old. I am 6 foot 2 and I weigh 14 stone 8. I was welterweight champion of my ship, the light cruiser Phoebe. Detective Sergeant Ray Lawton, the Canadian. I, I'm about the, uh, the only policeman you ever heard of who was once a lion tamer. In a circus. Like all policemen in Britain, we seldom carry arms. Although I assure you, we're quite able to use them effectively should the occasion demand them. British policemen rely on the weapons provided by nature, augmented occasionally, of course, by the issue of stout truncheons or rubber cautions, which I understand the Americans call black jacks, and which are wondrously effective. Our job, you see, is not to shoot criminals, but to bring them to justice, or, if possible, to prevent their depredations. We find our methods rather effective. Well, in June 1948, the great new London airport, London had long since outgrown the famous old Croydon airdrome, was operating at capacity, although it was still far from completion. My old friend Donald Rhodes, a veteran Scotland Yard man who was chief security officer at Heathrow, came to call on me at the yard. Can't stay away from the old home place, can you, Donald, I asked. I always know where to come for help, Bob. What's the matter? You know the GOC... General officer commanding what? Ancient and honorable brigade of robbers. Oh, Moriarty? Moriarty, Townsend, Inge, Hughes, West, Simmons. Brown, Bennett, (laughs) dozens of names. Yes, I know him. Or know of him, I should say. Big operator. Biggest. Well, his recce people have been looking us over. What's he after? A nice new airplane for himself? Gold. At Heathrow? We transship thousands of pounds in gold, you know. International affairs. Planes fly in dripping with the stuff. Leave it overnight with us and... uh, Leave it lying about? We keep it as short a time as possible in our bonded warehouse under guard. Strongest safes in the country. Guarded, of course. (laughs) Try and get past them. Much gold? Plane load at a time. How is he going to do it? Tanks or something at dawn? Oh, he'll be much more clever than that. He always has been. That's why he isn't sewing mailbags at Dartmoor today. How'd you get on to all this? I brought the chap along, one of my mechanics. Like to talk to him? Naturally. Come in, will you, Colonel? Yes, sir. This is former Lieutenant John Carn of the Royal Tank Regiment, Bob. Good afternoon, sir. Sit down, Mr. Kern. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Tell Chief Inspector Sheehan about it, will you please, Kern? Well, sir, I've been with Mr. Rhodes for quite some time. The day before yesterday, I received a telephone call from an acquaintance of mine named Edward Mybridge. Where did you know this Mybridge before? We were in prison together, sir. Prison? Well, Mr. Hitler's off flag, 18, in the war. Oh, German prison camp. Yes, sir. I hadn't seen him since we were demobbed and we had a drink together. Oh, let's not waste any time, please, Colonel. Oh, no, sir. Well, he telephoned me again yesterday, sir, and... You had another drink? Right, sir. He asked me how I'd like to make a lot of money, whiskey, and I said fine. I asked how... He said, passing on some information about Heathrow, how it was run, and the guards, and all that. What sort of looking chap was he? Red hair, squint eye, limps on right leg. Sound familiar to you, Bob? Not as what you call him, Colonel. Edward Mybridge, sir? His name's Ginger Johnson in our books. Unmistakable. He's not a nice fellow at all, Colonel. I found that out, sir. Oh? He warned me to say nothing to anyone about our conversation, or he'd have to take steps. I remembered what he did to a German prison guard the day we were released, sir. What? Cut his head off with a mess knife. A very hard character indeed, this Edward Mybridge, alias Ginger Johnson. An old Borstal boy. He had served honorably in the army, but had returned to his old ways immediately upon demobilization. He was well known to us as one of the GOC's most useful lieutenants. This G.O.C., a man of great mental attainments, we knew for the leader of one of the most desperate gangs of lawbreakers in all our experience. 
A genuine storybook mastermind. He had for many years operated like a real general officer commanding, maintaining a small staff of rough-and-ready assistants like Mybridge, and recruiting his actual operatives, his army, for specific jobs as he needed them. Scotland Yard had never been able to lay a finger on him, although he was quite well known to us under a variety of names and ostensible professions. It was obvious that this was to be no small undertaking. He needed to be watched, and thoroughly, and beginning at once. I telegraphed a chief inspector I remembered in a Scottish town not far from Perth, and he reported to me at Scotland Yard the next day. I finished my briefing on what he had to do for us. Oh, I'll recognize him all right, sir. You have a lot of pictures of him. I wish we had him. I'm not to arrest him, sir. You'll not have a chance. He's a most law-abiding man. Now, he's never seen you in his life. And you understand, I don't want him to see you. Oh, okay, aye, sir. I'll want to know everywhere he goes, everyone he talks to. Aye, sir. Don't telephone in. Stay with him till you see him home in the evening. Then come in and report. Oh, okay, aye, sir. And good luck. You'll need it. Oh, I'm a very ordinary-looking man, sir. He'll never see me. Chief Inspector Ross was back in my office in two hours. Uh, <clears throat> well... He, uh, I was standing on the corner, sir, waiting for the bus with him. And just as it stopped, he turned to me and said, It's all right, Chief Inspector Andrew Ross. You can go back to Perthshire. I'm just going to my bank this time. A detective constable we imported from Leeds who looked like a clergyman was addressed pittingly by name by the GOC who trod on our man's toes. The language he employed was quite unclerical. The law, of course, does not permit tapping a suspected man's telephone, so we were forced to continue to try to trail him to find out precisely what he was doing. But infallibly, he recognized our people. Rhodes kept hounding us. He couldn't organize his plans to defend the airport until he knew more of the GOC's probable intentions. And the man outwitted us at every turn. There came a morning ten days or so later when I saw Vivian Morris... One of our women detective sergeants passed my open door. Oh, uh, Sergeant, I call. Good morning, sir. Come in here a moment, will you? Uh, yes, sir. Vivian. Yes, sir. You're a very pretty girl. Why, thank you, sir. Have you ever followed a man? Report of Detective Sergeant Vivian C. Morris to Chief Inspector Sheehan at Scotland Yard. I don't think he recognized me, sir. You look like a young suburban mother, Vivian. I am. Got two girls. I shall send them each a hair ribbon. What happened? Well, I got on his bus one street after him. There was no seat. I spotted him at once. He was staring about the bus, looking for one of us. And we were not there. All at once, he leaped to his feet and offered me his seat. The very mirror of politeness. Yes. Then he rushed to the door, leered at a perfectly innocent man in a Homburg hat, and leapt off the bus almost before it had stopped. I couldn't follow, of course. Naturally. But tomorrow is another day. Report of Detective Sergeant Morris the second day. Yes, sir. He stayed on the bus this time. I had my knitting with me. I'm doing a pair of tartan stockings for Sheila for her birthday. He didn't pay the slightest attention to me. He got off at Waterloo Station with most of the others on the bus, including myself. He went into a small tobacconist shop. Here's the address, sir. Thank you. He was wearing a dark blue coat and a bowler hat and carried a small briefcase. I went into a Lyons Corner house. You know the one, sir. Well, I could watch the door of the tobacconist. I had three buns and three cups of coffee before he came out again, this time wearing a brown tweed suit and hat and without the briefcase. He looked about him sharply and hailed a taxi cab and they drove off. The number of the taxi cab was EBC 414. Thank you, Sergeant. Most well done. Would you just shove me the telephone, please? Thank you. There's an urgent telephone call waiting for you, sir. Who is it? Inspector Green of Traffic, sir. What does he want? He said it's quite important, sir. All right, put him on. Yes, Green? Uh, Green here, Shane. See, I hear you're interested in Ginger Johnson. What about him? He's dead. I refuse to burst into tears. He was apparently struck by a motor car. Where? On the Great West Road near the New Heathrow Airport. Oh, was he killed instantly? Well, he lived only a few minutes after we picked him up. Well, he's out of our hair. Oh, uh, did he say anything? Uh, uh, just a sec. What must he say? He's a token. Oh, uh, say, perhaps you know what he was talking about. What did he say? He said, 
Tell Karen not to drink the tea. It's poisoned. <laughs> Sounds quite Max Romerish, doesn't it? <laughs> You're sure he said tell Karen? Did he say Karen? Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right, Karen. See, hmm. I don't know any Karen. Quite all right, old boy. I do. Oh, uh, <coughs> thank you very much. I hung up on him. Is there anything I can do to help, sir? Yes, go out and get someone started on tracing that taxi cab at once, please. Here, take the paper with a number on it. Right, sir. Will you put me through to Heathrow Airport at once, Chief Security Officer? Oh, good, you're here, Bob. Oh, Donald, I was just telephoning you. Never mind, officer, he's just come in. Look, Don, what about Colonel the T? Eh? Ginger Johnson just got killed. His dying words were to tell your man, Colonel, not to drink the tea because it's poisoned. Tea? What's it mean? I think he was off his rocker. Thought he was still in the German prison camp. Could be. What I came over for, I have a signal from the foreign office. The Americans are sending us some money soon. Much? Mere 388,000 pounds in gold. When? Ten days from today. Wonder if that's what the GOC is getting his sights on. A great many people knew that we were expecting a large amount of gold from America. He has a long nose. That long, do you suppose? You had a great deal of experience with him while you were here at the yard. I wonder. Oh, excuse me, sir. Uh, Come in, Vivian. You know Sergeant Morris, don't you, Donald? Indeed, I do. How are the girls, Vivian? They're fine, sir. Excuse me, sir. Uh, They're checking the taxi driver, sir. They'll telephone you. Good. You can go home now, if you like. You want to try again tomorrow? Of course, sir. Good girl. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night, Mr. Rowe. Good night. What's... What's she doing? She's caught up with the GOC. Find out anything good? Shortly. Look, we'll have to get going on this thing at once, if it is the the new shipment he's after. I know it. There's not much we can do until we have an idea how he intends to try. Pity Ginger Johnson died. He might have told us instead of babbling about poison tea in German prison. She in here? Schattinger here, sir. In the 999 room. Yes, Schattinger. And all the good luck on tracing that taxi cab, sir. Found the driver had just come into the company garage. Had his trip booked with it. Good. The uh, trip at 10.23 this morning was from Waterloo Station to a shop in Sowell. A chemist shop, sir. A chemist shop? Yes, sir. The taxi driver said he saw his fare enter the shop. George Shill, chemist, he said. It. George Shill, I know that name. What George, about George Shill, Shill has been involved in a number of narcotics cases. Yes, I know. Thank you very much. What about George Shill? That's who the GOC was visiting this morning. Is he in the narcotics thing, too? We shall find out, old boy. I wonder where he went from there. Probably to bump off Ginger Johnson. Bump him off? Now tell me why he should do that. Well, good old Ginger might have been looking on the wine when it was red. Bible, old chap, or the whiskey when it is amber, and blabbered about his talk with your man, Kern. The GOC wouldn't like that, would he? He wouldn't know whether Kern had talked to you, and he might have decided to prevent any more talk by Ginger to the wrong bloke. Ah, a little fantastic. But plausible. Where'd they find Ginger? Uncomfortably close to your precious airport on the Great West Road. Ah. Yes. Put me through to Superintendent Trevelyan. Is that you, Trevelyan? She in here. Look, sir, I'd like to have a detail of men at once on an investigating job. Yes, sir, most important. I'd like to have a check made at once of all houses along Great West Road near the new Heath Airport. I'll direct them if you like. Eh? Oh, thanks, Donald. Mr. Rhodes, the chief security officer at the airport, will help them out. I'm looking for a house that has uh, a recent lodger... Check the houses that overlook the Air Force first. Please, for a lodger that did not return this evening. Here's the description. Tall, red-haired, has a squint eye and a gimpy right leg. Got it, sir? Thank you. Yes, sir, I'll get a search warrant and come at once when they find him. Thank you very much. They can telephone me at home if they find the place out of hours. Right. Two minutes after midnight, I was awakened by a telephone call from one of the men of Superintendent Trevelyan's squad. After some difficulty in obtaining a search warrant at that time of night, I proceeded to the house in which he had telephoned. 
The house was almost directly across the road from the main gate of the airport. Donald Rhodes, who was awaiting my arrival, accompanied me upstairs to the former lodger's room, which provided an excellent view of the airport from its single window. The householder turned on the lights and left us. The room was quite neat. There's, uh, there's a chair by the window. Yes. Turned towards the window. Cushions rumpled quite a bit. Somebody's been sitting on it a lot. Here's an officer's musette bag in the closet. Have a look. That's his, all right. See? E. Mybridge, Lieutenant, King's Royal Rifle Corps. Good regiment. He was a good soldier, I expect. Here's a drawer in the table. Ah. What? E. Lights, Wetzler. Good pair of glasses, these German officers. 10x30. He was spying. That's this. What's this? Royal Corps Signals Field Message Pad. Or his reports to the GOC, eh? <laughs> Quite regimental. Been using it, too. Good. What? Writing on the sheet he just tore out left an impression on the second sheet. Let's see. Hold up the lamp there, Donald. Mm -hmm. No, hold it so the light comes across the page from the edge so it casts a shadow on the ridges of the writing here. Hmm? Read it. Hold the lamp still. See to guards at... at what's this word? Looks... looks like midnight. What guards will he see to midnight? Makes no sense. Let me look again. No, that isn't C. Here. No. Looks like... I know what it is. What? T. T. T to guards at midnight. I don't... What was it Ginger said to tell Curran? Don't drink the tea. It's poisoned. It was the custom at that time for a local tea shop to send a man with a tricycle around the airport every night with a huge container of hot tea. It was a familiar sight to everyone on the field, and the sound of his funny little French taxi horn was the signal for everyone to have his tuppence ready for his tin cup of the stuff. The GOC's plan was obvious. If that tea were poison, then if they all drank it, and if half a million pounds in gold lay unguarded with a dead man at the gates, a, a most diabolical scheme. Nevertheless, a feasible one, by the GOC's reckoning. But he had overlooked some factors in his reckoning. One factor he'd overlooked was a rough, tough man's aversion to poisoning a wartime friend. The other was the flying squad. I sent men the following morning to all parts of London on a search for certain men whom we knew to have worked for the GOC before. A number of them were in prison. But we discovered that 11 of them had been mysteriously disappeared. They, we reasoned, had been mobilized by the GOC for final briefing and held in readiness for the attack. The GOC himself had left for parts unknown. He reappeared only once, and Vivian Morris reported that he had made a most curious purchase. Six pairs of nylon stockings, the largest sizes available. We knew something of the GOC's plans. This was our final briefing in the flying squad's garage. Repeat your instructions, Nobby Clark. I to drive the seal lorry that picks up all the guards and takes them to the shelter. I drop off the flying squad man for everyone I pick up. The flying squad men are to be dressed in BOAC uniforms like those the guards wear. Each will be armed with a truncheon or a rubber cough. At the shelter, I'm to tell the guards I'll pick up what is going on. Right. Detective Sergeant Norton, what do you do, Lion Tamer? I'm in charge of the flying squad men that will be planted in the bonded warehouse where the money is. And you, Mr. Miller? I'd like to be with Lion Tamer. What's your job? Oh, I'm in general charge of the cars. So I was well to wait. Champ, we'll really? save one of them for you, Dusty. Say to it, Martin. All right, Dusty. Now remember, not a man must touch the tea. Oh, no chance. Not that poison it hurts any of you, but I, I shall need it for evidence. Well, couldn't we offer them a drink, sir? Donald? Look, it's my airport and it's my responsibility. What do you do? I just sit in that bloody little shelter by the telephone, and when they're all inside, I'm to lift the receiver. Good. And a sergeant from the 999 room? Constable Lloyd, sir. I want to watch the special switchboard for it to light up when Mr. Rhodes lifts the receiver. And then? Then at once I'm to shout into my wireless microphone one word. Well? Go. Where's Dusty Miller? Oh, 
Then I bet our yoikes and the cars with the rest of us converge on every entrance to the airport. Render such assistance as might be necessary. None will be necessary, Dusty. And Lawton, when do you start operations? Not till they start to open the safe, sir. Then what? Then we smite them and hypnotize it. Carry them all off to the pokey. To the what? Oh, sorry, sir, that's Canadian. Uh, to the bowels of the vast time. And when you're done, boys, Heathrow will supply beer for all. A bottle of pigs! <laughs> beer and bandages, boys. The day came. The airplane from America arrived with the gold. It was transferred under heavy guard to the bonded warehouse. Donald Rhodes supervised that himself. I joined the guard at the gatehouse of the airport about 11 that evening. It was very quiet. That'll be Clark, taking our men around and picking up the regular guards. Very lonely and very quiet. Maybe they're not come, I thought. I borrowed a cigarette from the gate guard, but I crushed it out. They mustn't know there's anybody here besides you, I told him. That's right, sir. Squidge down on the floor. I waited. That was Nobby, taking the regular guards to the shed. I... Who's that? I gave it, sir. Yes? Clark here. Tell Mr. Sheehan I've picked up all the guards and our people are waiting. Yes, it was... I heard him. Just in time, sir. Here comes the tea. The man with the tricycle came up and stopped. Hello, Herbert. Hello, James. I was going to be late. Have come. Hey, got your gin cup? Here. Some guard or somebody stopped me down the road a bit and demanded what I was doing. Made me open up the tea and let him look at it. Got all cold, I'm afraid, him staring at it. All right, Tuttle's, please. Right. Go on, in. The guard brought in the tea, which we set on the floor to keep as evidence. The driver came back with the empty container and went on about his business. The guard and I crouched on the floor of the little hut, waiting. Only the sound of a belated airplane or two broke the silence. It was half an hour later when we heard the sound of a lorry. I crawled under the table. The guard lay back in his chair, motionless. The lorry stopped at the gate and a man got out. He looked in our window. Here's one of them now. I stood up cautiously. The lorry moved straight to the bonded warehouse and stopped. We heard them at the door. We kept quiet in the dim light. The door opened. I watched through a crack in the sheltered door. My hand on the telephone to the 999 room. We sat in our cars, motors running, hidden at the road junctions all around the airport. My eyes began to hurt, watching that switchboard. I said to the guards in the shed, now mind you, not a sound. I could see the shadowy figures clustering about the door to the bonded warehouse. A man whispered in my ear, what have they got on their heads? They look like ratty elephants. They had women's stockings on for masks. It sure looked weird with their legs hanging down over their faces. I hope the GOC is with them, I thought. The last one entered. I picked up the receiver. There it is. Go, you sods, go. Come on, the flying squad! They're at the safe. I saw a man running towards me. He tore the stocking from his head and I leaped out the door at him. Stop! Stop, I yell, stop! I'm Inspector Shea! When I came to an hour later, I discovered the grandfather of all bumps on my head from the loaded cosh the man had caressed me with. My men of the flying squad stood about, many of them bandaged to the eyes, but all happily quaffing beer. We trotted up the score, eleven prisoners, including the one who had struck me and whom the gate guard had taken care of. Two broken arms, one smashed nose, and a turned ankle. A pile of heavy coshes and short iron bars the robbers had carried. And the 388,000 pounds still untouched. The prisoners bore a large variety of contusions, black eyes and broken heads. 
I, uh, I had a headache for a week. We never did catch the GOC, but we sent 11 of his men to prison, having caught them red-handed. And to this day, no one has ever dreamed of robbing Heathrow again. If they do, son, may I have a chance at him, too? You have heard another true story from the files of Scotland Yard. Only the names were, for obvious reasons, changed. Research for Whitehall 1212 is done by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Beginning next Sunday, February 24th, the time period now featuring Whitehall 1212 will be occupied by Hollywood Star Playhouse, which will be followed immediately by Whitehall 1212. Whitehall 1212. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the authentic stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have for obvious reasons been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Here is the story of Scotland Yard file 133123. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson of Scotland Yard. Good afternoon. The Blackness Inn contains articles which have figured to a greater or less degree in several thousands of cases, a great many of them involving the crime of murder. Case number 133123 occurred, believe it or not, a few years before my time here at the yard, the year 1910, 42 years ago. However, it is still remembered as one of the most unusual cases in the yard's history, and I think you'll shortly discover why. In fact, despite the disguised names, you yourself may recall the case if you're old enough. I show you now two of the exhibits remaining from this notable case. First... The top of an ordinary suit of cotton pajamas. These stains are blood. You will agree with me that occasionally the Black Museum does live up to its reputation as a chamber of horrors. Now, the other is a curiously altered suit of men's clothing of the period. It also figured prominently in case 133123. You'll hear about this case in the words of Inspector James Waters, who led the investigation in the year 1910. The man who put me onto it was a wretched busybody, and I didn't like him very well. I sat scribbling aimless words on a block of yellow paper as he talked. I fully realize it's none of my business, Inspector Waters, but I feel it my duty as a British subject, sir. Go on, please. In my opinion, he's murdered her. Oh, come now. Bear with me, Inspector. I am listening, sir. First of all, reflect that they have been on bad terms for a long time. So you said. So he had plenty of, uh, what do you call it, motive? Motive, yes. So you see? I'm afraid I don't, sir. Eh? I mean, uh, what you have is the information the man has given you, that his wife was visiting relatives in America. In Los Angeles. Los Angeles, he says, and that his wife died there and was buried in Los Angeles. That is true. Well... I believe he murdered her and hid the body. But, my dear sir, there's no evidence that he... Pardon me, sir, there is. What? Well, first, the evidence that he requested her friends, including myself, to send no cards, no floral offerings, whatever, to him in memory of his wife. Well, that... Is, I think you will agree, a little strange. Yes, but... And, secundo, the fact that I've lately returned from America myself. And? I interrupted my business trip, sir, at Los Angeles to call upon her mother and offer my condolences. Well, go on, please. I was informed by her mother, sir, that the woman had not been in Los Angeles for more than four years. I 
I called on the widower at his house in Camden Town, number 39, Hilldrop Crescent. A battered tin sign bearing his name was tacked under the door. Dr. Edward Walton Harvey. The door was opened by a remarkably pretty young woman whose name, it appeared, was Miss Elaine LeBaron. She was Dr. Harvey's secretary. She led me up the stairs from the entire ground floor, apparently used as a combination of lumber room and a strange place for coals. She opened the door, smiled at me, and I entered alone. Good afternoon, my friend. I doubted seriously that I should ever be Dr. Edward Walton Harvey's friend, but I bowed politely. Come in, sir. Sir, that was better. I entered. What can I do for you, my friend? May I sit down, sir? By all means, sir. What seems to be your trouble, sir? This is not a professional call, Dr. Harvey. I'm Inspector James Waters of New Scotland Yard. Happy to meet you, Inspector. What can I do for you? I've called in connection with the death of your wife, sir. Oh? May I ask you a few questions? Certainly, sir. I... Uh... I must admit, though, that I I find that subject r rather a painful one. I can understand that, sir. Yes. Quite painful, sir. You were, of course, on quite good terms with the late Mrs. Harvey. Oh, yes, of course I was. I... Frankly, sir, no. I'm afraid I don't quite understand that, Mr. Uh, Dr. Harvey. You are a doctor, sir. Oh, yes. I got my degree from a college in the States... You're an American. Born there. I've lived here for quite a while, though. But uh, let's get back to our muttons, as the French say. I speak French like a native. The last few years have been very difficult ones for me, Inspector. Is that it, Inspector? Yes, Doctor. How have the last few years been difficult, if I may ask? My wife was a wonderful woman. But she was in the theatrical profession... A singer. I'm afraid not a very good one. In the States, you see, she wasn't much of a success, but over here... I trust you'll pardon me, but the standard of excellence in your music halls... Do you follow me? I'm inclined to agree with you. Then she was more successful here in England. She certainly was. She didn't sing any better, but an American, you know. She made a lot of money. Rather strange friends, I'm afraid. Bohemians, you know. Yes. Well, we got to quarreling. <laughs> I think you'll find that that's no secret. Nevertheless, her death was a great shock to me. I grieve constantly for her. What are you looking at, sir? I see you still keep your late wife's clothing. Oh, Oh, you mean those furs? And the other things. Yes, these were my wife's. Yes, I uh, I gave them to Miss LeBaron, my secretary. Uh, she does leave things lying about. The young woman who showed me in? I, uh, I have recently asked her to make her home here as my housekeeper. Uh, that's what we'd call her in the States. I saw no reason to throw away her clothes, you see. I'd have thought she'd take her clothes with her. Huh? To America. I guess she didn't expect to be gone long. How long has Miss LeBaron been living here? Was she here when your wife left? No, but she was a frequent visitor here. It was quite convenient to have my secretary handy, you see. And Miss LeBaron is a quite deserving young lady. Yes, of course. So that's the story. There's only one thing I do not understand, Doctor. What's that? I understand that the late Mrs. Harvey is not buried in Los Angeles in America. Sir? And that according to her mother, Mrs. Harvey has not been in America for some four years. Well, I guess you've caught me, Inspector. <laughs> My wife isn't dead. Oh? She left me. She ran away from me. Where did she go? I don't know. Just piled a few clothes in a bag and walked out. Blacked my eye first. We had a terrible quarrel. Just terrible. She called me the most awful names. And she insulted Miss LeBaron frightfully. It was dreadful. And then she rushed out of here, shouting for a cab to take her to Charing Cross. 
Well? That's the reason I gave out the story she'd gone to America, Inspector. That's why I gave out that she died there. How do you know she is not coming back? She'll never come back. Really, Inspector, a doctor has to have some dignity. I don't want people to know my wife has run out on me. I'm afraid you may find, though, if you don't mind my saying so, that you've been quite unwise. I didn't ask your advice, sir. I'm not giving it. If your wife returns and finds you've given away her clothing... I tell you, I know she's not coming back. The gas jet in my room at Scotland Yard burned late that night. I was not currently on an assignment, so I had a good deal of time to spare, and I found myself curiously caught up by the dusty little doctor's unique formula for avoiding scandal. He'd stored up a large order of scandal for himself, I thought, when and if his wife should return. But he was so certain that she would not. Next morning, I began certain inquiries... In the course of the next three weeks, I found... Dr. Harvey, on two occasions, had pawned jewelry belonging to his wife. Both occasions were before the date on which his wife left him. Count that against him. He was not entirely honest. Mrs. Harvey had withdrawn the entire sum of money she and her husband had had in joint deposit at Barclays Bank. Count that for him. That was a clear indication of her intent to desert him. Mrs. Harvey had known of the doctor's relations with Elaine LeBaron for many months prior to her leaving him. There was no record that she had objected to this situation. She had obviously tolerated it. Why should she make an issue of it at this late date? Possibly he had lied to me. Count that against him. A cable to America to Mrs. Harvey's mother at Los Angeles confirmed the fact that the missing woman had not been seen there. Dr. Harvey had explained that. All that in abeyance. Dr. Harvey had given a quarter's notice to his landlord at Hilldrop Crescent. That meant he intended to leave that place. Was that suspicious? Or was he merely being prudent? against his wife's possible return. But he was so certain that she would not. A month before his wife left him, Dr. Harvey had purchased five grains of hyosin hydrobromide from Lewis and Burroughs' shop in New Oxford Street. Hyosin hydrobromide, I learned from Henry Bernard, is a drug used in institutions for the mentally ill as a sex depressant. It is also a peculiarly deadly poison, one grain being sufficient to cause death. He was so certain that she would not return. I took a four-wheeler to Camden Town at once. There was no answer when I knocked on the door of number 39, Hilldrop Crescent. Dr. Edward Walton Harvey was gone, and with him, Elaine LeBaron. I went back to my office at Scotland Yard to do two things. First... I caused notices to be sent to every police station in England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales with the descriptions of Harvey and Elaine LeBaron raising the hue and cry from the North Sea to Land's End for them. Second, I obtained the necessary warrants and sent a squad of men to Hilldrop Crescent, armed with pickaxes, shovels, and other equipment, with instructions to search the place most thoroughly. Most thoroughly, I said. I joined them. Men were in the garden, digging. Others were turning over every article of furniture in the rooms and tapping the walls. I stayed in the untidy lumber room, cum coal cellar, on the ground floor. We've got all the coal shoveled away, sir. Let's see. Bring uh, pickaxes and take up that floor. Oh, I'm oh get cracking. All right. George! The garden was in ruins. Curious bystanders had appeared to give gratuitous advice to the sweating detective constables. I watched anxiously as one worker drove the point of a pickaxe through a water main. The landlord stood by and swore softly to himself. Nothing happened. I wondered if I had not been a trifle precipitate. Still, one can't take chances. Inspector Waters! That came from inside the house. I sprinted back from the garden. What is it, I called? Yes, sir. Found something, sir. Yes, sir. Looks like a bit of a man's shirt, sir. Yes, no, more like a woman's dress. I think this floor's been taken up before, sir. Must have been, else how did that get down there? Tell you what I think it is, sir. I think it's a pajama jacket. See, broad stripes, gaudy like... Go ahead, dig some more. Carefully now, carefully. Uh, Morgan, just run upstairs and see if the chaps up there have run across anything that matches this piece of whatever it is. Yes, sir. Is wrapped around something. Use your hands, not the shovel. Yes, sir. 
Steady. Yes, sir. Something here, all right, sir. Oh, well, what is it? Oh, what do you want? Oh, did they find something upstairs? Let's have it. Here, let's compare this down there. Here, catch. Got it. Match is all right, sir. Told you it was a pajama jacket, sir. These here pajama trousers matches it perfect. Oh, go on, dig it out. Dig it out, dig it out. Pull that stuff off it. The pajama jacket, sir. Devil blow me blind. What is it? Looks like a side of beef, sir. <coughs> and blimey, is that I? The trunk of what appeared to be a human body, wrapped up in the jacket of what was apparently Harvey's pajamas. It had been efficiently, professionally dissected. It was impossible even to determine whether the body was that of a male or a female. It was removed to the pathological laboratory for examination by Henry Bernard. Back again in my own office, I received the first report on the search for Harvey and Miss LeBaron. The pressmen had discovered our activities at Hilldrop Crescent, and most of the evening papers carried articles about the missing doctor and his secretary. An excited gentleman with a hoarse voice and a green bowler hat burst into my office. He smacked the desk vigorously with a copy of the Express. I knew it, sir. I knew it. I told him at the theater as soon as ever I saw the newspaper. One day there'll be a murder in that family, I said. Madame Rene was a great artist, sir, and I mourn her. My dear sir, who on earth is Madame Rene? She was the wife of this fiend, sir. The late Mrs. Harvey? Alas, I knew her well. And they said you had some information for us, sir. My name is Ponsonby Tiggs, sir. D-I-G-G-E-S. The same as the actor, Dudley Tiggs. Although I'm no relation of his... I am a dramatic tenor, sir. I have appeared with Madame Rene at the Metropolitan, Hoban Empire, and many of the other music halls in London, as well as the Hippodrome, Manchester, and uh, in most of the principal cities of the provinces. I am not unknown. The information, sir, if you please. Uh, what information, sir? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes. I have heard. I have heard that viper say many and many a time, sir. What viper? The unspeakable Harley. Dr. Harvey. Oh, Harvey, indeed, yes. You are correct. I have heard him say many times that he has always been enamored of the Belgian coast as a holiday place. Oh, very interesting, I'm sure. Well, thank you, Mr... Uh, uh, Diggs, at uh, the real point of my visit, sir, only yesterday morning, perhaps even as you and your men approached Hildop Crescent, I saw this fiend. Where? In Victoria Station, sir. Oh, no, 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 but bear, bear with me, I beg you. The boat train for Folkestone leaves from Victoria Station. Folkestone? The port. The port for Antwerp, my dear sir. Information at once was transmitted to the Belgian police. It was a mystery to us how they could have left England, but this was too good a lead to be ignored. Later in the day, information reached us from the police at Folkestone that a man answering to the description of Harvey had been seen by a railway porter and again by a news vendor who recognized him from his photograph in a newspaper. Elaine LeBaron had not been seen. I visited Henry Bernard, the pathologist, in his laboratory. No, Inspector Waters. <clears throat> I'm still unable to determine the sex of the body you found. The fellow who did it was a very good technician. The merest shell of a body. Looks like a doctor's work. Well, certainly someone with a considerable knowledge of anatomy. Very workmanlike. No identification, possibly. Oh, no, we shall see. I will say that identification will be most difficult, but I have only just started. Yes. I did discover one thing which I hope will be of help. What's that, sir? I found 2.7 grains of hyacin hydrobromide in the remains. Message from the Belgian police at Antwerp. Industriously searching city for trace of fugitives, but no results as yet. Have placed special attention to all transatlantic steamships sailing from this port and hope to report progress in course of hours. Rely on us. I hadn't thought of that. Certainly they go further away from Antwerp. Harvey was an American after all. If he could escape to America, we might never find him. I must stop up that hole. Many ships at sea are already equipped with the wireless telegraph, I remembered, and instanter caused messages to be flashed out to all. To all of them, with special reference to ships sailing from Antwerp, warning them to be on the alert for Harvey and LeBaron. Another message came from Antwerp. Your Dr. Harvey, seen and positively identified by former patient of his now living in Antwerp. Girl was not with him. Sending you further details. 
I spoke with Henry Bernard again. I'm coming along. I'm coming along, Waters. Found the evidence of the poison, and I shall identify her for you. Uh, find out for me whether the woman ever had an appendectomy. Oh, what, sir? An appendicitis operation that left a scar on her belly. I found out. She had. I told Bernard, who grunted. Nothing more from Antwerp. Where was the girl, I thought? Had Harvey murdered her, too? Ruefully, I thought we don't even know for certain that he murdered his wife. What we wanted was Harvey. Experience of Captain Horatio Sowerby, RNVR, master of the steamship Claverhouse, Antwerp for Halifax, Nova Scotia. As we moved down the river skelet to the sea on the start of our voyage, I stood on the bridge with the pilot. Few passengers were on deck, it being a very dismal day. However, as I glanced down at the bows, I observed two men standing on the main deck of the forepeak. My attention was directed to them by the fact that they seemed to be holding hands. Uh, I was astonished to observe that the younger one placed his arm about the other in a most affectionate fashion. Mm, I'll have a little talk with those two, I said to myself. They walked back to their cabin, arm in arm, as I watched them, unobserved. Message from the Antwerp police. Unable to discover any trace other than the one reported of fugitives Harvey and Le Baron. Cannot find any indication they may have sailed for America. Shall we continue our search? I talked again with Henry Bernard. I'll tell you when I find out, Waters. See this fragment of skin? Yes. If I can prove to a jury that that is an appendicitis scar and not a fold in the skin caused after death, we shall pretty well have identified her. Can you do it, sir? I don't know. Continuing the experience of Captain Horatio Sowerby. I made it a point to speak to those two I had discovered holding hands. Pleased to meet you, Captain. Say, uh, this young man is my boy. I'm taking him on a sea voyage for his health. Very delicate. Your son, sir? Eh? Oh, yes. You don't look like your father, young man. Uh, don't try to talk, son. That's a very bad case of laryngitis, Captain. Very painful, dangerous for him to try to talk. I see. Uh, you're a doctor, sir. Me? Oh, no. Well, I hope you enjoy your trip. And you, young sir, I hope it'll do you a lot of good. Thank you, Captain, for both of us. Uh, I think we'd better go to our cabin now, hadn't we, Sammy? There's something queer about that, I thought as they walked away. Not hand in hand this time. The wind blew the boy's coat away from his body. That's when I saw his trousers. The back of them had been ripped down the seam and fastened together again under the coat, with safety pins to make them wider. Extraordinary, I said to myself. I turned away to go to my cabin. The boy had left his hat on the table. I picked it up. The sweatband had been stuffed with paper to make it much smaller than its actual size. Then I recalled the boy's startlingly crude haircut, as if it had been done by an amateur. Ha-ha, <laughs> I said to myself. That boy is a woman. When I got back to my cabin... There was the wireless message from Scotland Yard. I was sitting at my desk again, seriously considering going to Antwerp myself. After all, I'd seen both Harvey and the girl. I should be able to recognize them if I saw them again. Then the door opened, and a constable brought in the wireless message. Inspector James Waters, Scotland Yard. Believe your man Harvey and the woman LeBaron to be passengers on my vessel bound for Halifax. Woman disguised as boy. Please, wireless, additional information to aid identification. Sowerby, Master, SS Cover House. They've got away. To add to my woes, Henry Bernard came cheerfully into my office. I've got it, Waters. What? That's definitely an appendicitis scar. Too late now. What's the matter, old boy? You sick? I'm dead. Oh, I thought you'd be delighted. I can prove that it's a scar, all right. And we can demonstrate to a jury that the body can't be anybody else but Mrs. Harvey. And with that hyacinth I found in the body... It's no good. They'll be in America in a few days, and then who can tell where they'll go? We've been had. Not necessarily. How do you mean? When did they leave? The day before yesterday. You're on the telephone here, aren't you? What good does that do? What ship are they on? Claverhouse for Halifax. Where are you going? Listen. Are you there? Hello, hello. Are you there? I say... This is Henry Bernard here. Now, listen to me carefully. I want you to find out for me at once whether there's any ship sailing for Halifax that will arrive there before a ship called the, uh, uh, what's the name, Waters? Claverhouse. A ship called the Claverhouse just sailed from Antwerp gets there. All right, do you understand? 
There was one that afternoon, the steamship Morgiana, due in Halifax 40 hours before the Claverhouse, barring acts of God. I got aboard somehow, leaving messages to be sent to Captain Sowerby and asking him to wireless me on the Morgiana. I'm not a good sailor. It was a bad time of the year for the North Atlantic, and Captain Sowerby's wireless was working quite well. Waters, this is Morgiana. Has Harvey moustache? Sowerby, master, SS Cleverhouse. I said no. Waters, SS Morgiana. What color is Ellen LeBaron's hair? Sowerby, master, SS Cleverhouse. Blonde, I said. Water, SS Morgiana. Stewardess discovers woman's garments in cabin of Harvey. Sowerby, master, SS Cleverhouse. Good, I said. Waters, SS Morgiana. They are seasick. Sowerby, master, SS Cleverhouse. So am I seasick, I said. Waters, SS Marjana. You will pass out at seven bells tonight. They are still unsuspicious. I'm practically certain they are the ones you want. Sowerby, Master, SS Coverhouse. Practically certain, I said. But there I was two mornings later in Halifax. The news had leaked out. Perhaps I shouldn't say leaked. Practically everyone in the world except the man and woman on the Claverhouse had heard of it. The pressmen were in Halifax, some 40 strong. As the Claverhouse dropped anchor at quarantine, we all crowded aboard the pilot boat. I went over to the Claver House in a rowing boat with the pilot. Captain Sowerby met me at the Jacob's Ladder. Sir, in their cabin, Inspector. Where? Come along, please. A few curious passengers stared at me as I followed him to the cabin door. Um, this one. That you, Stuart? It's uh, Captain Sowerby, sir. Just a minute, please. Come in. Well, we made it after all, didn't it? Well? That isn't them. I... I recognize you, Inspector Waters. Oh, stop it, darling. We didn't make it after all. I don't know how you got here, Inspector, but I'm ready, I guess, eh? You, you won't have to take her with you. Edward Walton Harvey and Elaine LeBaron, I arrest you both for the willful murder of Cora Harvey. I warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. <coughs> uh, come, gentlemen, while the lady changes her clothes. Harvey had grown a heavy moustache and had changed so much in the few days of flight that it was difficult to recognize him, which had given me that awful moment when I first saw them. Elaine LeBaron was never brought to trial, there being scant evidence that she had played any part in the murder other than that of the other woman. Harvey was tried at Old Bailey, and after a bitter battle opposing medical men, which was won by the brilliant testimony of Henry Bernard, he was found guilty and was hanged a scant six months after he had committed the crime. <laughs> You have heard another in the series Whitehall 1212, compiled from the official files of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is compiled by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express, and the stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Beginning next Sunday, the 24th of February, Whitehall 1212 will be heard over most of these stations one half hour later because another great program, Hollywood Star Playhouse, will be heard in the time period we now occupy. Remember, listen next week to Hollywood Star Playhouse and Whitehall 1212. For correct time and station, check your local newspaper. Thank you. This is NBC the National Broadcasting Company.
Whitehall, one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have for obvious reasons been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. I am Chief Richard Anderson of Scotland Yard. Murder with a gun is is not common in Britain, but Anthony de Bruin was shot to death. I would like you to see the evidence that led us eventually to the murderer. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson. And you're standing in Scotland Yard's Black Museum, of which I have the honor to be the custodian. Now, while we have certain extremely gruesome objects in these two rooms, many of them are quite innocuous when taken out of context. They are here not as ghoulish exhibits for the morbid, but as examples for study by our people in connection with their jobs. Now, such an exhibit is this one in case number 160277. Now, this is an ordinary cheap raincoat. Ah, that's identical the one. Identical with those worn by thousands of men. Identifying tags of all kinds have been removed. It was completely anonymous. Our people thought it might be an important clue to the identity of the murderer. It seemed impossible. But my good friend, Inspector Anderson here, followed this extremely tenuous clue to the end. Almost to the end, sir. What do you mean, Inspector? I wasn't present when they were hanged, sir. The crime. At 10 o'clock of the morning of April 3rd, 1947, Anthony de Brun, a young stockbroker's clerk, was walking with his fiancée toward Howard's Jewelry Shop in Charlotte Street near Tottenham Court Road in London. They were on their way to purchase an engagement ring. Or at least six carats, darling. Set in platinum, too. I wish I could afford it, really, though. Whatever it is, I'll love it, Anthony. <laughs> well, come on. Let's see what I can afford, shall we? Darling. Hey! hey, hey Robert! Out of the road, there you go! Out of the road! From Inspector Anderson's first notes on case 160277. Uh, robbers wore white cloth masks. Faces not seen by anyone at murder scene. Apparently young men. No jewelry taken. De Bruin only casualty. Shot through head. NB, pathologist extracting bullet for examination. Gun not found. Apparently taken with him by murderer. Girl hysterical, unable to talk coherently. Witnesses to murder unable to identify. <laughs> murder and companion disappeared inside business building at number 14 Charlotte Street. Interview with Thomas Cobley, porter at number 14, by Detective Sergeant John Quinn of Scotland Yard. Oh, I've seen him all right, sir. See this knob on me end? One of them hit me with a bleeding great pistol as he ran past me, sir. After that, he tried to shoot me, but the thing wouldn't go off. Did you recognize either of them again, Cobbley? Oh, that I could, sir. Both of them had their masks staring about in their necks. I've seen their faces all right. I'd recognize the one with the mustache anyway, sir. I think. You know how they were dressed? Well, uh, uh, one of them had on a raincoat, sir. The other one, uh, uh, well, I'm afraid I don't remember, sir. But I'd know him again, sir. Interview with Police Constable Roy Harris on point duty near the rear entrance to number 14. Yes, Sergeant. Oh, it was them, all right, I'm sure. Two men answering to Cobbler's description came running out of the rear entrance at 10-7, Sergeant. I saw the one with the moustache. Would you recognize him again, Constable? Oh, I'm sure I would, Sergeant. However, I didn't notice the raincoat. In fact, I'm sure that neither of them wore one. But you would recognize them again, though? Positively, Sergeant. Raincoat or no raincoat. Inspector Anderson of Scotland Yard. 
We found the raincoat three hours later. It had been hastily tucked in a dark corner of the hallway at number 14, through which the men had apparently run. Yes, it was the same coat you saw in the Black Museum a few moments ago. The manufacturer's label had been removed, so had the label of the shop that had sold it. Contained no initials, no marks of any sort. A shabby, shapeless garment that might have been worn by anyone. In the right-hand side pocket was a caliber forty-five automatic pistol, the type used by the American Army. It apparently been fired twice. A clip containing four ball cartridges was still in place with an additional one in the chamber. I took it myself to Chief Inspector Carl Tree in the ballistic laboratory. Uh, hey, I had it checked, Anderson, for fingerprints. And? None, of course. Uh, let's use one of those shells. Tom, did you fill the catchment box with cotton wool? Yes, sir. All right, stand aside, Anderson. All right, Tom, get it out, will you, please? All right, sir. First time I've seen that, sir. All right, they're sending us up the bullet they're taking out of this chap's head. Postmortem must be about finished. Then we'll put them both under the comparison microscope and see for certain if this is the gun they both came from. Quiet. I- I'll be waiting, sir. Aye. Right. We'll let you know at once. By the next afternoon, the 4th April, we were certain this was the murder gun. Ergo, the raincoat had probably belonged to the murderer, the man with the moustache, who we had been assured could be readily recognized. If we could find him, that would be difficult. I put criminal records onto it. They produced some 150 dossiers of known criminals whose take ran to robbing jewelry shops and or carrying guns. Further checks showed that the pistol had been stolen from the U.S. Amphibious Engineer Regiment in June 1946. There was no clue to the thief, the American Army DCI informed us. The porter cobbly remembered that the men had worn gloves. The constable said that he did not see the direction they had gone. They simply lost themselves in the crowd of passers-by. Quinn and I went over the anonymous raincoat again. I haven't been able to discover anything, sir. Uh, He's done a good job. Every single identification that's visible to the naked eye has been removed. How do you know? Well, I compared it with me own and Nobby Clark's and yours, sir. All the tags on this one are gone. I wonder if he removed things that aren't visible to the naked eye. You mean things you might find with ultraviolet or infrared light, sir? I was thinking of something else. What, sir? Give me a razor blade, Quinn. You, you're going to rip the coat apart. I was lucky. The first cut I'd made. The seam where the left sleeve was attached to the coat itself revealed a tiny stamped paper tag sewed inside the lining. It was a kind of manufacturer's stock tag. Photographs were quickly made, circulated to every manufacturer of raincoats in the country. That took a week, but a firm in Leeds identified it at once as one of theirs. The coats, they said, bearing that stock number, had been sold to shops in southeast London, either Deptford or Bermondsey. Well, thank heaven for forgers, Quinn, I said. That I don't get, sir. Look, A, people forge clothing coupons. Yes, sir. B, when you buy clothing at any store in London, the shopkeeper puts down the number of the coupon book, what you've bought, and your name. Why, oh, that's right, sir. Uh, Go and find me the names of the people who bought these coats, Quinn, my lad. That wasn't quite as simple as all that. Uh, But it wasn't so hard either. There had been 24 dozen of that lot of raincoats sold in those two districts, and we accounted for all but six of them. Inspector Anderson and I went over the list of 282 names. We found not one name we'd ever heard of, and criminal records reported that none of them were known in their files. Well, it was a good try, sir, I said to Inspector Anderson. Well, we still haven't checked on each of these names personally. Uh, We'll have to do it, sir, I expect. Quite. Well, gird up your loins, Quinn. Sir, they're right up under me chin now. I was just thinking of something. Sir? Got your own book of clothing coupons on you? Yes, sir. Let's see them, will you? Yes, sir. Sign? Sign it myself, sir. Hmm. Hmm. What's the matter, sir? What's your name? But I 
John Quinn. You know that, sir. This is signed Quinn John. Well, by crazy. And mine is signed Anderson Richard. Let's look at this list again, the hind end, too. Yes, sir. Clancy Oliver. That'd be Oliver Clancy. Gold Joseph. Never heard of Joe Gold. Johnston John. No, John Johnson. She and Robert. No one could be named She and Robert. We're right, old boy. Freeman George. George Freeman. Mullen Fike. Crikey, I remember that name. So do I, sir. But he died last month. Yes, sir. A smashing grab feller. A uh, real white boy. I remember. He killed in a bus accident in Clarkenwell. He must have bequeathed the coat to somebody, mustn't he? Hmm. You know, I I seem to remember he he had a kid brother in Borstal, sir. Check up and see if he's still there. If he's been let out, I shall very much want to talk with young Mr. Freeman. <laughs> In the room in Clarkenwell where George Freeman had lived prior to his untimely death, Sergeant Quinn found the younger brother, Arthur, who had been released from Borstal Reformatory only a few weeks before. He was quite willing to accompany the sergeant to Scotland Yard, where Inspector Anderson interviewed him. Sit down, Freeman. Don't mind if I do. Um, we found your raincoat, Freeman. Did you? Yes. Who had it? What? Oh, I'll lend it to a fella. Who? <laughs> oh, I'm not a copper's knock, Mr. Inspector. You, um, you lent it to someone, then? Yes. Listen, uh, what do you want of me? We want some people to see you. What about? Oh, a little affair up Tottenham Court Roadway. Oh, uh, that fellow got murdered. Right. Well... Who wants to see me? I should think you could guess. Oh, do no good. I wasn't there. That you can prove, no doubt. Oh, I've got an alibi. Oh, I'd be glad to hear about it. I'll tell you when the time comes. I've got it all right. I expected you would have one. How did you know it was my raincoat? It was your brother's, wasn't it? You're pretty smart. Thank you. But not as smart as you think, Mr. Inspector. Have you any objection to appearing as an identification parade? Me? Uh, other people are going to appear with me? Of course. Same size as me? Mm -hmm. Same build? Mm -hmm. uh, so forth? Naturally. Well, uh, if you're afraid you'll be identified, Freeman, nobody will identify me. Well, in that case, I shouldn't think you'd object. I'm not objecting. Well, then. Oh, I just don't want to be framed. You needn't worry about that. Oh, oh. Take it or leave it, Freeman. Heads you win, tails I lose, eh? If I won't do it, you lock me up and... Uh... I'll arrest you on very definite suspicion, yes. And if I do, you'll contrive some way to point me out to the... Look here, Freeman, I'm trying to be fair. Oh. I won't even go in the room where they're having the identification parade. Huh? You'll leave me go as soon as it's over. If you're not identified, yes. Nobody will identify me. All right. All right, then. Oh, I'm not afraid. Sergeant Quinn. Yes, sir. Quinn, this gentleman's for the identification parade. Will you show him the way, please? Oh, yes, sir. Well, will you come with me, please, sir? Lead the way, my good man. Thank you. You want to know uh, who I'll let that line go to? I'd be most interested. I'll tell you what I'll do. I got an idea that raincoat was found somewhere near that Charlotte Street place. Is that right? Was it? Yes. Huh? You'd like to know who it was that lost it, eh? I'm not going to bargain with you, Freedom. <laughs> I just want to be bloody sure I'm not being framed. When I walk out of that identification parade without being fingered by anybody... Then I'll tell you why I'll empty it to. Thank you. Uh, uh, are you ready, sir? In a moment, my good man. That's a promise. I wasn't there. 
Perhaps he was. Freeman was not identified by anybody. True, only two persons, the constable and the porter, had seen the killers without their masks. But neither was able to point out any person in the lineup at all. Freeman, in high glee, returned to my room. Come on, let the rank too. He's Charlie Mortimer. Within the hour, criminal records had supplied us with details of Charles Mortimer, whose record showed he had served two terms at Dartmoor for armed robbery. Two detective constables were sent at once to his last address of record. Mr. Mortimer was not at home, but in his room were found three Patek Philippe watches. They were at once identified as part of the loot from a jewelry shop robbery at Queensway in Bayswater a few days before the one in which the man de Brune was killed. Well, I said to Sergeant Quinn, our friend Mortimer may not be the murderer we want, but he'll have some explaining to do. Why don't you think he's the murderer? I didn't say that. I said he may not be the murderer. Well, sir, if he had the raincoat... If? Yes, sir. I've seldom heard of people like Freeman implicating others in murder. Except for a reason. To get even is the phrase. Ah, there's another thing. If Mortimer was in on the jewelry shop job in Bayswater... As he obviously was. At least he had those three watches. Well, if he was, why should he try armed robbery again two days later, sir? That's a very important point, Quinn. I think so. Well, when we find Mortimer, we'll have a lot of questions to ask. We'll find him. Oh, excuse me. Inspector Anderson here. Oh, hello, Thomas. You have? Good. Where? We found him. Mortimer? Yes. Hello, uh, Thomas. Where is he now? Oh, here. Well, <laughs> send him in. I'll go get him, sir. Good. Quinn's coming to fetch him. Uh, did he talk? Didn't ask him any questions. <laughs> Good. Let him think it's the Bayswater job he's been mad for. Right. And may I say that's very fine, quick work. Quinn will be there any second. Quite. Bye, old boy. Hello. Uh, uh, Inspector Anderson again. Will you ring George and ask him how soon he can get those people together again? The people that attended the identification parade this morning... The ones on the Charlotte Street murder case. Uh, what's the number? Um, 160277. Thank you. Ask him to let me know as soon as he can, will you? Thank you. <laughs> what is it the Americans say? We're in business. Ah, ah Sergeant Quinn. This is Mortimer, sir. Go on in. You may sit down, Mortimer. Yeah. Sit down, Quinn. Thank you, sir. Has he been charged? Yes, sir. Accessory to armed robbery. Warned, of course. Anything I say may be taken down in writing and used as evidence. Ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lies. Uh, let me ask you one, Mortimer. Where's your raincoat? Out there at the desk. I mean the one you borrowed. What did I borrow one for? I've got one. I thought you borrowed one from Arthur Freeman. From Artie Freeman? Now look here, mister. Artie Freeman's been looking for me ever since I... Uh, ever since that jewellery shop job in Bayswater that your bloody coppers pulled me in for. Do you think he'd lend me anything? Why is Artie Freeman looking for you, Mortimer? He's promised to cut me throat the minute he sees me. <laughs> This is how Charles Mortimer explained that somewhat astonishing statement. It was on the day that Arthur Freeman was released from a Boston institution where, as a juvenile delinquent, he had served a long sentence. A friend of his, a certain Basil Green, another ex boston boy, and Charles Mortimer had arranged a welcome home party for Arthur at a pub in Clerkenwell. It was quite a party, Mortimer said. After the other guests had departed, Arthur Freeman and Charles Mortimer sat at a table together and talked. The third man, Green, was asleep on the floor. Welcome home again, Archie, old boy. Welcome home to you, Shai. Very happy returns. That's right. You drink. Yeah, I'll see you. You. I got you some money. Well, I got two half crowns. More than that. I ain't got no more. 
Maybe Basil's got some. Hey, Basil. Why am I... He's asleep. There he is. Take your foot off his face. Why? Got to be polite. I'm polite. I need money. I'm stony. Let's go get some. All right. You know where? I know a jewelry shop. Let's go rob it. That's what I mean. Take Basil with us. He's got a gun. I ain't got a gun. I'll borrow Basil's. Where's this jewelry establishment? Huh? Bayswater. Queensway Bayswater. <laughs> Listen, uh, you double cross me, I cut your heart out. Oh, I ain't gonna double cross you. Better not. I slit your throat, boy. Just don't worry about your pal Charlie Morton, old boy. <laughs> uh, when we do it? What? Rob jewelry shop. Kill people in shop. Get jewels. I got the place all figured out. Been casing it. Taking sides. That's right. Where we all do it? Tomorrow. Oh, listen. Uh, oh, let go. Listen, uh, I'm not kidding about this. Charlie, I ain't had a sixpence of my own for so long. What a bloody farthing. I've got to have money. I go. And if I have to kill somebody to get it, that's all right, too. If i got to kill to get money, I'm the lad will do it. Look at me, Charlie. And I don't care who I kill. And that goes for you, too, if you cross me up. I'm not going to think I'm a crook. Meet me and Basil tomorrow morning at eight o'clock on the down platform at Buy's Water. I'll bring Basil's gun. We're gonna be rich, Clark. <laughs> that was the way the first robbery began. The first association of Arthur Freeman, Basil Green, and Charles Mortimer. The affair was quite successful from their standpoint, and the three men separated. Mortimer carrying the loot. Mortimer went directly to a receiver of stolen goods and disposed of all but the three watches we found in his lodgings. A thoroughly dishonest crook. The rage of Arthur Freeman was terrible to behold when he came to Mortimer's deserted lodgings and found only the three watchmen. Watches, Mortimer told us. He told us more. I heard from Basil Green that he raged. Simply raged, sir. Cut me throat from ear to ear, he said. Cut me up in little pieces and feed him to me, he promised. I was fear upset. Gentlemen... I never killed nobody. I know he'd do what he said because I know the knife he carries. I'll be safe in prison, won't I? Won't I? I'm bloody weary of dodging Artie Freeman. I was just on my way to a boat for South America when your Scotland Yard gentleman picked me up. You saw the tickets. Inspector Anderson sent me to pick up Basil Green and Arthur Freeman. I found Green easily enough, but our chief suspect, Freeman, had disappeared. At an identification parade, Green was quickly identified by those present at the Charlotte Street murder. No one even looked at Mortimer. Green was placed under arrest for complicity in the latter case. Mortimer was tried and convicted for the Bayswater robbery. Green, a rather simple-minded young spiv, decided to make a statement. Yes, sir, my own free will in the court. Yes, sir, I understand what I say will be used in evidence. Go ahead, Green. Well, sir, will I start? Wherever you like. Well, sir, I, I was asleep when they planned it. Do you mean when Mortimer and Freeman planned the first robbery? Huh? Yes, sir, that's what I mean. Artie and me and Charlie went to Bayswater and we did that thing. Do you mean the robbery? Huh? Yes, sir, that's what I mean. Charlie took the stuff we got and when Artie and me went to find him, he was gone. You know about that, sir. And then Artie got awful mad and he cursed and he... What, what did he say? Why... Well, I... Couldn't repeat that, sir. There's, there's a lady present. Uh, Miss Bellamy will hold her ears. Yes, sir. Well, he threatened Charlie and said he'd cut off Charlie's bloody ears and cut his throat and stab him and murder him. And that is Charles yes, Mortimer you're referring to. Huh? Yes, sir, that's what I mean. So, then he said we had to have some money right away. You're now referring to Arthur Freeman? Huh? Yes, sir, that, that's what I mean. He said he wouldn't give me my gun back and we'd go and stick up another jewelry store right away and I told him I knew a little about this place in Charlotte Street. He said, all right, let's go. 
We went and looked at it, and the next morning we did it. Uh, what'll I say now, sir? Whatever you like. Well, sir. We have those baths, on. We used at Bay's water. As soon as we went in the place, somebody shouted, and somebody must have pressed a buzzer or something. God, he yelled out. No, he cursed, sir. And we run out, and there was this man, Mr. Brun, or whatever his name was. He, he was just coming in the door, and he said, Stop, and all he cursed again and shot the man, and we ran. Now, mosques was falling down, and we hit a man in the other building. We run right through it and out the back, and Artie took off his raincoat. It used to be his brother George's. He was a very nice fellow. You are now referring to George Freeman as a nice fellow. Huh? Yes, sir, that's who I mean. Artie wasn't. Isn't, I mean. Well, Artie swore at the raincoat and said he could be identified by it and threw it away. That's the way it was, sir. Your statement will be given to you after it's typed. What for, sir? For you to read and sign. Sir, I can't read. Very good. Well, I know where you can find Artie if you want him, sir. You... you know where he is? Yes, sir. You'll die when I tell you, sir. <laughs> Should I tell you, sir? If, if you like, Green. Well, sir, he's in jail. And there he was in Brixton jail. We hastened there, and the warder took us down to the cell block, where after a long walk, we finally found our man. He grinned through the bar at me. Hello, Inspector. Hello, Freeman. How'd you find me? Your friend, Basil Green, told us. I'll kill him for that. I doubt it. What are you in for, Freeman? Errol, I broke a policeman's jaw. I thought they'd send me up for a while for that. By the way, my name's William Patterson in here. Good place to hide out. Not good enough. I got a little bothered about you, you see. Obviously. You found Charlie Mortimer? Yes. And he talked. At great length. Just as Basil Green did. Unlucky for me. Oh, no. We came to get you out of here. Oh, yeah. And take you elsewhere. Arthur Freeman, I arrest you on a charge of willful murder. I warn you that anything you, you say will be we'll taken down, down in writing and may be used in evidence. evidence. Unlock the door, please, Water. At the trial at Old Bailey, both Arthur Freeman and Basil Green were found guilty of the murder of Anthony de Bruyne and were sentenced to be hanged. The sentence was duly carried out. You have heard another in the series Whitehall 1212, compiled by special permission from the spiles of Scotland Yard. Only the names have been changed. Research for Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. This evening, Whitaker Chambers comes to the NBC microphone to read a letter to his children. Now, this is not an ordinary letter. This letter means as much to you, the American citizen, as it does to Mr. Chambers' closest relatives. This letter brings you the true nature of communism, its political implication to you as a citizen of the world, more particularly of the United States of America. Now, this evening, Mr. Chambers will tell you why he chose communism, what he thought it would mean to him, politically and personally. That's a letter to his children by Whitaker Chambers. The truth. Whitehall, one, two, one, two. Scotland Yard. 
For the first time in its history, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the true stories of some of its most celebrated cases. These are the true stories. The plain, unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, brought to you by an all-British cast. Only the names have, for obvious reasons, been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research for Whitehall 1212 is from Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Now this is the voice of the custodian of Scotland Yard's famous Black Museum, Chief Superintendent John Davidson. Good afternoon. This is a man's handkerchief. I doubt you've ever seen a handkerchief so stained with blood. I don't believe I have. I just like to touch it. They should really wash these things, shouldn't they? If the young man who owned it had washed it, he wouldn't be where he is now. No, I don't know exactly where he is, but I've been led to believe it's an unpleasant place. His body is buried, as Mr. Justice Coburn said, within the precincts of the prison in which he had been confined. That was Pentonville Prison, where a great many murderers are buried. Now, here is Chief Inspector Godfrey Allen Rouse, who had most to do with the case number H-42426. Yes, I've been on duty all night. No, I've had no adventures at all, except an interview with a sad, fat man who accidentally set his bed on fire and whose landlady was annoyed with him. I don't believe the poor man has smoked cigarettes in bed since. I was shambling sleepily along a certain street in the West End, thinking how nice it is to go to bed at the height of the full, fresh, fragrant morning when my arm was rudely seized. My thoughts of bed vanished with a minor popping sound as I recognized the features of Mr. Alistair Crumbine, proprietor and chief clerk of the nearby Forensia Hotel. I gather from Mr. Crumbine's gobbling that Someone was violently dead in his hotel. Sighed and followed him. There, a functionary conducted me by means of a frighteningly creaky lift to the top floor of the frenzy and preceded me into a room, the door to which was standing open. Across the neat bed lay the body of a dead woman, appallingly battered about the head and upraised arms. She was a thin, middle-aged woman and there was no sign of blood on her. She'd been carefully washed off. Although the bed linen was spattered freely... There was no sign of a weapon in the room, except for the carnage on the bed was quite tidy. A door leading to what I assume was a private veranda was closed, locked, I afterwards found, from the inside. The functionary and I stood and looked silently, and then I heard the lift creak again, and Mr. Alistair Crumbine was there. Who is she, I asked Mr. Crumbine. She's dead, isn't she? There's no doubt she's dead, is there? I reassured him, and he burst into lamentation. Oh, my poor hotel. What's my poor hotel going to do with people getting murdered in it? What's to happen to me? What happens to your guests, Crumbine? He's a guest, isn't he? <laughs> Who is she? Oh, the poor lady in my hotel. She's dead. Yes, she's dead. Who is she? Eh? Who is she? It's Lady Madge Johnston. She's dead. I knew of Lady Johnston... Lady Madge Johnston, a well-known philanthropist, widow of Sir Lawrence Johnston, a former member of the London County Council, reputed to keep a large box of crisp one-pound notes for handing out to indigents at all times. What are you doing, Alistair? The box of money is here, all right. You mean there is a box of money? Look! You may believe it or not, but there was a great Schweppes ginger beer case still bound with iron straps under the bed, and it was... Absolutely running over with fresh, crisp Bank of England pound nerves. Who? Wonder if it's all there. Uh, wonder if he took a fistful. Who? Chap that did her in. I wonder who did it. In my hotel. When did it happen? The maid found her when she brought up a cup of tea at seven o'clock, like she always does. Darjeeling tea she always drank, the poor thing. Nasty, strong stuff. At seven in the morning. Yeah. And then the maid came and woke me up and I did, uh, hurried home at once. At a seizure, she said. Elsie Weed from St. Louis, USA. Who? Uh, uh, the maid uh, had a seizure. She say anything? Only that she was going home. She had I know, a... I know, a seizure. Anybody else been here? I don't think so. No. Who was that man who brought me up here? He's been here. Oh, the fellow's the porter. 
He operates the lift. He here? Eh? Was he here? Oh. Uh, he must have been, mustn't he? Has he any ideas? What does he know? I'm afraid I didn't ask him. Get him. I want to talk to him. Uh, oh, oh, yes, of course. Get him. <laughs> yeah, yes, of course. Fellows! I say fellows! Isn't there a bell on that lift? Oh, yes. Well, use it then. Oh, he, he, he'll hear me. Fellow! So will everyone else in the hotel. Oh, do you think, sir? They'll have everyone up at the place here, and I, I don't want them. Ring the bell. Uh, oh, yes, of course. He'll be here at once. Where does where does that door lead? What door? Oh, to the veranda. wonder if he got in that way. Uh, don't open the door. Oh, don't be careful. You'll fall. Be, be careful. What on earth oh. happened here? Oh, I should have told you. Oh, I hope you didn't fall. Uh, oh, no, you're still there. Uh, there's no floor on the veranda. What? We have the carpenters here, you know. They're making a few changes. Some new floors in the veranda. A new... A man could break his neck here. It is quite a fall, isn't it? Where are these carpenters? Have they got ladders? Ladders? Yes, of course they've got ladders. How do you think they get up here? Do you suppose it was a carpenter that did it? Oh, but they all go home at night. They leave the tools and... I say, she might have been struck by a hammer, mightn't she? Let's see. Might very well have been. What about their tools? I was saying, they leave them in a storeroom, locked down on the ground floor. We shall go down there and look presently. Best send for these carpenter chaps. Do you suppose... I say, do you suppose one of them could have done this? Heavens. They do use hammers, don't they? We shall see. I think we should have them here at any rate. Oh, by all means, old boy. Oh, here's the lift. I'll tell Fellows to ring up the carpenter foreman and have him. Oh, uh, Fellows, would you... Oh, it isn't Fellows, is it? Oh, good morning, Cephalie. Uh, where's Fellows? Good morning, sir. He went home. His time was up. I'm on duty now, sir. I'm here. Oh. Oh, dear. Who is it? Cephalie, sir. I'm the day man. Fellows went home. Get him back here at once. Yes, sir. But I don't know where he lives, sir. In South End, I think, sir. Or Amersley? Or perhaps it's Shepherd Bush. I'm not sure, sir. Houston? Well, do you know where that carpenter foreman lives? Get him at once. Yes, sir. So I'm not sure... Here, where... here, here. Wait, wait, wait. Wait a, wait a sec. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir? Sipily isn't as bright as he might be. No, sir. But there's Lady Johnston. Morning, Lady Johnston. Shake sick. So what's the matter with Lady Johnston? Please go, Cephal. Run along, old boy, do. Yes, sir. Shall I, sir? Oh, is something wrong with Lady Johnston? She hurt. Is she? What shall I tell the boy? He'll find out sooner or later. She's dead, son. Oh. What's the matter with her? She's been killed. Who killed her? We don't know, Cephalie. Now, please go on. I know. I know. It's one of them carpenters has killed her. That's why you want me to go find them. I know what you're talking about. I know. I know. Be quiet, Cephalie. Huh? Well, who did then? Tell me who did. Tell me. Now, go on, Cephalie. Yes, Mum. Uh, sir. Uh, poor Lady Johnston. I know. I heard him. I heard him talking in the night. Well. Well, indeed. Do you have many like that? <laughs> Poor Syphilis. Still, the boy may be right, you know. About what? About the carpenters, of course. Why? Well, who said she was battered to death with a hammer? A hammer's a carpenter's tool, isn't it? Uh, a weapon? I said she might have been beaten with a hammer. She might have, I said. Well, are there no other hammers in your hotel? The carpenters have the only one. They're the ones who did it. They must be. They did it. Now, wait till we get them here. Uh, don't you think so, Chief Inspector? I don't know. Well, then, who could have? I don't know that either. You wait till we get them here. You'll see. Look here, old chap. Uh, eh? Just run along to a telephone, will you, and ring up Scotland Yard. It's Whitehall, 1212. Tell them there's been a killing here and ask them to send some people. Uh, send who? Uh, whom? They'll know whom to send. And tell them I'm here too, will you, and I want someone to relieve me. Yes, sir. Uh, what'll I do then, sir? 
then I suggest you go talk to Sipoli. Perhaps he and you can think up some good ideas together. I'm your man. Oh, poor Lady Johnston. Whilst Crumbine dashed down the stairs, which also creaked abominably, I sat myself down with Lady Johnston's corpse of things. These are the things I thought of. A, the good charitable lady had been killed in the night. Whoever did it uh, had with the good lady made a great deal of noise. No. Who heard the noise? And when? Did they recognize any voices? Someone who was familiar, or had uh, become familiar with arrangements at the Forensi Hotel, did it. Else, how, how had he known about Lady Johnston? How had he got in the room? That door to the outside of the veranda had been locked. And the veranda five floors above the street is no floor anyway. How did the intruder get in? Or had he not had to get in? Had he been inside all the time? And what had the night porter been doing? Sadly, I must have a little talk with that night porter, and I remembered his name, Fellows. The man who had been relieved by the boy Sipoli and gone home to South End or Hammersmith or Shepherd's Book or perhaps Houston. The night porter would have a lot of questions to answer, I could foresee. Lady Johnston said not a word to me, but grinned horribly. There were, there were a couple of spots on her face the person who had washed her up had missed. Excuse me, milady, I muttered and went to look at the outer door. The key which had locked it was still in the lock where I had left it. The inside, mind you. I opened the door. The floorless veranda yawned above those five stories to the street. Could a, could a ladder, I wondered, carpenters use ladders? I must see if that foreman carpenter or his mates had been reached yet. I closed the door, <coughs> locked it. Went out and ran to the lift. After a moment, it started up. Well, I reflected that would at least save time. I could ask simply some of the questions that plagued me. Perhaps he might know something. I waited as patiently as I could. At last, it hove in sight. Hello, Sibley, I said. I could see Sibley staring up at me. Hello, Sibley, I said. Why, you remembered my name, sir. Well, thank you, sir. Hardly anyone remembers my name, sir. Joseph Adoniram Sibley, it is, sir. From Blackpool. Way up in Lancashire, sir. I don't know your name, sir, though. Well... Oh, no, don't tell me. I'll find out. Poor Lady Johnson, she didn't remember my name either. She always called me boy. I hate being called boy, don't you, sir? Yes, sir. Do you want to see Mr. Crumbine, sir? He's on telephone. He's calling the foreman carpenter, sir. Mr. Morris, like you said. Only he can't get Mr. Morris on the telephone. And so he called Fellows. Fellows is the night porter, sir. And he lives in Kennington. Not South End or Hathnet or Shepherd's Bush. Or Houston. No, Kennington. Mm -hmm. Kennington isn't far away and Fellows will be right here. In a minute, and maybe you'll know who killed poor Lady Johnston. She was so nice. But she always called me boy instead of my right name, Joseph. I don't know him. Don't you feel dreadfully sorry about her? I'll take you to the cellar, sir, whilst Mr. Crumbine's on the telephone. This is the cellar, sir. There. Nothing down here. Storeroom, sir. Where we keep the guest trunks and boxes and everything, sir. Excuse me, sir. I beg your pardon, sir. Excuse me, sir. I'm always bothering the guests, sir. Mr. Crumbine tells me, and... Look here, sir, Billy. You're not bothering me, and besides, I'm not a guest. Minor. Well, sir, I want you to know that I'm really not such a simpleton that Mr. Crumbine thinks I am. Now, look here, sir, sir Billy. He thinks I'm not quite bright, sir. But I'm bright, all right. And I have the equivalent of a high school education, sir. Oh, really? Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> I know algebra, sir, up to binomial theorem, sir. And I'd wager Mr. Crumbine doesn't know that much about algebra. And I know Latin. Quos quetanem abutera catilina patientia nostra. That means, how long, O oh, Catiline, are you going to continue to try our patience? And I know Kipling quite well. My, my father was a great student of Kipling. Excuse me, sir. There's a widow in Sleepy Chester who weep for her only son. There's a grave on the Parbeng River, a grave that the Burmans shun. And there's Suba da Prag Tivori to tell how the deed was done. That's the, uh, that's the grave of the hundred head. I know it all, but excuse me, sir, I forget so much. I think that's why Mr. Crumbine thinks I'm not quite bright. I can't remember things. I tried for me trade test in the war, sir. 
but right in the middle of the examination, I forgot. I've forgotten what I forgot, but they made me go away. That's the room there where the carpenters keep their tools. Wouldn't you like to look at it, sir, while Mr. Crumbine is on the telephone? Well, goodbye, sir. I wonder if he heard anything last night. Or has the poor beggar forgotten it? Well, I suppose we'll never know. Poor kid. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Chief Inspector. How did you get down here? The lift. Oh. Uh, simply take you to the wrong place. I gotta sack that. Sir. Oh, no, 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 no. This is quite the right place. Did you get your people? The carpenters? No. But they'll be coming in. The fellow? Yes, he's on his way. Turns out he lives in Kennington. No distance at all. What do you mean about the right place? You want something down here? I thought I'd have a look at this place where the carpenters store their tools. You do think it was a carpenter, did it? Where's this place? Just a step. Here. Not locked up. Well, they go in and out all day. Come on, I'll show you. Here they are. The carpenters? No, old chap. The tools. Let's have a look. Saws. Whatever these things are. Planes. Levels, drill braces. Mitre boxes. Hammers. I say, let's have a look at these. Suspicious, eh? Suspicious, eh? Yes. Well, let's have a look. Looks all right. So is this one. There's only three. Three what? Hammers. Uh, hammers. Better. This one's clean. Beautiful. These carpenter chairs. I mean it's clean. Oh. You mean like the old lady was. Carpenters don't usually wash their hammers, do they? Well, I don't know. I'll tell you, they don't. Look at the others. See? Sawdust. Rust here, paint. I see, but I know. Maybe it's new. I don't know. But I don't think so. Well, have you found the murder weapon, gentlemen? Whitehall 1212, to which you are listening, is compiled from records of authentic cases from Scotland Yard. The research is prepared by Percy Hoskins, Chief Crime Reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. In today's story, Chief Inspector Rouse has just discovered what may be the murder weapon in a cellar storeroom. Now, back to the story itself. The people from Scotland Yard for whom I had asked, photographers, fingerprint men, all the rest, including a relief for me, had now arrived, and I sent an earnest young constable back to the yard with the extraordinarily clean hammer, with instructions to take it to the forensic laboratory people for a thorough examination. I sat down in the corner of the cellar with Alistair Crombine and Fellows, the night porter, and held grave discussion. Good thing you got me before I got in the bed, sir. Why is that, Fellows? Uh, that's how I got my eyes shut, sir. You'd never have woken me up till Monday, sir. Oh, him. Is today Sunday? As ever was, sir. We all ought to be in church singing hymns or praying or going on like they do, sir. As I say, sir, it's a good thing you found me sitting there eating the last of my liver and onions and my Sunday night shirt, or I should never have waked up until 8 o'clock Tuesday night and Monday being my night off, sir. At which time you'd have been sacked, because you're due on the job at half past six, my dear fellows. I'm sorry, sir. That's why we weren't able to reach those carpenters. And all at non-conformist chapel, sir. Well, you can arrest them Monday, Chief Inspector. Why should I arrest them? Well, it was their hammer that Lady Johnston was murdered with, wasn't it? We don't know that yet, you know. Wait till I hear from the report. have to be certain you know, sir. You know what Sibley has been saying, sir? Oh, that nonsense. Oh, what's Sibley been saying? <laughs> if you listen to everything Sibley has been saying. What's Sibley been saying? He says he recognized them, sir. At least three or four times he told me, sir. What's Sipley been saying? Oh, a lot of nonsense. What, fellows? Well, sir, excuse me, Mr. Combine. He's been hearing voices. Voices? Voices? 
What kind of voices, fellows? Well, uh, may I tell him, sir, what Tiffany's been saying? <laughs> if you want to make a fool of yourself. I believe him, sir. That lad wouldn't tell a lie. He hasn't brains enough to tell a lie. Well, what's he been saying about voices? He's been hearing him, sir, nearly every night for a week. What sort of voices, fellows? Chevrolet. Let's have him in here and ask him. And he's gone, sir. I, I met him when I came in. I sent him out for some coffee for all these Scotland Yard fellows. Oh, thank you, sir. We're all very grateful. Wonder where all my men are. All over the place. Well, sir, Sibley's been telling me uh, he sleeps here at night, sir, in the other end of the cellar. That three times, I think it is, he's been he's been waked up and by strange men and voices whispering. He's bad. Now, wait, sir. I thought I heard him myself. And Ziffley and me been, well, we've gone hunting for him all over the hotel. Why not? Well, no, sir, but I believe they're the ones who stole that hammer, if they did, and killed poor Lady Johnson with it. Ziffley swears he's heard them. Unless it's a, a what is it, a, an hallucination. Might be, you know. He's been waking me up every night, practically. You don't believe it. Well, clues sometimes come from the strangest places. Well, there might have been somebody planning to. Yeah. Still, we never found anybody. It'd be extraordinary if you did, fellow. Beg your pardon, sir? It isn't that simple. But, sir... But it's interesting enough to make me want to know more, I can assure you of you that. You so? <laughs> Nonsense. The men's dark. Well, we'll see. <laughs> and at that moment, the earnest young constable I'd sent to the laboratory with the two-clean hammer arrived. Well, constable, I said... Yes, sir. They've examined it. There's a preliminary report, sir. I was being a little too Sherlock Holmes. No, sir. Eh? No, sir. Why? Well, should I be for these gentlemen, sir? Eh? Oh, come by. Well, it's your hotel, and fellows. Uh, perhaps we may find your whisperer. Zipper is, sir. Speak up, Constable. Well, sir, first the laboratory said the hammer looked too clean to be true. Ha. Huh. It was. It had been wiped clean. Exactly what I said. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, when they started to examine it under a low-power microscope, sir... What did they find? A drop of blood. A blood stain, sir. Well, well, well. Yes, sir. Under one of the claws, here, where the cleaning rag missed it. The type? A, B, sir. Under what type Lady Johnston's is? Well, we got a sample, sir. That's what took me so long. What type? They're identical, sir. This is the weapon she was killed with. Constable, uh, There's I... something else, sir. What's that, Constable? Well, uh, sir... Will you gentlemen excuse me for a moment, please? Uh, oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, Constable? I stopped by the CRO, sir. The criminal records, I was, hmm? Well, that's quite right. There should be a check made of every person concerned in every crime investigated, of course. I have some checks, sir. Good. Here. Both these people? Yes, sir. Let's see. Better turn your back to them, sir. Yeah. Combine and Alistair. No record. Well, I'm glad of that. Yes, sir. Read the other. Fellows George. No record. Well. The other one, sir. Sipoli, Joseph Adonarum. Oh, no. Read it, sir. I needn't need to more than glance at the card. Sipoli, Joseph Adam Nyram had been convicted twice. Once for robbery, once for causing grievous bodily harm. Both felonies. Who was not quite right? And when Sipoli returned with the coffee for the Scotland Yard men, the... Ernest Young Constable and I called him aside. In Sibley's own room, we showed him the card containing the notation from the criminal records office. He looked at me with something of a sneer, and his voice wasn't the same. Well, Coffer, I suppose you want to search me. I turned away while the constable frisked him, as the Americans put it. Nobody said anything. When I turned back, Sibley was grinning at me. The constable looked at me in horror. There on the little table before them lay a blood-stained handkerchief. It was in his pocket, sir. <laughs> Don't let that give you any ideas, Chief Inspector. I was boxing the day before yesterday with good old fellows, and he blooded me nose. 
Ask him. Get him, Constable, please. Yes, sir. Mr. Fellows. Fellows! Come in here, please, Mr. Fellows. Right! Come in! Ask him. What's wanted, sir? Fellows, were you boxing with Sipoli here the day before yesterday? Yes. Oh, yes, sir, I was. See? Did you... Give you a bloody nose, didn't I, sir? <laughs> and here's the handkerchief I sopped it up with. Uh, have you been carrying that wretched thing about in your pocket all this time? <laughs> But when we sent the blood-stained handkerchief to the laboratory, they found the blood on it was not type A, simply his own, but type AB, which was Lady Johnston's. Confronted with this anomaly, Sipley made a statement. Yes, it's her blood. Yes, I killed her. I'm sorry I didn't get all of the blood off the hammer. I made up the story of the people whispering. So if I couldn't blame it on the carpenters, there'd be somebody else. You'll find the handkerchief I used for my blue nose on the floor of my room, under the rug by my bed. <laughs> I just pocketed the wrong one. They both looked to lock. It's no good, I give up. I murdered the old... Why? I'll tell you why. Because everyone said I wasn't quite bright. Because nobody would bother to learn my name, Joseph Adoniram Sipoli. They called me boy. Just like the old lady did. Boy. So I killed her. I wish I could kill all of you. I didn't get any of the money, though. Fellows came along too soon, looking for the people that whispered. So I went along with him. <laughs> we didn't find anybody. Boy. Boy, indeed. Not quite bright, indeed. Well, I almost got away with it, didn't I? Almost. Joseph Adoniram Fully was hanged at Penterville Prison and his body's buried in the precincts of the prison. The boy who was not quite bright. He wasn't a boy, though. He was 27 years old, so he looked much younger, as the prison surgeon who made the post-mortem examination said. Heard today on Whitehall 1212 was Horace Brayon as Inspector Rouse. Others in the order of their appearance were Harvey Hayes, Morris Dallimore, Gordon Stern, Evan Thomas, and Lester Fletcher. This is Lionel Rico speaking. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed by Willis Cooper. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Oh, one, two, one, two, quickly. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have for obvious reasons been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. 
Here are the participants in case number 604-MR-530 from the official files of Scotland Yard. Leo M. Stefanovich, former member of the Polish Navy. Yes, I deserted the Navy. Marian Konieczki, who'd fought in Spain. What I am interested in is money. Kazimir Kashuba, <laughs> who was found dead. Albert Stevens, the copper's narc. It's a living. Superintendent Alistair Watkins of Scotland Yard. I must warn you that if you expect high adventure in Limehouse or sinister orientals lurking in dark byways, you'd best turn off your wireless now. We're quite ordinary people at Scotland Yard. Professional policemen, catchers of criminals, and we don't go in much for the picturesque, the way we are sometimes pictured. However, if you'd like to see how we proceed upon a case, I'll ask you to step inside our black museum and meet the man in charge of it. Come in. This is Chief Inspector John Davidson, who's in charge here. How do you do? I'm afraid that the so-called Black Museum is neither black nor a museum, nor is it the Grand Guignol. We have here a large number of guns, knives, other weapons which have been used in crimes. We have also disguises, clothing, exhibits of all sorts that have helped in solving many of these crimes. I think you ought to explain, John, why we keep these gruesome relics. Yes, indeed. They're here for a purpose quite removed from idle curiosity. They're principally for the use of the men of Scotland Yard in studying crime techniques and exemplars of crime methods. They bring to life the cold words contained in our files and are most useful as well as graphic. For example, in this case, Superintendent Watkins is reenacting for you. Now, this is a bullet that killed a man. It was fired from this gun. 32 caliber Waltham automatic pistol. And it was Scotland Yard's job to prove that. And this, the top of an ordinary mechanical pencil. This is a very important bit of evidence. Just a cheap little metal pencil. It wasn't cheap for the man who lost it, John. Well, it cost him his life, you see. We were standing in the corner of a saloon bar in Whitechapel, talking. Albert Stevens, the copper's narc, and me. I expect you don't know what a narc is. N-A-R-K. In America, I think you call him a stool pigeon. Every detective in the world has his pet narc. And Albert Stevens was mine. It was an insignificant place we were in, and Albert Stevens, two mild and bitters, had set him talking sixteen to the dozen. I don't suppose you'd know him by sight, sir. But I could tell you how to find them. That is, I've seen them about here and there. It's American cigarettes they're handing now. But they ain't got many left. And when they're sold out of them, they'll try something else. Have you got any ideas of it? No, sir, not yet. But it'll be something big, I'm sure of that. Do they know you, do you suppose? <laughs> Nobody knows it's a taxi driver, sir. They've rode in my cab twice now. And they've never even looked at my face. But uh, I've looked at them. Will you have another mild and bitter, Albert? Well, I wouldn't say no, sir. Here, miss. Fill this up here, will you, again? Will you? Thank you. They're some kind of foreigners, sir, they are. Uh, Thank you, miss. Uh, This I know. They're in the black market up to here. You said that. What kind of foreigners? I can't understand them much. Except that they talk about, well, what they think is English. Greeks or Spaniards or Russians, I think. All three of them. Oh, they tip quite nice, too. But uh, you're sure they're in the black market? No doubt about it, sir. I hear enough about it. Don't know their names. Well, one is called Marion. Marion? And the other's name is Kashmir. Kashmir. <laughs> Maybe he's an Hindu. And the other is a gentleman in some kind of navy, sir. Not ours. Some foreign navy. He wears a uniform. Who seems to be the boss? Well, I'd say this year, Kashmir is, sir. Uh, he, he's a odd man, he is, sir. Uh... Is that all you know about them, then? That's all I know right now, sir. Well, ain't that worth three pints a mild and bitter, sir? Yeah, just about, Albert. Well, I was sort of hoping you'd have a spare ten shilling note on you, sir. I have, Albert, but not for you, my lad. When you've something better than a comic trio of foreigners who gibber about American cigarettes, maybe, but not till then. 
Would you like to buy a magnificent new solid gold mechanical pencil, sir? Here, here, here. A sacrifice for ten shillings. <laughs> Where'd you get it? A lady gave it to me, sir. Now, what say? Say seven and six to you, sir. Come now, Albert. You know that's worth all of ninepence. Ninepence, then, sir? I need the money. Come off it, Albert. Well, then, sir. What? What? What did you say if I told you these foreign blokes is murderers? Shouldn't believe a word of it. Oh, they might be, sir. Well, when you can prove it, come round and see me, Albert. Well, don't I get another pint, sir? Uh, here, miss. Another of the same for my friend here. Night, Albert. At Scotland Yard next morning, I walked leisurely down the long corridor on the second floor that leads to my office. A voice hailed me as I opened the door to my office, and I looked back. It was Detective Sergeant Llewellyn, a Welshman who had been a constable at the Water Street Police Station when I was a sergeant. Here was a welcome face. David, I said, I've not seen you in six months. Longer than that, indeed, Superintendent. It's ten months, and I'm very glad to be seeing you. Where have you been? To the army all this time, sir. I was seconded to MI5. Yes, yes, I heard that. It was tiresome work, but now I'm back. Thanks, indeed, to the Lord. (laughs) Taking a well-earned rest, I expect. Oh, indeed, to goodness, no. There's no rest for the wicked. (laughs) I'm on a case already. Can we have dinner this evening, then? I'm not so sure, sir. What have they given you? Oh, a murder. Good bloody one? I've just seen the man. He's bloody enough, indeed. They found him shot to death in his car early this morning. Where? Chepstow Place, Notting Hill. The constable who found him in his car, parked beside the curb, thought he was taken with drink and sound asleep. <laughs> but it was a thirty-two caliber bullet in the back of his neck and out the front of his head. Very gory. Know who he was? A foreigner, it seems, with the name of Casimir Kersuba. Oh, Whatever is the matter, then? Do you know him? Come on in my room here. I don't know the chap, but I have an idea I know someone who does. Well, indeed, to goodness. Come on in. Come on in while I telephone. I've got his number in my book here. At least a number where I can reach him. Ah, here it is. Whoever is he, Superintendent? chap named Albert Stevens, a narc. Talking to him just last night. Mentioned a chap named Kashmir, he called him. Foreigner. (laughs) Just might be. Now, where is the beggar? Every little bit. Yes, who is it? Oh, oh, hello. Is Albert there? Albert Stevens? Yes, been home since yesterday morning. Who wants him? When he comes in, tell him to telephone Watkins. Watkins, got that? Hoskins? Watkins. W-A-T-K-I-N-S. He knows me. What do you want? Just tell him to call me, that's all. Does he know where to call? Yes, it's very important. Do you understand? He ain't come home since just the morning. All right, have him telephone me at once. You needn't shout at me, Mr. Bloody Well Watkins. Goodbye. Not there. He'll telephone me. I say, where can I reach you? Oh, I've got all this report on the man to write up, for goodness sake. I'll be in my office till noon. Oh, he'll telephone me before that, I'm sure. Well, I must be going, sir. I'm sorry I couldn't reach him just now. But I'll be in touch with you as soon as I hear from him. I'll be very grateful to you, sir. It was good seeing you again. Been a long time, Llewellyn. Well, goodbye. So long. So long, old chap. Oh, you dropped something. Hey, where? There on the floor, beside your right foot. Oh, must have thrown this. What is it? Found it in the car with the dead man. Huh? A top off a cheap mechanical pencil. Let's see it. Do you mind? Not at all. Don't have to be careful of fingerprints. They've had it in the laboratory. Nothing on it. That's it. Beg your pardon, sir. I've seen this pencil before, Lou. Oh, millions of them about, no doubt. The chap that was killed must have lost it. No. Eh? I've seen this particular one before. I saw it last night. I don't follow you, sir. Huh. That settles it. Look here, closely. Yes. See these initials scratched on it? Very tiny here. Yeah. Probably done with a pocket knife. Is it? A.S. By crikey, A.S., that's what they are. Whose do you suppose? Uh, he offered to sell it to me last night. Who? Albert Stevens, the copper's knock. I was just trying to telephone. Goodness sake. So that's why he hasn't come home. Eh? He said he knew this, Casimir. He said 
Casimir had money. And money was what he needed. Well, Casimir was robbed, we know that. But I never knew a copper's knock to have the courage to commit murder, sir. <laughs> Why, I... I bought him the courage, old boy. Four pints of mild and bitter. Suppose that makes me an accessory to murder? The constables who were dispatched to the home of Albert Stevens reported that he was still absent. At 11 the next morning, he had not yet come home. His wife knew nothing of his whereabouts, nor did the garage people where he usually kept his cab. At noon, a teletype signal was sent to all metropolitan police stations giving a description of the man and the number of his cab, GLP-301. The same information was published next day in Metropolitan Informations, which goes to all police officers. There was no immediate response. Neither the man nor the cab could be found. By now, Superintendent Watkins had been officially assigned to the case, and on the morning of the fourth day, we held a strategy meeting in his office. He had some new information for me. They found the gun. Indeed, sir. They'd been taking the car to pieces down at Hendon, for you know. They found a thirty-two caliber Walther automatic pistol hidden in the lining of the top. Good. Our friend Casimir was killed by a thirty-two caliber bullet, you know. And ballistics assures me that this is the gun from which it was fired. Good. Fingerprints? What? Fingerprints? None. The ballistics say they're sure that more than one shot was fired from the gun. How could they tell that? There, there are two cartridges missing from the clip. And it seems they found too much powder fouling in the receiver and the barrel for one shot. I, I don't quite understand, but they're quite positive. They find more than one bullet? Only the one that went through Casimir's head was embedded in the dash of the car. Where's this other one, then? Somebody else's body, I expect. Hmm. That? Whose, I say? Yes. Oh, blast. Sir. Superintendent Watkins, him. Hi, Watkins. Fletcher here, T Division. Hello, sailor. Okay, we found your man, Albert Stevens. Oh, good. Found him. Oh. Where was he? Sitting in his taxi cab. Where? At the bottom of the Thames. What? Near Wapping Old Stairs. One of our boats found him. Is he dead? Twice dead, old chap. Drowned and a bullet through his heart. Well, so that's where the other bullet went. I admit I'd more or less dropped a brick in pinning all my hopes of a quick solution of the case on Albert Stevens. Llewellyn and I moved at once to realign our strategy. This was our estimate of the situation. It is possible that Stevens did murder Casimir, of course. Uh, possible, but not probable. The forensic laboratory people, the ballistics people, say that the bullet they found in Stevens' body was fired from the same gun that killed Casimir. The thirty-two Walther automatic they found in the car. But then, who killed who? Ah. Uh. I suspect that since the gun was found in the car with Casimir, he was the last one shot, wouldn't you? Well, then, of course, Stevens couldn't have killed him. Right. Stevens must have been dead and at the bottom of the Thames when Casimir was shot. Then who killed Casimir? Obviously not Stevens. The forensic laboratory can tell us who died first, I hope. We know. How? The gun. It was with Casimir, remember? Unless someone shot him, then took the gun and killed Stevens with it, pushed him into the Thames, and then brought the gun back. Sounds silly. Indeed. Then who shot Casimir? One of Stevens' friends might have if he knew Casimir killed Stevens. Revenge. How do we know Casimir shot Stevens? Well, we... Besides, Stevens didn't have any friends. Except me. I don't think I did it. His wife, perhaps? Yeah. Perhaps... Well, besides, how could she get that gun? Hmm. No friends. None I know of. I knew Albert rather well. Ha. <sighs> huh. What? Casimir had friends, though. Albert told me about them. Who? A man named, um, woman's name, um, uh, Marion. I don't know her. Him. And a man who wears a foreign Navy uniform. Polish? Casimir was Polish. And a deserter. I suspect our man's a deserter, too. They were all mixed up in the black market, Albert said. What sort of black market, sir? Oh, all sorts, it appears. Why should they kill Casimir? 
And or Albert Stevens. Well, Albert, that's simple. They found out he was an informer, a narc. Why Casimir? Oh, people had been murdered for money before. Perhaps Casimir was cheating them. He was apparently the boss. Well, a crook who cheats a fellow crook is asking for it. Let's get on to Marion and the Navy officer. All we have to do is find them. Now, allow me to digress for a moment. There was, of course, no record anywhere of Casimir's former address. We put people on that at once, suspecting that Marion and the Navy officer might live close to Casimir's home. But another day dragged by without tangible result. I was sitting gloomily in my office, trying to think of a more tenable theory than the one we had tentatively adopted. Oh, bless the phone. Yes, Watkins here. Glad to see you, sir. Inspector. What's her name? Name, please. Miss Dottie Telfer. Spell it, please. T-A-L-I-A-F-E-R-R-O. You've heard of me. I'm the actress. Miss Dottie Telfer, sir. And... Actress! You know me. Actress, sir. What's she want? She says it's in connection with Casimir... What was her name, miss? Cashew, that I said. I heard her. Yes, sir. Send her in. Yes, sir. And ask Sergeant Llewellyn if you'll just step in here. Yes, sir. Come in. Good afternoon, madam. Are you Superintendent Watkins? I am. Sit down, madam. I thank you. You said you knew something about Casimir Kashuba. Yeah, I saw him the express, but he's dead. Extremely. And good enough for him, I'd say. You knew him? Yes. He was a crook. I'm afraid you're rather late in telling us that, madam. Well, I mean to say I... I... What sort of dealings did you have with him? Why, I never had any. Well, I mean, he cheated me, and now he's dead. How am I going to get back the 17 pounds I gave him? That's what I want to know. Why did you give him 17 pounds? Oh, excuse me, sir. Oh, come on in, Llewellyn. This is Miss Dotty. Yes, sir. I'm a music hall star at the Shepherd's Bush Empire. How do you do, madam? Sit down, Llewellyn. Seems Miss Telfer has given Casimir 17 pounds. Whatever for, miss? Well, it was rather silly of me, but I couldn't resist it. Resist what? Well, I was having a, a late supper after the show last Tuesday, and there was a man, Kashmir Kashuba, it turned out to be, sitting two tables away from me. Is that the first time you met him? Of course. Do you think <clears throat> that... Uh, on the table before him was the most magnificent handbag. Handbag? A woman's handbag, the kind I hadn't seen for simply years. I couldn't resist doing what I did. What did you do, madam? <laughs> oh, I know it's breaking the law, but isn't everyone in the black market? Not everyone, exactly. I? Oh, well. I just stepped over to the table and introduced myself, and he gave me his name, and I said, would you mind terribly telling me where you got that adorable bag? I wanted one myself, you know. Black market. <laughs> So he said he manufactured them and that I could have one if I liked. All I had to do was to give him 17 pounds so that he could buy the special leather it was made of. And in a day or two, I could call at his flat and it would be ready for me, do you see? And you fell for that old one. You called at his flat. Would you believe it? When I called. He professed never having seen me. He said he was not a manufacturer. He wasn't. And nothing I could say would make him give me back my 17 pounds or the bag. And did you kill him then? I did not. Later, perhaps. I never killed anyone in my life. I'm a law-abiding... Will you give us the address, my dear law-abiding young woman? Well, it's in Maida Vale somewhere. I think I have it here, in my shabby old handbag. Thank you very much, Miss... Telfer, an, an actress. An actress, I think you said, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, that'll be all, Miss Telfer, and thank you very much. Come along, Llewellyn. Right. Yes, but how am I going to get my 17 pounds back? The man's dead You're now. not going to get it back, Miss Telfer. What? You're very fortunate. The black market's cost you only 17 pounds. It cost Casimir his life. Ready, Llewellyn? Within 20 minutes, a Scotland Yard car dropped us at the address and made a veil Miss Telfer, actress, had supplied us. We interviewed the proprietor of that dismal place, 
A cross-eyed young man in an unusually dirty waistcoat in the red mingus tartan. His name, he informed us, was Ian Kalbfleisch, and he had a cold. Well, he ain't here. We're quite aware of that, my good man. He's dead. Did you murder him? No. Are you in the black market, too? No. May we see his room? Tay is that Ebo. Whose is it, then? Another man. Who? An officer. <laughs> Navy officer. Oh? RN, RNR, or RNVR? Not one of ours. <clears throat> Polish Navy. When did this Polish naval officer take the room, Mr. Kalbflash? Day after the murder. Oh, you know the day of the murder, then? I can read. Was it all the papers? Is this man here now? No. Will he return? He always has. Was this naval officer a friend of Casimir's? I don't know. May we see the room? Got a warrant? Yes. All right. <laughs> Second door on the left. Come on, Lou. All right. It's unlocked. Come on. No, leave the door open, Lou. Our friend with a runny nose might just warn him that we're here. Right. I'll keep watch. While Llewellyn kept watch from the open door, I made a quick search of the place. I found nothing at all of any apparent importance until I went through the pockets of the navy greatcoat in the closet. I was about to exhibit my findings to Llewellyn when he hissed sharply at me from the doorway. What's up? Chap coming in, wearing a Navy uniform. People in your room, Commander. Who are they? For me. Scotland Yard. What, what, what do they want? If you'll come in, Commander, we'll be glad to tell you. Who are you? Sergeant Llewellyn of Scotland Yard. I think you'd best come in, sir. Come in, sir. What is the meaning of this, may I ask? What is your name, please? Leo M. Stefanowitz, Commander of Polish Navy. What do you want? I should like to ask you a question. Well? May I ask you where you got this mechanical pencil, sir? Uh, I will tell you. I got it, uh... Well, uh, where did you get it? I didn't kill him. Kill whom, Commander? Why, Kasimir Kashuba. Uh, this was Albert Stevens' pencil, Commander. I didn't kill Albert. The top of this pencil was found in the car with Kasimir Kashuba's body, Commander. I didn't do it. Perhaps you can explain, then. Yes, I... Well? Uh, uh, Marion did the killing. Oh, indeed, Marion. Uh, yes, I, I told him not. Uh, it was Marion who did it, uh, not me. Oh, our friend Marion, he did it. Hmm. Yes, I am telling you the truth. Marion. Do you know where Marion is? I will take it to him. Yes, I, I will help you. He did it, and I will help you find him. Uh, please, and let I me see, take you to please. him. Please. Will you please? Casimir was my friend. I'm just wondering something, Inspector. Eh? Uh huh? I am wondering if Albert Stevens was also his friend. Let's go and find your friend, Marion, shall we, Commander? It was a quiet little hotel we drove to in the West End. Inspector Watkins and me and the commander all jammed in the police car together. The clerk nodded in a familiar way to Stefanovitz when we entered. Is my friend in? Yes, sir. Oh, don't announce us, please. We will work the lift ourselves. Uh, get in, gentlemen. All right. Uh, now we shall see justice done. Indeed. The first floor, gentlemen... Uh, the door directly opposite. Uh, here. Who is he? Uh, Leo, Marion. Who is with you? No one. Come in. Ah, Leo, my boy, I am glad. We are from Scotland Yard, sir. I warn you, both of you, that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used what is in evidence. the meaning of You this? murderer! What? Yes, these gentlemen have come to arrest you for the murder of Casimir. Secret! You traitor! You... You coward! Arrest him, gentlemen. He is the murderer. You, 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 look, look, this man. He's the one who fired shot. 
Huh? He's the one who did it. I, I see him do it. You see me? You know you did it. He's I, the one who did it. I'm not. He should catch me from behind as I sit in front seat. I was in the front seat. He did it. Shut up. Oh, Doug, talk with you, sir. Yeah, you yeah, yeah, you yeah, fell, yeah, You see, yeah, you. Yeah, gentlemen and gentlemen, Marian Konechny and Leo Stefanovich, I arrest you both on suspicion of having been involved in the murder of Kazimir Kasuba. And of Albert Stevens. You've both been warned. Have you nothing to say? At the trial, the two men admitted all the details of the two murders. Albert Stevens, it seems, had talked too much about his relations with the police, and someone in a moment of rage had shot him, and his cab had been dumped into the Thames. Walking away from there together, they'd stolen a motor car. Kasimir Kashubo, who had been drinking heavily, twitted his companions about the new hold he had on them as murderers. He boasted that he'd had no part in the crime, and one of the two men had shot him in the back of the neck with a Walther automatic pistol. Each man blamed the other. The jury took 25 minutes to decide who was guilty. Mr. Justice McConaughey placed the black cap on his head. Marian Konyatsny, Leo Stavanovich. The jury have found you and each of you guilty of the murder of Kasima Kashuba. It is the sentence of the court that you and each of you be taken to a lawful prison and thence to a place of execution. That you be there, each of you hanged by the neck until you are dead. And that you are respectfully... The two men appealed the verdict and won. They were immediately tried for the murder of Albert Stevens and again heard the fatal words. That you there, each of you... Be hanged by the neck until you are dead. The latter sentence was carried out. series Whitehall 1212, compiled by special permission from the official files of Scotland Yard. Only the names have been changed. Otherwise, the story is true. Research for Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express, and the stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper and produced by Jack Goldstein and Collie Small. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's adventure zooming your way today with Joel McRae featured in another authentic story based on the files of the Texas Rangers. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its files to bring you the unvarnished, true stories of some of its most celebrated cases. This is an accurate record, authentic from start to finish, of the most famous criminal investigation organization in the world, compiled from the files of Scotland Yard by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express, written and directed for radio by Willis Cooper. New Scotland Yard, the London headquarters of the Metropolitan Police, is situated near the embankment on Whitehall. Here also are the headquarters of the CID, the Criminal Investigation Department, the body of men whose exploits for more than a hundred years have made the name Scotland Yard synonymous with the brilliant detection of crime, the unrelenting pursuit of the criminal, and the presentation of the painstakingly acquired evidence that assures his eventual punishment. Police officials of every nation in the world are constant visitors to Scotland Yard. Some of them come as observers of Scotland Yard methods, others on official police business, and many remain as students of Scotland Yard's crime... It was raining in London the second day of my visit to Scotland Yard. It practically always rains in London. I got out of my taxi and walked through the gates of Scotland Yard shivering, and the red-faced young constable at the steps of the building was very polite. 
but he was also very firm with me. I said, good afternoon, Constable. Good afternoon, sir. Commander Rawlings is expecting you. Uh, you're the American gentleman, aren't you, sir? That's right. From Minnesota, sir? From where? Minnesota, sir. Minnesota? Oh, thank you, sir. Commander Rawlings will be in the Black Museum, sir. Where is that? It's inside, sir. You take the stairway down to your left. Third door on the right, sir. Right, oh, Constable. Right, sir. I'd been there the day before. Up the stone steps, through the heavy doors, into the big, bare outer corridor with a musty old smell that every copper in the world can recognize with his eyes shut. Look in through, sir. Deputy Commander Rawlings, Sergeant. Oh, you're the American gentleman, sir. Down the stairway, third door on the right, sir. Down the stairway, third door on the right, sir. Sir, polite cops. Well, third door on the right. One, two, three. Come in, please. Ah, good afternoon. Afternoon, Mr. Rawlings. Uh, do come in, old boy. Glad to see you, Mr. Rawlings. Mind if I smoke a cigar? Uh, not at all. And welcome to our little chamber of horrors. Quite a place. Who's that? That? Oh, uh, death mask of Heinrich Himmler. You know, Hitler's... I remember, yeah. The, the SS man, Butcher. Some of the chaps took him in, you know. But he was a, a trifle too quick with the poison. What's this? Gunny sacks. Oh, yes. Uh, a bloke named Manton wrapped his ex-wife up in it. 1943. A place called Newton. What happened to him? Took the 8 o'clock walk. Huh? Execution time was always 8 o'clock. Bloody early. Oh. Mrs. Rachel Dobkin. Lost property, eh? What is it? Looks like a burnt chicken bone that somebody busted. That is Mrs. Rachel Dobkin. It was a gang of navvies that found the skeleton. Navvies? Uh, laborers, you know, pick and shovel workmen. Ah. All over London at the time, uh, that was in July 1942, workmen were tidying up uh, the bombed out wreckage. The blitz, you know, uh, they did quite a good job. Uh, this gang was working on a Baptist chapel in Kensington, piling up bricks and mortar, uh, digging into the ruins for buried victims and whatnot. They uncovered a good many, incidentally. Well, they called a nearby police constable and reported it uh, as they were required to do. The constable took the routine notes as the navvy gave him the facts. I prized up this here stone slab, and there he was, just like he is. Lord Stone the Crows, I says, like, he looks a natural down there. And I looks again, and I says to Sammy, yes, yeah, Sammy, I says, what's a skinnington doing all burned up like this? And down in the basement of a Baptist chapel, I says. That sword, Hitler, I says. What do you think, Constable? Well, not knowing, I can't say. All right, then, I'll call the yard and have him pick him up. What's the poor Skellington done, Scotland Yard wants him? Identify the poor fellow, Cuthbert, like we always do. So we can see if he's to be charged to Hitler's account or was murdered or something. In a Baptist chapel, Constable? And don't muck him about, neither. Before the yard men get here, he's burnt and broke up enough as it is. The laboratory will have a time not off with him finding out who he was. Mine now. Who oh, does he think he is? A bloody prime minister? Muck a bad with a skeleton indeed. I wouldn't even brush the plaster dust off the poor thing. Yeah, that ain't plaster dust, mate. It ain't? What is it? Well, I was a master mason for the blitz, mate. I know quick line when I see it. Quick line won't destroy a body, Rawlings. That's a myth, a superstition. You know that. But murderers don't usually know it, old boy. I see what you mean. Keith Simpson, the home office pathologist, walked into my room up the stairs the next day. Skeleton was a lady, Commander. Oh? Yes. About five feet tall, I should say. Oh. Between 40 and 50 years of age, probably wore an upper dental plate with seven teeth. Four other teeth had fillings. Oh, found two or three strands of grey hair also. Well, pass it on to Edward. She's got to be identified. There's quite a job, I should say. Has to be done. Is that all? Uh, you said something about quicklime. Yes. No trace of quicklime in any other part of the rubble of this chapel except near the skeleton. Uh, suspicious of murder. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, have a look at this. Yeah. What is it? The thing the skeleton talked with. Talked? When she was alive. The trachea, voice box. Oh. Look here. Mm. See these things? Yeah. These little wing affairs? Oh. Very fragile. Now, the upper horn of this wing... Yes, it's been broken. Yeah, this, my dear Commander Rollins, is one of the most significant fractures in the whole field of forensic medicine. Assume that I've asked a question. It is almost always caused by one means, manual pressure. Oh? Strangulation. Checking the missing person's register occupied several weeks, and the yard men found 281 names of missing women between the ages of 40 and 50, around five feet tall and with gray hair. I think they were. Then we were faced with a problem of finding which one of these women wore an upper dental plate of seven teeth and also had four other teeth which had been filled. On the 85th personal call, Detective Constable Charles Barry reported that a woman in Bayswater, whose missing sister's name was on our list, had told him this sister had worn false teeth and an upper dental plate. The woman who had disappeared on Good Friday, 1941, 16 months previous, had been married, but living apart from her husband. Her name was uh, Mrs. Rachel Dobkin. Uh-huh. Something clicked in my mind, I I had seen that name and that date before somewhere. Uh, that was uh, at the time of the Great Easter Blitz of 41, when the Luftwaffe really poured it on us. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, I sent uh, the files for a copy of the Police Gazette of April 11, 1941. The Police Gazette? The Yard's Daily Police newspaper. Oh. We've got a Police Gazette in the States, too, but uh, it's kind of different. Yes, I dare say. Well, I, I found the item I wanted, a very brief one under Lost and Found Articles. A woman's purse had been found in a post office at Guildford in Surrey by the postmistress when the office was closed on the evening of Good Friday, 1941. Well? It was Mrs. Rachel Dobkin's purse. I don't get it. Well, <laughs> neither did we. I assigned Detective Inspector Lewis Hatton to work with me. We agreed it was most baffling. Most baffling? Hmm. No question that this was her purse. Ration card, in the name of Mrs. Rachel Dobkin. Identity card, same name. Ten shilling note, eleven pence and coin, lipstick, comb, mirror. Two tram tickets. Hers, all right. Curious. Curious there's no return ticket to London. Perhaps she was running away. She'd not get far in England without her ration and her identity card. No inquiries were ever made for the purse. Mm. And uh, we find her skeleton in Kensington 15 months later. Sure it was hers? No doubt at all. We found a dentist almost at once. He positively identified the jaw and the fillings and the teeth. Charts? We showed the sergeant his charts made at the time he did the work. They checked. Um, when was that... Um... Chapel Place destroyed. The day before Easter, Saturday. It wasn't a bomb hit. Knocked down by concussion. No hit. But she was reported missing the day before. Good Friday. Aye. No fire either. But the skeleton was burned, charred. Baffling. Where are you going, Hatton? Oh, I thought I'd take a run up to Kensington again. I'd like to see the Kensington Fire Brigade's occurrence book. And there wasn't any fire? No, not on the night of the raids, uh, Saturday, but we don't know about the other days, do we? What? Telephone me if you find anything. A hunch. A hunch, sir, that's right. Uh, sometimes they, uh, what is it you Americans say, uh, pay off? Pay off, that's right. Sometimes they pay off. Hatton didn't telephone me. He came bursting unceremoniously into my room upstairs two hours later. Eh? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. There was a fire. Really? I saw the occurrence book at the Kensington Fire Brigade. The fire was on Tuesday the 15th at 11.31. That was when the Kensington Police Station telephoned it in. What? 
One of the constables had discovered it. Police constable? That's in the police occurrence book, too. But didn't the ARP fire watchers have... No, no, the fire watchers didn't report it at all. Well, maybe there wasn't a fire watcher there. Oh, yes, there was one, sir. Don't you want to know his name, Commander Rawlings? What? The name of the fire watcher who didn't report the fire in the chapel where the skeleton was found is... Harry Dobkin. I called for a meeting of all those who were concerned in the case. Keith Simpson, the Home Office pathologist. Good evening, Detective sir. Detective Inspector Hatton. Sorry to be late, sir. Uh, Station Sergeant Andrew C. McLeod of Kensington. Yes, sir. And myself. McLeod was there to tell us what he knew. The others to lend me a hand in taking stock and determining what should be done next. Uh, first, I asked Hatton, uh, have you uh, discovered Harry Dobkin? Unfortunately, not yet, sir. Why? Well, it is true, sir, that he was employed as a fire watcher by the firm of manufacturing chemists who... Buildings had joined the chapel in Kensington, but they informed me that his services were unsatisfactory and he was sacked on 14th September last year. He wasn't an enrolled ARP member then? No, sir. He was employed as a private fire watcher. We've checked the address he'd given. The place was destroyed by enemy action on the night of... Uh, night of 21-22 February this year. There has been no trace of him since. Due inquiry is being made, however. Oh, naturally, sir. And it is certain that he was on duty the night of the fire on Tuesday 15, April uh, 1941. Yes, sir. It's a matter of record in Station Sergeant McLeod's occurrence book. <clears throat> yes, sir. According to the occurrence book, P.C. Ivor Lamb of Kensington Police Station saw him, recognized him, and spoke with him after the fire was extinguished by the fire brigade. Uh, I've brought with me the page in question, sir. Uh, third entry from the top, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, nothing much we can do until we see Dobkin. We'll find him, sir. Unless he's gone for a Burton. Unless he's dead, yes, sir. Now, um, let's see what we have. Keith Simpson says the woman was murdered. Yes, I am strongly of that opinion, Commander Rollins. You believe that she was murdered by her husband, Harry Dobkin? I have no opinions whatever on that subject, Commander. That is a detective matter, not a medical one. However, I believe that you'll find that she was murdered. <clears throat> uh, one moment, Sergeant McLeod. Simpson, you are convinced the skeleton was that of Mrs. Rachel Dobkin? I would testify to that effect. There is the matter of the deduced description tallying with that of Mrs. Dobkin. The teeth have been positively identified as hers, and I have here what I consider highly important corroborative evidence. Now, this is a film copy of a full-face photograph of Rachel Dobkin. Oh, let me see. And this is an X-ray photograph to the same scale of the skull of the victim. Now, I superimpose them. And you observe that there are at least five points of coincidence. Mm -hmm. Observe. Mm -hmm. Size, yeah. height, and width of the eye sockets. Right. Mm -hmm. Height and width of the nose space. Mm -hmm. I, I, I say, I, I should say there is no doubt that the victim was Rachel Dupkin. As I stated, I suspect murder. Well, as the uncalled for purse in the post office at Guildford, for one thing. If the woman were alive, she'd certainly make inquiries about a lost purse. She couldn't live without her identity card and her ration book. Yes, and that broken bone in the voice box of the skeleton is almost unmistakable evidence of strangulation. Manual strangulation. <clears throat> sir. Oh, yes, sir, Sergeant McLeod. Sir, this man, Dobkin, uh, was living apart from his wife. Uh, it was uh, a legal separation. Yes, we know that. It's something you don't know, sir. Begging your pardon. Dobkin had been contributing to his wife's support for several years. What? Aye, but he was very irregular about it. You know, she had him in court for it. So? Yes, sir. Well, now, up to the end of the second week in April, he had been quite dilatory about paying in his weekly 20 shillings. How do you know? He had to make the payments at the Kensington police station, sir, either to me or my assistant. Oh. And he hadn't paid anything in since, uh, the 18th September 1940. Well, that may... Yes? Excuse me, sir. There's an urgent telephone call for Station Sergeant McLeod. Kensington Police Station calling. 
Uh, will you excuse me, sir? Oh, you can take it right right here, Sergeant. Uh, there's a telephone over there, uh, top of the bookcase. Oh, aye. Well, thank you, sir. Very good, Constable. Yes, sir. Interesting that Lisa... It might have something to do with her motive, though. Yes, of course. Well, it's good to have a record of it anyway. Your friend Dobkin hasn't been blown to bits. Yes, and if you have enough evidence to charge her with murder... Good thorough chap, this Kensington man. Sergeant McLeod? Oh, the best, an old guardsman. Oh, so? CSM, 4th Battalion, Scots Guards in the First War. Military medal with bar, DCM. <laughs> good man. <laughs> you thought that moustache spelled Sergeant Major, didn't they? <laughs> Sir, that was Detective Constable Sanderson from our house. Yes? He's uh, spoken to the parson of that church. Parson tells him nothing inflammable was oh. ever stored in that cellar where the skeleton was found. Mm. Ah, but when he went to view the damage after the fire, on the morning after, that was on Wednesday, 16th of April, 1941, he found a half-burned straw polyas in there. It had been torn open and set on fire. I see. Oh. It obviously did not belong there. Didn't the parson see the skeleton at the time? It was under that rock slab, sir. Ah, yes. Well, very interesting. Oh, uh, you didn't finish telling us about Dobkin and the money he wasn't paying to his wife at your station. Oh, I sir, that. Well, it, it's quite curious. You know, on the morning of the 16th of April, he showed up in Bigger's life and paid in his 20 shillings. Really? Yeah. did he? Aye, sir. And he showed up on the dot every Wednesday after that with payment until the date when he was sacked by his employers there in Kensington. And Mrs. Dobkin never appeared at your station to collect it. How could she, sir? She was dead. That was the way it all ended, then. Or did you find the murderer after all? Or was it murder after all? That bit of the late rather unlamented Mrs. Dobkin there would hardly be here in the Black Museum of Scotland Yard if it wasn't murder, old boy. Yes. You know, that broken bone there is real good evidence of strangulation, isn't it? It was good enough. Well, go on, go on. What did you do when you found out Harry Dobkin was dead, too? Give up the idea we that he... didn't he'd... find out that he was dead. But the bomb that... merely found out that he had disappeared. Oh. It would be rather a coincidence, wouldn't it? A woman apparently murdered under circumstances that involved her husband so deeply, and then the suspected husband popped off so conveniently before he was even suspected. Well... A little too much to swallow, a little too simple. Yeah. If I'd been in your Harry Dobkin spot, I'd be tickled silly if people thought I'd get pumped off. And if the opportunity offered, you'd be glad to walk away and say nothing to anyone. Let people think so. Um, that was one of the several mistakes Dobkin made. If he could have taken another name... But didn't he? There's the matter of identity cards. Ah. Oh. In a country at war, it's a little difficult to walk in and say, I'll have an identity card and a ration book in the name of uh, Sam Small or Bonerges Blitzen Jr. Uh, they ask embarrassing questions, you know. Spies, huh? It, spies they'd be thinking of. Right. And a few questions will discover the fact that your name is Harry Dobkin and there are more embarrassing questions and first thing, you know... Uh, I get it. So we reasoned if Harry Dobkin was still alive, he'd be alive somewhere as Harry Dobkin. And all we had to do was to find him. Uh-huh. Oh. And did you? Detective Inspector Hatton had the idea. On the first day of September, he walked into an establishment on Edgware Road, a shop that sold men's cheap clothing. It was the 39th place he had visited, and other yardmen had made similar inquiries in about 400 other similar shops all over London. He asked for the proprietor and was ushered into the man's little cubicle of an office. He identified himself. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Detective Inspector Hatton of Scotland Yard. Here are my credentials. What's the matter? There's nothing... I mean... It... I, I merely wish to see your records, sir. Records? Well, there's nothing... I'm looking for a name, sir. A purchaser of clothing of any sort between the 21st day of February and the present date. Well, uh, I, I don't... Uh, you know, uh, you are required by law to take the name of any purchaser of clothing who presents the proper ration coupons for the articles purchased. Well, or I can't uh, spend all... Or perhaps you sell articles without the proper coupons. An actionable offence. Oh, no. Uh, no, 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 Inspector. Uh, uh, may, uh, may I see your books? But of course, of course. 
I had them right here. Oh, dear. Hey, hey, hey. All up to date and correct. Thank you. Mm hmm. Taped. Henry. <laughs> Meredith. Oliver B. Barbassio and James. <laughs> Authoress Thomas. Dobkin. Harry. And the address. Did you find him? I thought he'd have to buy new clothing eventually. Thank you very much, sir. Good afternoon. Yes? Come in. Oh, Hatton. I found Dobkin, sir. Well, that's very good work, Detective Inspector. Thank you, sir. Where is he? Outside, sir. Well, uh, shall we have the gentleman in? By all means, sir. Come in, Mr. Dobkin. This is Mr. Harry Dobkin, Deputy Commander Rawlings. Come in, Mr. Dobkin. Have a chair. Thank you. Be seated, gentlemen. Might I ask what... Uh, why Scotland Yard is interested in me, Commander? Mr. Dobkin, you were a fire watcher near the chapel in Kensington where a fire occurred on the night of Tuesday, 15 April 1941. I was. Why did you not report that fire? Well, it's rather a story, sir. We should like to hear it, Mr. Dobkin. Well, uh, I was supposed to report to the fire warden at Neville Place. And did you do so? Well, no, sir, I didn't. Why, if you please? Oh, he wasn't there. Hmm. Where was he? Oh, I don't know, sir. I suppose he'd nipped around a corner or somewhere for a smoke or a mug-up or something. And Well, you understand, sir. I knew him quite well. What was his name? <laughs> Do you know, his, his name slipped my mind completely. Gord Gordon? Uh, Gresh? No, no. No, I'm, I'm afraid I've completely forgotten it. I did report it to post number seven, though. After the fire brigade had come and gone? Yes. I didn't want to leave the premises. You, you see... Why are you so interested in this after all this time, may I ask? Certain things happened that night. Oh, they must have happened whilst I was gone to report to post seven, sir. You saw nothing suspicious at all? No, sir, no, nothing at all. What happened? At any time that night? No, sir. The skeleton of a woman was found destroyed by fire in that cellar. There has been no fire in that place either before or since the 15th of April last year. Oh, dear, how dreadful. The woman was your former wife. I'm very sorry to hear that. I did hear that she had disappeared. I'm sorry, I, I dislike the woman intensely. You are surprised to hear of that? Well, naturally. But we'd been separated for some time. Uh, I'm afraid I've no tears for her. She was so... Well, never mind. So that's what became of her. And you have no knowledge, whatever, of the circumstances? No, none, whatever, sir. Very well, Mr. Dobkin. Thank you. We may perhaps call on you later. Is that all then, sir? Quite. Thank you for coming in. I'm terribly shocked, gentlemen. You have our sympathy, Mr. Dobkin. Good afternoon, sir. Well, uh, thank you, sir. Well? He's a liar. Yes? Excuse me, gentlemen. Uh, was there anything else found in that, that place? What sort of thing? Oh, why, uh, a pelleus, uh, a straw mattress. Why, the... why do you ask, Dobkin? Why, uh, why, you see, I had an old straw mattress on the roof of the building where I was fire watching, and, you know, it disappeared that same night. The... I thought perhaps someone could have stolen it and uh, used it to start the fire. I, uh, I'm sure I don't know. Well, uh, I, was, I was just thinking back. Well, if I can be of help in any way... Thank I'll... you, Mr. Dobkin. 
Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Dobkin. Asking for it, eh? We watched him quite closely for a week. Dobkin was puzzled, we discovered, and by the simple-mindedness of the yard people who had accepted his explanation so readily. Think he would be. But then he decided, apparently, that our ready acceptance was much too suspicious. Not smart, eh? Not so awfully smart. He called on me again. Hatton was with me. We were so genial and guileless, we listened so politely. I just thought I'd stop by and inquire what progress you're making. Oh? I remember that fire warden's name. Ah, Greenbaum his name was, Greenbaum. He told us his name was Gregory. Did he tell you I reported to him? Oh, yes, yes. Although he said his post was only two minutes away from the chapel, and if all the things that occurred, uh, placing your wife's body in the vault, doing all the other things, were done in the four minutes you were absent, well... I told you, I don't know anything about my wife's murder. Why, Mr. Dobkin, nobody has said anything about murder. Well, I, I don't know anything about it. I, I tell you, I didn't strangle her. I didn't. I didn't. Go I didn't. Ahead, I, Harry Dobkin, I, I arrest you on the charge of willful murder. No, I, I didn't. I must it. warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence against you. And what happened? He was brought to trial, and with the evidence that Scotland Yard was able to supply, the Crown found no difficulty whatever in convincing a jury of his guilt. There were out 25 minutes. The verdict was guilty, and he was sentenced to be hanged. On the evening of Thursday 10, September 1942, he made a final and complete confession. The following morning, Friday, 11 September, at 8 o'clock... <laughs> The story you have just heard was transcribed from the files of the Metropolitan Police, New Scotland Yard. Dates, names, and places are real. The story is true. The information came from Mr. Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express, and the true story was written and directed by Willis Cooper. <laughs> Whitehall, one, two, one, two. Hurry. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These records are drawn from the Scotland Yard files, and only the names of the participants have been changed. The research has been prepared by Mr. Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Mr. Willis Cooper. Here are the principal participants in Scotland Yard case number 397-MR381. Stanley Russell, shop clerk. Mr. Russell is not to be found. Mrs. Hope Russell, his wife. Mrs. Russell was reported missing on the day before Good Friday. Adolf Hitler's Luftwaffe. <laughs> Chief Inspector Bryce Purcell of Scotland Yard. I should like to introduce Deputy Commander William Bird of Scotland Yard, my superior officer. Before we proceed, I believe it would be a good idea to visit the Black Museum. Come along with me, if you please. After you, sir. 
Good afternoon, John. Good afternoon, sir. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson, curator of Scotland Yard's Black Museum. Well, how do you do? You came about case number 397MR381, I believe you said, sir. Right. Will you tell us about it, John? Well, this is the exhibit. No, don't touch it, please. It's quite fragile. And as you can see, it has already been broken. We have a great many other exhibits of crimes in these rooms. Murder weapons. Bloodstained garments. Bullets that have snuffed out many lives. Death masks and many notorious criminals. Almost every in instrument of violence that can be conceived. I should explain that these gruesome objects about us are not merely souvenirs. Many of them have aided our men in solving other crimes and bringing the perpetrators to justice. Now, this one... Tell us what this thing is, John. This is Mrs. Hope Russell. Sixteen months after the Easter Blitz of 1941, the work of clearing out bombed-out areas of London was still progressing. On the 12th July 1942, the Scotland Yard Information Room received an urgent call from P.C. John Dunn of the Kennington District. A patrol car in which Chief Inspector Purcell was riding was dispatched to the scene, a partially destroyed Baptist chapel. I was directed to the spot by P.C. Dunn, who was on point duty at the road intersection. Right over there, sir, where you see the men standing. They found some it, sir. The navvies that's working here. Right, thank you. Morning, boys. Morning. What have you found? Who are you, mate? I'm Chief Inspector Purcell, Scotland Yard. What's up? Down, sir. Down there. In that hole, sir. Yeah, it's an old burying wall, sir. But what is it? A skeleton, sir. He's dead. Up down, George, and Sean, with your torch. All right. There you see, sir. Here he is. Stand to one side, will you? He's off under this stone slab, sir. Don't see? I see him. Well... What's so strange about a skeleton and a burial vault? There ain't been anybody in there since 1934, sir. 1935. Uh, I was in that gang that moved the old corpses out of here, Herbert. It was 1934. We didn't leave a one. <coughs> God bless you. There's a quicklime down here, sir. Quicklime? How'd, uh, how'd quicklime get down there? You're the detective, mister. We just work here. The badly burned skeleton was removed to the pathological laboratories at Scotland Yard, together with the other articles found in the vault. A considerable amount of quicklime and a half-burned straw pellius which had partially covered the remains. There was nothing else. I stood beside Keith Briggs, the home office pathologist, while he completed his examination. What do you think, Keith? I asked. Well, she's dead. She? Well, it's a woman, all right. No question about that. The hip bones are characteristically a woman's. So is the sacrum here. And uh, well, how old a woman? Oh, middle aged, I'd say. See, the bones are fully developed, mm -hmm. so we know she was full grown. And there were one or two strands of long grey hair adhering to the skull. Here they are. And then the teeth here. What about them? Well, you see, they're pretty well worn. Now, you see here in the upper jaw. Mm -hmm. Seven of the uppers are missing. Now, oh. see these ridges? Yes. Well, they were caused by a dental plate, which probably consisted of seven teeth, and then... Uh, what are you looking for? The, the measuring tape. Oh, here. The lady was lying on it. What are you going to do now? Hmm, see how tall she was. She's rather jumbled about. Uh, and the, the feet, where are they? Oh, the thigh bone's all I need. Oh, hold it, please, huh? This one. Now, let's see. Let's see. Uh, yeah, 43 centimeters. Well, that's all right, sir. Now, 43 centimeters multiplied by 3.6. What are you doing? A sediment scale. You multiply the length of the thigh bone by 3.6. Man's is 3.7. And you get the exact height. Now, see, that's uh, 154.8 centimeters. 
We'll call it one meter fifty-five. Uh, meters thirty-nine point three seven and fifty-five hundredths of thirty-nine point three seven is twenty-one point six five. No, thirty-nine point three seven plus twenty-one point six five. That's uh, seven five twelve six nine ten nine ten nine three five six sixty-one point oh two inches. Oh, yeah. She was five feet one and two hundred inches tall. In a word, five foot one. What was her name? Whatever her name, sir, she was murdered. Consider that I've asked the question. Eh? Oh, oh, oh! How do I know? Well, this bone here. Where does it fit? This is what she talked with. It's the voice box, the trachea, you know, her throat. Look. See these little wing things up here? Mm -hmm. Oh, you see this one? See, it's broken. Well? Well, this is one of the most significant fractures in all forensic medicine, sir. Why? There's only one way to do it. Oh, come on, man. Don't come Sherlock Holmes on me. How do you do it? Well, I was about to say by manual pressure on the throat, sir. Strangulation, you mean? Intentional strangulation, sir. There's no other way. And then there's the quicklime. <laughs> Surely you know that quicklime will not destroy a body, sir. Yes, I know it, Keith. But murderers seldom do. <laughs> Reference to the ARP records showed that every other casualty and missing persons in Kennington had been accounted for. It was apparent that the victim had not been a resident of that district. I caused bulletins and charts of the teeth to be sent to all the dentists in London for identification. No results were forthcoming, and we were forced to conclude that the dentist in question had become an air-raid casualty, or that the work had been done in some other city. I gave Purcell a very difficult assignment. Difficult, sir? Um, well, it's not so difficult, but it's tedious. It'll take a long time. I know, but it's got to be done. I'm strongly of the opinion that it was murder. We checked carefully, sir, and the, the only quick line on the entire premises was that in the vault with the skeleton. I thought they might have dusted the entire place with quick line for sanitary purposes, but they hadn't. Certainly looks as if someone had wanted to dispose of a body. Until we know who she was, we'll never discover who he is. Ah, yes, sir. Well, I'll get cracking. I'll need men to go over the missing persons rushes, sir, to find the names and addresses. Every woman five feet tall, of middle age with gray hair, who is still missing now. And then I'll need more men to make inquiries of all the next of kin to see which of them wore false teeth. And to find out which one wore an upper plate that matches the one in Briggs's chart here. Mm. It'll take a good many men and a good bit of time, sir. You can get the men, Purcell, and we've got the time. Good luck. Oh, thank you, sir. Nothing whatever happened for two weeks except for the unrewarded activities of Purcell's men. I had a minor inspiration about the seventh day. Put me through to Sergeant Bowles, please. Commander Bird here, Sergeant. I should like you to send me all the file copies of the Metro operations for the period two weeks before to two weeks after the Easter Blitz of last year, please. Yes, at once, if you please. The Metropolitan Informations is a daily newspaper containing digests of all the crime news. It is usually invaluable. I pored over every issue, looking assiduously for an item that might prove of some help. I had reached the end of the first week after the date the Kennington Chapel was destroyed, with no results whatever, when Purcell reported. Found, sir. Oh, good. Here. Yeah. Here is the missing plate. Oh, that's much better than I'd hoped for, Purcell. Apparently the plate hurt her mouth. She often left it at home. As a matter of fact, I found it at her sister's. Oh? I stopped upstairs to see Keith Briggs in the laboratory, and they fit exactly, allowing for the fact that there's no flesh on the jawbones. Ah, here's Keith. Oh, is that right, Keith? Mm, that's right, sir. And the marks on the skeleton's teeth coincide exactly with these little clamps here. I've uh, brought the skull down. Yeah. You see, sir? Oh, she looks very fine. Congratulations, Purcell. Thank you, sir. The only thing is, uh, she was reported missing three days before the raid that destroyed the chapel. She was? It's in all the records, sir. Where were you, madame? Mm, she might have been hidden in the vault. Immediately she was murdered, sir. And then the fire, when the place was bombed... It must have been quite a hot fire. 
Let's see. The Kennington Fire Brigade, please. Yes. Oh, what's her name, Russell? Mrs. Hope Russell. Russell. Hope Russell, did you say... Oh, hello. Is that the Kennington Fire Brigade? The senior company officer, if you please. I'll wait. Hope Russell. I've run across that name somewhere. Yes? Thank you. Hello, this is Commander Bird at Scotland Yard. Do you remember during the Easter Blitz last year when the Baptist Chapel was destroyed there in Kennington? What I wanted to know was that a very severe fire... What? There was no fire. What? No fire, whatever, when the chapel was destroyed. Oh, two days later. Hmm, how very curious. It was reported by whom? The Kennington police. Or wasn't there a... Oh, look here, old chap. I'm sending at once for their divisional superintendent. Could you possibly come along with him to my office at the yard? Yes. I'm afraid it is rather important. I'll have him pick you up in his car. Thank you so much. At once, yes. No fire. Keith, would you mind? Get him in the fire chap over here at once. Use my name. Ask them both to bring their records for that night. Please. All right, sir. <coughs> no fire, eh? What's that woman's name, Purcell? Mrs. Hope Russell. I knew I remembered it. Look at this. Metro information, eh? Look under articles lost and found. I was just reading it. <sighs> lost and found. Here, the, the third item. Read that. Found by postmistress Guilford Surrey in the post office yesterday, a woman's purse. Black leather, plain, strap. Contents, lipstick, comb, mirror, two London tram tickets. Eleventh in coin, ration book, identity card, issued to Mrs. Hope Russell. Well, what was she doing in Guildford? Look at the date of the paper, Purcell. April? The... What was she doing in Guildford three days after the air raid in Kennington? <laughs> The divisional superintendent and the fire brigade officer from Kennington sat in my office with Purcell and me. I looked at the fire brigade records first. Now, here, sir, this is the day of the big raid when the chapel was destroyed. Good Friday evening, 11th of April, 1941. Yes. Every call is set down in the occurrence book here, sir. Yes, I know. Together with all the calls to the auxiliary fire service, the civilians, sir. Yes, I know. And you can see there's no report whatever of a fire at the Kennington Baptist Chapel from either source. Right. But over here, sir, on this page, Tuesday the 15th, four days later, 11 o'clock p.m. You see, sir? Mm -hmm. Chapel and so forth. Report telephoned in by Kennington Police Station. Do your records correspond, Superintendent? I'll read it to you, sir. 10.57 p.m. Tuesday, 15th of April. P.C. Allison telephone to report a fire at the ruins of the Baptist Chapel. Alarm telephone to Kennington Fire Brigade at 11 p.m. Your anger's up yourself, Robert. I did that indeed. Here's my initial. What do you think, Percival? Why did the police constable report it? Yes, I was just going to ask that. I don't understand, sir. Wasn't there a fire watcher? <laughs> Wasn't there? Well, sir, there, there was a fire watcher. There was supposed to be. Well, where was he? Asleep, sir, probably. Or out catching a drink somewhere. Not an ARP man. No, sir. A private man employed by the wholesale chemists across the road from the chapel. A thoroughly useless man. Completely undependable. Yeah, his employers caught up with him at last, sir. He was sacked six or seven weeks ago. I've not seen him since. Neither have I. Well, sounds like a spiv to me. He is, sir. I knew him quite well. He had a great deal of trouble with his wife, and I used to see him quite regularly. Oh. He agreed to pay in 18 shillings and ninepence, I, I think it was, weekly, at the police station for her, which he didn't ever do. <gasps> Not ever. Never once till Easter Monday last year, right after the big raid. He kept it up, too, till he was discharged and left. I suppose this chemical firm he worked for could put us on to him. I'd like to have a chat with the fellow. Wouldn't you, Purcell? I certainly would. I'll telephone them now and ask them if you'll give me the name of the firm and his name. Oh, his name is Stanley Russell. Russell? I wonder if you'd know his wife's name, Superintendent. Oh, I've seen it often enough. Yes, yes, sir. His name, uh, her name is uh, Mrs. Hope Russell. <laughs> Mrs. 
In the Pirates of Penzance, Gilbert and Sullivan complain bitterly that a policeman's lot is not a happy one. I subscribe most heartily to that sentiment. I would like you to hear Chief Inspector Purcell's report to me, just as he gave it in my office. Well, Purcell, I said, did you find our Mr. Stanley Russell all right? Uh, not there. Well, you've left men to wait for him, haven't you? Sir, I got the address of the place. Sergeant Hatton and I drove there in a yard car driven by Constable oh, Small. Oh, get on with it, man. The whole bloody place was gone, sir. Gone? The whole bloody block was destroyed. Destroyed by an enemy bomb in an air raid six months ago. One day after Russell moved in. Not one person in the whole building's been heard of since. Oh, sir, I respectfully request permission to go somewhere and get howling drunk. You know, Purcell, I think I'll go with you. But we didn't. We sat quietly in Commander Bird's office and thought long, dark thoughts. After a while, Keith Briggs, the pathologist... Observing the light inside, stopped by, and almost at the same time, John Davidson from the Back Museum came in to see what was up. <laughs> Nothing's up, John, I said. On the contrary. What happened? Purcell was just telling Keith here. The chap is a blitz casualty. Did? And may God have mercy on his soul. Mm, I'd rather hope to hear a bloke in a black cap say that, Keith. I thought we had him. Dead to rights. Oh, don't be so bloody American. I think we could have proved it. He strangled her, then hid her body in the vault. Took a handbag to Guilford and lost it in the post office there. Cleverly putting Scotland Yard off the scent. Timing was a little bad. And then when the Blitz came... Tried quick line first. Didn't work. Blitz came, and he set her afire. If, if he'd been a better fire watcher and not... Hiding a hole somewhere, he'd have known there was no fire that night. Yeah, but he wasn't a good fire watcher. He wasn't good at anything. I wonder... I wonder uh, what, John? What do you mean, John? Well, <clears throat> if I'd strangled my wife and burned her up, which God forbid, because I haven't one, <laughs> I'd be very happy to have people think I was dead. If I'd hear that my home was destroyed and everybody in it dead, I should be delighted. Most delighted. I changed my name. Not in wartime, you no, wouldn't. Say, no, that's no. right. Identity cards and ration books. Absolutely. I'd forgotten. Getting new ones in the name of Harry Hawkins or Sam Small <laughs> oh, would be difficult. <laughs> but even Scotland Yard would stop looking for me if they thought I was dead. Wouldn't they, Commander Bird? And you'd go around buying new clothing and whatnot, if you could, and presenting your own ration book in your own name and... Where are you going, Purcell? I'm going to stagger home through the blackout, sir, with your permission. I have a large number of men's clothing stores to interview beginning tomorrow. And I'd like to get a good night's sleep. Good night, all. The Stanley Russell crop was enormous. Chief Inspector Purcell discovered that 200... Let me see. 234 of them had purchased clothing since the date our Stanley Russell had been reported dead by enemy action. But not one of them was the Stanley Russell we wanted. We made thorough inquiries of all his known acquaintances, all to no avail. The war office had no record of our man. We were reluctantly forced to the conclusion that he was dead, or the, that he had heard of our search for him and gone to ground most effectively, as I said to a rather haggard Purcell. Purcell shook his head. Ah, uh, I'd like to keep on looking, sir, if I may. I have a hunch that he'll turn up unexpectedly. It will certainly be unexpected so far as I'm concerned. Hmm. I'd like to keep on trying, sir. Well, for a few weeks more, but I'm afraid... Commander Bird speaking. Yes, he's here. It's for you, Purcell. Well, I'll, I'll take it outside, sir. No, you... don't. Take it here. Thank you, sir. Chief Inspector Purcell here. Who is he? Oh? Well, I, I, I don't know him personally, but I know of him. Yes. 
Will you ask him to wait a moment? I'll ring you back. Sir. Yeah? I've <coughs> never been so shocked in all my life. Oh, really? What's happened? Somebody dead? Somebody's alive. What? If I'd heard this on the radio, I wouldn't have believed it. All right, what's happened? Mr. Stanley Russell is calling on us. Well, Brother Purcell, let him enter and be received in due form. <laughs> Will you show Mr. Stanley Russell in, please? Thank you. <laughs> you sound like a spider, Purcell. Thank you, sir. I feel I am. And a chair for our guest. Do you think I sound like a spider? Come in. Mr. Stanley Russell, sir. Good morning, gentlemen. I, I was looking for Inspector Purcell. Come in, sir. I'm Chief Inspector Purcell. How do you do, sir? And this is Commander Bird. Good morning. Good morning, sir. May I sit down? Thank you. Does one smoke in here? Yes, by all means. Will you... Will you try an Abdullah? Ta, I'm afraid I always smoke with binds. <coughs> now, I hear Scotland Yard is looking for me. That's <coughs> that's true. Why, may I ask? You've been extremely hard to find. Oh, I've been in the country. Derbyshire. We should have come there eventually. Oh, I've saved you the trouble. What do you want to see me about? You were a fire watcher, Mr. Russell, in Kennington. Yes. There was an unreported fire at the Baptist Chapel there whilst you were on duty. When? Two nights after the raid that destroyed the chapel. I didn't see any fire. Is that all you wanted? No, Mr. Russell. Well, I don't recall any fire, sir. You didn't see or hear the fire brigade? No, sir. Near 11 o'clock? Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> I must admit I wasn't there. Where were you? I did see the fire brigade moving away when I came back, but... Where were you? Oh, I was out of cigarettes, and I strolled around the corner to see if I could borrow one or two from the fire watcher at post four. He says he never saw you, Mr. Russell. Oh, he's probably forgotten. It's a long time ago. He will swear he didn't see you that night. Well, the fire obviously didn't do any damage. A woman was burned to death in it. Murdered? Do you know anything about her? Of course not. I, I'm very sorry to hear that anything like that... The woman was your wife. May I have one of your cigarettes, please? Thanks. So that's what became of her. Do you know anything about it? I'm afraid I must disappoint you, gentlemen. I wasn't on very good terms with her. We know that. I'm afraid I've no tears for her. She was... Oh, well, she's dead. now. I shan't say anything. Naturally, I'm shocked. Naturally. I'm afraid I'm not sorry. Do you know anyone who would have had a motive for murdering her? <laughs> you had a motive, didn't you, Mr. Russell? <laughs> I can see how you might think so, but I didn't murder her, I assure you. When did you last see her? I don't really remember. Several months before she was murdered, I think. How do you know she was murdered? Why, well, you said so. Did I? Oh, I would have had good cause to, Inspector, but I'd have been a fool to do it now, wouldn't I? Yes. Well, Mr. Russell, thank you for coming to see us. If there is anything else you remember, please come back and see us again. I think that's all for now. How can we find you if we need you? We may want your corroboration of certain facts. Well, I'll write down my address, sir. It's a sad affair, and you have our sympathy. Thank you, sir. I admit I'm terribly shocked. Of course. Well, here's the address and telephone number, sir. Thank you. Feel free to call on us at any time. Goodbye. Well, good goodbye, gentlemen. I was merely trying to do my duty. Oh, you've done it admirably, sir. Goodbye. goodbye. Thank you. Well, he's a liar. I know it. May I ask why you... Why would... I let him go? <laughs> he thinks he's got us completely fooled. He'll be back with more helpful information. Come in, Mr. Russell. 
I, I just remembered yeah. something that might be of importance. Uh, come in. I remembered that an old straw pelleus, uh, a mattress I used to catch 40 winks on, it was stolen about that time. Mm. Oh. Could that have been used to stop the fire? Did you find it? Yes, we found it. Oh, that's good. Well, I, I must go now. Oh, by the way, was the body destroyed? By the quicklime? Yes. What's the matter? You are a very clever man, Mr. Russell. Much too clever for your own good. Why? Why, may I ask? No one had mentioned quicklime except you. Well, I thought... I mean... I, I didn't... I wasn't even there. I, I tell you, I didn't touch her. I said you were much too clever for your own good. You... You think I... I didn't strangle her? Go ahead, Chief Inspector. Stand no. Russell, I arrest you on the charge of willful no, murder. I didn't do it. And I, I warn you that whatever no, you no, say will be taken no, down in writing no. and may be given in evidence. <laughs> the crime, the painstaking evidence Scotland Yard had collected, together with Stanley Russell's own statements, were sufficient to convince a jury that he had murdered his wife, Hope Russell, and burned her body. All his allegations of misconduct on her part were proved completely false. It was demonstrated at the trial that he had planned the murder for a long time, and having found a convenient time and place, had committed it. The verdict. The law, we, the jury, find the defendant guilty of willful murder. The sentence. Prisoner at the bar. Stand up. It is the sentence of this court that you be hanged by the neck until dead. And may God have mercy on your soul. You have heard the true story of case number 397MR381 from the files of Scotland Yard. The names of the participants have, for obvious reasons, been changed. Starting next week, Whitehall 1212 will be heard at a new time, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Research by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. Stories for radio written and directed by Willis Cooper. Next, listen for Tales of the Texas Rangers on NBC. Whitehall 1212. Quickly, please. For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These accurate records are drawn from the Scotland Yard file by special permission of Commissioner Sir Harold Scott. They're true in every respect, except for the names of the participants, which, for obvious reasons, have been changed. The research has been done by Mr. Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express, and the stories for radio are written and directed by Mr. Willis Cooper. Here are the principal participants in case number 201-MR340. Sidney Patterson, builder. Mr. Patterson is absent, sir. Detective Inspector Edmund Whitaker of Scotland Yard. It was quite obvious why Mr. Patterson was absent. There are other participants in our case number 201 MR340, but not of the same importance as Mr. Patterson. We shall run across them as we go on. We shall run across a great many interesting things as we reenact case 201 MR340. And I should like to warn you, if you have the slightest trace of murder in your heart, that a murdered person's teeth are almost impossible to destroy, and that nothing is ever lost. It will certainly be found sometime, somewhere, by someone. Now, will you come with me? This is Scotland Yard's Black Museum. Yes? It's Inspector Whitaker, sir, with a friend. Oh, do come in, Whitaker. Thank you, sir. Come along. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson, the curator of the Black Museum. Well, how do you do? I'm afraid this place is a little like a chamber of horrors. 
Although our exhibits taken by themselves are not so startling. But they are souvenirs of the lawbreaker's art, particularly of the unlovely art of murder. Now, this human bone here brought one man to the hangman's expert hands. And these dried bloodstains on this cloth are from a once-loving husband's throat. And this revolver... Oh, but you wanted to see the exhibits in our case... 201 MR 340, didn't you, Whitaker? Yes, if you please, sir. Well, these are the only ones we had. Man, tooth, and this badly charred top of an ordinary office stool. That's all we have here, of case 201 MR 340. The rest is nowhere. Detective Sergeant Alexander McMurphy and I, we were the murder squad next on call, was sitting peacefully chatting in my office at Scotland Yard that evening of the 16th May, waiting for our relief, who were due in less than half an hour. Oh, you're early, Anson. No such luck, Mark. Oh, hello, Boots. What's up, Boots? Investigation, sir. Why couldn't they wait another half hour? Sorry, sir. It just came in. Oh, uh, we don't live right. Camden Town, sir. Mm. There's a fire. What? They want someone from the yard. What are we? A bleeding auxiliary fire brigade, do they think? They seem to have come across someone sitting in the middle of it, sir. What? Sitting in it? Grilled to a turn. What? Mm. Here's the address, sir. Your car's waiting. We hastened at once, of course, to the Camden Town location, about 20 miles away. The fire was a small one. It had partially destroyed an old shed which had been used as an office by a local builder, Mr. Sidney Patterson. It was only a smoldering ruin when we arrived and identified ourselves as a magnificently moustached section leader in charge. We followed him into the soggy ruins of the shed. Right here, gentlemen. We wetted him down with the fire hoses as soon as we saw him, but it was much too late. Hot fire? Oh, ruddy inferno. Mm -hmm. He had paints and oil stored in here. <laughs> Not my idea of a way to commit suicide. Suicide? Note on the table there. What was a table? Pinned to the top with a drawing pin. See? Yes. Hold up your torch here a sec, will you, section leader? Yes. Uh, good, goodbye, all. No work, no money. Sydney R. Uh, Patterson. Mm. That was the poor sod's name. See the sign? I'll telephone the laboratory to pick up the uh, remains, shall I, sir? Best use the two-way wireless on the car, I think. All right, sir. What's he, uh, what's he leaning against? Looks like a stool or something. Uh, that's what it is, sir. A office stool. See these buckets all around him? He must have surrounded himself with buckets of paint and whatnot. He flipped a match into one of them. You ever hear of a chap committing suicide by setting himself on fire before? No. Oh, I wouldn't want to. He deserves an awful Well, horrible. don't touch him. Well, I was only trying to pull him away from the stool here. Part of him ain't burned, see? Where he's don't, stuck to it. Don't. It's a laboratory chap. Oh, blimey. Hmm? Setting himself on fire didn't hurt him. What do you mean? He shot himself first. Did you see the bullet hole in his back where it ain't burned? When it was against the stool? In his back? Oh, was the man a contortionist? No, sir. He was a builder, sir. At the Yard's pathological laboratories, the relatively small, unburned portion of the body was carefully examined, and it was established that the bullet wound was the probable cause of death. The bullet, which was recovered, proved to be a thirty-eight caliber revolver bullet, which had been fired into the body from the back, entering just below the left shoulder blade and ranging downward, presumably through the heart. Experiments by all of us demonstrated to our satisfaction that such a wound could not possibly be self-inflicted. The improbable suicide was definitely murder. I sent two detective constables to search the ruins of the shed. It had been roped off at our request by the Camden Town Fire Brigade. You'll be looking primarily for a revolver, I told them, but fetch back anything you find that appears useful to us. Whilst they were shifting the ashes, Sergeant McMurphy sifted the affairs of Mr. Sidney Patterson. He reported to me what he had found. From the little I've been able to gather, Patterson wasn't much of a success as a builder, sir. He seems to have been a genius for getting into difficulty. What sort of difficulty? Money. Hmm. How strikingly unusual. Huh? Oh, 
He had one time been a ship's carpenter on one of the P&O liners, but was discharged when he was unable to account for tools to the value of eight pounds eleven shillings. Mm -hmm. It was strongly suspected that he sold them, but the charges couldn't be proved. He served in the Royal Marine Light Infantry as a lance corporal. His record is, um, shall I say, dubious. How dubious? He was accused of a, num a number of times by his shipmates of cheating, specifically at the game of crown and anchor. <laughs> he was extremely unpopular in the Royal Marines, it seems, and was finally discharged. Mm -hmm. I shall have a more detailed report from his former commanding officer tomorrow. You hadn't any friends at all? I've been able to discover only one with whom he could be said to be reasonably friendly, a man named Duncan Fraser, a rent collector in the city with whom he frequently played billiards. Mm, I hope he didn't make the mistake of trying to cheat a Scotsman. I'm not so sure, sir. Eh? Duncan Fraser has been missing since the night of the fire. The hue and cry was immediately set up throughout all Britain for the missing Duncan Fraser. It's extremely difficult for a British subject to leave our tight little island without record. But the search was no avail whatever, and apparently dropped all fears. The constables applied to the ash sifting at the scene of the fire found only one thing of note. The twisted remains of an ornate red and black fountain pen, which was identified by his wife as Sidney Patterson's property careful examination showed that it was the pen with which the farewell note had been written, and comparisons with other known samples of Patterson's handwriting demonstrated that it had been actually written by Patterson himself. Sergeant McMurphy and I were extremely glum as we discussed our progress in my office late one night. Progress, indeed. We've been progressing backwards, sir. Yeah, if we could find the revolver, it would be quite simple to trace its owner. If the owner is Duncan Fraser, we'll still have to trace him. Mm-hmm. No luck, yet. None at all, at all. You know, sir, one thing puzzles me. A great many things puzzle me, Matt. If this missing rent collector did murder Patterson, why did he first deposit half the money he'd be co he collected? In the bank, I mean. Hmm? If he was going to kill someone and, and scram, why didn't he keep it all? He'd need it. How did he get Patterson to write his own suicide note? Had a gun on him, maybe. Well, the handwriting, Wallace, insists there's no indication of stress, strain, or emotional upset or whatever. In the handwriting. It's normal, they say. Mm. I wonder... What? Uh, I'm thinking. I have a filthy little hunch, Mac. What? What if Fraser's dead? Maybe he is. We can't find him. The teeth of that dead are went destroyed. Patterson's? I'm wondering if it was Patterson's. Or Duncan, Mac. Hmm. Patterson was a was a known crook. Could he have been playing games with us? Show me that telephone, old boy. Uh, good evening, Mrs. Patterson. A detective Inspector Whitaker, Scotland Yard here. I wonder, Mrs. Patterson, if you could tell us. The name of your late husband's dentist? Thank you very much indeed. No, Mrs. Patterson. I'm afraid there's nothing to report yet. Get this tooth merchant in here first thing in the morning, will you, Mac? We'll meet him in the laboratory and let him look at our client fang. Well? Well, what, Doctor? I never saw these teeth in my life. What? Oh. I can assure you they are not Sidney Patterson. You can swear to that, Doctor? Well, I hope you're not impugning my professional judgment, sir. Well, not at all, Doctor. It's a, it's a matter of correct legal procedure. I have ample records in my office which you may consult. Chart impressions. Sidney Patterson had lost three teeth a long time ago. I extracted the left upper canine and the adjacent incisor myself more than a year ago. Mm. You'll observe that both are in chat in this jaw, sir. Then you're prepared to swear that these teeth are not Sidney Patterson's, sir? I most assuredly am. And that this is not Sidney Patterson's body? Since the jaw containing the teeth is attached to the remainder of the body, I'm prepared so to swear, sir. It's often impossible to grow a new head on a body. 
My fee will be one good day. I will indent for it at once, Doctor. Good day, sir. Now, what did I do with my hat? Oh, yeah. Good day. Good day, good day Doctor. I am sincerely glad that teeth are not inflammable, Mac. If more people knew that, there'd be fewer left to be called for corpses around here, sir. Right. Now, have you found Duncan Fraser's dentist yet? I at once caused a thorough investigation to be made throughout London and the vicinity of Perth in Scotland, where Fraser came from, to discover a dentist who had been employed professionally by him. The search was most thorough, although the combined efforts of Scotland Yard and the provincial police were not efficient, sufficient to find the person. In the meantime, we were able to lay our hands on some uh, oh, 13 or 15 persons who had known either Patterson or Fraser. Each individually viewed the grisly remains in the Scotland Yard mortuary, and the result? Ivor Young, Esquire, former employer of Duncan Fraser. Oh, it's hard to say, but I believe this to be the body of Fraser. Michael Fish, a former neighbor of Fraser. No, that ain't him. I know him well. Edgar Stone, brother-in-law of Patterson. I'm quite sure this is Sidney Patterson's body. And so it's left the fountain pen I gave him. Artificer Sergeant Rodney Smith, Royal Marine Light Infantry, a former service acquaintance of Patterson's. No, that ain't him at all. Oh, and I wish it was. Bleeding stinker he was. No, but this ain't him. Police Constable Mark Emerson, a former billiards companion of Fraser. Duncan, all right. He looks awful. But then he always did. Hamish Fraser, uncle of Duncan. Oh, no. No, that isn't my nephew, Duncan. Samuel Furness, laborer, sometime employee of Sidney Patterson. I know it's him. Well, didn't I work for him? Confusion. Confusion confounded. Six said it was Furness. Seven insisted it was Fraser. Patterson's widow herself was not sure. And she and her brother, Edgar Stone, Patterson's brother-in-law, had high words. Mac Murphy and I nipped round to the goat and compasses to refresh and sustain ourselves. I was finishing my gin and bitters, and Mac was deep into his second pint of mild and bitter, when the proprietor, one Dick Gillespie, came out of the saloon bar and accosted us. Oh, I say, Inspector Whitaker, I didn't know you were in here. Well, Alex. There was a, a telephone call for you. Oh, who was it? Uh, Sergeant Kenneth of the yard. What do you want? Well, he said, he said they'd found the dentist. <laughs> oh, 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 what's the matter, Inspector? Your teeth hurt you? It was a dentist from Perth. The Scottish police had found him. We brought him at once to Scotland Yard, where he immediately identified the charred remains as those of Duncan Fraser. One of his molars was curiously malformed. It corresponded exactly with the one shown in the clinical photograph of Fraser's mouth the doctor had made a year ago. There was no mistaking it, he said. We returned to my office to marshal the facts that we had accumulated. The labourer, Samuel Furness, who had been so certain of his identification of the body as that of Patterson, was waiting. Mac and I listened. Oh, I knew that was Mr. Patterson what burned up to a skeleton, sir. Why are you so sure, Furness? Because I was the last man to see him alive, sir. When? Well, in the afternoon of the day he was burned up, sir. Go on. Well, it was like this here, you see, sir. Go on, go on. Well, I come into his office, sir. You know, the shed, what was all burned up. I was after the seven and six he'd owed me for two months. Oh, he was always putting me off, sir, but... Why? Uh, well, he, he always seemed to be stony, sir. Never seemed to have a shilling. Ah, uh, he was always putting go me on, off. Go on, go on. Did you get your money? Oh, that I did, sir. Before you could say knife, he had out his purse and he pulled out a great wad of notes. Then he counted me out me seven and six... And then he handed me half a crown. And he says, here, buy yourself half a pint, Sammy. <laughs> cool, I was fair took her back at old Sydney giving anybody anything for nothing. He seemed to have <laughs> plenty of money, did he? Well, his wallet was fair stuffed. <laughs> you know, it's the first time I ever known him to have more than threepence in my life. Oh. <laughs> well, I was so took back, I tried to get up and I fell right on me apple and plum. Yes. I kicked my foot against a couple of bags of cement he had under his desk and I fell right down. <laughs> did you see the bags of cement? Well, they was under the desk, sir. Did you see them? Well, I... Uh, 
Oh, no, sir. I didn't, but Thank I know you, I picked it. Patterson had plenty of money in his wallet for the first time. We found that there was absolutely no identification in the ruins of the burned shed that any cement had ever been stored there. We'll find him. I said that nothing is ever lost. No thing, no person. I will admit, however, that it is sometimes extremely difficult to find a missing thing or a missing person, especially when the objects of the search have few distinguishing characteristics. Sidney Patterson was such a man. Description of Sidney Patterson, broadcast by Scotland Yard. Age, 43. Height, 5 feet, 9 inches. Weight, 11 stone 4. Medium brown hair and straggling moustache, same color, which he may have shaved off. Eyes, blue. When last seen, was dressed in grey tweed, single-breasted suit, white shirt, dark red tie, black low-cut shoes. How many men answering that description do you see in a day? We had reports from every corner of the United Kingdom. Two slightly addled gentlemen, neither of whom resembled Patterson in the slightest, marched, one at Torquay and one at Tranvaal in Wales, into police stations announcing themselves as the wanted man. Each was promptly committed. Lodging housekeepers by the hundred were interviewed. The manhunt dragged on for eight days before we had our first glimmer of success. Um, let, uh, let Mac Murphy tell it. He was there. There was a lodging house in Regent's Park, a very obscure one which smelt of Brussels sprouts. The proprietress was in the hospital having another baby, and her husband, a very harassed man, was in charge. Yes, he said, they'd had a lodger who seemed to answer to the broadcast description. Had had, I said. Uh, well, he ain't here anymore, I mean. What became of him? Well, he opted. He opted the very day that the piper come out with the description. Where? I don't know. He, uh, he just sent us his telegram. Brother ill. Must leave. We'll get in touch later. Rogers. Rogers, eh? That the name he gave? Right here. Right here it is in the register book. Here. Sidney Rogers, see? Sidney, eh? That his own writing? Yes, yes. I'd like to have that page, if you please. Oh, I'll return it. You're sure it's his handwriting? Oh, I... I seen him. I, I seen him write it. May I have the page? Well... Well, my, my old lady likes to keep things neat and tidy. Mm, well, I'll return it as soon as we've checked it against a sample of his handwriting. Now, uh, when did he come here? Uh, 16th of May. It says right here. And when did he leave? Well, the day is his description first come up in the pipe. Mm, he leave uh, his luggage? Oh, he hadn't any luggage. He, he was here all the time without even, without even changing his shirt. That room of his, oh, fair piggy. <laughs> Must be. Well, <laughs> we're rid of him, and he's paid up to the end of the week. Anyway, so we don't lose nothing. Yeah. You, you suppose it, it was him? It'll be in the papers. Comparisons of samples of Patterson's handwriting with the signature of <clears throat> Sidney Rogers showed them to be identical. Peterson's full name was Sidney Roger Patterson. The telegram had been sent from South End. We turned our attention to that muddy little place. He was not to be found, although our search was scrupulous and thorough. We put a postal stop on all letters addressed to his former home, expecting that sooner or later he'd attempt to write to his wife. Thus, all letters addressed to that house would be held out and delivered to us first. We would open and read them, reseal, and allow them to be delivered to the addressee without the wife's knowledge that we had read them. No letters appeared. We waited. Time was on our side, and the searchers at South End trotted along, making no apparent progress. And then, after a week had passed, the post office people sent us a letter. It was addressed to his brother-in-law, Edgar Stone, who had a room there. Letter addressed to Edgar Stone. Dear Edgar, just a line to you in the hope that I shall be able to see a friend before I end it all. Will you come to see me at South End somewhere, uh -huh. please? Take the 10.35 train 
It arrives at South End at 12.8. Come out of the station, walk straight across the road and down Whitegate Road on the left side. I shall see you coming. If you come, please bring me a 15 and a half inch shirt and a comb. Best of luck. Mine is gone. F. Farmer. Well, so... I withdrew the detectives from the area mentioned in the letter, which was resealed and delivered to Edgar Stone. I didn't want to alarm Mr. Farmer Patterson. Next day, Edgar Stone came to see me. He sat down nervously. What can I do for you, sir, Stone? I asked. I, I... I have received a letter, Inspector. Yes? It, it's from... Are you going to South End on Sunday, Mr. Stone? Uh huh Stone had a strong sense of justice, strengthened, perhaps, by the shabby way Patterson had treated his sister for so many years. He agreed at once to assist us. We sat in my office and planned it, Mac and Stone and I. You're all taking the shirt, of course, Stone, I said. Yes, sir. What a man who's going to end it all once with the shirt is beyond me. Probably needs it. Afraid he'll be recognized if he goes out to buy one, I expect. He's got plenty of money, we know that. If the banks had been opened that afternoon... He, well, he'd, he'd have any. He wouldn't have any. What? Well, Fraser would have deposited his afternoon's collection, the same as he did his morning. Well, the banks have been open. Fraser would still be alive. Sydney would be up to some other mystery. Uh, yes. Well, let's get organized, shall we? First, we'll need a good man on this Whitegate Road to see Patterson doesn't get frightened and do a bunk. You'd better do that, Max. Well, uh... Oh, I'm afraid he'll spot you for a cop. Sky. Hmm? I've seen too many cinemas, I'm afraid. I don't like false beards. Wait. You play the fiddle, don't you, Max? What? You could be a street fiddler, couldn't you? Well, I... I could. That's what you'll be. Complete with tin cup and pathetic look. Very touching and, and very unsuspicious. And I'll have half of what you take in. How am I going to stop a man with a fiddle? Oh, simple enough, old boy. Just play God Save the King. You stand at attention till I get there. <laughs> We planned it as carefully as we could. This was to be the definitive last act. Stone and I took the same train to South End, but when he got off with me, I stayed inside the station. Far down the street, I could see Sergeant McMurphy in an ancient green suit of clothes, sawing industriously away on his fiddle. There were a few pedestrians on the street. Church services were just over. <clears throat> There's Whitehead Road, I said to Stone. Come back at once. The up train's due in a few minutes. Good luck. I wish I didn't have to do this, Inspector, but... Just remember what he's done, Stone. It's the only reason I'm doing it, sir. Good luck. Sidney was my friend once. He turned and crossed the road, walked slowly down Whitehead Road. I watched him from the station window. As he approached Mac Murphy, he paused a second. I chuckled as Mac Murphy held out his tin cup and Stone dropped a coin into it. Far away, I could hear his fiddle. I went to the door of the station and stepped outside as he turned the far corner... There is such a thing as trusting a man, but... I waited. The distant street fiddler shambled round the corner which Stone had turned. I fidgeted. A couple passed on the way home from the church. I waited. A small boy ran past with a hockey stick. I waited. And at last I saw Mac Murphy in his green suit come slowly round the corner toward me. In a moment, Stone reappeared. He glanced at Mac as he passed, and I thought I saw him nod... I started toward him, sauntering quite casually. We passed without recognition. Mac had halted again and was playing. I stopped alongside him. How much have you made, Mac? I asked. Four shillings. Hmm, good. What happened? Oh, it's all right. Anybody who sees us will think I'm asking you how you fell to this lower state. First house round the corner. There was a cardboard sign in the window. Sydney was printed on it. Door opened. He went in. That's all I saw. Good. I'll nip round to the back... You walk on around in front and play. Let's we'll see what happens. Well, I, I, I don't... I can't play, God save the king. It was easy to nip over the fence and slip around to the rear of the second house, which was marked J. Huntington. I tried the rear door. It was unlocked. I opened it cautiously and stepped inside. It was empty, apparently. I stepped down the narrow hall. Is that you, Mr. Huntington? I walked toward the voice. Mr. Huntington, is that you? I walked to 
the door on the left. Mr. Huntington. He stood there in the frosty little room, a pathetic figure with his neatly combed hair, holding a clean white shirt in his hand, an embarrassed little smile on his face. Oh, I thought you were Mr. Huntington. I'm Inspector Whitaker of Scotland Yard, Mr. Patterson. Oh, yes. I knew you'd find me eventually. I just wanted to put on a clean shirt before I... before... Uh... I detain you on suspicion of being involved in the murder of Duncan Fraser. Oh, poor Duncan. And I warn you that anything you may say will be taken down in writing and used against you. Uh... There, there we are. I've only one thing to say, sir. I did murder Duncan. This is the revolver I shot him with. Give it here. The one you couldn't find, sir. Give it here. It wasn't lost, sir. Give it here. Oh, no, sir. No, Sidney. Nothing is ever lost. Sit lies and pray. You have just heard the story of case number 201 MR340 from the official files of Scotland Yard. All of the facts related are true, with the single exception of the names of the participants, which, for obvious reasons, have been changed. The research prepared by Mr. Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express, and the story for radio was written and directed by Mr. Willis Cooper. Next. Listen for Tales of the Texas Rangers on NBC. Whitehall, one, two, one, two, quickly. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most celebrated cases. These are accurate records drawn from these files by special permission of Sir Harold Scott, Commissioner of Scotland Yard. They're true in every respect, except the names of the participants, which, for obvious reasons, have been changed. The research has been done by Mr. Percy Hoskins, Chief Crime Reporter for the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. New Scotland Yard, the London headquarters of the Metropolitan Police, is situate near the embankment on Whitehall, hard by 10 Downing Street and almost in the shadow of Big Ben. Here also is the headquarters of the CID, the Criminal Investigation Department, the body of men whose exploits for more than 100 years have made the name Scotland Yard synonymous with the brilliant detection of crime and unrelenting pursuit of the criminal and the presentation of the painstakingly acquired evidence that assures his eventual punishment. On the lower ground floor of New Scotland Yard is the famous Black Museum, where whose present custodian is Chief Superintendent James Davidson, a Scotland Yard veteran. Behind this door... Good afternoon. This Black Museum of ours is rather unique. Everything in it was at one time connected with the successful solution of a crime, or was closely involved in the crime itself. We possess an imposing collection of lethal weapons here, each carefully docketed to indicate its origin. Here are half-empty bottles of almost every poison known to man, together with a statement of particulars concerning its use. Here are the bloodstained garments on which the solution of a crime of violence depended. Among the 
Black Museum's relics are disguises used by famous criminals, death masks of notorious men and women whose ends Scotland Yard encompassed, and a great many other more gruesome mementos of man's inhumanity to man. Among the exhibits are others seemingly incongruous objects that in that time served well in the undoing of desperate criminals. Such an exhibit is this one, the fragments of a set of teacups. This collection of shards was the first step in the solution of a frightful crime which occurred during the Blitz of July 1940. Yes, sir? Would you please bring me file number 302-MR-651, Constable? 302-MR-651, uh, sir? Yes, sir. One, sir. In July 1940, the Battle of Britain was at its height. The Luftwaffe hits us at all hours, and from advanced defense fields of the RAF, the weary spitfires rose day and night to do battle. Thousands of British people died in Britain as a result of enemy action. But in the midst of the very present war, murder went on as usual. Chief Superintendent Peter Carruth received a telephone call at Scotland Yard on the morning of the 3rd of July, a Wednesday. Pass 302MR651, sir. Thank you. The call was from Chief Constable at Matfield, a Kentage village near Tunbridge. The Chief Constable reported the finding of the bodies of three women shot to death and requested the assistance of the CID. The services of Scotland Yard are available to the provincial police at all times if requested. The Home Office, assuming all expenses, if the request is made within 24 hours of the discovery of the crime, at their own expense, if we're called in after that. Chief Superintendent Carruth was gratified that the request came at the very beginning of the case, and he drove to Matfield at once with a medical examiner from the Home Office and Detective Sergeant Small, also Scotland Yard. They were met at the scene of the crime by Matfield Chief Constable Thomas Bennett, it's good of you to come so quickly, all of you. It's all quite beyond us here, sir. What with the blitz and all? I'm sure. I had a bad time. Having it, sir. Yes, I have no doubt. Those hours, Mr. Bennett. Spitfires. Jerry must be up again. Well, here's what happened. In the house, there's Miss Evans, the servant. Uh, is she dead? Two holes in her head. Yeah. Play, place all ransacked. All tore up. Where are the others? Mrs. Ames and her daughter Jessica's lying down there in the orchard. Also shot. Yes, I, I see. Where do we want to start, sir? Um, a house, I think, first. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, come in, then, sir. Uh, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. They've lived here in Matfield a long time, have they, Bennett? And Miss Evans, the servant, has always lived here. Mrs. Ames and her daughter moved here a year ago. Mrs. Ames a widow? No. Estranged from her husband, though they're quite friendly. He lives at Piddington. Oh, yes, I know. I've been there. Owns a farm. Does he know about this? My station sergeant telephoned him this morning, sir. He was in London, but he'll be home this evening. Shall I uh, go first, sir? She's lying right by the door, and you might trip over her. By all means. You go might try this. Uh, oh, these no, is the no, gentleman no. from Scotland Yard, Constable. Yes, sir. This is her. Miss Margaret Evans, sir. Age 61. Servant. Living in. Ah. Oh. See what you can find out, Bernard. Right, you are. Small, get started looking for fingerprints. Yes, sir. Place has really been ransacked, hasn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. What's missing? I haven't checked yet, sir. I haven't touched anything. Good. Well, not much chance of finding out if anything is gone, though. Everybody that lived here is dead. I'd like to see the others. Right, sir. If you'll come with me. Oh, uh, what's that over there? Mm. Tea things? Yes, sir. Looks as if she dropped the tray when she saw the murderer. Have a look at them, too, Small. All right, sir. Uh, down this part, sir. The orchard, uh, that's where they are. Mrs. Ames? And her daughter, Jessica. Mm. They have many visitors? Very few, sir. And the place is back from the road, isn't a bit by the roses. Hard to tell they do have. Here she is. 
This is the daughter, I suppose. Right, sir. Her mother's over there, off the path. Daughter was running away toward the house. Mother was facing the other way. Shot in the back, too. Aye. Found anything here in the grass? Cartridge cases, anything? Uh, no, sir. Oh, we, we did find this glove, though, sir. Sorry, I had it in my pocket. Almost forgot it. Oh, woman's glove. Size six, I'd say. Hogskin. Shop sell thousands a week. Left hand. Whose is it? Isn't Mrs. Ames, sir, too small. Or Miss Jessica's either. Uh, too large, I'd say, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yes, I think so. Uh, maybe the murderer, sir. We'll see. All you found? All so far, sir. Mm. Where was the glove? Oh, over there, sir. I, I marked the spot with those uh, two sticks. Uh huh. Alongside the mother's body. Yes, sir. Well, as soon as Bernard's examined the bodies, I think you'd better have all this grass scythed down and see if you can find anything else. Cartridge case or anything. Yeah, right, sir. Shall we walk back to the house? Yes, sir. Good hunting, lad. Beg your pardon? I'm talking to the fighter chap up there. Oh, oh, oh. I hope he shoots some Jerry's bloody ears off. He probably will. Got a son in the raft, flight sergeant of the coastal command. Good man. 19 years old. When I was 19, I was a farm man for good old Uncle Tom Cobbley. Hey, what if they found anything yet in there, sir? We'll see. Oh, here's Bernard. Anything yet? Well, I, uh, I want to see the other bodies first. Discovered a little so far. Uh, where are the... Um, uh... Down the path back there, sir. We've touched nothing. Except this glove. Oh, is this one of theirs? Wrong size. All right. Uh, you can remove the bodies as soon as I finish, Chief Constable. Yes, sir. I'll have the van here at once. Uh, see to it, please. Yes, sir. What are you doing, Small? I'm trying to fit these cups together, sir. Well, what about fingerprints? I wanted you... Oh, I found a good many, sir. They all checked with hers. Oh, how did you know they were hers? Oh, I took hers. I wish live people's were as easy to take. No others? Well, I'm not sure yet, sir. As soon as I get the others down there, I'll make a very thorough check. These cups and saucers. She dropped them when she saw the murderer, probably. Yes, quite. But why should there be four cups, sir? Four? One for the mother, one for the daughter, one for the maid, for her. Miss Evans was more a companion than a servant, sir. Here in Matfield, we... Ah, uh, ah, uh, yes. And one for the murderer. Why, then, they must have known the murderer. People don't usually offer a cup of tea to a perfect stranger. You could make up a list of their friends, Chief Constable, uh, they and then... very few friends, sir. Kind of standoffish like they was, and... But the parson, the grocer, postmistress, not any real close friends, so to speak. Make up a list and check where they all were yesterday. Yes, sir. What about this estranged husband of Mrs. Ames? Would he have a motive? Oh, I don't think so, sir. He used to come visit her, I know, but... Oh, he did, eh? And he's in London now, you said? I went down yesterday morning, they said, sir. Where does he live, do you say? Piddington, sir, near Oxford. Uh, you take over, Sergeant Small, you and Mr. Bernard. I'll call you from Piddington. Piddington, sir? Do you think... I that... think I'd like to know whether our friendly ex-husband was really in London yesterday or elsewhere. <laughs> Piddington, that afternoon, 70 miles away from Matfield, Jem Davies, the man of all work, explained to Chief Superintendent Carruth that John Ames had not yet returned from London. Miss Viola Masterson, the manager of the Ames farm, however, was at home, recovering from an accident. Carruth spoke to her in her sitting room. Her left arm was in bandages, and she was obviously in slight pain. Carruth sympathized with her. I am so sorry to disturb you, Miss Masterson. It's quite all right. I'll be up and about in a day or so. It pains a little, though, now. I suppose you've heard about the former Mrs. Ames and her daughter. I'm so dreadfully sorry. I knew them slightly, you know. Oh, did you? I'd have gone over to Natfield if I hadn't been so stupid as to fall off my bicycle and injure my arm. I'm afraid I'm not a very good cyclist. Oh, do you have any clues as to the... 
the... Murderer? Very few at the moment. Very few, I'm afraid. Oh, what a pity. Mr. Ames went to London yesterday. Hmm? Yes. He was probably in London while his former wife and daughter were murdered. He often stops in to see them on his way. If he'd stopped there yesterday, he might have prevented it. Yes, yes. I suppose he can account for his movements yesterday. I'm quite sure he can, Superintendent. I expect him at any moment. You were here at the farm all day? I rode about the farm all day on my bicycle until I had the accident. Ah. I'm sure Jemmy Davis can confirm that. And the bicycle is still where I left it, where I fell off, unless Jemmy's brought it back. I see. Uh, by the way, have you ever seen this glove before? Oh, let me see it. No, I'm afraid not. Did it belong to... We're not quite sure. Well, it's not mine. Much too big for me, I'm sure, Superintendent. You've never seen it before? Never. Thank you, Miss Masterson. Is that all you wanted? Aren't you going to wait for Mr. Ames? Oh, I don't like to disturb you, Miss Masterson. I'll wait out there with Jemmy. It is Jemmy, isn't it? Uh, by all means, talk to Jemmy. I'm sure he'll confirm everything I've said. Good day, Miss Masterson. You know where to find Jemmy? <laughs> he was sitting alongside the stable door cleaning a shotgun when I last saw him. Jemmy Davis was a simple-minded man. He didn't realize that he was talking much too freely to the friendly Scotland Yard man. Well, it'd, it'd be a terrible thing, I expect, but I don't shed no tears for him. I didn't like her nor her daughter neither. Hated them? It'd be none of my business, sir. But now, Mr. Ames, uh, he'd be a real fine man. And she... Uh, she treated him awful bad. How? Dug in the manger. Kicks him out, she does. And then when he finally meets a woman he loves, and that woman loving him, she won't give him no divorce. You seem to know a lot about Mr. Ames' affairs, Jemmy. Yeah. Him and me, we be just like that. I'd do anything for that man. Her too, for that matter. Who? Miss Marcheson. There. Well, that's pretty clean, ain't it? Let's see. Clean as I'd ever want a gun to be. <laughs> Had it for years. Old-fashioned, like me. <laughs> uh, but she'd be a good shotgun. He uses it all the time for rabbits. Mr. Ames? Well, buys his own shells, too. Hmm. Uh, Miss Masterson, she's scared of it. Tried to teach her how to shoot it. But she was scared. <laughs> now, you couldn't kill a person with this here gun, I says to her. Not unless you got up real close. Funny thing, though. She shot a rabbit with it yesterday. You know, it made her so sick at her stomach when she shot the poor little fella. Never again, she says to me. <laughs> Did you see the rabbit, Jemmy? <laughs> well, what were left of it? She were too close. Well, not worth bringing back to cook. <laughs> you know, I think that's why she fell off her bicycle thinking about it. Where did she fall? Well, it was in the meadow yonder. The wheel slipped on the grass. Jemmy, did you ever see this glove before? Huh? No, sir. Oh, can't say as how I have. Sure? No, sir. Whose is it? I found it. Well, finders, keepers. Uh, that's what they say. So you don't think Mr. Ames and Miss Masterson will be upset by Mrs. Ames' death? Lord bless you, no, sir. Now they can get married. Well, that dog in the manger wife of his. Well, he must have been the last one to see her alive. Oh? How's that? When he stopped us here on the way to London yesterday. Why, I thought you was going to wait for him to come back, sir. Chief Superintendent Carew hurried to the local police station, where he put through a trunk telephone call to Matfield. Detective Sergeant Small, the Scotland Yard man, answered the telephone at the murder house. Small here. Small, I want you to check at once on something. Yes, sir. I want you to make the most diligent inquiries. Get that chief constable there to inquire of every person in Matfield if necessary at once to discover if this man Ames was seen in Matfield yesterday. You got that? He was seen, sir. He was? The postman, sir. We've been making inquiries all over the village of Mrs. Ames' known friends, and we've come across several curious things, sir. Well? Well, the, the postman observed Mr. Ames walking toward this house yesterday afternoon. He sure? We positively identified him, sir. Known him for years. Spoke to him, called him by name, and Ames replied. What else? He was in the 
was carrying the shotgun, sir. Oh. I discovered here that he intended to visit them, but the gun... Well, looks as if he's our man, doesn't it? What else did you discover? Well, there's a bicycle belonging to Mrs. Ames is missing. Oh? And the porter at the railway station reports a strange woman carrying a parcel arrived in town yesterday, but so far we have been unable to trace her. Now, the local police have picked up a deserter from an army camp near here. He's being questioned now. Oh. Uh. And a lorry driver for the gas company at Oxford reports picking up a woman on the highway near here yesterday afternoon. She was wearing one glove. Oh? Now, he thinks her bare hand was scratched and bleeding. Yes? She explained she'd fallen off her bicycle and was trying to catch a train. He took her to the railway station. And then... Well, what did you say, sir? I didn't say anything. Oh, I was speaking to Dr. Bernard, sir. I'll put him on. He wants to speak to you. Uh, thank you. You there, Carruth? Yes, Bernard. I've discovered why you didn't find any spent cartridges, Superintendent. Yes? The women were killed with a shotgun, probably a 410 shotgun. Yes, yes, I know. The uh, murderer had to pick the discharged shells out of the breech of the gun by hand. Yes, but... It... And probably carried them away and disposed of them elsewhere. Did you recover any of the shot from the bodies? Yes, quite small pellets, uh, bird shot. Mark it in evidence and hold it for me. I think those little lead pellets... I'm going to hang someone, Bernard. Back at the Piddington farm, Chief Inspector Carew found that Ames had returned in his absence. Jamie, the garrulous man of all work, was just leaving. He was going to fetch Miss Masterson's abandoned bicycle, he I said. I be going out to fetch Miss Masterson's bicycle, sir. Look here, Jamie. Would you like a half a crown? What for? That rabbit Miss Masterson shot. Is it near where she left the bicycle? Oh, fur longer too, sir. Fetch it back for me. What for, sir? Well, it ain't fit to eat. She were too close. Oh. I've a fancy to see how that gun of yours works, Jim. Oh, that old gun of mine? Uh, she be a very good gun, sir. Show me. Here. Well, good man. Now, is Mr. Ames in the house? Aye, right, sir. Now, I'll, I'll fetch the rabbit and show you. But the poor thing will be all full of birdshot, sir. That'll be all right, Jamie. I'm very interested in birdshot. Yes? I'm Chief Superintendent Carruth of Scotland Yard. You're John Ames, hmm? Yes. Now, you're the gentleman who was here this afternoon. Yes. May I come in? Do. You've come about the murder of my wife and daughter. Yes. I'm sorry, Mr. Carruth, you said? Yes. I cannot pretend any great grief, although I am shocked at the tragic. May I sit down? I, um... I spoke to Miss Masterson, your manager, this afternoon. She said you were here. Perhaps if Miss Masterson is strong enough... Here I am. Oh, sit down, my dear. Please, sit down. Don't hurt my hand, John. I'm all right. Well, sir? Am I correct in assuming that uh, with the death of Mr. Ames' and strange wife, you and he... Uh... We can be married, yes. Mr. Ames? That is true. My wife has consistently refused to give me a divorce. Although we were on fairly good terms... She and, and... I weren't. I'm glad she's dead. Violet, And yes. that horrid daughter of hers, too. Now we're rid of them once and for all. Violet. Do you share Miss Masterson's views, Mr. Ames? I... I'm afraid... Well, perhaps he's not as ferocious as I am, but he shares my views all right. Don't you, John? I... Yes. And what were you doing with a shotgun on the way to her home yesterday, Mr. Ames? John, you didn't. You didn't. Mr. Ames. You, you didn't tell me. Oh, John. John, now you spoiled everything. Your wife and your daughter were murdered with a shotgun, Mr. Ames. I didn't do he it. He didn't, he didn't, I say. What gauge is your shotgun, Mr. Ames? This is absurd, Mr. Ames. Yes, of course it's absurd. Why do, you, why do you think it's absurd? My dear sir, my gun, which incidentally is an American-made Remington over and under 12 gauge, has been broken for four weeks. You see? Broken. The sear spring is broken. It's quite impossible to fire the gun. You can examine the gun at your leisure at Henny McGovern's, the gunsmith's. 
on High Holborn in London, where I took it yesterday. We'll check that. Why did you visit your wife yesterday, carrying your broken gun? I dropped off in Matfield on my way to London to have the gun repaired. I begged her again to give me a divorce. She refused? She refused again. <laughs> for the last time. And we're going to be married now at last. Don't expect us to weep for her. Whoever killed her should be given a medal. Viola. Oh, stop it. You're just as glad as I am. Aren't you? Excuse me. The telephone. Yes? Yes, he's here. One moment. It's for you, Mr. Carew. Thank you. Chief Superintendent Carruth here. Small here, sir. We found Mrs. Ames' missing bicycle. Oh. Yes, sir. It was discovered in a ditch close to the place where the lorry driver picked up the woman with one glove. Oh, good. And there are numerous fingerprints on the handlebar, sir, but of the right hand only. Most interesting. And the strange woman whom the railway reporter observed was uh, carrying a parcel, you remember? Yes, yes, of course. Well, it was a, a long parcel about the length of a gun, he says, wrapped in brown paper. I see. Have you taken the things you spoke about? The things, sir? Yes. Oh, oh the, the fingerprints on the bicycle? Yes, quite. Yes, sir, I've taken them. How soon could I see them and the people you spoke of? Up there, sir? Yes. Well, there's an up train that we can have stop at Pittington, leaving here in half an hour, sir. I think you'd better come then if you can find the others you mentioned. I'll meet you at the Pittington station. Right, sir. Goodbye. I'm very sorry. Could I ask? You have uncovered some other evidence, sir? You're not going to arrest John, then? He won't be charged with murder? I think I can almost assure you that you will not be charged with murder, Mr. Ames. I'm sorry, I, I, I must go and meet my colleagues. This is quite important. Will you be coming back? I probably shall. I, I shall want to be able to assure Mr. Ames that he will not be held. Oh, John. <laughs> The Scotland Yard man still here, Mr. Ames? Why, uh, I'm here, Jamie. Well, I, I fetch you the dead rabbit, sir, with your half crowns worth of birdshot. They met him at the railway station two hours later. Detective Sergeant Small, Chief Constable Bennett, the lorry driver who had picked up the woman with the bloody hand and the one glove, and the railway porter who had observed the woman carrying the brown paper parcel the size of a gun. Leaving Chief Constable Bennett at the station to make a telephone call, the party proceeded to the Ames Farm. Oh. Good evening, Mr. Carruth. May we come in, please? Why, this is quite a delegation. May we come in, please? Why, I suppose... <clears throat> Do come in, although... Thank you. Where's Miss Masterson? Viola? Yes, dear. Why, what... Uh, Miss Masterson, do you recognize any of these people? Why? Why, no, of course not. Patterson, oh. do you recognize this woman? Hey. She's the lady in blue slacks I picked up my lorry on the road in Matfield yesterday. The lady that said she fell off her bike. Her hand was all bloody and she had one glove on. Like this one? Yes, sir. Exactly like that. O'Connor. Yes, sir. Have you ever seen this lady before? I seen her yesterday, sir. Getting off the 1206 train that passes through Piddington before it gets to Batfield. She was wearing blue slacks and carried a brown paper parcel about the size of a gun, sir. Now, look here. What's the meaning of all this? Come in. Well, Bennett. Just like you thought, sir. I telephoned the doctor who treated Miss Masterson, and he informs me that he treated her left hand for multiple lacerations, removing particles of road gravel and stains of tarvia from the palm. Miss Masterson... There is no gravel or tarvia at the meadow. Thank you. Mr. Ames, I'm extremely sorry for you. John, now we won't get married. Viola Masterson, I arrest you on the charge of willful I murder. I wanted to get married and she stood in our And way, I must John. warn you that anything I you say will be taken down and may be used in evidence against you. 
John, what have I done? The evidence adduced by Chief Superintendent Carruth, the identifications by the lorry driver and the railway porter, the shotgun pellets which proved identical with those Miss Masterson had fired into the unfortunate rabbit, the glove which was identified as hers by the store which had sold it to her, the gravel from the road in her wounded hand, and the motive, which was all too plain, proved sufficient evidence to convict Viola Masterson of the murders of Mrs. Ames and her daughter, and of the servant, Margaret Evans, who provided the first clue, the fourth cup. Miss Masterson had determined to murder the servant to eliminate the only witness to the murder of the others. In a trial marked with frequent air raid alarms caused by an enemy whose depredations could not prevent murder from going on as usual, she was found criminally insane and is now imprisoned in the asylum at Broadmoor. John Ames was tried as an accomplice, but acquitted. He joined the 1st Battalion of the Baps and was reported missing in action in the Italian campaign. Constable, you may turn the file 302-MR-651, the Blitz murder case, to the records room. Good afternoon. You've just heard the first case in the series Whitehall 1212, drawn from the official files of Scotland Yard by permission of Commissioner Sir Harold Scott. All names were changed in this story for obvious reasons, but everything else is true. It occurred. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed for radio by Willis Cooper. Next, listen for Tales of the Texas Rangers on NBC.